Excellent, thank you. Well, uh, I already have been watching you settle in and get ready, and I really want to be there with you today in Moscow, but unfortunately, I can't be. So let's do this. Um, my name is Artem Luke, and I'm a partner in the Russian Synesis Institute based in London, and it is my honor and privilege to be moderating the very first session of this year's 13th ABA conference on the resolution of CIS related business disputes. I am unfortunately able to be in Moscow, as I've just said, but I look forward to seeing everyone in person next year. Turning to today's session, this is going to be a fast paced, exciting and informative session with seven superb speakers, our magnificent seven. I'll introduce each speaker before their presentation and there will be a vote on the presentations at the end of the session. Unfortunately, not all of our speakers have been able to attend in person, so we will have a mixture of virtual and in-person presentations. Each presentation will be given in a Pecha Kucha format. For those who are unfamiliar with this format, the rules are as follows. Each speaker has 20 slides and the slides automatically change over after 20 seconds. So sit back, relax, and enjoy our magnificent seven from Pecha Kucha, who will share their tips, traps, and tidbits for CAS disputes practitioners. These are really insights that all of you should know. I'd like to start by introducing our first speaker. Our first speaker today is Jana Tomaszewska. Jana is the managing partner of her own law firm here in Moscow, Tomaszewska and Partners. Jana has a wide range of experience in her career and is internationally ranked on Chambers and Partners for her outstanding ability to see any project through to its completion. Jana always does what it takes to ensure a strong rapport with all clients and superior results. Today, Jana will speak on coordination of multi-jurisdictional teams and typical pitfalls. Jana, over to you. So good, good morning, everyone. So I'm, I, I've accepted the challenge to uh, speak about something useful in six and a half minutes. So let, let's go. Basically, uh, I'll ask you a question. Where do you think the war is won? In the war room or at the battlefield? And I will argue that every war is won in the war room. Therefore, you will want to have your war room stuck with people with enough expertise to see that the project like is completed in the way the client wants it to be completed. And in all complicated uh, multi-jurisdictional cases, I will say that just 50% of success depends on the lawyering skills. Another 50% is a good project management. And you actually need your good project office. Uh, guys in charge of that other 50%. Key factor to success is actually to see which practical difficulties may arise on your way to the actually resolving that uh, complicated case you have at hand and to see which gaps you have to bridge between, what, be, between the expectation of the lawyers and what the client can actually deliver. So uh, there could be a mismatch between expectations and reality. Like the client may think that, well, I hired expensive lawyers, like I'll sit uh, calmly for two years and wait for the results. It's not gonna work. The client has to work as well. 
And uh, it's very important for the project office to see what actually the client has to do, what the client has to deliver. And here comes the money issue. Because normally the clients are very good at asking their lawyers how much is going to cost, but they fail to consider how much it's going to cost for them internally, all these collateral expenses and collateral damage, like people who will need to be paid just for working or for this arbitration, just gathering evidence or meeting with the lawyers, et cetera, et cetera. So because the client doesn't think of that, his view on the expenses can be underestimated and he can get very, very unhappy with the results. Or poor project management can lead you know, to the client throwing things at the council, like let's consider this, let's consider that. They will get a huge bill and get very unhappy. Another problem could be overestimation. Like they can have a relatively simple problem, but then you know, different people from the client's team again will be throwing stuff at the council, like you know, let's do that, let's go there. And as a result, again, they are going to get a huge bill. Uh, they'll get less enthusiastic and maybe they will not be able you know, to go through. So it's important, it's really important that you have in your team someone who takes project management and getting to the result as a first priority, because it will help to balance, balance things and you know, to align different teams and like to align different efforts and also to manage the budgets. Uh, also, it's important to sort of work as a translator in a way between uh, different legal teams and the client, because they may not get the message, like for instance, we had a funny case when the barrister, he, he was like almost uh, ready to resign because he didn't get what he wanted. And like in his last attempt to fix that, he texted uh, the client saying, well, if you could please consider, you know, replying to that email. And the client was very relaxed. He thought, oh, well, if you could, maybe it's not that necessary. And also, uh, also another factor, you know, uh, people do lie at the beginning. And it's just how the, how, how the human brain works, right? They can get convinced that something went, you know, exactly they think it went and they'll be lying to, to their lawyers. So a hint here, try to talk to as many people in the client's team if possible. And if you can get to the junior team member who actually did the work on that project when, which went wrong, it's a very valuable thing, right? Because you can get real insights on what happened. And, Another thing which I always encouraging our clients to do is to negotiate. The project office will be, you know, the guy who will be telling, just let's negotiate. You have your proceedings, that's amazing. Consider the proceedings as a gun on the table. Now you have put the gun on the table, let's negotiate. And don't worry if uh, your negotiation efforts, they go rounds and rounds, you don't see the result. You may eventually see the result. So the mistakes lawyers are sometimes doing they're thinking oh let's do that next cool thing and then negotiate i have news for you the other side is normally thinking the same so if you're successful they're gonna sit there and think okay let's wait for another great things from us and then negotiate and you can spend you know two years without seeing the other side face to face so do negotiate and what the project office is doing is multitasking it will be managing lawyers private investigators internal teams, uh, it will manage fi finances and like uh, can, uh, at times you can manage up to 20 different work streams and really uh, it's important to, to have someone on your team who takes effective management as a key priority who is not lost into you know uh, legal stuff uh, and, and uh, one of the things which uh, a cool project office can do is actually ensure that you have map of the assets Простите, пожалуйста. Спасибо. Вы можете планировать а, свои взыскания таким образом, чтобы а, хотя бы с чего-то начать, то есть с официального подхода, когда вы должны понимать, где и как нужно действовать, чтобы успешно завершить а, споры, конфликт, то есть разрешить его в суде. Вам также нужно а, позаботиться о том, чтобы какое-то количество, какое количество активов было уже а, выделено под а, процесс, под юридический процесс. И каким образом можно а, защитить активы? А, допустим, не знаю, у вашего клиента есть какая-то прекрасная коллекция вин, которая находится в, а, в продаже, допустим, или продается. М может ли клиент со своей стороны вести управление этим процессом? Да, конечно. Может ли юридическая фирма вести 
этот uh, процесс продажи и um, сохранение активов, безусловно. Но все это нужно обсуждать с клиентом заранее. Это никогда не произойдет автоматически само по себе. Никто не возьмет на себя роль без того, чтобы она была предписана и обсуждена. В общем-то, это все с моей стороны. Большое спасибо. Что ж, большое спасибо, Анна. Огромное спасибо, коллеги. Мы будем сейчас двигаться в очень быстром темпе, поэтому я предлагаю перейти сразу к следующему спикеру. У нас второй, наш второй спикер – это Николас Айленд из Лондона. Он ведет преимущество на помогает в случаях нарушения мошенничества и работает очень широко по всему миру. С очень сложными случаями, в очень сложных юрисдикциях. И отношении, он ведет эти споры конфликты, разрешает эти споры конфликты в отношении крупных компаний. My name is Nicholas Ireland. I'm a senior counsel at McFarlane's in London, specializing in international fraud. Ветник в компании McFarlane's в Лондоне. Мы специализируемся в международных судебных разбирательствах в случаях мошенничества. Я лично специализируюсь на таких странах, как Россия, Украина и других странах СНГ. Сегодня я хотел бы рассказать о доказательствах, получаемых законным путем, как их можно защититься. Подобным доказательствам относятся данные, получаемые при взломе компьютеров, украденные документы, а также информация, получаемая частыми детективами и информация, получаемая с применением подкупа. А сегодня я хотел поговорить о стратегии, которые можно использовать в отношении сторон, применяющих в разбирательствах информацию, полученную незаконным путем. Стоит поговорить о том, как оспорить правомерность и допустимость незаконно получаемых доказательств. Разные юридикции по-разному трактуют допустимость подобных доказательств. Например, в Англии только из-за того, что доказательства были получены незаконным путем, совершенно не означает допустимость использования таких доказательств в разбирательстве. Именно поэтому важно понимать, какие есть стратегии, которые помогут нам действовать в отношении страны, использующей незаконно полученную информацию. Есть разные способы противостояния, но ввиду ограниченного времени позвольте сказать о трех основных способах. Первый способ направлен на то, чтобы позволить сомнению допустимость такой информации. Второй способ проведения проверки разбирательств. И третий способ способен раскрыть ее конфиденциальной информации. Итак, первый способ – подвергнуть сомнению допустимость незаконно полученной информации. В подходящее время необходимо принять решение получить доказательства законным путем, чтобы продемонстрировать, что противоположная сторона является недобросовестной, и ее доказательствам нельзя доверять. Чем серьезнее законные действия, тем больше эффект можно оказать на достоверность доказательств, представляемых оппонентам. Следующий вопрос. Насколько корреспонденция или переписка представляют собой ценность? А, потому что суду совершенно не хочется видеть стороны, которые судятся только на основе переписки или данных, взятых из корреспонденции. Поэтому нужно запастись терпением и временем, использовать оптимальные способы. Which might be 
are helpful to them in the underlying civil proceedings. And practically speaking, the parallel proceedings will force the wrongdoer to incur substantial costs, substantial resource in fighting on multiple fronts. So involve local lawyers and use the wrongdoer's decision to illegally obtain evidence to launch parallel proceedings. Those proceedings may give the opportunity to launch a further, stronger attack on the wrongdoer's credibility, and it will also cause serious practical difficulties for them as well as PR issues. Tip number three is forcing the wrongdoer to disclose documents which is claiming privilege over. As you will know, a party is entitled to withhold inspection of documents over which legal professional privilege is claimed. However, there's an exception to this known as the fraud exception or the iniquity exception. Effectively, what this says is that if documents were created to further a fraudulent or criminal purpose, then a party cannot assert privilege over them. So if a party has illegally obtained information, then all documents which relate to that wrong are susceptible to disclosure. And this might include things like emails or potentially instant messages. It really could be anything. This applies equally to direct communications with legal advisors, even if they were unaware of the illegality at the time. So it may be possible for a party to identify likely documents or sources of documents and send forced disclosure of them. This is therefore a huge pressure point and it can be used to force the wrongdoer to provide documents that might have thought it was safe from producing. So where you have a strong prima facie case of fraud, i.e. the illegal actions in obtaining the evidence, this is potentially an extremely important weapon. There's no limits as to what sort of documents could be covered, but it might include things like engagement letters for intermediaries and private investigators, or even strategy notes from lawyers. Now, whilst litigants may focus on the admissibility of unlawfully obtained evidence, one should also be aware of the array of counterattacks which can be deployed against the wrongdoer. This issue is a lot more common than you may think, so it's vital to understand the strategic options available, of which there really are many. So to finish, if you find yourself facing illegally obtained evidence, ask yourself, how can I attack the wrongdoer to maximize the client's position? Now, given time constraints, I've only discussed a few of these today. However, I'd be more than happy to discuss individual cases offline. For now, though, thank you very much for listening, and I'll pass you over to our next speaker. Thank you, Nick. And we move on to our third speaker, uh, who is Natalie Todd, a partner specialising in fraud and asset recovery at PCB Burn. Her practice focuses on Russian and CIS cases, and she has acted for banks and individuals from those jurisdictions for a number of years. She has worked on multi-jurisdictional asset tracing cases, including obtaining worldwide freezing, search disclosure, and passport surrender orders in one of Russia's biggest ever alleged bank frauds. A little known fact is that both Natalie and I started our legal careers at the same firm. Over to you, Natalie. My name is Natalie Todd, and my talk is about interim measures in international arbitration and the English court's powers under Section 44 of the Arbitration Act 1996, which I will refer to as the Act, to order interim relief to assist proceedings. I'm a partner in PCB Burn, and I'm attending this year's conference virtually from London. I specialise in fraud and asset recovery and frequently work on Russian and CIS cases. My practice focuses on complex international litigation and arbitration, and I am ranked in the civil fraud and commercial and banking litigation directories. The demarcation of the roles of the National Court and the Arbitral Tribunal is contained in Section 44. The Act was intended to ensure that the powers of the Court should be limited to assisting the arbitral process and should not usurp or interfere with it. Some specific cases highlight the issues and the Courts and Tribunals need to factor in the newly introduced emergency arbitration rules. Applications for interlocutory injunctive relief in support of arbitrations are typically to preserve property, preserve evidence, restrain a party from committing a possible breach of contract, or freeze a party's assets. The first question the applicant needs to consider is where to make his application, in court or before the tribunal. Applications to court are common when urgent, made on a without notice basis, and where additional delay in enforcing an award might render it pointless. When seeking an urgent, without notice, freezing order, and where the order will bite on a third party, usually banks, against whom awards cannot be enforced. And when urgent, or the tribunal permits it, and necessary to preserve evidence held by third parties. 
In applications under English law, the tribunal also has the power to order interim relief. This is subject to contrary rules, but the LCIA, ICC and UNSA trial rules all permit interim relief applications. The LCIA and ICC enable parties to appoint an emergency arbitrator before the tribunal has been formed. In Zim Integrated Shipping, the High Court considered whether to exercise its discretion to grant urgent interim relief for the purpose of preserving evidence or assets under Section 44.3. Zim was seeking to preserve contractual rights, the very existence of which was the subject of arbitral proceedings between the parties. The court noted that Section 44.3 was a limiting provision which could only be used to preserve assets or evidence and could not be used to make any kind of interim injunction. It hesitantly held that the contractual rights were assets and that the case fell within Section 44.3. The court was wary as a matter of its discretion, given the proximity of the injunction, determining the matter which was to be decided by the tribunal, and Zim's application was unsuccessful. In AT versus OGA, the claimant sought an order to restrain the defendant from circulating a notice. The court was first asked to resolve whether the arbitration agreement applied to the dispute and whether this was, this was to be decided by reference to whether there was a serious issue to be tried on that point, leaving it for the tribunal to decide the issue of jurisdiction or if the court should determine that question as a matter of construction of the arbitration agreement. The judge held that it will generally be the latter because the issue relates to the jurisdiction of the court to make the order sought, as it does in a stay application under Section 9, where the court has no jurisdiction to grant a stay unless there's an arbitration agreement covering the dispute. The dispute fell outside the agreement. In Gerald Metals, the claimant applied for emergency LCIA arbitrator so as to prevent the, re the respondent disposing of his assets. The LCIA learnt that the respondent had offered undertakings and therefore rejected the claimant's application. The claimant applied to the court for an urgent interim relief to prevent the disposal of assets on the basis that the undertakings were insufficient, but the court could not act. The LCIA emergency rules were implemented to reduce the need to invoke the court's assistance in urgent cases by enabling a tribunal to act quickly. The court should only act, therefore, to the extent that the tribunal has no power or is unable to act effectively. Urgency is assessed by reference to whether the tribunal had the power and practical ability to grant effective relief within the relevant timescale. It is explicitly provided in all major arbitration rules that tribunals have the power to grant interim or conservatory measures. The power to grant interim relief is also vested with emergency arbitrators, allowing parties to seek relief before the tribunal has been constituted. However, arbitral procedural rules do not generally set out the criteria for interim measures to be granted leaving arbitrators with wide discretion. Lack of uniform standards leads to uncertainty as to whether a party's application will be accepted and leaves arbitrators without firm guidance on the criteria they should apply. In practice, how arbitrators exercise this discretion depends on a number of factors, including applicable ex arbitrary and procedural rules, arbitrators' interpretation of the criteria to be applied. By way of example, the LCIA rules provide wide ranging powers for the preservation or disposal of any documents, goods related to the, relating to the subject matter of the arbitration and on a provisional basis, any relief which the tribunal would have the power to grant in an award. However, the respondent must be afforded a reasonable opportunity to respond. Will emergency relief from the tribunal be a viable alternative to seeking relief from the national court? Even with the expedited timetables, will the relief be available within the effective timeframe? Will it be possible to make the award binding on third parties? Will the order or award require enforcement in another jurisdiction? Is it enforceable under the New York Convention? The role of the court to support arbitration parties is now extremely limited given the emergency institutional rules. The court's power can be exercised on an urgent without notice application. Aside from this instance and a case where the tribunal does not have the power to grant the relief sought, the court is unlikely to grant interim, interim relief unless the application is so urgent that it can't wait for the emergency arbitrator to be appointed. This limited ambit may be concerning for a number of reasons. It may be harder to persuade the tribunal of urgency on a paper application than it is to persuade the court with submissions at an oral hearing. Tribunal interim measures are unlikely to satisfy the requirement of finality under the New York Convention to enable enforcement internationally. Applicants for interim relief may seek to construct, so far as they legitimately can, an argument for the application needing to be made without notice so as to therefore appear before the court, when otherwise the application would have been made on notice. In this changing landscape, it remains to be seen whether the relationship between national courts and arbitral tribunals continues to swing between a false cohabitation and true partnership. Thank you for listening, and do let me know if you'd like to arrange a call to discuss. My email address is on the slide. Thanks.
Thanks, Natalie. Moving on swiftly, our fourth speaker is Alessia Patrol. She is a founding partner of Patrol Chilikov Law Firm. She has over 10 years of experience in advising Russian and overseas clients on various matters of Russian private law, including acting as counsel on Russian local and transnational disputes, both before state courts and in arbitration, and supporting and managing foreign proceedings. She is specifically experienced in complex cross-border fraud, matrimonial and private matters. She is frequently appointed to act as a Russian law expert and as an arbitrator. Alessia, when you're ready, over to you. Thank you. Good morning, dear colleagues. I'm very happy to be here this morning. It happens sometimes uh, that a creditor dic discovers that his data is not that wealthy, while associates of that data are very wealthy. And I will speak today on whether a mission to catch such assets is impossible. I'm speaking about a non-documented arrangement with someone very trusted and dependent, like a mother, kids, driver, or a schoolmate. The assets may end up with the nominee by two ways. It may be a transfer, a disposal of the asset in anticipation of some enforcement or bankruptcy, or it may be a lifestyle, um, a beneficiary owned the assets through entire life and acquired them always in the name of some nominees. And this is a very risky arrangement, uh, not simply an obstacle for the creditors. It is very risky for the beneficiary simply because a nominee may sell the asset, the nominee may get divorced or die. Russian textbooks, everyone, every textbook on property law says that Russian law doesn't recognize trusts because in Russia, the owner has a full and unlimited powers to dispose the asset. Uh, and this may not be restricted uh, by any sort of agreement. This is true, but it is also true that where the use of trust uh, is for the illegal means, Russian law suggests and offers a very wide range of mechanisms for the creditors, starting from challenging transactions and until using uh, the general clause uh, and tort law. Challenging transaction uh, would be an easy exercise where, for instance, um, an asset is gifted to a son in anticipation of the bankruptcy. It is more difficult where the asset was initially acquired in the name of the nominee. But here again, some rules on transactions like sham transactions may be available. Then where civil proceedings are complemented by criminal proceedings, uh, the creditor may convince the court to freeze the asset held in the name of a third party, uh, simply convincing that there are grounds to believe that the asset was acquired from criminal funds. And such criminal proceedings may be complemented by uh, a declaratory relief from a district court where a victim of a fraud asks uh, a district judge to announce that a real owner is someone else. And uh, the key evidence here is some witness statement uh, of the nominees in criminal proceedings. Then, Russian law may also be prepared to look through the legal entity and announce that the assets held by the legal entity are beneficially owned by some debtor. I may be criticized for bringing for attention some extraordinary case, but this is whatever we have, a famous Sinatra case where the assets of the legal entity, the legal entity was ignored and the assets of the legal entity had been seized. Then I bring um, to your attention a bankruptcy case where the court rejected to agree that a mother is a real owner of a valuable asset, a mother who worked as a nurse in a hospital and allegedly loaned some funds. So he was rejected as a real creditor in bankruptcy proceedings. And my favorite is a general clause, Article 1064 of the Civil Code, which says that under Russian law, any harm, any damage, cost uh, must be compensated. 
And I understand many CIS countries, civil codes, they have similar clause which may be used. And uh, because it is a general clause, not a German style list of protected interest, any damage is compensable. Uh, the concealment and assistance in concealment of assets from creditors is a tort under Russian law and maybe uh, it, it's a separate tort uh, of the individual. And I bring uh, a series of a case law where a Russian courts had been prepared to follow and rely on the general clause. It is a Samolovsky's case, famous one, where a son was uh, sons uh, of the controller had been found liable uh, for assisting parents in concealing assets. And then it's a Falahev's case where uh, a mother was found liable in tort for assisting her son, a controller of a bankrupt legal entity, for concealing the assets. And this is complemented um, with the next uh, Farmstrong case, uh, where uh, which is uh, which uh, which is brought to the attention because uh, the transfers were multiple because the assets had been siphoned off the legal entity in a series of transactions. And the court found that every participant, every assistant, even if disposed the asset may be found liable. And what are the limitations of that liability of, of a nominee? Uh, the limitation, so, Primarily, it is a liability for the value of the asset, which uh, a nominee assisted to conceal. And it is helpful because it means that uh, recovery may be made from any asset, not necessarily one transferred to the nominee. So you can see that uh, a mission to catch the assets in the name of the nominees, it's not impossible. It may be uh, a very expensive and lengthy exercise, uh, but it is. Uh, still possible. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alessia. Our fifth speaker is uh, William C. Phillips, a partner at Covington and Burling in New York. Will is adept at creating a winning strategy. He has tried cases before judges and juries across the country and has rarely lost a trial. He uses creative strategies coupled with a deep involvement in the details of his matters and a highly competitive spirit to attain a remarkable record of success for clients. These achievements have earned Will recognition as a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers. Will staffs cases leanly, recognizing that clients want his full and personal engagement. His positioning, grasp of his clients, he concerns at every stage, and his staff negotiations posture often create a favorable settlement in mind for his commercial cases. Over to you, Will. Hi, I'm Will Phillips coming to you from New York City. I've been asked today to talk to you about one of our favorite uh, litigation tools in the US, depositions before the hearing or the trial. Why and how? Why, what can you accomplish? Well, there are many different uses of depositions, but I wanna to talk to you today about four uses in particular, the discovery deposition, depositions to preserve testimony, to freeze testimony for cross-examination and depositions to position the case for settlement. So discovery depositions are to learn facts that you don't know in your case. It may well be that much of your case uh, is known, it depends upon things that are internal to your adversary. You can find out and confirm what happened in the case. You can also have that, take the opportunity to test strengths and weaknesses. Um, in order to conduct this type of deposition, you usually ask open-ended questions and try to encourage the witness to talk. It's a fishing expedition of sorts, but be prepared to cross if you obtain damaging testimony, because after all, this testimony may be usable at the hearing. Another form of depositions to preserve testimony. This is for the witnesses that you want to present at trial, whether they're adverse to you or supporting to you, but you can't get them because they're no longer employed. They may be outside the ability of any entity to compel their testimony. Uh, and this is the equivalent of hearing testimony. That's important because you need to ask crisp, precise questions to which you want known answers. This is not a time to explore because the answers can be used at the hearing. Uh, it's, you may need to cross to, make, to bring out your side of it. 
Depositions to freeze testimony for cross-examination. This is probably every litigator's favorite form of the use of depositions. You lock in the testimony of the other side's witness, and if they deviate from that at the hearing of the trial, then you use that transcript powerfully to cross-examine them. For example, you at the hearing, you would lock in the current testimony, maybe get the witness to repeat it, remind the witness that you have talked to them earlier when they were under oath to answer truthfully, give them a copy of the transcript, invite them to read along with you, read the question and answer, stop, move on. Um, depositions can also be used to demonstrate the strength of your case for settlement purposes. This may be the first time that you really have a chance to show the other side the strength and weaknesses of your case because you haven't revealed it earlier. It's particularly true if the other side's client or, or senior executive is present. Sometimes depositions, uh, cases can tend to settle even when depositions of senior executives are noticed. Um, but uh, poor morale after a poor by performance by a senior executive can also often lead to settlement. Uh, so what do you need for a deposition? Well, you need a court reporter and a stenographer. You might want live feed, which is what tells you the transcript of the deposition. Um, you also uh, may want a videographer to videotape it. I, I, they're not necessary, but they've become normal in these days. Uh, sources of information. Uh, what you, there's the usual sources of documents, but be creative here. Witnesses are well prepared going into depositions, and you want to try to find things they're not prepared on. So, do internet searches. Look in public records. Uh, good deposition form usually starts with introductory matters, name, employment, lines of reporting, education. However, I often skip this material on an important witness and go straight to the stuff that I care about before they get too used to how to answer my questions. Um, don't jump right into the documents, however, and follow the facts that they lead you. I've seen too many people who become slaves to their outline. I usually try to keep a list of my topics on a sheet of notepaper next to me uh, and, uh, and, and try not to jump to the documents, but just go uh, to those topics. Slow down in asking questions. Think about how the transcript will look. And in all circumstances, avoid sarcasm because it very often comes across exactly the opposite of the way you want it to uh, in a transcript. Short questions. Uh, the example on the screen right now is an example of a question that should be taken and shot into many pieces. If you took many pieces of this question and asked it over 10 or 15 questions, you would get a good examination. But one question like this is, is ridiculous uh, to try to answer. Um, a good execution of a deposition is usually to establish a conversation, be friendly, get the witness to let their guard down. They want and, and make it feel like an examination, not, an ex, not a test or an exam. And when you get good testimony, move on, don't wait. Uh, with a difficult witness, atomize the questions, break them up. You can also use looping where you use the words of their previous answer in the next question. Another technique is to pipe the quote. You put into your question that you want the words, the, the words that you want the witness to repeat. Long-winded witnesses uh, are a difficult phenomenon. Ask the witness to pause, listen to the question, ask the witness if they understand the question. And finally, ask the witness to answer yes, no, or to tell you that they can't answer yes or no to give you the option of whether or not you want the longer answer. Difficult lawyers, we unfortunately run it, all run into them. My advice is ignore them, avoid debates with them, avoid colloquy with them. If they really object obstreperously, you can start using the technique of asking them if they're uh, instructing the witness not to answer. And as a last resort, go to the tribunal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Will. And we move swiftly from the USA to Germany. Our fifth speaker is Olga Hamama 
Olga Hamama is a co-founding partner of the dispute resolution boutique V29 Legal based in Frankfurt, with a main focus on serving as arbitrator. Olga has more than 10 years of experience acting as counsel, arbitrator, sole arbitrator and secretary to the tribunal in more than 50 international disputes and dispute related matters. Prior to co-founding V29 Legal, Olga was a member of the International Arbitration Group of Freshfields. Olga has specific interest in matters relating to modern technology. She is a member of the Working Group on Dispute Resolution and Blockchain-Based Transactions at the Silicon Valley Arbitration Mediation Center. I'm also a member of the center, and I'm sure the organizers wouldn't mind me saying that this Silicon Valley Arbitration Mediation Center is looking for new members from Russia and Russian-speaking jurisdictions. So have a look if this is of interest. And with that, over to you, Olga. Thank you very much, Artyom. Dobre utra. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, can you hear me well, just to make sure that everything functions? Uh, yes, so, we can. Perfect. Given the specific format of the presentation, I opted to talk to you about 10 issues to consider when it comes to the CAS-related arbitration proceedings based on my personal experience, professional experience within the last 13 years. So first and foremost, uh, international arbitration proceedings, uh, which relate to the CAS region, are international arbitration proceedings. So you should not be expecting any um, irregularities when it comes to a very, you know, accepted, globally accepted and established procedure. Um, as you know, there is a lot of prejudice when it comes to the CAS region and uh, dealing with CAS business partners. This prejudice doesn't always appear to be true, so please respect your partners, do the research and have the cultural understanding when you enter business. Uh, into business. So one of the specifics are usually parties, your business partners turning opposing parties you will be dealing with. Quite often power is concentrated within individuals, both business power, power or political power. You will be dealing with so-called oligarchs who might have close ties uh, to politics, but who might also become hunted by the politicians when their friendships and close connections break. So this might cause additional uh, difficulties in dealing with arbitration proceedings. Location of assets is another very important issue I would urge you to consider. Um, again, you will usually be dealing with uh, complex corporate structures with many shell companies which are will be incorporated in offshore jurisdictions. And behind those complex corporate structure, you will quite often find ultimate beneficial owners. Corruption, unfortunately, remains one of the other realities which is uh, present uh, in all post-Soviet countries. And this is something to consider throughout business, but arbitration proceedings as well. So how does corruption affect business? Well, first of all, it affects the conduct of business, access to the market, obtaining of the necessary permits, for example, administrative decisions. You might be facing parallel court proceedings when third parties want to distract you or distort uh, your business and uncertainty coming from corruption. Bureaucracy is another specific when it comes to the uh, CAS region. Quite often, often there is a huge discrepancy between the set of regulations and the practice. And this is something you should be conveying to arbitral tribunals in order to manage their expectations. Dispute resolution mechanisms. We are talking about international arbitration and local uh, court proceedings will usually uh, step back and not, will not be favored because of the uncertainty. But domestic arbitration proceedings are worthwhile considering um, as they also provide the benefits of the New York Convention. Arbitration agreement. When it comes to arbitration agreements, I would um, urge everyone to consider what type of arbitral institution should be designated. Usually we will see um, arbitral institutions that have some CAS related experience and also will have experience to 
um, advise parties and, well, not to advise parties, but to um, apply uh, the law at the seat of arbitration will provide your recommendations when it comes to uh, arbitrators um, and when it comes to uh, language of the proceedings and skills of those arbitrators. Another specific to consider is protection of investment treaties. Consider which corporate entities or individuals are entering into agreements. Whether BAT provides additional protection, this is quite often not the case when it comes to preferred offshore jurisdictions. Now coming to procedural issues. Interim measures are often uh, procedural tools you will be facing as a party, but you should also be considering as a party, especially if there is a suspicion of dissipation of assets and, uh, for example, uh, problems uh, with uh, if you have problems with evidence. Um, verification of proceedings is enough the issue to consider, especially if ultimate beneficial owners act as guarantors and you can pursue proceedings both against guarantors and um, other contracting parties. Don rates. Uh, Don rates remain to be another unfortunate reality, a, a reality in the CAS uh, region, which are used by opponents, uh, again, to seize documents, to seize um, assets, and they might influence uh, proceedings also by uh, introducing illegally obtained evidence. This might also come from um, parallel criminal investigations proceedings, which are initiated by way of corruption in order to obtain evidence, illegally obtain evidence, and introduce it uh, into arbitration. So this is something to be cautious about. Forged documents also remain a um, reality when it comes to arbitration proceedings. Um, in these circumstances, please consider using ink experts and all other types of forensic expertise that might be helpful uh, to deal with this unfortunate specific. And now coming to a positive note, uh, procedural calendars and holiday seasons. I experience quite often Western practitioners trying to schedule meetings during the so-called New Year celebrations, or for example, May celebrations, at least in Orthodox parts of the former Soviet Union. This is not a good idea. So these were a top 10 from me. Thank you very much. And if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out via email. Thank you. Thanks, Olga. Our seventh, last, by, by no means least speaker is Dmitry Marinkov. Dmitry is a legal counsel with an international corporation in Dusseldorf, Germany, and also regularly acts as an arbitrator in international commercial cases. Dmitry has participated in over 30 arbitrations under various rules, including EIS, VIAC, ITC, PAS, Arbitration Center at RSBB, Intertrial, and has conducted in English, Russian, and German, including appointments as sole and presiding arbitrator. He is a member of the Editorial Council of the Journal Commercial Arbitration, published by the uh, CCI of uh, Russia and of the Editorial Subcommittee of the Asian Institute of ADR. Over to you, Dmitry. Thank you, Artem. Good morning, Dobro Udra. I've been entrusted by moderator Artem the topic of appointment of arbitrators in CS related disputes. And in fact, there are over 100 arbitrations taking every year uh, with CIS relation uh, outside of the CIS. So, uh, and there are some particularities about appointments and the reasons for a low number of Russian arbitrators. Here I'm using ICC statistics simply because ICC is probably the most international arbitral institution and because they publish comprehensive statistics. So you can see there's still a discrepancy between the number of Russian parties and the number of Russian arbitrators being appointed. And there is no real progress, as you can see. The same picture we have if we look at the CIS parties, so from neighboring countries such as Belarus, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, uh, no real improvement over the last five years. And it's not an ICC particularity. Uh, there will be a similar situation if we look at other international arbitral institutions. With China, the situation is even more problematic. As you can see, lots of parties, hardly any arbitrators from, from China, Germany, Belgium have equal numbers. If we look at the United Kingdom and Switzerland, we see they 
uh, have much more arbitrators than actual parties taking place. We need to ask ourselves, is there a sufficient number of arbitrators uh, at all to deal with CIS-related disputes? My personal answer would be a clear yes, and I would like to refer you to several initiatives which uh, aim at making arbitrators from the region more visible. So where does this discrepancy come from? Is it a kind of a lack of trust in arbitrators from the region, or is it simply a consequence of uh, foreign law being applicable? So procedural law and substantive law, so that a party considers it's more appropriate to appoint an arbitrator from, let's say, Sweden or Switzerland. So uh, that's a survey by the international uh, law firm BLP. Uh, which criteria are used when selecting an arbitrator? Let's concentrate on the top three. You need to have the expertise for the subject matter. You need to have prior experience. And uh, you, here, here is an, another survey, understanding of the sector, knowledge of law, experience in the arbitral process. Another um, survey by the Queen Mary College London. So a pool of experienced arbitrators, in my opinion, is an important factor for uh, making arbitration the preferred method of dispute resolution in, in the given jurisdiction, but also improving the attractiveness of a certain seat of arbitration. So to be taken seriously internationally as an arbitration venue, you have to have a pool of arbitrators. And let's be frank, uh, who uh, who is going to appoint a CIS arbitrator, if not a CIS party? Uh, Russian or CIS arbitrators are rather unlikely to receive uh, appointments from other parts of the world where there is no CIS connection. And we, when we talk about appointment of arbitrators, we talk about the topical issue of diversity. Um, and that has been underlined by the two most recent um, surveys um, undertaken by the Queen Mary College, University of London, where they clearly emphasize the commitment to a more diverse pool of arbitrator. And it's not only about gender, it's also about geographic origin, for instance, our CIS region. And by the way, why are in-house counsel rarely appointed as arbitrators? I mean, they do have industry knowledge, they draft contracts, and if we have law professors regularly sitting on tribunals, why not also in-house counsel? I think that appointment of a CIS co-arbitrator has an added value to a well-balanced arbitral tribunal, uh, both in cultural and legal background, maybe some particularities and knowledge of CIS uh, related arbitration, be it service of documents, enforcement issues, or arbitrability. And I often uh, uh, hear a question, how realistic is it to get an appointment if foreign law is applicable? I think it is realistic. Uh, because uh, often cases are decided on the basis of facts, some technical issues, and interpretation of contract provisions. Um, at, uh, some several years ago, in this building, at one of the previous editions of this conference, I heard a statement by, by an esteemed Russian colleague saying, I never appoint a Russian arbitrator because he or she would be isolated within the tribunal. I respectfully, I respectfully disagree. Let's discuss. I was in a situation a couple of times and I never felt isolated. And by the way, why do we tend to idolize arbitrators? I borrowed this logo, Arbitration Idol, from an initiative called a Digital Arbitration Break with their kind permission. That's a kind of an ironic reference to the singing competition on American television called American Idol. And indeed, no one idolizes judges or mediators, at least not in this part of the world, uh, not in continental Europe. There might be difference to the common law world where judges make law and are very visible. Otherwise, I personally believe that the council task can be much more difficult than the arbitrator's job and the fees are also higher, as you know. So why is there this kind of idolizing arbitrators? They're simply service providers who are under a contractual obligation to conduct proceedings fairly and expeditiously and to render an enforceable award. Is it maybe because there are less arbitration cases than arbitrator candidates? Um, if, you have, if you are a foreign practitioner and end up uh, in front of a CIS uh, arbitral institution, uh, make sure you know the particularities of those institutions and make sure uh, the arbitrators you appoint know them. 
uh, we, we talk about um, default provisions in terms of the language and so on. So to summarize, uh, the key factors for success uh, popularity of arbitration is not only about modern arbitration legislation and uh, some reliable institutions, as well as um, uh, arbitration friendly, arbitration friendly, uh, let, give me 10 more seconds, please. Arbitration friendly courts. It's also about an available pool of arbitrators and who else is supposed to appoint CIS arbitrators, if not CIS countries. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dmitry. Thank you, Sean. Well, how was that for you, everyone? I think we heard some fascinating and insightful information. We heard about the good, the bad, and even some about the ugly tips, traps, and tidbits for CIS disputes practitioners. I would now like you to take part in a vote as to which insight you found to be the most interesting practice nugget. Everyone watching on Zoom will see the questionnaire on your screen, and everyone in the room, you should have a QR code on your seat, which you can scan to take you to the vote. So let's see what the participants think of these presentations. The votes have started coming in, which is great. So we've got the results both of the virtual and the in-person audience. And I would like to congratulate Alessia Patrol for being a clear winner in by both sets of the audience. So well done, Alessia, for giving the most insightful tidbit for today. Uh, so this is it for the first session of today's conference. Please join me in thanking the speakers for their effort in preparing and giving today's presentations. It's a lot of effort and it takes a lot of time to prepare. Our magnificent seven were Jana, Nick, Natalie, Alessia, Will, Olga, and Dmitri. Happy to go into battle with all of you. Two special thanks, one for Glenn Hendricks, Glenn, the mastermind of this grand affair, thank you. And to Victoria Gurushkina, the person responsible for the organization of today and without whom today's conference would not have been possible. Thanks to the tech team for the support. Thank you to all the participants. Enjoy the rest of your day. There are still plenty of exciting and interesting sessions to come. I've been Artem Dipko. Thank you and see you all soon. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. If you're here in Moscow, in Europe, good afternoon if you're in Asia, and I guess good night if you're in the Americas. Uh, good day to you all. It's um, never late or uh, early to speak about the topic we are going to discuss today. We will speak about the impact of unilateral sanctions on international arbitration. Um, and before we start, let me introduce you the panelists. First, um, Tom Salvin, Marks and Sokolov, partner from Philadelphia, uh, Sergei Avakan. Uh, senior dispute resolution lawyer with Norton Rose Fulbright. On my left, uh, Konstantin Kroll, partner of Denton's in Moscow, and Jonathan Hines, partner uh, of uh, Morgan Lewis in Moscow. And behind us, our savior is uh, Paulus Doka. Unfortunately, he was unable to join us here today in Moscow. He is now in Vilnius. Um, yeah. We'll discuss it with us. So uh, before, uh, to start off our discussion, let me briefly uh, give you an idea of what uh, uh, the problems are, the problems we are going to discuss today. Um, 
just to, to make it easy and comprehensible, uh, we made a Christmas present for our clients. We produced a board game called uh, Kalabok, which is a Russian uh, figure from Russian fairy tales. And uh, Kalabok has to master an obstacle course here, starting with instructing a legal counsel, uh, then progressing to paying the arbitration fees, then uh, arbitration institute compliance, hiring an expert, venue, getting visas, avoiding mandatory provisions of applicable law on the sanctions, et cetera, et cetera. It's uh, a comprehensive master uh, um, obstacle course, and I will be happy to uh, challenge you in this board game during the coffee break. Let me know if you would like to have a copy of that. I'll be uh, happy to provide it to you. But indeed, uh, it, is a, it is an obstacle, uh, obstacle course for an average uh, special designated company, uh, which besides the arbitration procedure itself needs to keep in mind a lot of variables, a lot of unknowns during, uh, well, before an arbitration process, when drafting arbitration clauses, but also during the process and the enforcement. And with that in mind, we decided to, um, that would be relevant to discuss what might be good ideas to have in mind, to keep in mind when you draft arbitration clauses, uh, what to avoid, or perhaps there are any preferable things to have in your arbitration clauses as a step one uh, in our discussion. And um, I think uh, it's an open, uh, a free flow of discussion. Uh, we don't have a particular plan. We'll be happy to receive questions from the floor. Um, and whoever is uh, willing to answer, I invite uh, to do so. And John, Tom, please. I don't have to do anything. I do? No. So it's all audible, yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you, Roman. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, some have said, some have commented um, at the speaker's dinner last night how delighted they were. It's the first time they've traveled. Uh, in a long time. It's the first time I've worn a suit in a long time. Um, and I wondered whether I would remember how to tie my tie. But I did see another gentleman in the men's room struggling with his too, so I don't feel so bad. Um, anyway, some thoughts from me. I, I am essentially a, a deals lawyer based here in Moscow doing large-scale um, investments, joint ventures, M&A, etc. Um, but the sanctions have deeply affected our practice, my practice, and so I've had to become um, a sort of an involuntary expert, uh, if you will, on the subject. Um, and so this subject of today is dear to me. I'll give you some thoughts which, with, uh, just to tee up some things which others here may or may not agree with, and we'll discuss them. Um, I thought of it in this way. First, um, the subject being, OK, what to do, how to consider and draft an arbitration clause in a case um, that might run up against sanctions-related obstacles, including the, the new Russian, let's say, anti-foreign anti arbitration law that we'll be talking about. So the first, as I looked at it, the first point was, well, um, if one of the parties um, to the contract is already an SDN, well, that's pretty easy. Um, uh, if, both are, if both are Russian, um, it's pretty easy. Um, then you'd presumably provide for Russian dispute resolution because there would be grave problems even before you get to dispute resolution and doing anything, um, uh, great problems with that contract in general. So you'd presumably have dispute resolution in Russia and thereby protect against all of the obstacles as, um, as shown on the board game, I'm sure that could ensue in a foreign jurisdiction. Um, if, um, if there is a deal with a, with a foreign um, party um, and one party is in SDN, well, again, that's, that's a problem before you, you get to um, arbitration, um, all sorts of issues um, under the sanctions uh, laws. And so um, that's, that's an issue in itself. But now if either, uh, if, and I guess the most common case here what we'd be addressing, if neither party is an SDN or blacklisted, of course, US uh, versus the EU. Um, and of course, we have to remember that far fewer, let's call them real businessmen or real companies are, are blacklisted, uh, almost none 
by the EU or England uh, compared to the US long list of SDN, real companies and real businessmen. Um, one, in that case, one could start think about, thinking about constructing a special um, sort of super sophisticated sort of clause. And, and just to throw out um, the issues, one could do that anticipating uh, problems that could occur that will be illustrated by the discussion of the, the Russian cases here. Um, one could choose arbitration in Russia, um, uh, or uh, that is commercial arbitration in Russia, or even resolution in Russian courts, but most foreigners won't want that, of course. Um, and um, there is an issue, maybe Roman will, or others will talk about it, does this anti-foreign arbitration law actually allow uh, Russian commercial arbitration as opposed to mandatory hearing in Russian uh, commercial court, state court, I think so. Um, but you can, you, you can, um, you can, we can talk more about it. There could be a so-called waterfall uh, clause in a contract. Um, these were po these became popular some years ago when, um, even not even considering the Russian, the new Russian law, um, when the Russian arbitration um, reform occurred, let's say five six years ago. Um, and only certain types of disputes, uh, shareholder disputes involving a Russian company and some others could only be heard in uh, accredited institutional arbitration in Russia. And so uh, lawyers started constructing very intricate waterfall clauses that here's our chosen arbitration uh, forum, but if it's not accredited by the time we have a dispute, then it goes to forum B. And if that's not uh, accredited, then forum C, et cetera. These are very, very intricate and there are even problems in trying to um, understand and enforce them. They can be easily uh, attacked because they're so intricate. Um, or one could think about um, uh, appointing ad hoc arbitration abroad on the theory that perhaps there are fewer obstacles of the sort that Roman has mentioned and, 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 and will mention. Um, and let's remember, by the way, this law, this so-called Lugovoy law, uh, apparently has retroactive effect on contracts that already exist before the law existed and perhaps contracts that existed even before there were sanctions um, abroad. Um, and the last thing I would say is that in reality, um, of course, parties to some of the types of contracts that have been subject to uh, the case precedent so far in Russia under the Lugovoy law, they, they'd better um, think about possible more sophisticated clauses, um, contracts providing for regular trade, um, regular licensing, things of this sort that could lead to disputes at any point. Um, but we're not seeing uh, action in this direction that is constructing super sophisticated clauses, even today after the law is in effect in the sort of big ticket investment joint venture M&A deals that we do. Um, even involving um, Russian companies that are uh, sectoral sanctioned, not SDNs, but sectoral sanctioned. One could imagine that, um, uh, that the foreign party entering into a contract with an SSI, so-called SSI, US sanctioned, sectoral sanctioned entity could have particular concern that that SSI company could become an SDN, uh, et cetera. Um, or the dispute could arise in relation to the activities that are actually um, uh, sanctioned under the sectoral sanction against that company. But we're not seeing it. We're still seeing that parties to contracts like that, the big ticket ones, are still choosing London LCIA, um, sort of da a damn the torpedoes approach, maybe you could say. London LCIA, something ICC, um, if not English law, then Singapore law, uh, or um, even English law in Singapore, we're seeing SIAC uh, um, uh, arbitration clauses on the theory that, uh, well, Singapore doesn't really have its own or enforce sanctions like, certainly like the US does or even the EU or the UK. Um, and in fact, we were seeing a tendency as I'm sure we've all seen many of us toward Singapore arbitration rather than London. I would call it for psychological slash political reasons, not even thinking about this new law, just because, well, the English uh, don't like us, they have sanctions against us, 
and so we won't bring our arbitrations there, even if we won't have any technical problems in the arbitration. Some of the Russian state companies that were became SSI, uh, sectoral sanction, uh, took that position. So I think maybe that's, that's all the points I will throw out. I haven't given any, any magical uh, solutions, but at least maybe have raised uh, some of the points for further discussion. Thanks. Thanks, John. You mentioned the institutional problems with the arbitral institutes, such as compliance, such as payment of arbitration fees, appointing of um, sometimes appointing of a chair person to um, uh, the tribunal. And these are, of course, compliance issues. And these require perhaps licensing and um, uh, how it's done. What do we need to know about that, Tom? In general, what a practitioner or a participant needs to look at is the touch, if any, to the US. Because the sanctions programs, while they are, quote, sanctioning a Russian entity or a Russian sector, their teeth, the enforcement teeth, are only towards US persons, citizens, companies in the US, or people that have a presence in the US. So. If you're outside of the US world, you're not transacting in dollars, so your money's not gonna go through the Southern District of New York, you have a much higher comfort zone in terms of being able to avoid potential issues. Complications arise though um, in multi-party transactions, oftentimes if there's insurance involved and you've got oftentimes multiple arbitration clauses. So those companies often want to be in a familiar form, London, uh, Singapore, um, and they may have dollar contracts involved. And this happens a lot in shipping and maritime contracts and you get disputes, you lose a ship, there's dozens and dozens of parties all involved and all have competing issues. And if one of those parties who had a contract for something and he was involved in sectoral sanctions, it comes into play. How do you get paid? How do you pay the arbitrators. And in US has broad sanction laws against Russia, Venezuela, Iran, Cuba, and they all have somewhat different variations. The Russian sanctions have certain general licenses for litigation, but not for arbitration. So you'd go through a process to ask the US government, can we be paid from this? And they have certain things that they require, disclosures, but that also can expand to the arbitrators because if funds are coming from improper sources or sources that need to be approved and they're being paid the arbitration panel or tribunal, they may need a license for that as well. And even further down the road to render certain decisions and for enforcement of those decisions. So you, you want to plan very far in advance and but your initial analysis is what I started to say is, what touch to the US will I possibly have? And if you think you're gonna live in a world where I've got an Indonesian transaction with a French company and we're dealing in euros, we're not gonna be dealing with Americans, you're in pretty good shape and your arbitration clause can be narrow and, and perhaps very clean on that fact. If you think you might have multiple parties, you got somebody from New York, you got somebody from wherever, Cuba, Iran, it gets complicated quickly. Thank you, Tom. Um, in your view, Constantine, any anything to avoid in your arbitration agreement, seat law rules, anything? Uh, thank you, Roman. Um, uh, yeah, a few few reflections. But if I may, I will start the first few reflections on uh, John's uh, uh, excellent uh, uh, presentation. Well, when it was said that well, if a part is an SDN, then it's uh, sort of it manifests itself. It's all clear. Uh, in my view, it's not 100% all clear because there is no just one source of uh, sanctions. And uh, from arbitrators' perspective, uh, let's say you're approached by a party saying, we want to appoint you. So it would be so easy just to go to uh, a website of uh, US government or, or OFAC and just check if it's on that list. So if it's not, then fine, I can act. It's not as simple. Uh, because uh, an SDN is not just those who are listed there, it's also those who are controlled by SDNs. And control is 
generally it's 50% plus. So you need to conduct a thorough due diligence. And uh, to, to many, it's a problem in, in itself because with complex cor uh, corporate structures, it can get really, really difficult. So it's sort of one, one reflection. Uh, uh, the other, uh, uh, also John importantly mentioned that uh, uh, if you uh, go to arbitrate in uh, Singapore or Hong Kong or maybe other jurisdictions which have not adopted any of Russia related sanctions, that might be uh, a solution. And generally I would tend to agree with that and we can see a lot of uh, Russian clients in particular state owned uh, who opt uh, for these alternative arbitration forums uh, and they started to create competition uh, to London, uh, which was probably a forum as of, of choice by default almost uh, by most parties. But uh, uh, in itself, it's not always a solution because if you need uh, to uh, appoint uh, a council uh, and it's say it's a US council uh, uh, for arbitration in Hong Kong and Singapore, uh, that will still be a problem uh, for a US council to act for uh, an SDN unless there is a license granted. And problem with the license is that, yes, you may apply for it, but uh, uh, it's not guaranteed that it will be granted. And the timeline for getting a license is not guaranteed either. It can be uh, from a few months to, to a year, could be more. Uh, and that in itself, again, is, is a problem. And we're going to talk a, a little bit later whether such delays uh, could be construed as obstacle in getting access to justice. And that is an important, uh, an important point. In, in terms of uh, Roman, your question, how, how to draft uh, an arbitration clause, and uh, uh, John mentioned uh, uh, a waterfall or cascade clauses. So we, uh, we sometimes see them. And as John said, the problem is that they tend to be so complicated and the more the complexity, the easier it is for a party to try and challenge it. Uh, in, in a court uh, and or for a party and to try and get out of, uh, of those arbitration clauses and whether they're watertight is not 100% uh, uh, guaranteed. So we do use them, we see them, we draft them, but uh, uh, whether I would personally recommend them is uh, really depends uh, on the circumstances of a particular client, who are the parties, what their situation is. So my personal preference, uh, sort of number one, is to arbitrate uh, in the Russian arbitral institution, uh, because I'm, I think that we, we need to, uh, to develop Russian uh, sort of arbitration system. But of course, that is not the choice of the majority of the parties. So yeah, I'm in the minority here. Uh, so probably the, the second choice uh, is, um, in my view, Hong Kong and Singapore. First, because these jurisdictions have not imposed any Russia-related sanctions. Secondly, and importantly, both Hong Kong International Arbitration Center and most recently, Singapore International Arbitration Center have been accredited with the Russian Minister of Justice as permanent arbitral institutions, which enables them to administer uh, 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 disputes on the territory of the Russian Federation, including corporate disputes. Uh, and procurement disputes. So that, that is uh, an, uh, important. So uh, in my view, that is uh, the best uh, way. Uh, just to some quick points. Um, first about the waterfall clauses. I agree entirely. I mean, think about it. When they were first being used five or six years ago and the issue was you go from uh, alternative forum A to forum B, um, uh, if um, forum A is not accredited by the Ministry of Justice as an institutional uh, forum to hear such uh, cases. That's easy. Either they are or they're not. It's black or white. But in this case, think about it. The question is going to be, um, is the proceeding not possible um, in forum A because of obstacles that are raised, because the attorneys can't be hired, the experts can't be hired, the money can't be transferred? Is it really impossible? When does it become impossible? You can see that it gets uh, quite gray. And uh, second, um, uh, I, I'd be delighted uh, as a member of the presidium of the MCAS uh, uh, ICAC to see more arbitrations in Russia. But there are other choices, of course. Thank you, John. Thank you, Constantine. Well, the, uh, the, the mechanics of drafting a waterfall clause is quite the opposite to a normal arbitration clause because Actually, the institute number three in a clause 
eventually becomes the institute number one, uh, which is two other previous institutions will fall out. Um, and not everyone understands that. And when you see uh, institute number one, say they would put ICC, then LCIA, and now institute number three, which the parties at the time of drafting uh, an agreement think that is an unlikely option. Eventually it becomes, becomes option number one. So that's a re reverse thinking what you need to keep in mind. Um, and in terms of uh, preparations, uh, a lot has been said about hiring um, uh, stenographers, um, interpreters, hearing venues, etc. And those are always last minute hires. But those ones, which seem to be um, uh, rather irrelevant and not very important in the proceedings, uh, actually take a lot of time. And when you have hearings approaching you in a, in a matter of weeks or a month, and you, you need to instruct all those support staff uh, functions, and it becomes impossible to have a hearing simply. So things to keep in mind. And it also comes to my mind that last time I was in Spain and tried to hire, uh, book a car, I had to fill out a form and the form, the first three questions, of course, were my name, my address, date of birth, passport, et cetera. But question number four or five was, are you a, a PAP, a politically exposed person? The question number six was, are you an SDN person? <laughs> so uh, yes, it, it really penetrates all um, um, uh, aspects of our life. Um, with that, I think uh, we could also touch upon a little bit of the counter sanctions mechanisms and what actually states do to counter sanctions against the entities. And here I'd like to pass the mic to Constantine. Uh, uh, thank, thank you, Roman. Uh, yes, already uh, this morning, you must have heard a number of times uh, the name Lugavoy Law. Uh, in fact, I don't, I don't like that name uh, because that uh, uh, puts a particular onus on Mr. Lugovoy, who is one of the authors, he is a member of Russian parliament, one of the authors of the law, but not the, the only one. And also because of the connotation Mr. Lugovoy's name has in, in England, uh, because of alleged connection to uh, sort of a, a famous uh, a case of uh, Mr. Litvinenko's poisoning. Uh, so uh, I, would, I would call the law in question amendments to the Russian arbitrage procedure code. Arbitrage stands for Russian state commercial courts, not arbitration courts in, in the understanding of international uh, arbitration. So this law was adopted and came into force in the summer of last year. It was fast tracked uh, uh, in the Russian parliament and the second and third reading uh, took just 12 days, which is almost unprecedented. The first uh, reading of that law passed in 2019 and no one really paid much attention to, uh, to it, quite frankly, because it is common for these laws never to proceed. So effectively then uh, the law came into force. It uh, introduced two new articles uh, to the Russian arbitrage procedure code, article uh, uh, 248.1 and 248.2. So effectively what these novels are, they uh, grant Russian state courts exclusive jurisdiction over disputes involving sanctioned entities. And sanctioned, presumably sanctions must relate to Russia, but uh, as we already established, Sanctioned entities are not exclusively Russian entities. Those, these can be non-Russian entities, maybe um, the subsidiaries of Russian SDNs, etc. Et so um, uh, when do Russian courts get this exclusive jurisdiction? It's not at automatic. It only kicks in if and when a party's access to justice is limited because of restrictive measures or sanctions imposed by foreign states. And if a, part, if a party can prove that such uh, uh, restrictive measures are in place and their access to justice is limited, then Russian courts have exclusive jurisdiction and they are empowered uh, to get involved whenever uh, there is an arbitration clause uh, uh, entered into between the parties or prorogation uh, agreement to litigate in a foreign court. So Russian courts may interfere and uh, restrict the party from the ability to proceed with arbitration or litigation outside Russia and, uh, and force them to, uh, to have a dispute uh, heard by a Russian court. Um, importantly, if uh, a party fails to respect uh, that direction decision by Russian court, and now Russian courts have power to grant an anti-suit injunction. So this is totally unprecedented for 
the system of Russian law. It goes contrary to the doctrine of Russian law as we were taught at Russian universities because uh, Russia here is not unique as a civil law jurisdiction. It uh, generally bases its doctrine on the principle, the old sort of Latin principle of uh, parum, parum non habit imperium, which means that uh, one sovereign cannot have sort of uh, rule direction over, over another sovereign, uh, one way to translate it. But here, the necessity took over uh, the doctrine. And so now Russian courts are able to grant anti suit injunctions. Uh, and if uh, a party fails to respect that anti suit injunction, then uh, a Russian court has uh, further power to impose uh, a penalty. And that penalty can be uh, up to the entire amount in dispute plus uh, related costs and expenses. And interestingly, uh, that huge, potentially huge amount is payable not to the Russian state, but uh, to the sanctioned party, uh, which, which suffered the, the losses. Of course, you may, you may ask me uh, whether these anti-suit injunctions or penalties are going to be enforceable outside Russia. And uh, the uh, general answer is no, that in most um, uh, international jurisdictions, uh, these are not going to be uh, enforced. And uh, uh, we, we have looked at it closely from the perspective of uh, courts in the US, uh, in the UK, in the EU, uh, in, in Asia, and uh, in most jurisdictions that we know, uh, the courts are going to take a pro-arbitration view and respect the choice of the parties expressed in the arbitration clause. However, uh, however, there, there are still risks. Uh, first, if uh, a party has assets in Russia, uh, uh, then a uh, decision of Russian courts uh, can be enforced against these assets. Uh, uh, secondly, Russia has um, uh, certain bilateral treaties on um, uh, assistance in uh, civil cases or enforcement of court judges. That these are not many. Uh, and, and of course, there, there are uh, some with jurisdictions like uh, Mongolia, for example, but there are some in the EU as well, for example, with uh, Spain. Uh, which is not widely known. Uh, so if a party has assets in the jurisdictions which have uh, uh, treaties with Russia on, on legal support, then in theory, uh, decisions of Russian courts may be uh, enforced there. And um, there are some, uh, even though this is a recent uh, legal act, uh, it's only uh, just over one year old, there is already a developing legal uh, practice in this area, some uh, very interesting cases, sometimes uh, contradictory, uh, and uh, uh, my colleague here is going to, to talk in more detail about this. Thank you, Konstantin. Uh, yes. Um, about the application of the law. Um, first is, is it pretty clear that the, um, that the underlying problem has to be that an entity is an SDN and therefore has obstacles in paying the tribunal or hiring lawyers, et cetera, et cetera, and that a, a, a sectoral sanctioned company, either the US SSI or the EU equivalent, the English equivalent, that shouldn't be, the fact that there being an SSI shouldn't be a basis because the things that are that are prohibited vis-a-vis -vis such a company are don't seem to be relevant to the actions of trying to uh, get into an arbitration. And the second is, is it clear that this law is aimed only at, if I can say, put it that way, foreign arbitration, that if you provide for uh, Russian commercial arbitration, that's okay. The law will not touch it. Uh, uh, thank you, John, for, for these questions. Well, uh, first, the, the law is uh, defined in a very broad way, so it's open to construction. Uh, and the uh, uh, Russian law does not discuss the difference between sectoral sanctions and blocking sanctions. Uh, uh, so all it says is that if access to justice uh, is limited, then these are the consequences. But then, of course, you are right that in practice, uh, an entity or person under sectoral sanctions uh, would may find it difficult to prove that their access to justice is actually limited. Uh, because, in fact, as, as we know, these limitations would, should not prevent them uh, from arbitrating or litigating abroad, but it's, it's a matter of proving it in, in a court. 
Um, on your second question, uh, you, you are right. That uh, it is not clear whether uh, it, it should capture uh, Russian ar arbitration uh, as well as foreign arbitration. But uh, in my view, first of all, the purpose of the law was not to limit Russian arbitration. Uh, secondly, I cannot see how, uh, let's say, an SDN uh, uh, would, would have any problem arbitrating in Russia. So all the problems that Roman mentioned earlier, uh, paying the tribunal, carrying legal counsel, would be either would not exist in Russia at all or would, would be very light. So therefore, I think that Russia is a, is a safe, uh, safe, safe bet. To me, there is another, another actually problem that we haven't mentioned is that what law Russian court would apply if it assumes jurisdiction. Let's say governing law of the contract is uh, in English law and it's LCA, Russian state court said, no, I assume jurisdiction because uh, uh, parties access to justice is limited. In theory, Russian court can apply English law by relying on uh, experts witness, but whether it's going to do so in practice, I don't know. And uh, I, I have a strong worry that a Russian court may actually uh, uh, try and apply Russian law in such instance. Konstantin, uh, uh, just a big question. Uh, what do you think happens with arbitration clause if uh, national court assumes under this blocking statute uh, jurisdiction? Uh, does it automatically become null and void? Uh, well, uh, from a Russian law perspective, it falls away. It just it no longer exists. However, from the perspective of the uh, uh, applicable law, ap law applicable to the contract and law applicable uh, to the arbitration clause, which, which might be the, the law of the seat of arbitration. Of course, it continues. And uh, then there is a question of enforceability of such arbitral award. And uh, uh, by virtue of New York Convention of 1958, it, in, it should be and would be enforceable in most juris jurisdictions, except Russia, of course because in Russia, it would be contrary to public policy. Thank you. And uh, the way I read the law is not, it's not only about the sanctions, unilateral uh, sectoral law. It's about uh, res unilateral restrictive measures. And then you can, that they, they could virtually encompass everything, including tariffs, including cost, additional customs duties, etc. So, the law could be interpreted interpreted much wider, so there is a uh, room for, for for interpretation there. Clearly, thank you, Paulus. Uh, Paulus, before we come to you, we would like to hear some updates on the Russian case law, um, or on the Lugavoy law, and um, after that, we'll be happy to hear what's going on in Europe uh, with respect to counter sanction legislation as well. So um, um, bear with us for a few minutes, and we'll be back to you. Uh, now I'll pass it to you, Sergey. So what what are the updates? Yeah, no, thanks, Ruan. Uh, before I pass to a uh, description of the recent case law, I would just like to give a general reflection to what have been said by the co-panelists. And I think I would refer to your very bright uh, quotation from your recent uh, publication, which says that we are about or already have reached the stage when we are coming to a dark age of law caused by the sanctions. So I fully agree with it, and I think that it's high time for uh, the clients and for the uh, advisors to think of more sophisticated approaches, uh, for example, in drafting uh, the clauses. Uh, however, depending on the environment and on the places where uh, the awards are planned to be enforced, uh, it, it should be balanced always. Uh, and I think we'll touch it in, in, in the end part of our discussion as well. So. Uh, talking about the uh, application of uh, so-called Lugavoy law, um, uh, we need to mention that although uh, the provisions of this law at first ap appeared uh, to be attractive to Russian parties uh, for them to use it uh, in a, in, on a general basis, uh, the reality is so that there is a very limited amount of cases as of now where the parties have uh, applied to this type of uh, law. So uh, I think four to five brief examples of uh, main, which I would call main uh, 
case law, case law um, experiences of application law should be given. So uh, I think we'll go through uh, historical, semi historical and semi priority uh, order. So the first one, which uh, case which needs to be commanded is uh, interstar in star logistics versus uh, Neighbor, neighbor uh, Drilling Limited. Uh, it, the, the interesting part about this case is that although it has been initiated uh, by the Russian uh, claimant in the Russian court before uh, the Lugovo law ha has been enacted, uh, it was then retrospectively uh, linked to uh, Lugovo law by the Cassation uh, instance and by, by the Supreme Court. So what, what is the substance of this case? Uh, the Russian party claiming for uh, reimbursement of, uh, of payments for uh, works and uh, supplied goods applied to a Russian court with a rather exotic, uh, uh, exotically uh, structured claim. It was uh, aimed at judicial amending the arbitration agreement due to the sanctions imposed against this Russian claimant. So uh, this is not something that is uh, often seen in Russian court practice. So even if uh, even the, 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 the Lugovo law was not yet enacted by that time, the court fully uh, uh, satisfied these claims. Uh, and the reasoning for that was that the sanctions uh, and uh, the claimant was a SDN, uh, OFAC SDN uh, entity they uh, preclude uh, the client, uh, the claimant from uh, access to justice, and there is no other way than uh, resolving this dispute in Russia. Uh, coincidentally, or uh, surprisingly, this was the very logic of the Lugovo law that was uh, enacted a half a year ago, uh, after that decision. Uh, but the interesting part is that uh, this type of approach, which has been taken by the court, was nevertheless uh, considered by the Cassation Court and by the Supreme Court as being in line with the, with the content of Lugaboy law, which is not actually what is written in this law. However, uh, here we need to mention that uh, this approach on um, amending the, uh, the, the arbitration agreement was something that was initially uh, drafted in the Lugaboy law bill uh, and uh, Luckily, we don't have this in the law now. Uh, the second case, uh, I think it's quite famous and uh, well discussed in, by practitioners. It's uh, Tsargrad versus uh, Tsargrad Media versus Google. Uh, while uh, it can be a long discussion on the substance of this case and the reasoning, and it's very uh, politicized, but what we uh, need to comment uh, regarding uh, the Lugavoy law here is that a mere fact of inability to hire foreign foreign lawyers, uh, namely the lawyers from uh, the U.S. Uh, jurisdiction and U.K., was enough for uh, the court to uh, decide that the 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 claim on uh, on 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 revocation uh, of, of 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 blocking the YouTube account of Targaryen TV. Uh, it was enough uh, for this case to be considered in Russia. Uh, the only evidence, at least what we see from the from the court uh, acts uh, presented by Tigrat, was that uh, it is actually the, the 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 only letter from the UK law firm stating that they cannot take this client. That was enough. Uh, so I think uh, we have uh, here in audience present to people who know much more about this case, but uh, the, the reaction uh, to this approach of by Russian courts was, it was really, it was tremendous. So I think that was the exact point when uh, the foreign parties started to, to understand that it's better to get familiar with the new law. Uh, and it was it became easier for us as advisors to uh, to tell the clients that it is high time to to, to think of the consequences. Uh, again, coincidentally or uh, intentionally, uh, straight uh, in parallel with this case, there was another case which uh, is now still being discussed. It's Ural Wagonzavod or Ural Transmash uh, versus uh, Polish company PESA. Uh, we see that uh, the approach taken in this in the in this case was 
really contrasting what has happened in uh, in Zagrat versus uh, Google case. Uh, and when the case came to the cassation instance, uh, uh, the cassation instance uh, produced, uh, I think everyone will agree now that it's one of the most detailed description and interpretation of uh, the ways how uh, the Luga Boy law should be applied now. So uh, at all instances, uh, the claim for uh, application for anti-suit injunction uh, by uh, uh, Ural Vagon Zavod and Ural Transmash, uh, it was rejected uh, on the basis that the party, uh, the applicant has not uh, provided enough evidence uh, on the fact that uh, it, it is deprived from the access to justice. Well, uh, at a certain point, uh, foreign practitioners and Russian uh, legal society started to tell that this should be a kind of a panacea. This could should be uh, the point where we should breathe out and think that we now understand how the law should be applied. Uh, but unfortunately, or fortunately, we still don't know. Uh, the very recent news uh, of yesterday evening are that uh, even that even though the, the, the case has reached uh, Supreme Court cassation and uh, the Supreme Court rejected for it to be considered in the cassation. Yesterday, the uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court has exercised this very rarely used or even never used before uh, power to disagree with the judge of the Supreme Court and passed the cassation, uh, the, the cassation claim uh, of, of uh, PESA to, uh, of Ural Vagon Zavod and Ministry of Industry and Trade to, to, to be considered at the Supreme Court. So we'll now be facing the really interesting development uh, of this case. And I think uh, this should bring more clarity to us. Uh, the last case, which I wanted to mention, it's the case of this year. It's Silavi Machine uh, versus Vastok uh, uh, Energo, Ukrainian company. Uh, this case relates to the claim um, for reimbursement of uh, money. And the arguments of the claimant are that this case should be considered in uh, a Russian arbitrage court. So uh, the Russian court upheld this approach, uh, reasoning it by the fact that the supply contract between two parties uh, provides either for uh, arbitration in Ukraine or SEC. And since SEC has rejected to receive the arbitral, uh, arbitration fees and other payments, the only other option remains the Ukrainian arbitration, and it is not an option because uh, the, 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 the award will uh, hardly be enforced uh, in, the, in the Ukraine. So uh, the, the claims were satisfied in full. Uh, we are now pending the, uh, the appellate uh, instance, and we'll see what, what happens next. Uh, the general closing remark on the case law from my side will be that my personal understanding of the law is that this is type of law that is not made to be uh, really precisely and uh, interpreted and interpreted in detail by, by the courts and even by the high courts. That is the, the very reason why it provides so much discretion to the, to, to the judges. And what we can see in, in the future, I think that will be uh, the uh, pointed uh, clarifications by uh, some ad hoc court practice, but uh, this is not the law that should be limited by the courts to be applied. So since it's semi-political, semi-legal question. Thank you, Sergey. Uh, it seems that the law actually reflects, the broad language of the law reflects the general idea that all the sanctions regulations are also structured in a very broad manner, inviting interpretation by on, on the part of the courts and executives. And I think uh, the idea behind the law was also to give it to give a broad discretion to um, an average judge to decide whether this case falls within the law or not. Um, Roman, uh, yes, please. Quick, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I'm just sure. a quick a point sparked by what Sergei said. You, one of the, the first case, of course, involved the notion of, of a forced amendment of the arbitration clause because of a sanctions related problem. It reminds me that um, before you get to such a stage, the parties to a pre-existing contract, given the sanctions related um, possible minefield ahead in case of a dispute, might consider voluntarily um, amending their arbitration clause in the contract. But of course, that 
parties are very hesitant to do because it opens a so-called Pandora's box. If one party says, well, let's amend the arbitration clause, the other party will say, very nice, and I have a list of four or five other things I'd love to amend in this contract. So that's usually going to be a dead end uh, proposal, but we'll see if it ever happens in any cases. Yes, uh, I, I think we'll have time a little bit uh, for, for a few questions, but over to uh, Paulus to um, update us on what's going on in the EU in terms of counter sanction legislation. Paulus, over to you. Uh, thank you, Roman. Um, my, my first uh, short reaction on waterfall clauses um, uh, from the last week discussion with the compliance colleagues who raised the uh, interesting uh, thought that uh, going down uh, uh, through all this state of art water clauses. Uh, waterfall uh, arbitration clauses um, uh, should not be uh, should it be or should not be treated as a convention of sanctions. So it looks like that uh, uh, waterfall uh, clauses uh, the best option might be uh, that when waterfall arbitration clause is asymmetric. Uh, that means when uh, as the end uh, as the end person uh, is making a choice of arbitration institution, just not to not to trigger not to trigger additional uh, additional problems for 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 the other parties. Now, uh, jumping back uh, to EU regulation, um, uh, I would like just to, to draw attention to, uh, to several issues. The first issue is uh, a public policy issue. Um, so we have uh, lots of variation if sanctions, breach of sanctions are a public, uh, public policy issue. And uh, we have uh, completely different, uh, different approaches by the same courts. Uh, and for example, we have uh, uh, decision by by swiss uh, uh, federal court uh, as of uh, february this year uh, which is, uh, and it is stated that u.s sanctions are not part of public policy of european union uh, it doesn't depend uh, whether it under blocking statute of european union or not because uh, uh, EU blocking statute is uh, well uh, it's linked back it, it does not it does not work uh, properly in uh, uh, and and there are reasons for that so we have such a, uh, uh, there's no unified approach and probably is not surprising. Uh, we have variations when even the uh, UN sanctions are not, uh, are not uh, considered as a part of uh, public policy or a reason not to, uh, not to perform the contract. And there's a famous uh, Fincantieri Otto Nalara case uh, when ICC tribunal and Swiss, uh, and Swiss court uh, consider it uh, even UN sanctions are not uh, being a part of a public public policy or the reason not to perform the contract, despite the Genoa court, uh, which had the opposite opinion. So uh, it, I, when uh, I, I understand that the, the main uh, uh, discussion topics are choice of seat and choice of arbitration institution, it's very important. Uh, but also, um, I urge you always just to look uh, uh, into the final uh, final stage of call of game. Uh, when when you when you come to enforcement and, and check uh, and check if the arbitration award shall be enforced and how the sanctions uh, sanctions will interplay, and one also interesting uh, one also interesting thing uh, which I would like to to to, uh, to draw attention to is um, when uh, when arbitrators have to decide on uh, substantial matters related to sanctions. Uh, then the question uh, then the question came in that uh, it's an interpretation of applicable sanctions in play and uh, then arbitrator step uh, on the ground of public uh, public law domain and in certain european jurisdictions uh, arbitrators are not allowed uh, to decide on public law issues and such disputes uh, if they consider public law domain uh, my lose so-called arbitrability. So also uh, we just have to bear in mind and uh, 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 that checking each uh, jurisdiction uh, where where the award might be enforced or, or selecting the seat, it might be uh, it might be uh, might be interesting issue. And the last point uh, uh, which I uh, which I would like to raise that uh, EU law is uh, uh, has a, a little bit. Uh, uh, two side uh, 
to side issues when 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 dealing with sanction. It has a less uh, less extreme uh, regulation or less a less extreme approach when dealing with the uh, reasonable professional legal costs and compensations. And uh, probably all regulation have exemptions uh, uh, which uh, which say that. Uh, uh, as the end person, person and uh, sanctions or, or unilateral or restrictive measures, which, which I find the, 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 the more proper definition, uh, he might hire a lawyer and um, uh, and then and use his funds for 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 professional uh, fees for lawyers. Well, it does not say directly; it does not point directly to uh, to arbitration. Uh, neither it does it point to the court. So uh, I should. Uh, um, Work, I would uh, suggest work on the assumption that uh, it, it deals with both uh, uh, courts and, and arbitration. And on the other hand, <clears throat> if we look, for example, into famous uh, 2014 uh, council decision uh, uh, 512, uh, which says that uh, if uh, that no claim in connection in connection with the contract or transaction, which is uh, falls uh, somehow under uh, council de decision regulation on, on sanctions and it's a, it's a very broad comp uh, it's a very broad uh, uh, let's say scope and uh, and definition shall not be satisfied so that means that uh, technically speaking uh, if we deal with uh, for example this uh, 512 uh, council regulation so there are such a concept of uh, non-satisfaction, and that means probably that uh, such a dispute might not even be litigated or arbitrated. So probably that's all from 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 my side. Thank, thank you very quick, much. Uh, quick yes, point on John, on please. EU building, which is, um, Mike, and harking back to um, a point that Konstantin was making at the beginning about the fifty percent rule. If U.S. sanctions are touched in the in the matter then yes, you've got to check to make sure that it's not 50% or more owned. A little known point, it's one of the few points where the, Euro, the EU sanctions are stricter or potentially stricter than the US. That is, the test is not 50% or more if you're talking about <coughs> some of the relatively few, let's say, real businessmen, real companies that are sanctioned, um, Russian companies, people that are sanctioned by the EU. But if it's one of those people or companies, the test is not 50% or more, it's control, which could be 50% or more, or it could be control deemed by other means, management, influence, contract, shareholders agreement, etc. So one has to be careful, albeit thankfully there are relatively few um, such people and companies um, sanctioned by the EU in, in the blacklisting category. Thank you. It's such a complex topic. It certainly gives a lot of thoughts and a lot of work uh, for many uh, but I, I'm, I'm afraid we are running out of time and perhaps we could have a few take a few questions from from the audience if they are um, if there are not then uh, perhaps final reflections um, Tom you want to start certainly uh, I think the the, the broadness of, of, of the topic uh, we could go on for hours um, but I think there is a general shift for companies that can and should be bringing their arbitration matters and focus on Russia as a, as a forum. I think there will be a, a general reluctance for a lot of Western companies to go in that forum for comfort reasons for a while, but I think they will evolve with that. Um, in the meantime, though, I think there's a, a lot of practical approaches that can be undertaken as based on some of the comments of the panel, that can really protect uh, a client in this environment in trying to get through a dispute resolution process without running afoul of European and or US sanctioned regimes. So I think there's a lot of very good points that have come up so far. Quick question to Tom, have your, do I glean from what you said in the beginning that your firm has experience applying for a license to act or to be paid as um, counsel for a, a sanction? Entity and if so, how long did it take to get the license or to be turned down from the license? Yes, we we've done a number of those, and there's no hard and fast rules that were mentioned about how long that can take. In speaking to people at Treasury Department, it depends on how political what you want to get involved is. I mean, some of our cases, it was just a matter of 
Uh, it, was a, it was a divorce of an American. Her husband was an SDN and they had mutual assets in European countries. And how do you split those up? Because all sorts of complicated processes. We, we got the license, I think, within a few weeks, which was surprising. And we reported and we did what we did. Um, and we got approved to be paid out of uh, what were frozen funds as well. Um, if you're dealing with a bigger political issue where you've got a major SDN who's on a political radar, or very close to you know uh, President Putin's inner circle, then you you may sit there for a year. I have not been involved in that directly, but I just kind of gotten the indication that if the U.S. government wants something to move slowly. It'll just sit on somebody's desk. Were you ever turned down in a license application in such a case? I, I have not. Uh, and in fact, we were involved in one case where we were arguing that the arbitration panel wasn't properly licensed and they didn't have that. Uh, it was the Forbes case. Uh, we came in late on that. We were trying to slow that down. And the court said, no, the, the license is broad enough, covers the arbitrators, covers the attorneys. Move on. Thanks. Sergey. I think uh, instead of uh, giving general uh, final remarks, I would just uh, provide some practical tips that are used in our firm's practice and have been used. So uh, in order to uh, mitigate the impact of sanctions, uh, let's say the, the option A, and then I think it will be an old school model or approach would be uh, to consider indemnification, uh, some contractual indemnities, but uh, in fact, it does not cure the problem. It just compensates for uh, what we have. The second one is uh, providing for more sophisticated clauses, uh, including waterfall clauses, uh, clauses that exclude the triggers that may lead to uh, sanction application or the risk of their application. And here, the very quick remark would be that uh, if we are considering waterfall clauses uh, in conjunction with a Lugovoy law, we need to be very uh, cautious about the, uh, the really triggering condition that will lead to application of uh, this uh, waterfall switch. Uh, because uh, in the end of the day, the, the, the real event happens when, when, when the court applies its discretion. There is not much we can predict uh, regarding the triggering event. I think that thank you, thank you. So, do you think ad hoc would be a valid option here uh, to avoid all the institutional hurdles? I think uh, it can be an option subject to all of the, let's say, downsides of ad hoc arbitration in Russian jurisdiction and potential enforcement of such a word. That will be the general downside. I see, I see. Thank you. Over to you, Paulis. Final remarks, observations. Very short, uh, if possible. Yeah, um, your, your last question uh, was uh, uh, what I was going to say that I think that ad hoc arbitration, uh, it, uh, we, we should expect raise of ad hoc arbitrations. The only thing that uh, kind of guidance or assistance uh, for, for, for the parties on appointing authority um, should be resolved. And, um, and if appointing authority uh, is, uh, uh, there is a, let's say such issues resolved and that does not take too much time and we do not bump uh, into national courts with the, the same problems with new institutional arbitration so what hoc arbitrations might be a, uh, a future solution because the trade shall shall go on and arbitration shall continue the only thing is how to how to how to deal with, uh, with those blocking uh, uh, blocking statutes and and sanction uh, sanction statutes and so on Thank you, thank you, Paulus. Uh, Constantine, over to you. Thank you, Roman. Uh, well, I'd say two things. First, uh, in my view, the parties should se seriously consider arbitrating in Russia, uh, uh, either under the auspices of one of the Russian arbitral institutions or indeed under the auspices of uh, uh, international arbitral institution accredited by the Russian Minister of Justice, uh, but having seat of arbitration in Russia. Uh, secondly, I do hope that sanctions will go away sometime, perhaps not anytime soon, but some sometime they will go away. However, uh, the Institute of Anti-Suit Injunction that is now part of Russian law is probably going to stay. And uh, I think, but for the sanctions, it just, it would never ever happen. So to, to me, it's uh, an interesting impact on, on Russian law generally. Thank you. Um, 
a last um, reaction to something um, that Sergei said and harking back to something that Constantine said. Yes, indemnities is a possible um, tool in the overall toolkit to try to deal with this. And as a related matter, you know, foreign parties with contracts and foreign arbitration clause, they may be more comfortable staying with that clause and thinking of possible disputes where their Russian counterpart has assets abroad, because as Constantine rightly said, uh, very few foreign courts or tribunals will honor um, the Russian anti-suit injunction. And so the foreign party could think, okay, that's great. We'll just, the proceeding will go on. If, I'm, if I think I'm owed money, if I win, I can enforce against the foreign assets. But of course, if the foreign party has assets in Russia, um, there will be a bloody war, a bloody mess, um, a battle of asset seizures uh, abroad and in Russia under the, under the Lugovoy law. So um, it's not a pretty picture. Uh, there's no magic solution. But here we are, uh, lawyers here and out there in the audience to help, help deal with it as best we can. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, I guess it brings us to the end of our discussion. So I welcome everyone to give a, a, a thank our co-panelists in the usual way. And uh, we break for, thank you very much. We break for a coffee and probably uh, a couple of rounds of this game. We'll see you in the hall. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure and privilege to moderate this session that whose topic is, in my view, is very important in today's time. Um, we will discuss the interaction between insolvency and arbitration. And all we know that uh, the COVID pandemic caused a lot of companies to seek where, to restructure the debts through the court proceedings. And at the same time, many creditors uh, attempted to bypass the arbitration because it's sometimes costly and long and to go straight to the insolvency court to enforce their claims. And interplay between and conflict between insolvency and arbitration is fundamental and uh, has many aspects. As we all know, arbitration is a flexible, purely private process um, governed by the uh, institutional and ad hoc arbitration rules. Whereas insolvency is a mandatory uh, court procedure governed by the national laws, and it's quite difficult to opt out of it. Uh, we discuss and uh, decide to structure our discussion around the several practical situations where in arbitration and insolvency uh, collide. Uh, from the start of insolvency proceedings, uh, bankruptcy filing, to, uh, through the actions of the insolvency representative, to avoid the transactions, uh, interim measures, and uh, recognition of a foreign judgment order, uh, insolvency orders. And um, we have uh, four uh, distinguished uh, practitioners from uh, different jurisdictions. So each of them will discuss a particular topic. Uh, each has uh, 10 minutes. And then at the end of the uh, uh, presentations, we will invite the audience uh, to share their experience on this topic and maybe give some war stories and to comment their presentation. Uh, let me start with our first speaker. It's uh, uh, Jane Fedotova. She is a BVI practitioner and she will discuss the, uh, the beginning of the insolvency process and how it can. Uh, interplay with arbitration. It's about winding up applications and our uh, claims uh, uh, for, and, and the applications to dismiss them uh, in favor of arbitration proceedings. Jay, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me, but if not, you will tell me. So uh, yeah, as Pavel said, I'll talk about the clash between the winding up and mandatory um, provisions mandatory stay provisions. So to begin with, um, the scenario that I suggest to, to think about is when um, a, there is a creditor and a debtor, and the creditor decides to start the winding up uh, petition. Of course, the debtor might think, well, stop, stop. Uh, I have arbitration clause, and I, I would like to um, go and arbitrate. I don't think that there is 
a debt and um, it's an arbitrator who should uh, decide whether there is a debt or not. Uh, you know, the debt might think there is other kind of um, relationship that should be taken into account. Maybe there is a cross claim or something else and the arbitrator should be the one who would decide those claims. How are the creditor uh, from the uh, point of view of the creditor? He may think, why do I have to go to arbitration when it is black and white that there is a debt and I should go straight to winding up procedure and wind up uh, the um, data um, and you know, not waste my money and time because um, I don't need uh, uh, to have a, a separate document arbitral award. It's very clear that uh, the debtor cannot pay its debts. And this here we have a clash and the clashes and the conflict is actually between a private um, uh, type of resolution of a dispute and actually party autonomy uh, and uh, the um, uh, collective remedy, which is a winding up petition. Uh, and of course, uh, immediately when this process starts, one may think, are we in the territory of insolvency or are we actually in the territory of arbitration? And should the court um, dismiss um, uh, or stay uh, the application and refer the parties to arbitration or should the court actually uh, exercise the discretion and wind up the company. And um, those kind of two, uh, two positions also um, determine how the court will look at this question. In one case, the court will be, uh, could apply um, a, a test of um, tribal issue, which is a bona fide um, uh, test, meaning that is there a genuine dispute on substantial grounds that there is a debt? Uh, th this is the test applied in the discretionary uh, winding up petition process. And then uh, the second one is um, a question actually whether the dispute falls within the arbitration clause. And the test would be prima facie test. So these are two different tests and actually there would be two different outcomes. Well, I mean, not different outcomes, but like the kind of the standard would be different. The tribal issue standard is actually um, a higher standard and the prima facie standard is a lower standard. So that is quite an important one. And if, for example, a data is uh, not happy with this process, uh, the data may um, challenge that the, that the wrong standard was applied. But let me go back a little bit and uh, question whether at all uh, arbitration act uh, would be relevant uh, in the winding up um, procedure. And we have a case from English court, Salford Estates, which says that actually arbitration is of no relevance in, in a sense that there's no um, kind of application of the mandatory um, stay provisions in the winding up petition. And once the winding up started, it should be an insolvency process. Uh, however, of course, in exercising the discretion, the court will take into account that there is an arbitration clause and would exercise the discretion in accordance with that um, uh, kind of with this party's agreement. Um, and one would think that uh, probably because arbitration is international, there should be a common um, view on this uh, because there should be clear boundaries of arbitration in a sense that we should be all uh, in agreement whether if we start the winding up process, uh, arbitration should be um, kind of, the, the court should refer uh, the matter to arbitration or actually consider it to be a collective uh, remedy and collective process. But actually there isn't an agreement um, in, in a sense that the courts, uh, and I've looked at a couple of jurisdictions, but for example, in Hong Kong, uh, recently um, the position was that the court would um, exercise um, a discretion. Um, sorry, actually, actually the court would apply the mandatory state provisions and uh, would refer the matter to arbitration. But recently it was considered to be, there seems to be a shift towards uh, the tribal issue test. In Singapore, uh, there is a case uh, against VTB. Um, you may be familiar with that case. Uh, and actually the shift is uh, from the tribal issue test to the prima facie test. Uh, and that of course um, is curious. And um, in the BVI, uh, the position seemed to be quite clear um, until recently. And actually I think there, are, there have been now a couple of cases which have 
kind of put a little bit of a doubt uh, what is the position in the BVI. But it seems that the position is probably maintained as it was, although with some uh, nuances and um, caveats, if you like. So in the, in the BVI, the position was that the winding up petition, uh, during the winding up petition, the court will exercise the discretion, will apply the tribal issue test, uh, will look whether there is um, a bona fide dispute, uh, and um, will consider, um, you know, the kind of uh, will in will kind of will interfere, uh, if you like, in in the in in and look at the dispute to decide whether um, uh, there is a genuine dispute. However, there was, and uh, the uh, Salford state case was followed, and of course we have our own authorities which followed that. This is the Jinpeng and C-Mobile cases. Uh, but um, there was recently a case, uh, Rangecroft against Lennox, and the court said, well, um, actually there might be situations which um, don't squarely uh, fit into in you know kind of all they are like unusual and the court said like let's look at the circuits and let's think what um, what are the factors and uh, what is the nature of those proceedings so the court uh, was um, of opinion that because there were no other creditors there was only one uh, creditor that actually the collective nature of that remedy was not that um, not that big of a factor to say that that um, uh, this is, you know, uh, something which the collective interest should uh, um, prevail. Uh, then, actually, the court interestingly said, "Well, there was no statutory demand served, and actually, under the BVI law, there is no obligation to serve the statutory demand. It's, uh, it's, um, uh, you know, um, a decision that is made by the creditor. And usually, um, uh, if you serve the statutory demand." There definitely will be some objection, and this would just uh, kind of you know uh, delay the matters. So um, the court um, uh, said that actually, if one would serve a statutory demand in these circumstances, then it would be then there would be an opportunity for the debtor to set aside that demand. And if the debtor would set aside that demand, the uh, the mandatory stay would apply to those to that kind of application of the set aside and the court would refer the matter to arbitration automatically so um, having said that uh, interestingly the court um, observed that uh, there was uh, a request uh, by one of the parties to refer the matter to, to arbitration and the court still in my view has applied the tribal issue test in the sense that the court if you look at the decision the court said well, I have to decide, um, you know, I have a discretion and in exercising the discretion, I should consider whether the matter should be referred to arbitration, but then I have to uh, decide whether there is a dispute. Uh, so that is actually going in the territory of tribal issue uh, test. And, but once the court kind of wanted to apply that test, which we know comes from the Sparkasse case, um, the court said, actually, wait, I'm not able, uh, if, I, if I would do this, I would prejudice the, um, the debtor because the parties have agreed uh, um, to refer the matter to arbitration. And in fact, um, the way I understand is that, of course, there's a big debate. Can the court interfere in, in, the, discre in the matters that the arbitral tribunal should uh, decide? So... Um, there is, you know, you can go back and forth and say, well, um, both prima facie and the tribal issue test, they actually do interfere in any event with the, with the, with the merits of the case. But then you can have a counter argument saying, well, but the court doesn't decide the dispute. It's just a kind of preliminary view, preliminary investigation. So, um, uh, so in that case, the matter was referred to arbitration and very curiously, the parties at the hearing have agreed actually to amend the, the, to amend the terms of the arbitration clause that the case was referred to a single arbitrator seated in the BVI uh, who had a mandate within a very tight timetable time to, to decide whether there was a genuine dispute on substantial grounds and you know, very narrow uh, scope. So basically, there was a new arbitration clause created, which is very interesting, um, of course, and unusual. So um, to finish, uh, I'm you know about finishing my kind of presentation, which is uh, ten minutes. Um, um, you may question, and actually, I would be interested to hear maybe at the end of the session um, how the civil, the, how the lawyers from the civil law jurisdictions look at it. You may question. 
from the beginning, is it actually right that um, that seems like the formal recognition and enforcement of an arbitral award is being sidestepped? Uh, and actually, no one needs to, you know, do formal um, kind of step and recognize and enforce the arbitral award or even go to arbitration because, you, you know, the creditor will say there is a debt. Um, but of course, um, because the court has a discretion and because uh, winding up petition is not an enforcement process, but a collective remedy, the court will, will is likely, most likely, I think we have a, a case called Deselina in our jurisdiction, where the court said that basically the court would look at the New York defenses uh, in Article 5 when the court will exercise the discretion. So that is almost finishing my presentation. The only thing I probably just want uh, to, to add, but of course, um, uh, if, you if you're a creditor, a genuine creditor, and find yourself in this situation, so the advice would be that um, in the BVI, you should, you should most probably serve the salary demand as soon as possible. Of course, try to seek, um, uh, if, if it is happening that there is, um, if the court decides to stay arbitration, to refer the matter to arbitration, you should try and seek a stay, but not a dismissal of the application. Because it could be that actually the data is not genuine and the data will try and delay the matters. In that case, you could go back because it is discretionary. You could go back to the court and say, well, look, there is a going an abusive process and actually uh, the matter should be referred back and considered by the court. So, and if, if you are actually a genuine debtor and it seems that the creditor is um, actually, you know, sidestepping the arbitration procedure, of course, um, one way is to look at actually what is the wider relationship? Is there a cross claim and is there um, a need actually for the wider kind of, uh, uh, for, for the things to be considered? Um, you could actually start the arbitration. That would be uh, not a bad idea if you want the matter to be referred to arbitration. Um, also, um, you would be actually interested in dismissing the process rather than staying. And also, uh, probably you would be questioning what the standard which was applied. So on that basis, I would like to finish my presentation. Thank you very much. I just want to say it's a pleasure for me to speak to you today, and I hope um, you're having a good time. Thank you. Um, Jane, thank you. Uh, well, the clash between uh, insolvency and arbitration only starts at the uh, moment of insolvency filing, but it continues uh, after the judge opens the insolvency proceedings, the insolvency practitioner starts uh, various avoiding actions. And at the same time, the creditors need, uh, creditors need to enforce their debts. And the, if uh, agreements are subject to arbitration, the creditors uh, have an interesting choice where to go to, to the insolvency judge or to, uh, to the arbitrators. And this topic will be covered by uh, my uh, colleague, um, Alexander Pepeliuk. Alexander is a partner in a bankruptcy and destruction practice, uh, the district resolution of the leadings. Alexander has a wide experience uh, in representing the Russian and uh, international companies in Russia. Uh, Alexander, the floor is yours. Yes, hello everyone. Thank you for inviting me here and I'm uh, glad that I can see everyone in person. Uh, the question of bankruptcy and uh, arbitration clash, which is happening nowadays uh, here and then. And I, I think that any, anyone here can uh, share examples of the situations when they suddenly faced this uh, bankruptcy, bankrupt uh, <coughs> participant or uh, the third party who is trying to join the arbitration proceedings. And we see these uh, cases in, uh, even in the moot courts uh, where students trying to resolve uh, uh, these uh, sort of compli uh, complicated questions. And, and I, I was, uh, <clears throat> I was uh, asked uh, what to do when, uh, when uh, the uh, bankruptcy managers trying to uh, use uh, his force, his authority to move on and to challenge transaction instead of uh, moving in 
the way of arbitration agreement. And we see, uh, we recently learned that it is uh, uh, possible to prevent uh, this situation uh, developing. Uh, uh, also, uh, I think that this is possible probably in respect of Russia and other countries which are not a participant to European European Union, but still uh, it is effective measure which we uh, have seen um, last year. It was a, a case which uh, was heavily discussed uh, and even today by my colleagues uh, of, of River Rock and. Uh, uh, de deposit insurance agency who was uh, representing the ba uh, bankrupt bank, International San Francisco book. And uh, this, th there were a series of cases uh, where uh, they, uh, the mm, mm, English court faced the, uh, a, a question of what to do when the, uh, when they have a, a claim of bankruptcy manager pretending to uh, set aside uh, a series, series of transactions include, which include uh, arbitration, arbitral clauses. And uh, the English court supported uh, the prohibition stance which is, uh, uh, of which English courts are very well uh, known and uh, they decided uh, to um, issue, to grant anti-suit injunctions, in this particular case, anti-arbitration injunction, and uh, to support this uh, um, uh, arbitration clause. And they, by doing so, the uh, High Court of Justice decided that uh, the arbitration uh, clause uh, uh, include any uh, other person uh, and liquidator, a bankruptcy manager, uh, whoever could uh, come on behalf of uh, debtor. Uh, and therefore, there, there are no uh, exclusions in this respect. Uh, 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 in uh, um, uh, respect to uh, arbitration proceedings. The, um, this is, I, I believe, the most efficient way to prevent bankruptcy manager going uh, to uh, challenging the transactions. Because in Russia, the, this, is, this uh, judgment was sort of a, a bomb explosion when uh, we, we became aware that it's, it is possible to stop uh, bankruptcy proceedings. We saw that the uh, deposit insurance agency dropped the case and terminated proceedings, proceedings afterwards. And uh, uh, this uh, was so uh, effective that uh, uh, I cannot even uh, remember any other example of uh, this sort of uh, Mm, uh, impact. Uh, another one question here is uh, what uh, what is the scope of arbitration uh, clause should be used in uh, this respect? Whether it uh, enough uh, a standard clause, which uh, uh, and to which extent uh, it is um, covers uh, uh, the, the claims of bankruptcy manager and. Uh, it has occurred that uh, um, uh, even uh, before the English uh, judge, uh, the, uh, uh, the bank has pleaded that there uh, was at least one case which is similar to the one that uh, um, was brought before the English court, is the Singapore uh, case where they decided uh, in the opposite way. They didn't uh, see uh, the extension uh, to which uh, arbitral uh, clause could be used in respect of bankruptcy proceedings. And uh, the English judge had uh, rejected this pleading and uh, therefore uh, the scope of her arbitration clause was uh, confirmed even in respect of the cases where the bankruptcy manager trying to use a bankruptcy uh, uh, law provisions 
uh, which uh, provides uh, the uh, power to, to uh, challenge the transactions. Uh, another one case uh, which uh, came in, into my mind when I was preparing this speech was uh, the case of uh, Lori versus Akritia, uh, which uh, is uh, even uh, which happened in 2018 in, in, and two in and uh, 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 happened in English court and of course the, uh, this was a case where. Uh, the first, uh, at the first glance, uh, uh, is the similar case, but uh, this is uh, the, the only difference, probably, and not, uh, better to say, two difference uh, is that there was no bankruptcy proceedings, but was rather uh, temporary administration proceedings, which uh, the uh, uh, claimant uh, pleaded as a reason for avoiding the arbitration clause. And uh, in this respect, uh, court once again uh, supported the prior arbitration stance. But another uh, issue here is that uh, also th that the, there was a, like a matter of Cyprus li litigation, which the court decided to not to uh, to stop. Uh, because of their uh, European Union regulation, I guess, I guess the, the, it, uh, it named uh, uh, Brussels recast regulation, uh, according to which it is not possible to, uh, to suspend proceedings uh, uh, in uh, European Union countries on the same re uh, grounds uh, as the Russian court, for example. And uh, this... Uh, uh, also, this is not not the same story, but it is it is similar to bankruptcy because uh, the the some of the grounds of which uh, bankruptcy bankruptcy manager not not bankruptcy but temporary administrative manager uh, in uh, uh, in this case uh, was uh, bankruptcy uh, law articles. And uh, finally, the one, uh, the, uh, the last question here is what to do if the bankruptcy uh, proceedings were introduced and the, uh, according to some of jurisdiction laws, we see that it is possible to, uh, to stay arbitration civil law proceedings in, in uh, foreign countries. And uh, this happens uh, mostly in uh, more, maybe more popular, and I guess here Oksana could uh, additionally uh, clarify this issue later, but this relates to mostly to US courts, uh, because according to bankruptcy law, bankruptcy court in uh, USA, they, uh, the stay of proceedings come uh, automatically with the introduction of bankruptcy. S some of uh, bankruptcy judges did mm, uh, grant uh, this uh, in an uh, uh, optional way when uh, applicant tries to lead this argument in the court. But uh, the problem uh, rose, arise when these uh, injunctions uh, are in, in place and uh, they prevent ar uh, arbitration proceedings. And uh, I think that uh, the uh, relevant uh, provisions in, uh, in US, uh, um, in US uh, legislation could help here. Uh, the, the, any participant could, could uh, apply uh, for the lift of the stay and uh, under certain, of course, provisions which uh, uh, could be brought here. And uh, we know some examples of uh, cases when the judges decided uh, to, to lift the stay and to continue arbitration. Unfortunately, this is not the case in Russia because we, we, we cannot uh, ask the court to, to lift somehow to to, uh, to allow us to continue arbitration proceedings, but I wish one day this could be seen. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Um, automatic stay and the power of insolvency representative to seek avoidance of transactions are important features of insolvency law. Another important 
rule is about uh, prohibition of uh, to impose uh, interim injunctions upon the assets that are part of the insolvency state. Whereas it's quite a simple rule in the cross-border insolvency context, it's not so simple. And I, um, uh, my, uh, my colleague on the right, Aksana Wright, will uh, uh, address this topic. Asan is a partner in the New York office of uh, Fox Rothschilds. She is, uh, uh, has uh, many years experience in uh, arbitration and litigation matter, both in the US and outside of the US. Aksana. Thank you, Pavel. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And here we've got a common problem involving interim or provisional matters. Um, we have an individual A who has center of main interest in country A and uh, individual A filed for bankruptcy in country A. In parallel, there is an arbitration proceedings against this individual initiated by company B and they are pending in country B where a significant part of A's assets is located. And the issue here is can B obtain the attachment of A's assets in country B in aid of arbitration? So the question that we have here is, can an arbitration tribunal or a foreign uh, court adopt interim measures such as, for example, attachment or some asset freeze of A's assets or temporary restraining order or preliminary injunction and the likes uh, against A who's subject to insolvency proceeding in another country? So let's do some issue spotting for company B and its attorneys. So the first question that we have here is what effect the filing of insolvency in country A has on the proceedings in country B? And the answer will of course depend on the jurisdiction. So first of all, is the bankruptcy in country A automatically recognized in country B triggering some type of automatic stay of the proceedings in country B? which would likely prevent company B from seeking interim measures in country B. Or the other option, whether an administrator of A's bankruptcy estate uh, has to put some recognition process in place in country B before any bankruptcy is recognized in country B. And the example here, for example, in the US, um, the stay of arbitration or litigation proceedings will come into force only if the foreign insolvency is recognized uh, in the US under chapter 15 of the bankruptcy co code. And before chapter 15 was enacted, um, the courts in the US recognized uh, foreign bankruptcy proceedings uh, based on the principles of international comedy, but it was done on case by case uh, basis while chapter 15 has sort of a centralized uh, approach. So the administrator, uh, of A's bankruptcy state would file uh, proceeding under Chapter 15 in the US. And if uh, it's granted, if uh, the request is granted, then the automatic stay will be put in place um, in, in the US, meaning company B wouldn't be able to proceed with the interim, uh, so with the interim measures. So without chapter 15 filing, company B may be able to proceed and obtain interim measures in the US. And here I have as an example, um, a case involving a Russian bank, um, in which uh, a New York court confirmed this principle saying that a foreign proceeding can only be recognized when the debtor's foreign representative petitions a US court for recognition of the proceeding. But of course, the US approach is not universal. Uh, the laws vary, and in other jurisdictions, interim measures might be automatically restricted without this additional step. Uh, so the next consideration here for company B and its attorneys is whether the bankruptcy proceeding country A is universal or territorial. So what effect does that filing has? Does it only apply uh, to the territory of country A, staying the proceedings against the data on the territory of the country A, or does it apply extraterritorially to the proceedings in country B as well? And here, again, going back to the US where I practice um, under the bankruptcy court, uh, under the bankruptcy code, the courts in the US have very broad power 
And as long as the proceeding um, in a foreign country affects the US data or US property, uh, there've been a number of decisions holding that uh, the bankruptcy court's power extends to that proceeding extraterritorially as well. Um, so the next question that, um, that we have here, even if there's no automatic stay and you can proceed with filing interim measures in country B, are there any limitations on interim measures? For example, some in the US, you might be able to proceed with attachments or um, you know, freeze of debt debtors assets that might not be the case in other countries. Your interim measures might be restricted to preservation of evidence only. Um, the next issue um, that we should discuss here as well, even if the insolvency is recognized, and I think Alexander um, covered a little bit that issue. So even if the insolvency is recognized, can the interim measures be put in place nevertheless? Uh, what are the B's options? Let's say the chapter 15 was filed, uh, the insolvency is recognized, can be uh, moved to uh, lift, lift the stay under section 362. And it's, 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 a, it's not a straightforward uh, issue and I'm not gonna go like too much into the weeds, but uh, in the US, uh, there is this definition of core bankruptcy proceedings and non-core bankruptcy proceedings. And the core proceedings are subject to the determination of the bankruptcy co uh, court, while non-core proceedings could be de decided by the arbitration tribunal, for example. However, it's, it's really not straightforward. The bankruptcy code doesn't really provide the definition. Um, it's a very expensive definition of what constitutes core proceedings. And each court has its own view. What, what's a court, court proceeding, which, which is not court proceeding. So even if you go, even if you're within the same state, let's say you're in New York, Southern District of New York ha, might have one view, what constitutes court proceedings, and Eastern District of New York will have a different view. And just an example, I've had many years ago, I had a case um, involving um, post-financial crisis. It was a um, bankruptcy of a failed hedge fund. And we were representing uh, the trustee of the hedge fund's estate. And we filed, it was like a very straightforward adversary proceeding, trying to enforce um, a promissory note against the third party. And the third party objected saying, you know, it's, it's promissory note subject to a contract, uh, bankruptcy, it's not a court proceeding. Bankruptcy court uh, shouldn't be adjudicated that issue. And it was like, it didn't involve a lot of money. It was just very kind of straightforward uh, breach of contract. And the judge in Judge Gerber in Southern District of New York, who's now retired, he issued a 30 page decision on this very simple matter, discussing kind of the going back in history, discussing the bankruptcy court, the regulations, the legislative history, uh, deciding that it was a court, the court proceeding, he can adjudicate it. So the, that's a big cut issue for the bankruptcy. Um, uh, courts in the US. Um, and um, that said, some courts, and there are a number of the decisions of the US courts, which find that they have limited jur jurisdiction with respect to uh, international arbitrations and the lift in the stays with respect to international arbitrations and allowing um, uh, international arbitrations to proceed. Um, and I'm probably running out of time and I want to leave some time for people to ask questions. But I do want to mention, since I've been mostly covering the US, I want to also mention the English Gibbs rule. Um, there was a recent decision involving the uh, Sberbank, another Russian bank, um, which held that creditors can enforce their debt over UK assets. And even if there was a stay, uh, there was a foreign bankruptcy and there was a stay in England of, of the proceedings. However, the court held that this under the Gibbs rule that state can be permanent and at some point the creditors were allowed to proceed against enforcing uh, against the debt over UK assets. Roxana, thank you. Uh, yes. What's the aim of the bankruptcy process? Is to get a 
discharge of a, uh, of a debt. So in the end, it's important to recognize the insolvency judgment in the country where the debtor has assets. And at, sometimes in that country where arbitration proceedings may go in on. And uh, this topic will be addressed by uh, my colleague, former colleague Tatiana Minaeva. Tatiana is now the partner in the London office of uh, Reynolds Sporter and Chamberlain. And he has a wide experience in uh, both arbitration, investment arbitration, commercial disputes involving the uh, former Soviet Union states. Tatiana. Pavel, thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, yes, I'm arbitration lawyer. I'm not insolvency practitioner, so I'm not going to go into sections, subsections, sub sub subsections of uh, insolvency act. I would like to just share my view as an arbitration lawyer. When uh, either we sit as arbitrators and see that mainly respondents are in insolvency, in foreign insolvency proceedings or when we represent um, claimant in such proceedings. So in my personal experience, I had two cases where I sat as arbitrator and respondents were in insolvency proceedings. Uh, in first case, it was in Ukraine, and in second case, it was in Poland. In both cases, respondent didn't take part in the arbitration, and what we face is that we don't have any ground not to proceed with arbitration. Uh, we proceed with arbitration because at the same time, we need to take uh, into account that arbitrators have the duty to issue enforceable award. And everything depends on where this award is going to be enforced. Um, for example, let's say uh, we have LCI arbitration and we have a respondent who undergoes foreign insolvency but the assets are in England. So as I just mentioned, there is no ground for us to uh, uh, stay the proceedings or not to, to discontinue the proceedings. Uh, it's up to the claimant. The claimant has the strategy in place whether to uh, uh, and how the claimant is going to enforce this award at the outset. But the key point here is to observe is whether this foreign insolvency has been recognized in England. And if foreign insolvency hasn't been recognized in England, then uh, we proceed. And uh, uh, from my personal point of view, there is no risk to, um, to enforcement of this award in England. However, if uh, uh, foreign insolvency is being recognized in England or has already been recognized in England, then there is a huge risk for uh, the claimant to, uh, to enforce this award because this is where, after recognition, uh, where all the insolvency pleasures kicks in, like moratorium, stay of proceedings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, just briefly, also with, with the, all this kind of context, that I'm not insolvency lawyer, but just to mention that there are few uh, grounds when uh, foreign insolvency can be recognized in England. And uh, first ground, also it always depends where in foreign insolvency takes place. For example, if foreign insolvency takes place in Commonwealth countries, then this will be uh, automatic recognition under Insolvency Act 90, uh, 1986, section 426. Then there is this uh, ancestral model loan, cross-border insolvency, uh, there was, uh, before Brexit, there was European Union regulation on insolvency, but after Brexit, it doesn't apply in England, in U United Kingdom, so on Stral model law on cross-border insolvency applies. And then there is one more ground, which is called English common law. And this English common law very heavily depends on the facts of the case. So let me just give you example of the case, of the recent case, um, in the context of uh, Russia, Russian, for, uh, Russian insolvency. So I would like to briefly speak about the case, which, is, which was brought by, by uh, insolvency practitioner, Russian insolvency uh, trustee practitioner, Ms. Kireyeva, against uh, Bejamov, Mikhail Bejamov, who was, foreign, uh, who was um, former owner of Meshprom Bank. And, um, this uh, claim was brought to high court, to English high court. And Ms. Kireyeva, she had several uh, requests 
first request was to uh, recognize herself as foreign uh, as an insolvency practitioner, not practitioner, <laughs> trustee of foreign insolvency. The second request was actually to pass uh, English property of Mikhail Bijamov to the insolvency estate in Russia, and also to uh, subject uh, Mikhail Bijamov to questioning about that property. So in that case, English court, uh, of course, Mr. Bijamov uh, had defendant, uh, had uh, arguments in defense, and one of the argument was that uh, English court shall not trust this foreign insolvency because it was based on fraud, on unjust enrichment, and uh, English court didn't accept these arguments as valid because there was um, it didn't find any grounds not to trust um, Russian court. So in this particular case, as I said, it's very heavily uh, facts related. Uh, English court applied common law ground to recognize foreign insolvency. And why? Because uh, first, uh, Mikhail Bijamov was not, uh, uh, was domiciled in England. He was not domiciled in foreign state. And secondly, Mikhail Bijamov uh, recognized himself foreign insolvency through his uh, representative. He took part in foreign insolvency. So that's why English court decided that it has ground on common law to recognize foreign insolvency. Uh, however, that recognition was very limited. Uh, uh, the judge decided that movable property can be passed to a foreign insolvency estate, but not immovable property. And so the judge refused to pass actually Belgravia property to a foreign um, insolvency estate. Uh, at the same time, also the request about questioning of Mikhail Bijamov was also denied because since the court already decided in respect to this foreign property, in this respect, sorry, to this Belgravia property that it's not going to be passed to foreign insolvency estate. So Mr. Bijamov should not be questioned about this uh, property. So it's a just very, very brief and very high level overview of this case. The case is much more complicated, the same as generally insolvency in England. But let's discuss briefly one more scenario. And um, this scenario is on the slide. But very briefly, so imagine that Russian company undergoes, a Russian company received a loan from English company. And uh, after it received, and also Polish company, imagine just Polish company provided guarantee to secure this loan to English company. In this guarantee, there is LCIA arbitration clause with seat in London. Russian company undergoes insolvency proceedings in Russia. And Polish company did not take part in this insolvency proceedings. Uh, in this insolvency proceedings, in the restructuring plan, it was decided that all obligations of the Russian company should be, including the guarantee, should be extinguished. So uh, insolvency trustee applied to English courts to recognize insolvency of the Russian company. In response, English company initiated arbitration proceedings against Polish company. What should do, what should Polish company do? And I'm sure that there are so many options. What can Polish company do? Because uh, I just will suggest several options and I'm sure that you can share with your ideas. But um, what I could suggest, and it's not legal advice of course, is that uh, first Polish, company can apply to Polish courts to recognize Russian insolvency proceedings. And in this case, if successful, the guarantee would be extinguished as obligation. My second proposition is that Polish company can actually apply to Polish court to recognize itself insolvent. And then the final uh, proposition which I have is that all depends on, of course, on the terms of guarantee. And because a Russian Polish company did not take part in Russian insolvency proceedings, and um, it can argue in arbitration that first um, English company should first apply under the loan agreement and uh, to the Russian company and only after that 
apply to uh, to a Polish company with this arbitration claim. So I think that Pavel, this is something <laughs> which I wanted to share. That's all. Tatiana, thank you. And I, I think it's time to give a floor to the audience and uh, we are very much uh, welcome any of your comments or any war stories that you have uh, in respect of these or other questions relating to the cross-border insolvency and arbitration. Does anyone uh, have something to add to the discussion? Uh, yeah, where is one? Uh, could it be in a microphone? To the channel? Yes, thank you so much, Isabella Pruska, Karel's DVI. I have a question to colleagues, to Evgeny, who is also um, currently working at DVI. So it's best to speak English or Russian. What is more convenient for you? Uh, well, I guess probably, probably in English. Uh, so that everybody can understand. So there, there was this recent case in the BVI when um, the matter was actually referred to the arbitration. And I was just curious, what do you think? Will this trend continue or it was just an exceptional case and it was, you know, like one, uh, one of a kind case? What do you think the practice would be nowadays? Thank you, Isabella. It's very nice to see you on the other side of the screen. <laughs> Um, thank you. That's a very good question. Well, actually, um, it seems that the court in the recent case, which is called um, a creditor against anonymized company, um, sorry, anonymized company against, no, sorry, yes, that's correct, a creditor against anonymized company, um, has decided that actually there is some limit to that, um, uh, you know, uh, referral of arbitration, uh, referral of matter to arbitration. And actually, uh, um, in that particular case, the court said it was clear that the defense was a put up, put up job. So basically, uh, um, if it is clear that there is some type of an abuse going to happen, uh, it seems that the court um, would not refer a matter to arbitration and will exercise the discretion to, um, to wind up a company. Um, other kind of examples which I can see could be, you know, if it is clear that uh, possibly, um, uh, you know, or maybe arbitration was, uh, there was an attempt to, to, to begin arbitration, and let's say the other side, the debtor has not participated in arbitration, um, or, or, you know, kind of something, you know, similar, not, not maybe just not participated, but some type of a delay or, or clear tactic to avoid or, or kind of to extend the arbitration and delay the match. I think that's something which the court could consider as, um, as an abuse and that maybe um, would, would, would uh, dismiss, um, sorry, not dismiss, but wind up the company. Thank you, I hope I answered the question. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Dmitry Kupsov, a little firm. I would like to turn back to Alexander's speech uh, about the uh, IBSP case. We are well familiar with it. And um, uh, one of the questions which we have been uh, trying to understand uh, in our minds when dealing with it uh, is whether the creditors uh, of the bank uh, shall be bound by the ASI or not. Because uh, the ASI was issued against the DIA, uh, against its agents, against uh, its officials, but it, it said nothing about the creditors. And we all, we all know that creditors in Russian bankruptcy are entitled to challenge transactions. And in no recording case, authority uh, of the creditors to do so was one of the reasons for which the court did not agree uh, to discontinue proceedings. Uh, in in IVSP case, we saw that the, the, the judge take a different stance. Can you speak up, please? Oh, sorry, uh, took a different stance. But uh, in any case, we understand that <clears throat> uh, the recent approach of the Supreme Court as to the role of the creditors as representatives of the debtor, uh, this uh, judgment in the IBSP case could be criticized uh, in higher instances. So uh, do you have any uh, views on this or did you investigate this issue yourself? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. That, that's uh, uh, really interesting because I, I have noticed that after the DIA dropped the case, 
other creators uh, uh, followed the same approach and they and it, it was uh, ultimately terminated and the the reason i, I guess that that uh, the one that you have uh, mentioned is that the uh, Disregard the creators filed these these claims. They are uh, eventually the uh, uh, remain representatives of the debtor, and that, that that's the reason why they uh, followed this destiny. I I, I uh, can can uh, can follow this uh, 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 discuss this idea further that that uh, what will happen if uh, creators uh, decide to to move on uh, and to initiate new proceedings uh, instead of the one which they uh, left and maybe in separate proceedings uh, uh, trying to recover damages uh, which they incurred uh, uh, due to actions uh, of uh, the possible defendants. This is the question of uh, um, sort of competition between bankruptcy, uh, civil proceedings out of the bankruptcy and arbitration uh, proceedings. So, or, also, this the, this question I I, I think uh, more much more complicated, uh, and uh, I think we would one day see the progress of this one. Well, Alison, if if I also com comment on, on this question, uh, I think we need to distinguish two situations. One is when the creditor is. Uh, files the application based on the rules of insolvency law and in such situation the creditor acts on behalf and the interest of the state but there is also another feature of Russian law is so-called the individual action Puliana it's when the creditor tries to uh, protect its own interest and file a separate proceedings to annul the transactions such uh, actions are not unique uh, and for example, the same could be done in, uh, in in the Netherlands. And I believe in this case, the arbitration clause should not uh, cover this type of action because uh, here it's uh, the debtor and the third party who basically collided to defraud the creditors. Why the creditor should be bound by the uh, by the fruit of this uh, of this conspiracy? I mean, the arbitration clause. I think the uh, individual creditor may decide that to go in, in, in foreign countries or in Russia, uh, it's up to him how to protect uh, its own interest. Thank you. Yep, that, that's it. That's what I was uh, trying to say, that uh, attempts of uh, creditors to recover their losses uh, uh, is a, is a uh, ordinary way of uh, which we can all, all uh, see uh, nowadays, but uh, the and, and I and I think that it is of course not a, a, a should not be uh, covered by arbitration clause of, of debtor and uh, third parties. And uh, moreover, this is probably uh, not the bankruptcy case. But I, I uh, think that I met met, met uh, a president of, of English court where. They decided uh, to uh, to um, consider this sort of claim uh, of, I mean, the actual Pauliana uh, in in parallel to bankruptcy, um, and uh, the judge decided uh, in favor of bankruptcy, the, which I, I guess. Uh, would uh, would somehow uh, and should be noted by all all uh, insolvency pr uh, practitioners uh, um, and should be uh, taken into account. Thank you, Alexander. Do you have any more comments, or maybe to uh, you can give some examples where you uh, you know face these issues and how these issues were resolved by the judge or the by arbitrators. I can, I, I can I have a question to Oksana, I can, uh, if, if I may. <laughs> we, we had a short discussion before this uh, meeting, and I, I, and I uh, 
uh, was thinking about this case, which I mentioned, uh, the case of uh, Second Circuit uh, uh, U.S. Court uh, uh, of Appeal, and it was about Photochrome 1975, uh, where the judge decided in favor of Japanese company claimant who who uh, ignored uh, automatic stay uh, and received arbitrary uh, arbitral award. Uh, despite the bankruptcy proceedings. And the, the, the uh, uh, bankruptcy court decided in favor of uh, the claimant. Uh, what do you think uh, will happen uh, nowadays uh, concerning that this was 30 years ago and would this case still be applied and relevant to uh, modern uh, cases? Um, so that case, right, from the 70s, it was based on the previous version of the uh, bankruptcy code. Nevertheless, the, so the, the issue in that case is whether um, the bankruptcy code in the U.S. can issue uh, anything against the creditor who potentially in violation of the automatic state that is put in place in the U.S. is proceeding um, is proceeding with arbitration in another country. Uh, in that case, the court held that as long as there's no personal jurisdiction over the creditor, um, banker, uh, bankruptcy courts kind of is, is tied, can't really issue anything against um, the creditor because there's no personal jurisdiction. And uh, the case is still valid. Um, and there's, you know, there's, a potential argument for uh, for the creditors who pursue those arbitrations outside of the U.S. and potentially don't really plan to get involved in any proceedings in the U.S. because the moment you know you get uh, involved in some proceedings in the U.S., um, you try to go after some assets or something else. They could be you know you could be subject to personal jurisdiction of the U.S. courts. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? Well, if not, uh, let's close this uh, session. I would like to thank uh, our panelists for the, the nice presentations and giving the perspective from both the, uh, of the insolvency practitioners and to the arbitration practitioners. Thank you much. Thank you. This is Ed Cross. Nice to see you all, sort of. And we also should get Chan Bao. Hello. Oh, hello, Chan. Hi, Chan. Hello, Hi, Chan. Everyone. So, you're where you're calling from? From Hong Kong? Uh, from Singapore, actually. Singapore. Wow. Good. So we the room is filling, and we started with a little delay because. Um, the previous panels uh, were so exciting and <laughs> uh, talkative that it took just a little bit longer and we wanted to enjoy the great lunch. And um, I would now like to start as I've been given the honor of moderating this panel with our panel discussion. And uh, first of all, of course, I thank the organizers very much for uh, inviting me to come here again. It's been a great pleasure and um, particularly pleasure to be here live. And um, Coming right to the topic, in a world of innovation and digitalization, it becomes increasingly important to develop a sound understanding of the human nature. Um, as we heavily rely on witness evidence, the question arises, how reliable is witness evidence? And uh, can you please put on the first slide, which I have? Yes, thank you very much. So um, I will first give a short introduction to this subject and then hand over and introduce um, our uh, esteemed panelists. You must tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I think we all know this and we've all heard this as a reminder to the witness, but I think we also, all of us know that witnesses not always tell the truth, not always tell the whole truth, and not always tell nothing but the truth. So for the purpose of today's session, I would like to first develop with you what is truth. 
I would like to draw a distinction between two scenarios. One which I call the mild and the other one, the severe appearance. The mild one first. Mild one is untruthfulness. A witness may provide false information unwittingly. The ICC Commission and Vladimir will speak about this um, report on the accuracy of fact witness memory in international arbitration. They have created a special term for this untruthfulness, and that is memory distortion. That's the mild version. Now, the severe version, that's lying. We all know that as well. Witnesses may provide false information intentionally. The difference is that a liar can choose and um, whether he says the truth or not, um, a uh, memory distorter <laughs> cannot because she or he believes to be saying the truth. Now, how to express the truth? Is there a way to express the truth? Does our expression reveal it? Um, do the words we choose express it? Um, interestingly, liars usually tend to conceal that they're lying. It's much easier concealing something than being outright lying. I'm sure we all this, know this from the cross-examination. Sorry, I simply cannot remember. That's a typical concealment. So um, is there a method to determine the truth? Is there one? Do you think so? Who believes we can objectively determine the truth? Please raise your hands. Torture. <laughs> Torture. 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, um, drugs. So, so we got a, quite a, some interesting votes. Torture, drugs. Well, I think it's the search for truth is inherent in human beings. And many people, especially we lawyers, believe uh, we can recognize lawyer, liars. The lawyers can recognize liars. And um, but actually, we are pretty bad at it. We're very bad at it. And there have studies that have this, uh, shown that test persons, um, there was a US data study with more than 500 people um, trying to find out if somebody's lying or not. And um, those were judges, uh, those were policemen, those were secret service agents, um, those were students the CIA, FBI, and what you guess is the outcome? The outcome is 50-50, um, except one single group um, of those which I mentioned was getting a slightly higher rate, and those are secret service. So uh, that's the only one in this group who, who had a uh, significantly or like 10, 15 percent higher success rate. So, and this is uh, explains why we always had a very strong interest in finding the truth. And um, I'm coming now to the <laughs> uh, Vladimir. Can you? Um, Vladimir already mentioned it, but um, going on the next slide here. Uh, so people have tried to find methods uh, to find out the truth. They started with the mild one. Um, people were asked to eat bread and uh, the time was counted how long they needed to eat the bread. And if somebody took a long time, it was a sign of being nervous. Um, so um, he was a liar if he was eating the bread very long. Um, I hope we don't have lots of liars here because it took very long for lunch to come um, to join this event. But <laughs> it's uh, you didn't have bread, you had wonderful food. Now the Torture, um, that was um, that's the more uh, violent method, which unfortunately still is applied in some places, uh, is a means of finding the truth. The accused were coerced to confess and wrongfully convicted. And clearly this is a violation of human dignity and today's human rights. So this is why some smart and ingenious persons have developed a highly sophisticated new method, 
which we're going to discuss today and which I want to introduce to you for all of those who don't know it. And a very popular scholar called this, beyond any doubt, the greatest engine ever invented for the discovery of truth. I'm sure you all know what that is. It's cross-examination. Cross-examination, um, that was, I'm sure, clear to all of you that only lawyers can invent such a ingenious uh, engine, but is it really the greatest engine? We'll hear uh, more from my uh, subsequent uh, panelists, um, but I just want to walk you through um, the search for truth. Um, I don't um, have a uh, clean solution, but I think that, that uh, it's interesting to see uh, that there are other methods um, than coercing and pills. Um, one is the polygraph, uh, which was intended to catch offenders in the act. It's based on the assumption that invol involuntary physical reactions can indicate if a person is lying or not. Uh, but in fact, it's like with good witness preparation, um, a uh, witness can be trained um, and they can be trained um, to um, really trick a uh, polygraph. And also people who fear that they're misbelieved, they act as if they were liars. So it's, it's not accurate. So if lying can't be detected by bodily reactions, can, do you think the behavior of person can detect if they're lying? For example, there is a widespread um, assumption that if you're cross-examining somebody and he, does, he avoids eye contact, um, that he's lying. There's also an assumption that um, if you have sort of um, leg, foot, arm, unrest, nodding, etc., that you're a liar. Um, there have been, I can tell you, um, uh, there's no um, empirical evidence, in fact, um, that that has any meaning or not. Um, paradoxically, on the contrary, um, in a 2020 study, which was done by Mr. Vri and Mr. Fisher, uh, they say uh, liars will show an expression of covert self-control. So if somebody is lying, they will try to be very, very calm. So liars take more effort to cover up their nervousness than innocent people who are afraid. And that's really paradox. The calmer a witness, the more likely he's lying, the more likely he's lying. Does that make you think? Are you, someone of you surprised about that? Uh, actually, it made me think, uh, maybe I should be more erratic so you don't think that I'm lying now. <laughs> But some scientists also consider the analysis of speech to be more of the promising method. Um, and there was an, an actually very interesting experiment, which, which I like a lot, um, which um, came to the so-called Pinocchio effect. Everybody, all of you know Pinocchio. Um, that's a, from the fairy tale, a liar who gets a real long nose. And uh, Lynn van Zwoll um, made a, um, example where people had to give away money and they had the opportunity to betray um, their opponent and keep some of the money. And the persons, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> poker, you gain money, you don't give it off because you get, <laughs> so, so, the, so the liars, um, they were uh, looking whether the liars had any um, different behavior. And interestingly, they had a different language. The liars, they were talking longer, they were using more indirect pronouns, um, and they were just uh, using also make uh, sort of more vulgar words. So they were um, creating to cover up in a, in a way by speaking longer, and this is why it's called the um, Pinocchio effect. Now coming to my last slide. Um, just on the Pinocchio effect, what I wanted to add is that they found the same uh, Pinocchio effect uh, for those of you who want to use that in cross-examination. Um, if somebody is confronted with a very aggressive uh, cross-examiner, 
people also act uh, defensive and unsecure and they speak longer than they would usually do. So um, something to remember for the cross-examination techniques. Now, um, who of you knows the US drama series Lie to Me? Um, that is, um, yes, that's good. Uh, so all of you who know it, a, a few of you, um, this is based on the world's fam most famous lie investigator, Paul Ekman. And um, the sort of star of this series, uh, Dr. Lightman notices, for example, if a witness repeatedly pulls the corner of her mouth um, during the testimony, uh, this just for flash seconds, um, that means she doesn't believe her own words because she's lying. Um, and the method which is used, it's called the facial action coding system. And it's a system to taxonomize human facial movements by the appearance on the face and the micro expressions, which are uncontrollable facial expressions. They're only shown in a split second and they're universally the same across all languages and cultures. So everybody, I think this is sort of unanimously agreed among um, the uh, science, but the consequences, uh, they are a bit uh, controversial. Um, of course, uh, Paul Ekman says you can clearly tell the truth, but I think the majority view says they can show what um, impressions or intentions uh, somebody had, but they, um, sorry, they, they can so they can show uh, your impression, like eye closure, eye blink, etc. If you if you anger, if you're frustrated, if you're annoyed, but they cannot show why you're frustrated because you're lying or because you're nervous. So um, they don't necessarily determine a lie, um, but um, they determine if you have micro expression, there is more to the story than is being told. And now let me give you an example from the series. Um, and I would ask now the operator to show us the Bill Clinton video. Politics was behind this. People who want to silence me. That is who we should be looking for. I think it tells you so much. Yeah. Yeah, I pointed one way while his eyes were pointed another. Well, I haven't really lying. Your mind's working so hard to make stuff up. Your body can't keep you sane. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. So what, what Dr. Lightman, uh, for those of you who didn't see it clearly in the video, uh, makes clear, if your finger points in one direction and your eyes look in the other one, there is a controversy. And that means uh, that there is something wrong here. I don't know if it's lying, but <laughs> there could be an indication. Now, uh, coming to the last slide, um, and with this introduction, I'll move myself. Um, with this introduction, I now hand over to uh, my three distinguished panelists uh, to speak on the hard facts, the practice and the solutions um, before we give the floor to you, the audience, uh, for any questions. Now, um, I'd like to first introduce our first panelist, Vladimir Kvale. Uh, Vladimir is partner, actually he's a person who doesn't need any introduction, but I will still try. He's partner in the Moscow office of Baker McKenzie, heads the firm CIS dispute resolution, um, has extensive, extensive experience in arbitration. And I'm, I can say, I know him for many years, he's really the standout figure of international arbitration in Russia. He holds a number of functions and uh, imp with uh, important uh, organizations. And one is he's the chairman of the board of the Russian Arbitration Association. Vladimir, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Nikolaos. I want to test your memory, uh, people sitting in this room. And I ask you what you remember about something which you've seen today several times. Um, before I do it, and it's because it's related to uh, our sponsors, you know, that there's a number of law firms sponsoring this event. And you, you saw on the press wall, you know, uh, two columns with sponsors, and you saw. Um,
BVOs. You have, by the way, one in your uh, materials which you received at the registration desk. But what I noticed just before entering into this room, Debbie Voice brochure on the table was not put in the right place because their main sponsor, their brochure was supposed to be in the middle, while on the side they were, on the fact they were somewhere on the side. I asked people not to come outside and check how exactly the, the brochures are placed. I want to check your memory. But before I do, I ask you, Victoria, Victoria Kurashkina, by the way, she is a person, you know, who organizes this excellent event. And Victoria is personally responsible for placing the brochures. Victoria, I'm asking you how it happened that the Bivois brochures were not put in the middle of the table where they're supposed to be, but rather on the side. Actually, I believe they're just in the middle of the table, like 98%. <laughs> you believe you believe in 98% that they're in the middle? Okay, Nikolaus, what, what, is, what is your recollection? Uh, whether in the middle or on the side? Actually, um, I, I, I agree with uh, Victoria because I put a VIAC, uh, Vienna International Arbitral Center brochure on the table and I put it on the side. So they must have been in the middle. Okay, they must have been in the middle, okay. Uh, we need your mobile phones and we want you to vote. If you take uh, this page, you will see a QR code uh, for our session on the right uh, top corner. And you will see a questionnaire and I ask you uh, to answer a pretty simple question with regard to the Bivois brochure. Try to Remember what you saw during registration at the table near the registration desk. Whether the Bivois brochures were in the middle or they were in the side, or you do not remember. Can we have vote now? Yeah, don't tell people. They need to recollect it. Uh, okay. Tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Give, give one minute. I don't know how we are going to know the results. Oh, yes. <laughs> Victoria will show us. Okay, 20 seconds more. Let's vote and see what you remember. We've done it? Yes. Victoria, can you show us the results? Uh, yes, actually, 62% uh, do not remember, 27 in the center, 10% on a side. Okay, Victoria, can you show us how the table looked during this lunch break? We need to show it on the screen. Uh, for, for, it might come as a surprise uh, to the people see, he's sitting here. Answer is there was no uh, DBOS brochure on the table at all. Uh, so this, <laughs> this example demonstrates how easy we could influence witness memory. Witness memory could be distorted. And if you, if you read ICC report, uh, Victoria, can I have my first slide, please? Um, uh, as, as you know, ICC Arbitration Commission issued report on witness memory in international arbitration. If you have not read it, I, I urge you and strongly recommend to read it. This is extremely interesting document. Can I have first slide, please? Uh, because uh, by reading this document, you, oh, I, see, I could do it myself, okay. Um, you understand how you could distort a witness memory, distort in a sense that witness will honestly believe in something which in fact never happened. How it happens, uh, witnesses do not remember facts, but they rely on the people around them. So when, when witness statement is prepared uh, for not normally in tertiary arbitration, there's a lengthy discussion with the lawyers. The lawyers have their story in mind and they are telling the story to witness. Uh, they're telling also position of the party taken in international arbitration. 
And the, uh, and the witnesses who are very often employees of the company, they have loyalty to the company, uh, they trust the lawyers, and they have a tendency to believe what the lawyers are saying to them with regard to the facts. The lawyers also show them documents. Sometimes they show documents only in favor of the theory and not against the theory. And these documents have a real impact on the recollection of witness. Uh, the lawyers could also put questions in a different way. For example, there's no question in our voting, there's no brochures, right? They were either in the middle or in the side or I do not remember. But to put correctly question, it should be, there was no brochure at all. So lawyers could put question in a way that it would influence memory of witness because uh, the way how you put the question, how you phrase the question has also has impact on, um, uh, on answer. Uh, and we also know that written witness statements these days are normally prepared lawyers by the uh, as first drafts based on documents. They're presented by witness and witnesses ask to confirm whether it's true or not. And by reading a nice story, witness is inclined to confirm uh, the story. An extensive uh, preparation of witness for cross-examination has the same effect. So witness, not that they are lying, but they honestly believe in the story which was told by the lawyers. The recommendation of ICC Commission is, and we are, we are going to talk about it later, is that lawyers should abstain from using these tricks in order to distort witness memory. They should not, um, for example, when they make examination of witness, they, they should not make examination in a group of people. Because if you're sitting in a group of people and three of them will say, yes, I saw brochures on the table, it will be very difficult psychologically to say, I did not see it or there was no brochures at all. Because the other people and some of them with high authority say, yes, there's a table, uh, there's a brochure on the table. So there are some advices or commitments which the lawyers, the council on terrorist arbitration should take in order to avoid distortion of witness memory. Whether it works in practice or not, I frankly doubt. But for those who are involved in international arbitration and preparing witness for cross-examination, again, I highly recommend it to read because it's an extremely useful document. What is the alternative? And uh, the alternative is, and not surprisingly, I will argue in favor of the Prague rules, because Prague rules, as you know, based on different premises, there should be no written witness statement at all, and no lengthy cross-examination, and no preparing for lengthy cross-examination. So witness should come to the tribunal afresh. So it should be only brief discussion between lawyer and potential witness about what witness remember. And then lawyer or counsel makes motion to the tribunal saying, I have witness. I, I want you to ask witness questions related uh, to a particular case. Um, so with, with this, I, I, I guess I, I should give a floor to other speakers because we have some other interesting stories to be told. And we've, thank you for that, Vladimir, uh, for, <laughs> that insight and uh, also for the controversy. I think that the Prague rules, and I know you were the one uh, who was heavily involved, they now um, uh, tend to get more and more acclamation and recognition uh, because they are really saying uh, a lot of the obvious and, and common sense. Now, um, I turn now to our next speaker who's Ed Cross. Um, and can we put Ed Cross on the video now and we see Chan. Uh, <laughs> I see a Chan, but um, Ed is the one who's up next. Ed is a partner. Hi there, yeah. I don't know if I have to speak to get my face shown, but um, I'm happy to be Chan. And Chan, if you could just move your lips while I talk, that would be fine. Yeah, so, we okay, go. now we, <laughs> yeah, that Very would good. have been Big interesting exercise. Um, if she's really telling the truth or what you're saying. Um, now, Ed, uh, Cross is partner at Simmons and Simmons um, in London. He specializes on complex financial and contentious regulatory disputes. He is a former president of the London Solicitors Litigation Association, uh, which represents um, over 3,000 dispute lawyers in London. Um, and he has been at the forefront of civil justice reforms in the recent years and has been part of a small and distinguished working group advising the Minister of Justice on the implications of Brexit on the UK civil justice. 
Ed has over 25 years of experience in handling international disputes and what I understand um, also a significant part of that experience relates to clients in Russia and the CIS. Ed, um, wonderful to have you with us and the floor is yours now. Thank you very much, Nicholas. I'm very sorry not to be there in person, but look forward to attending next year. Um, Vladimir, you, you mentioned the Prague rules, which is interesting because I think there are some features of, in those that would um, find some favor, certainly with the English uh, commercial court judges, you know, the idea that lengthy witness statements are gonna be any help to a judge. Um, and uh, also the, the, the point about cross-examination, I mean, that is not a process that's designed to extract necessarily the truth um, from the witness. It, it's a skillful advocate is going to position this to make sure that his or her case comes out and that the witness is not given an opportunity to say what actually uh, evidence that witness has to give. So there are many challenges with witness statements and with cross-examination. Um, the question of whether or not you should do away with witness statements entirely is, is a tricky one because say with the Prague rules where you're de-emphasizing the importance of documents, of requiring um, a party to go away and undertake extensive searches for documents so that those difficult um, um, documents can uh, get into the hands of the other side. It places less emphasis on that and it's also now saying that you shouldn't really be able to put in witness statements to set out what your evidence is from your key witnesses. So I asked the, the rhetorical question, um, how do you ensure that the tribunal becomes surprised of all the key facts? It's a tricky one. The approach in England and Wales is very uh, different. Um, in the past, many years back, and still in criminal trials, uh, evidence would be adduced in chief. So the witness in a criminal trial will stand up and, and be, be examined with non-leading questions. And judges do find that that is a very good way of hearing uh, a witness's evidence in their own words, because that's exactly what it is. It's not a lengthy statement that's being carefully crafted uh, by the lawyers with multiple drafts, you know, with all the tricks or, or at least all the techniques that lawyers will often um, uh, deploy to sort of put their case to the witness and make sure that the witness is going to come up to proof uh, when they come to give evidence. And I think there's been a real backlash against this um, by the um, high court judges and the profession in London. Uh, and a working group was established in 2018 to look at this problem of these massively long statements that were being put in, reciting at length documents to get across to the court the, um, the factual evidence that they think is important to prove the case. When in fact, as we know, the, the, those sort of documents become a lawyer's creation, that they're, they're um, uh, they, uh, the lawyers are tampering with the witnesses' um, recollections by putting documents to them sometimes that the witness have not seen and then asking them to comment. And in an extreme case, you'll see witness uh, statements, which is a mistake, of course, but that, that seek to argue the case. And, and I know that so judges and arbitrators hate that. Um, so they set up this working group. They did a big survey of about a thousand um, people in the profession, and um, looked at a range of options, uh, returning to evidence in chief, so doing away with witness statements entirely, um, having witness summaries, just to say broadly what your witness will say um, in uh, at trial, and heaven forbid, sorry Americans, uh, going to a sort of US style deposition approach. I'm very pleased to say we didn't go down that route, and we didn't completely rewrite the rules on um, the approach we had. But what we did try to do, uh, and I'm sure it will have drawn on um, some of the problems that were identified in the ICC report, was to uh, introduce a, a, a strong discipline about how witness statements uh, should be taken and what their function is. So, um, and there are duties that are imposed on the witness, which they have to certify at the end of their now much shorter witness statement. And most importantly, there are duties imposed on the legal advisors to give, uh, to certify certain things. So for example, as a solicitor, you now have to certify that you have not asked a leading question of a witness on an area that's uh, really uh, in contention in the proceedings. 
Now you think about how when how you do that when you proof a witness, particularly if you're proofing a witness in a foreign language, like you're trying to be efficient in how you're asking questions, but you're not supposed to ask leading questions and you have to certify that you haven't done so. And that's quite a challenge and people are, are trying to get to grips um, with that now. Now you can show doc documents to witnesses, but it says you definitely shouldn't be doing so if the witness hasn't seen that document before. And what's worse is you have to produce a list of all the documents that you have shown to a particular witness. Now you can understand the logic of that because that as a cross-examination technique, the advocate will say, you know, ask them about those materials. And it also is a good way of policing and stopping um, witnesses being given too much information that they shouldn't really have seen. But what do you do with a witness where they're your instructing client, where they're reading the pleadings and they're seeing what the other side have said and what documents have come out in disclosure? It's not so practical. And again, I think that's causing um, some, some tension. Um, you've got to take a very detailed note of, of the proofing session and potentially that might become disclosable. And uh, you've, um, you're not allowed to go through multiple drafts of the statement. So what you can't do is produce a draft. Uh, well, you can produce the draft as long as it accurately reflects what the witness said in that first meeting. Um, but you can't then suggest a substantial rewrite. You'd have to get the witness to talk you through what the changes are going to be. And I, I've got to say, I think these um, changes are really important because uh, it, not only was the process polluting the uh, truth of what a witness is actually going to say as demonstrated through cross-examination at trial, but it was creating this sort of monster of a witness statement that really wasn't very valuable to the judges. So, so that, that's the new world in England and Wales. It applies to all uh, commercial cases um, in, the, you know, in the commercial court, the Chancery Division, and it, will, um, it came into force in April this year. Uh, Ed, may I have one question to you? Uh, how can you check that the solicitors uh, really complied with this rules recommendation when they were interviewing witnesses? How do you know about it? Well, you don't, do you? I mean, uh, one of one of the um, potential changes that was considered was whether the other side's solicitor should be allowed to sit in on a proofing of a witness. Now, that filled most people with absolute horror, and it wasn't adopted. Um, but that would be a way of checking, of course, that it was done. I think, um, call me old fashioned, but we're relying on the honesty and integrity of the English legal system, which, of course, I would say is fantastic. And But in truth, yeah. if you as a solicitor are having to certify that you have um, done something in an appropriate way, your team will know if that's not right and you could get caught out. And that would be a very serious matter. So I think most people will take it seriously. Yeah, uh, you know, when you said that you rely on an honesty of English legal system, it reminded me of an old joke about a Russian pretty famous uh, um, persona, Vasily Ivanovich, who uh, came to London and, and came back uh, very rich. And when people ask him how he became very rich, he said, I played poker. Uh, and, and then, uh, you know, normally in Russia, when you play poker, then you disclose your cards. And he said in London, they didn't disclose card because they rely on honesty. And after that, you know, I, I was really successful playing poker. <laughs> so it's a tricky issue, you know, if, if, yeah, especially in international arbitration, if you apply this rule and you have from one side solicitors who are supposed to follow this honest rules and the other party are not an obligation, then you are not in equal position. Yeah. Actually, I also have a follow-up question for Ed. That was really fascinating to see. And um, I think you're getting uh, closer to what uh, Vladimir described before in the Prague rules and, and also our sort of continental European system. Uh, but what I understand is that many, um, uh, there are already now uh, some restrictions and there is a whole industry of services which which do the witness preparatory work in London. How do you deal with that? Yeah, um, again, there's some pretty strict rules that apply in terms of coaching witnesses. Um, but if it's out, but, but the question is, this is often outsourced to non-lawyers who are not bound by the strict bar rules. 
uh, would that be how would that, that be dealt with? So the American the, or potentially firms, American lawyers who are not bound but who have an obligation actually it's on the contrary they do have and that's my understanding they have an obligation to prepare the witness um, so how would you deal with that situation? Well that, that's absolutely right and in an international arbitration you're, you're not bound by those same professional rules so you if you're up against a US law firm they will take a very different approach to the preparation of their witnesses and, and that duty you you're almost negligent if you don't coach your witness, if you don't put the other side's case to them in rehearsal. The, the position about those other firms, the, the likes of sort of Bond, Solon, I um, can't remember the name of the other ones, apology, but, but, but they, the way they do it is that they don't prepare a witness by reference to the facts of the case. They will prepare, they may give a scenario that's completely different and cross-examine them. It's about the familiarization, it's not on the facts. Um, and generally, you know, if, if you did a sort of US style coaching session in, in, for, for high court proceedings, you'd be in trouble. Okay, well, thank you. That was really interesting. Now we move to um, our um, fourth uh, panelist, um, Chan Bao, um, who will uh, discuss some of the details and practices um, from her wide experience. Chan is an international arbitrator. Um, much sought after and member of the arbitration chambers with uh, extensive experience working in multiple jurisdictions in Singapore, Hong Kong, New York, uh, and London, just to name a few. Uh, Chan is vice chair of the IBA's International Arbitration Committee. She's also vice president of the ICC Court of Arbitration and chair of the ICC Commission Task Force on RDA are an arbitration and member of the ICC's Belt and Road Commission. Um, she also served as Secretary General of the HKIC and she speaks, uh, apart from English and Mandarin, also Russian, what I understand. Now, Chan, the floor is yours. All Russian. Uh, but please speak English because... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, and thank you for clarifying that. And like Ed, I'm sorry that I'm not with you today. Um, the point about speaking Russian, and I saw Vladimir um, glimpse of it, and I have to say, um, I took Russian for four years in grade school, and so that's ex ex my exposure to Russian. And so while I have a very fond um, connection with the culture and um, my teacher at the time in middle school, I have to say, uh, over the years, um, all I can say is stress with you. Um, and with that, um, what I wish to present to you today is in fact on language itself. Um, and indeed um, the impact that offering evidence in a different language has on the veracity of a witness. Now, what we've been talking about during the course of this session has been the truth and then what is the truth and how it's expressed and how it's dealt with in cross-examination, and then some of the practical um, reactions to how to get to the truth um, of a witness during a, an arbitration litigation. As truth seekers um, that are operating in a linguistic world different than our own, it can be daunting, certainly. Um, just the fact that we're operating in a language that is different than our own native language can bring great discomfort. And then in such instances, um, we rely then more on cues rather than the words themselves, such as the fluency of that individual or the tone of the speaker or the, their mannerisms. And this inherently detracts from the words themselves. But then again, when we look and focus on the words themselves, what they mean can lead to a very different question. And so all of these factors come into play when we're talking about the actual words that are being used and the delivery of such and what that means with bearing truth. Now this, this concept is actually quite fundamental and has been well recognized for centuries. In fact, Charlemagne has um, indicated, well has been quoted to say that to have a second language is to have a second soul, which is a strong statement for the fact that language crafts reality. And what this means is that finding the truth from someone who does not speak your own language is to try to see into that person's soul in a way that is completely foreign to what your 
um, what your understanding of the world and the way the world works is. And in fact, there have been many studies, one in particular um, conducted by Stanford researchers, re researchers that found that Spanish and Japanese speakers who did not remember who was to blame for accidental events um, as much as those who speak English do. And the reason for this is because of the structure of their language and how they are, how they um, memorize um, an event or an accidental event and how intentional that event was. So for example, in Spanish and um, Japanese, the agent of a causality is dropped in accidental events. So instead of John broke the vase, like an English speaker would say, Spanish speakers and Japanese speakers would say the vase broke or the vase was broken. So the person who caused it is no longer the primary subject of the communication. So how do we get to the bottom of the truth? And how do we as truth seekers get to the bottom of what is trying to be communicated by a witness? And as proceduralists in international arbitration, we have come up with the best tools that we have at dis our disposal. And in fact, Ed has, um, in, uh, has um, shared with us some excellent tools that the UK has um, developed over the years. And in fact, in international arbitration, we have as well. Um, for example, in the IBA rules, um, there are now, there is um, under Article 4 or 5C of the IBA rules, a witness statement shall include a statement as to the, the language in which the statement was originally prepared and the language in which this witness anticipates giving testimony at an evidentiary hearing. Now this declaration is something that at least draws the attention to the cross examiner or the other side, that there is this oath that's been taken that this person has done their homework or at least they, that this person has is attesting to the words on the document or in the witness statement. However, we know the reality of witness statements is not as Vladimir had mentioned, is not necessarily those actual words that have come out from the witness themselves mouth. Oftentimes it's prepared by the counsel. And of course, when you have a different language involved, not only do you have different a, pers a different person um, setting out those that language, but it's oftentimes through a translator or an interpreter. So the filtering process of getting to the truth is in fact something that um, has not been sufficiently, uh, as at least I argue, has not been sufficiently tested. Um, and certainly um, mo very recently, the English courts have um, recognized this. And in fact, in 2020, um, developed a, I think it was 2020, developed, or 20, um, developed practice direction number 32, which expressly deals with um, providing greater certainty in the manner in which witness statements given by individuals who speak a foreign language should be prepared or put before a court. Now, so they have added to the set of guidelines that one should think about when preparing witness statements or testimony and dealing with um, a, a, a witness um, using a different language. Um, and so there have been several cases that have um, also dealt with this issue that have all culminated now in this practice direction number 32. On top of this, now we also have technology, of course. And um, indeed with the increasing use of video conferencing for hearings, how does this compound the issue that you might deal with when dealing with a witness speaking in a different language? And again, the UK courts have um, dealt with a case um, during the pre-pandemic. Um, and this case, in this case, the court set aside an award of 68 million US dollars in damages, observing that the tribunal had not appropriately at least assessed the credibility of one of the key witnesses. And that witness did not speak English and gave evidence by an unreliable video link, which may have led the tribunal to, to its conclusion as to the witness's credibility. 
And so this case highlights that where video technology is used, then this is then we have to be particularly careful as to how witnesses of using a different language um, are are addressed and dealt with. Now I know I've run out of time, so I'll I'll leave this um, at that. But I'm happy to share other thoughts and practical tips if there is time that remains. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, John, and also thank you very much uh, to uh, all the three speakers, uh, excluding myself, who've been uh, keeping so much <laughs> watching on the on the time. And we have actually we caught up uh, some of the time. We have, I think, the next session um, is supposed to start at three uh, in fifteen minutes, and there is a short break also planned. So. Um, I would like to take a few minutes, which we've left as an opportunity to uh, get some questions. I see a hand raise over there in the audience. Can we get a microphone uh, over there, please? Back of your sure. hand. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I have a question to add. So we mentioned that there are different rules and clashes of cultures when preparing witnesses. What happens when US lawyers based in London prepare witnesses in arbitration? I can't hear you. They don't do so well because they don't remember to turn their microphone on like us English lawyers. They, um, uh, they can pretty much, if they're not appearing before an English court, but they are appearing in an international arbitration, they, they can do what they like as far as um, preparing witnesses. So this is a real problem and a potential disadvantage. You know, there are real constraints on us as English lawyers before an English court on what we can do. So um, any further questions? This is a solid question. You know, your tone of your question, is there any further questions? <laughs> <That's leading. laughs> it's prohibited. I think it's time for break. Thank you very much. Well, um, then I take that opportunity to thank the uh, panelists for this great panel. I think it was um, very, very um, educative, informative. And um, I also thank the audience. It's great to see so many of you come here and um, wish you enjoyable tea break and uh, look forward to our break discussions. Thank you very much. Right, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's time for us to start uh, this session. My name is Rupert de Cruz and I've got the honor and pleasure of moderating um, this session on Raise Judicata and Issue Estoppel in CIS disputes. We um, have got a lot to cover in a limited amount of time. So let me just proceed immediately to some quick introductions. On the screen, you will see, uh, unfortunately, she's not able to join us in, in person, but uh, the first of our panelists is Lawrence Ponty. Lawrence is a, a counsel at Archipel, which is a boutique international law firm, offices in Geneva and Paris. Laurence herself is qualified in France and in England and registered to practice in Geneva. She has, she has over 10 years of experience representing private and state owned entities in the CIS in a range of, of sectors and has uh, experience in cross-border litigation and enforcement of proceedings and regularly sits as an arbitrator. Then uh, starting from my um, right and moving left, our next panelist is Bakit Tukulov. Bakit is the uh, founding partner of Tukulov and Kasilgov litigation, uh, a firm based in Almaty. And uh, Bakit, as the uh, name of his firm indicates, is a dispute resolution specialist. Um, prior to setting up his firm, he worked for uh, Kazakhstan's largest uh, law firm, Grata, and then prior to that for Salons and now Dentons in Kazakhstan. Bakit is recommended in all of the main directories uh, as a, an expert in, a leading expert in dispute resolution, arbitration and litigation. 
He's been involved in a large number of high profile cases in Kazakhstan and has significant experience in particular acting as arbitrator and also as an expert in foreign proceedings conducted in amongst other jurisdictions, England, Cyprus, Germany, and Russia. Next to Prakit and next to me is Glenn Hendricks. Now I'm sure Glenn doesn't need any introduction, but just let me say a few words about him. Um, you will know him, we all know him as the driving force and the inspiration behind this conference and its 12 predecessors. And it's no exaggeration to say that this conference and um, those predecessors would not have taken place without Glenn's drive and leadership. Uh, as far as his professional experience is concerned, he served as counsel and arbitrator in numerous international arbitrations. He's also experienced in litigation and ancillary to such proceedings, including actions for emergency relief proceedings to enforce arbitral agreements and awards. Glenn is consistently recognized each year by Chambers Global Arbitration Review, who's who, and best lawyers in uh, America. Next to me on my left is Kirill Trukhanov, founding partner at the Moscow-based law firm of Trubor. Kirill has extensive experience of representing major Russian and foreign clients in Russian commercial courts and before international arbitral tribunals. He has won precedent-setting cases in, the fee in fields of financial markets, antitrust and energy disputes, and holds master's degrees in private law from the Russian School of Private Law and has an LLM um, and in inter international dispute resolution from Queen Mary University in London. And then uh, finally, Lionel Nichols. Lionel is a partner at the London law firm of Candy and a dual qualified English barrister and Australian solicitor specializing in international arbitration and commercial litigation and public international law with 14 years of experience acting for individuals, corporations and states, particularly Russian and CIS parties. He is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and holds two master's degrees and a PhD from the University of Oxford. So those are the introductions. Um, I, would, uh, I would actually urge you to look uh, in more detail at the profile of each of our panelists because their experience is, is um, truly impressive and you'll find them in the conference brochure. But onto our discussion itself, thanks for the, putting up the slide. Um, as you know, it, it's about raised judicata and issue estoppel in CIS disputes, and this, this point can come up in a variety of contexts, but um, in, in traditionally in the past, it, one has experienced it in guerrilla tactics where you have a, a, a proceeding commenced outside of Russia, and then perhaps one of the parties commences a, a Russian court proceedings to interfere uh, with the foreign proceedings. But we're going to look at it in a slightly different context. We've put together a case scenario which we hope will bring out some of the nuances of this topic. And we would uh, urge you to become involved in the uh, um, discussion during the course of the session. So let me take you through the, uh, the fact pattern that we've come up with. Uh, this hypothetical case involves Prosperity Bank, a lender, and OJSC Matrushka. Matrushka is a Russian company. It's a wheat producer, and it has operations all across the CIS. Its operations in Kazakhstan are run through its subsidiary there, a Blyasko LLC. Prosperity and Matrushka enter into a loan agreement. Prosperity lends 30 million US dollars to Matrushka to develop its operations in Kazakhstan. Alongside that, Abliasko and Prosperity enter into a pledge agreement by which Abliasko pledges its agricultural lands in Kazakhstan as security for the loan. The loan agreement contains various covenants, which if breached would entitle Prosperity to accelerated repayment of the loan. And one of those covenants is a requirement that the agricultural lands that are subject to the pledge maintain a minimum level of fertility for the duration of the loan period to avoid uh, confiscation by state authorities. The loan agreement contains um, a dispute resolution clause requiring disputes to be sent to, alternatively, LCIA, Swiss arbitration, or uh, American arbitration, AAA. The pledge agreement contains a different dispute resolution clause requiring related disputes to be sent either to, sorry, um, uh, alternatively to the Moscow or Astana courts. 
Now, let's get the clicker out. Yeah. Prosperity Surveyor undertakes a survey of the agricultural lands and finds that the fertility level has dropped below the covenant limit. As a result of that, Prosperity uh, commences arbitration proceedings seeking accelerated repayment of the loan. And at the same time, starts proceedings in alternatively Moscow or, or Almaty seeking enforcement of the pledge. The, for present purposes, the dispute before the Almaty or, or uh, Moscow courts um, reaches a hearing first. And the court finds that there has been no breach of the fertility covenant, if I could call it that. And its finding in the court proceedings is based on a, on a report obtained by a state surveyor. But in those court proceedings, Prosperity uh, wishes to challenge the finding of the state surveyor, arguing that um, outdated technology was used for his report and wants to admit in evidence the report of its own surveyor, but the court um, does not allow that in evidence. Matrushka then wishes to rely on the covenant finding in the court proceedings within the arbitral proceedings as conclusive evidence that there was no breach of covenant and therefore that prosperity is not entitled in the arbitration to accelerate it, to an award for accelerated repayment of the loan. That is our fact pattern. And this is really a slide which summarizes uh, who the parties are and um, the agreements that we're going to be discussing. So let's cut to the chase. First question, and getting to the heart of the issue, does the covenant finding in the Moscow or Almaty court proceedings create a raised judicata or issue estoppel in the arbitral proceedings. Let's start by imagining that the arbitration is taking place in the LCIA. Um, Lionel, what's the answer? <laughs> Thanks, Rupert. Um, so I think the way that uh, an English uh, tribunal uh, applying English law in an LCIA city in London would, would look at this is to work out what's being asked here. Is it a, an issue of uh, issue estoppel or res judicata? Because the two obviously have a lot of similarities, uh, but there are some important distinctions between the two. So what we have here is the covenant finding in either the, the Russian or Kazakh court. Um, would that create a res judicata or alternatively an issue of stopple. Uh, and the difference between the two under English law um, depends upon essentially whether it's a dispositive finding which has been made by the court in question. Uh, if it is, and, and it, it's deciding a cause of action that has been pursued in the court, then that potentially raises a res judicata. If alternatively, what the court has decided is a stepping stone or a building block towards its ultimate decision, and as part of that stepping stone or building block makes a determination of fact or of law, um, then because that's not dispositive of the cause of action, that cannot give rise to a, a res judicata and would instead give rise to a um, potentially an issue or stopple. But of course, the elements need to be present for either an issue or stopple or a res judicata. They'll be familiar to, to many in the room, but just by way of reminder, um, there needs to be a, a decision of a court of competent jurisdiction. We have that here. Um, that decision needs to be concluding and, and finally dispositive of, of the issue. Again, we have that. Um, the issue needs to be um, the same as that which is raised in the arbitration. Again, our fact pattern ticks that box. Uh, and the fourth requirement is that the parties be the same. Um, that raises issues that we'll come to later on in this panel discussion. Yes, we'll, we'll come to the, uh, the point about the parties in, in just a moment, but um, let's now uh, switch the hypothetical. Let's assume that this arbitration is not taking place in the LCIA, it's taking place in Switzerland. Can we have Lawrence up on, on the screen, please? 
Thanks, Rupert. Can you hear me well? Yes, yes, we can. You're coming through loud and clear. Lawrence, um, would the covenant finding in the court proceedings have an effect in Swiss arbitration, either as a raised judicata or issue a stop? Well, thank you. Thank you, Rupert. Um, just uh, as a preliminary remark, uh, what would be a prerequisite here would be um, to, to determine whether the decision uh, issued by the Russian or the Kazakh courts um, is entitled to uh, recognition in Switzerland. Uh, then um, we will need to examine which is the, you know, the law applicable to the determination of res judicata. And um, here, in short, uh, according to uh, the Swiss court's case law, um, res judicata effect is granted to a foreign uh, court decision. Um, um, I, I mean, the, 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 the res judicata effect granted to a foreign court decision um, can, is the same as uh, that which would be granted to a decision rendered by uh, the, the, um, the Swiss courts. Now, um, there is no such thing in Switzerland as issue estoppel. So the question would be whether there is um, a res judicata effect or not applying to the decision. And uh, the Swiss concept of res judicata is quite restrictive. Um, it is uh, also limited to the operative part uh, of a decision, and it does not apply to its reasons, um, even though the reasons um, uh, are necessary to construe the dispositive part, right? Um, and, and as it was specified actually very recently by the Swiss courts in June of this year, uh, again, the Swiss concept of res judicata does not include uh, the broader concept of um, issue estoppel. Now, I have to say there are little nuances um, to the limitation of the res judicata effect to the dispositive part of a previous um, um, decision. So, first of all, um, the, the Swiss Supreme Court um, considers that an arbitral tribunal would violate um, procedural public policy um, if it departs from an opinion expressed um, in an arbitration award previously rendered in the same arbitration, including the arbitral tribunal's um, uh, discussion and decision on the interpretation of um, contractual instruments. And this, even those the opinion um, is mentioned uh, is, is not mentioned. Sorry, in the dispositive parts uh, of the award. Um, in the present example, um, this would not uh, apply. However, because we are talking about two separate proceedings um, before said courts and uh, before an arbitral tribunal, and not about a single arbitration proceedings uh, where several. Uh, rulings where where it should right, so so to sum up, um, res judicata within its Swiss meaning again would not apply to the covenant uh, uh, finding if such finding is merely um, made in the reasoning uh, of the foreign decision. However, if the dispositive part of the decision includes um, a declaration that the covenant was breached, then res judicata would apply. Uh, to this declaration, but provided that all the conditions are for, for res judicata are met. And um, if I have just one minute, um, I would also like to mention a second nuances um, in, in Swiss case law, um, which was uh, actually discussed uh, in, in the recent decision I've just uh, mentioned. Um, in that case, you know, the, the Swiss Supreme Court uh, found that the parties to the arbitration had recognized the res judicata effects of the previous decision rendered by the state courts. And um, it's true that it was in a quite specific context, but 
on the basis of such agreement uh, reached by the parties, the, the Swiss Supreme Court um, concluded that, you know, while incorporating um, uh, without discussing the state court's finding in its award, the arbitral tribunal did not um, uh, violate procedural public policy. Uh, so you, here you can see that despite a quite restrictive, uh, restrictive uh, approach as regards res judicata by the Swiss courts, they nonetheless try to adopt a quite practical approach um, and to avoid tactics uh, which could undermine the arbitration proceedings. Uh, so to come back to our example, assuming that the parties to the arbitration had agreed at some point that they would be bound by the findings of the Russian or Kazakh courts, such agreement would likely grant res judicata effect to those uh, courts' decision, again, from the perspective of um, an arbitral tribunal seated in Switzerland. Okay, thank you, um, Laurence. I mean, in, it, it sounds from your answer that at least strategically, it would be uh, important to try and get a declaration as part of the de depositive, dispositive part, um, uh, section of, of, of a judgment in a, in a Moscow or uh, Almaty court proceedings. But which brings me back here, if I could turn to you. In, in practice, would a uh, a Kazakh court be willing to grant that sort of declaration or would they go straight to uh, and, and restrict their finding to a question of whether the pledge is enforceable? Thank you, Rupert. Uh, well, under Kazakh law, uh, you cannot seek relief, which is not specifically stated in the, in the law. You just check that you're... Sorry. Just check. Sorry. Okay. Does it, does it work? Okay. Uh, under Kazakh law, you cannot seek relief, which is not stated in the law. In, in this case, I'm not aware of this type of relief when you can seek declaration of the sort. So I don't believe that a Kazakh court would grant this kind of relief. So it would work. Interesting. Would the Russian courts adopt a similarly restrictive approach? Not exactly. As far as the Russian court is concerned, uh, it is highly unusual for a client to seek a declaratory relief in such a scenario, but Russian procedural law and substantive law allows this. And uh, in light of what uh, Lauren says, well, it can be and must be done. Yes. Um, Lionel mentioned when he was when he was summarizing the, the the principles that apply to issue estoppel that one of them is that the parties ordinarily at least should be the same in the two sets of proceedings but here we see that in the arbitral proceedings those are between Matrushka and Prosperity Bank and in the court proceedings they uh, uh, those proceedings are between Abliasko and Prosperity Bank just as a matter of concept, in, under, under Russian law, Kirill, is, could that amount to an issue of estoppel if you've got different, different parties in, in this way, although closely linked? Well, the Russian law is simple. It says the same parties, full stop. So no issue of previous is uh, involved. So no, no chance of issue of estoppel? Yes. Yeah. Lionel, uh, English law, would, would it be possible to argue that there should be an estoppel here, even though the, the parties are different? Yes, absolutely possible. So different from Russian law in that regard. Um, English law recognizes the concept of privies. So a privy is someone who has a, a legal or beneficial interest in the outcome of a proceeding. So um, the default position under English law is the same as under Russian law and that they must be the same parties and there's authority to the effect that it would be a highly unusual or exceptional circumstance where they are not the same party, um, but an issue of estoppel could still arise. Um, but, but English law does allow for that possibility. Um, and the, the, the English courts or an English tribunal would, would engage in a, a broad merits-based judgment um, without adopting any formalistic uh, rules to determine whether the two parties in question are effectively privies and, and, and therefore um, an issue of stop shall arise. Thank you. Now, Glenn, I think from a US point of view, it's different again, isn't it? Yeah, I think if you move down the spectrum with the most restrictive uh, from Kirill in Russia, you know, same parties, period, short answer, and then to Lionel in the UK, where if you're a privity, uh, but in the US, uh, I think we have a the same rule, but a broader notion of what a privity would be. And, and I just, if, 
just take a minute. I want to back up a second and actually kind of tie this discussion to the one we had in the uh, prior uh, session to tell the truth, which I thought was really excellent. And some of the differences between civil law as might be, uh, you know, we heard from Laurent in uh, Switzerland and a common law jurisdiction like the US uh, and this notion of race judicata versus issue estoppel. And as Lionel put it, issue estoppel allows you to give effect not only to the operative um, conclusions, the legal consequences of the judgment, but also the reasoning or the building blocks that were necessary, the fact finding or legal conclusions that led up to that judgment. And uh, I'm gonna read just a very short quote from Stavros Brekalakis, who makes the point that in a common law jurisdiction in the US in particular, there's sort of a notion of the court engaging in fact finding and making factual determinations. And he says that um, civil law countries and this is overgeneralizing to some extent, subscribe to the view that a judicial determination is fallible by nature, and in that sense can only determine the legal consequences of what seems to have happened, rather than determine what actually happened. And I think we have a somewhat naive belief in the United States because we have faith in cross-examination as this great tool to reach the truth, and our vast discovery powers and just depositions and getting all the emails and everything else that the court is actually going to make a determination of what actually happened. And therefore we have a very broad view of issue estoppel and we take a fairly flexible, relatively speaking, we follow the rule that it has to be the same parties, but the same parties defined as in if one of the parties to the proceeding could have been expected to represent the interest fairly of another party, and in this case, you've got a parent and subsidiary, and you would think that the subsidiary would be looking out for the interests of the parent in the proceeding, uh, that we would recognize issue estoppel, uh, even if it's not in the operative part of the judgment, against, uh, and, and use it either offensively or defensively. Thank you, um, and, and thanks for that broader analysis, which I think puts the whole discussion into, into much better context. I'm just gonna pause here to find out if there are any immediate questions that anyone in the audience has arising from what we've touched upon so far. Ilya. Um, yes, uh, just a quick question. We, uh, I hope I'm allowed to- You are. Uh, yeah. Uh, we speak of a foreign judgment. Uh, how much uh, notion of foreign for recognition of foreign judgments in Switzerland and so on and so forth. How important is this uh, reciprocity or treaty regime for just giving effect to foreign judgment in the context we are discussing? Yeah. Um, so Lionel, I don't know if you want to touch upon the uh, broad English approach to recognizing foreign judgments, just very briefly. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so um, as a matter of English law, um, there, there's not a, a, a formalism um, or distinction between recognizing foreign judgments and recognizing foreign awards. Um, it would be effectively the, the same um, procedure. Um, and so it would just be recognized. So it doesn't have to be any, there's no magic in the word foreign, um, as long as it is another arbitral tribunal or another court which has decided the issue then it potentially gives rise to a, a, an issue estoppel or a res judicata yeah. and i think that just the point to, to add to that it, it doesn't matter that the uh, the jurisdiction in question is not the subject of a bilateral enforcement treaty with the uk the uk will enforce um uh, judgments from any jurisdiction whether or not that jurisdiction is signed up to a bilateral enforcement treaty. The procedure may be slightly different. The only uh, points are that um, they meet uh, the, you know, the usual criteria of being fi final and um, not subject to an appeal and, and, and so forth. Did you want to say something, Kirill, about the willingness of the Russian courts to enforce foreign judgments? Slightly different, but recognize. 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 Yes. 
uh, well, uh, Russian courts do recognize foreign judgments, at least they used to recognize uh, English court judgments until recently. We had a number of cases uh, in our portfolio, but since I think the last couple of years, uh, the Moscow uh, city court has issued so far, uh, has tried at least two or three cases when it declined uh, an application for recognition of the English court judgment on a simple basis that there is no treaty, mm -hmm. full stop. And, and Lawrence, do you want to say something from the Swiss perspective? How, um, how liberal are, are the Swiss courts in recognizing foreign judgments? Does there have to be a treaty in place? Uh, sure. Well, in, in the context of um, <clears throat> recognizing uh, Kazakh or Russian uh, decisions, for example, that the issue would be uh, regulated direct by the Swiss Private International Law Act. Um, in other scenarios, um, you may have a bilateral treaty um, applying like the Lugano Convention. Um, but in the context of our case, that would be, yes, the Swiss Private International Law Act and, of course, a few uh, criteria um, have, to, have to be met, um, jurisdiction, um, no violation of uh, public policy, etc. But I understand we, we may discuss this um, further in, in, the, in our session. Thanks. Glenn, do you want to say something from the US perspective? Yeah, and I, I think, Ilya, you, you hit a really important point. So he, let's say that the arbitration was occurring in the United States and you have a Kazakh court judgment um, with findings that, and so in that situation, we would look to our regi foreign judgment regime, enforcement regime, which is very similar to what I just heard about England. The United States does not have a treaty with a single country in the entire world for the enforcement of our judgments or reciprocal enforcement, not with Canada, not with England, nobody. But we have a very liberal open regime for enforcing foreign judgments or recognizing foreign judgment, that's an important distinction. And it's the same sort of uh, issues, you know, was there due process, was there jurisdiction, um, that sort of thing. I think the, the really interesting thing here, which it would, there's a, there's a real dispute uh, in US courts is in looking at the race judicata or issue estoppel effect of a Kazakh judgment, would you look at the law of Kazakhstan or would you look at the US law? So I just told you we have this very broad view of issue estoppel, but there would be an argument um, for the party that wants to resist recognition of the Kazakh judgment saying, well, listen, in Kazakhstan would not give effect to issue estoppel? And why should a US court give more effect or broader effect to a Kazakh judgment than a Kazakh court would? <laughs> and so how that would shake out, honestly, um, you've got authority going both ways and it would come down to a choice of law. When you're looking at the preclusive effect of the judgment, do you look at the law of the enforcement forum, in this case, the United States or the law where the judgment was rendered, Kazakhstan. And you'd come up with two different answers depending on that answer Perfect. to that question. Perfect. just a quick note. That, that's been a good question. Um, uh, well, the idea is the one who first recognizes it then can refer to that judgment. But the question is, you might not be in position to recognize a foreign judgment uh, in a situation where there is no jurisdiction of the Russian court or Kazakh court over that foreign party, for example. So in that case, you might be in trouble. Yes, I mean, this comes back to uh, one of the boxes that, that Lionel identifies, at least under English law, that needs to be ticked, which is that a court whose judgment you're seeking to enforce has got to be one with competent jurisdiction. Um, and I think I'm right, um, uh, Lionel, that the, 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 the concept of competent jurisdiction under English law will be judged by English law principles. So I, I don't know how it would apply in, in other situations, but... Um, uh, we'll see how that might play out in a slightly different context in a, in a moment. Um, I'm just going to skip to, for the panel's purposes, I'm going to skip to question four, just because of time. We might come back to question three. But the next question is, you might recall that the case in the case scenario, Prosperity, the bank, in the court proceedings, wanted to adduce 
evidence of its own surveyor that the fertility of the agricultural lands had fallen below the covenant level and, and wasn't allowed to do so by the local courts. Is that something which prosperity can use in the arbitral proceedings as an argument to say, no, tribunal, you shouldn't in this situation treat the finding of the Kazakh or, or Moscow, uh, the Amati or Moscow court as an issue of stopple because I didn't get a fair chance to present my case in those proceedings. Lawrence, why don't you just deal with it from a Swiss perspective to begin with, if you don't mind. Um, so, so here, um, it would be for prosperity to show that uh, the covenant finding uh, cannot be recognized in Switzerland because it, it was issued um, in, in violation of uh, its right to be heard. Um, so as I've just said, um, in our scenario, uh, the, the, the question of uh, recognition would be um, directly regulated by the Swiss Private International Law Act. Um, and, you know, according to, to this act, a foreign judgment uh, would be recognized in Switzerland uh, if, as we said, the, the foreign state courts had jurisdiction to render the decision if the decision is final um, and or enforceable in the foreign state. And uh, of course, if there is no ground for denial um, and those grounds for denial are specifically uh, provided for by Article 25 of the Swiss Private International Law Act. And it includes um, different scenarios like um, incompatibility with the Swiss uh, public policy, uh, or the objecting party not being properly notified and uh, the violation of fundamental principles of procedural law, such as uh, the right to be heard, which would be um, our uh, hypothesis here. Okay. Um, Glenn, let, let's assume this, was a, this is an AAA arbitration. Uh, what do you think prosperity's chances are of persuading a tribunal to ignore the issue of stopple on due process grounds or the covenant finding on due process grounds? Generally, the analysis would be the one that we, we spoke of earlier, which is just applying the uh, US law on the recognition of foreign judgments. And so there are a list of criteria and one of them is, was there due process in the uh, proceedings that resulted in the judgment for which recognition is sought? And so here, the fact that uh, one party was not allowed to put on a witness, um, that would be a good argument, I think, that uh, due process was not respected. I, it's not an automatic, what we would call slam dunk, automatic win. But um, as you put it in your English vernacular, it would be worth having a go <laughs> um, and, 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 and making that argument. You know, how it would turn out, I'm not so sure, but it would a lot depend on, you know, what was the justification. Um, I will say that the, in looking at due process, the U.S. court will not get bogged down in the fact that the foreign court procedure is different than the U.S. court procedure. So the fact that there's no discovery, for example, um, you know, that it's a civil law, prog rules kind of, uh, you know, inquisitorial procedure would not matter. But if the party is actually deprived of the opportunity to present its case, which would be the argument here because they were not allowed to put up an expert, um, it would be at least a colorable argument. Okay. Lionel, um, would the English approach be any different? And if so, how? I think broadly similar, but perhaps one or two differences under English law. I think going back to Glenn's point earlier, I suspect an, an English tribunal would start as, as the default being all of the boxes for issue or stopple are ticked and therefore prima facie an issue or stopple is created and it goes back to Glenn's point about how the the presumption under common law jurisdictions is um is is that uh if a, a an issue has reached finality in any court or tribunal that's it it's finally determined so I think that would be the starting point under English law um as, as Glenn said, I think you'd have a go if you were the party and you'd run this argument. 
Um, but I suspect what the English Tribunal would be interested to hear would be what is the procedure under the, the local law? So under Russian law or under Kazakh law, is it customary that there would be expert evidence allowed on this point? Um, if it would ordinarily be the case that expert evidence should be allowed, but it was not in this case, then potentially the English tribunal would find there is no issue or stopple. But if the default position under the local law is that there should not be expert evidence, then I think the English tribunal would, would probably have no difficulty in holding that an issue or stopple exists. So I'm going to pause again to see if there are any um, observations or questions from the audience on, on the due process side of things. And if not, I'll move on to the next question we have, which is, let's suppose the tribunal uh, accedes to the, to the compelling arguments of Lionel and, and, and Glenn as co-counsel and for, for prosperity, ignores the issue of stopple, for, sorry, the covenant finding in the court proceedings. Um, Kirill, is there then going to be an enforcement problem in Russia if the tribunal ignores a finding of the Russian court on the fertility issue and the award has to be enforced in Russia? Well, I think it really depends on what the tribunal does next. If the tribunal ignores the finding of the Russian court and then itself arrives at the same conclusion, then basically I see no problem. Uh, the award will be enforced in Russia. But if it ignores the finding and then makes the opposite finding, then uh, when you come uh, with an application for enforcement, you face the problem because the Russian judge will see that, well, there is a final Russian court judgment which uh, says A, and there is an, an award which says uh, the opposite, and there is an application to enforce it. And most likely, uh, the enforcement will be declined on the basis that shall be no uh, uh, contrary uh, awards or judgments in one jurisdiction. You cannot have two judgments which say the opposite thing because basically it, it, it breaches the uh, basic uh, principles of uh, court system. Okay, but the, let's just bear in mind that the court proceedings is about enforcement of the pledge. Yes. Arbitral proceedings is about accelerated payment under the loan. Let's suppose the the Russian courts find that um, there has been no breach of the pledge, so, uh, so it doesn't the, enforce the pledge agreement. It doesn't enforce the pledge, yes. It, 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 um, but prosperity comes to Russia with an award, yes. not about the pledge, yes, but about accelerated repayment. Yes, but I would say it's the same because uh, but basically uh, the, the issue is the same the trigger uh, is the same in both agreements. What triggers accelerated payment triggers enforcement of the pledge. So it's a trigger point. It's the fact that yes. there's a commonality of the trigger point yes. rather than commonality of the final decision. Yes, although in practical terms, since it is uh, different parties and uh, uh, there is no concept of previous, there is, well, a good chance if you are persuasive in the court, <laughs> To, to, to enforce their word. And Baki, from a, from a Kazakh point of view, would, it, would well, there be a problem in enforcing in well, Kazakhstan? We would probably have a broadly similar approach, but maybe things would be a lot more complicated um, in the sense that there's virtually no practice uh, to refer to. And uh, if we step back a little, uh, our notion of issue estoppel is uh, broader than uh, uh, as, as compared to a Russian notion. So, uh, and the findings would be a bit different. Okay, let, let's just change the scenario a little bit. Up until now, we've been working on the basis that the pledge agreement contained a different dispute resolution clause, a court um, jurisdiction agreement. But let's imagine that in fact it, say it contains the same arbitration clause as the loan agreement. So there is an obligation therefore, contractual obligation to bring any pledge related disputes in the same arbitral proceedings as the loan agreement. Then let's suppose that Bliasco doesn't fancy its chances in the arbitration, thinks it's got a better chance in, uh, in its home court or in the Russian courts, takes 
court proceedings, ignores the arbitral proceedings, takes court proceedings for a declaration that there is no breach of covenant. Declaration that the fertility level has not dropped below the covenant level. And he gets that declaration. Should the tribunal then treat that finding as an issue of estoppel? Lawrence. Lawrence first. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, fr from a, a Swiss law perspective, um, this again uh, raises a, a recognition issue. So uh, the arbitral tribunal should first verify whether the um, decision issued by the Russian or the Kazakh courts um, can be recognized in Switzerland. And here we um, are in a situation where the arbitration clause um, covers the issues relating to the pledge and presumably um, a, a plea of lack of jurisdiction uh, was made by uh, the opposing side, uh, so in our case, uh, prosperity, before the Russian or the Kazakh courts. Um, in this scenario, um, according to the case law of the Swiss Supreme Court, the um, examination of the, the jurisdiction, sorry, of the Russian or the Kazakh courts um, should be made again person to uh, the Swiss Private International Law Act. And um, as said before, this act provides that um, foreign state court judgments um, may be recognized in Switzerland uh, if the foreign state courts um, had jurisdiction. And again, according to the Swiss Supreme Court, um, in the presence of an arbitration clause, the jurisdiction of the foreign state courts should um, in principle be made um, uh, on the basis of the New York Convention and in particular Article uh, 2, uh, Paragraph 3, uh, which deals with the recognition of um, arbitration agreements. Um, so in our case, if the Russian or the Kazakh courts accept to hear um, Abiasco's request, um, despite the existence of the arbitration clause uh, in the pledge, such courts um, will actually be regarding, re regarded sorry, as lacking jurisdiction uh, within the meaning of the Swiss Private International Law Act and their decision uh, will not be um, entitled to recognition in Switzerland. There are a few nuances in the reasoning which the Swiss Supreme Court would apply, but that may be bit too much detail at, at this stage. Okay, thank you, Lawrence. Uh, Glenn, coming back to you, how would the uh, US tribunal treat this declaratory finding of the of the Moscow or Almaty court? Uh, it, yeah, in, in a word, it bet the same. <laughs> they would uh, they would look at it from a jurisdictional perspective and say, well, there's an arbitration clause here. And assuming there was no waiver, you know, that they actually objected, asserted the existence of the arbitration clause, didn't waive the right to arbitrate, then the arbitration tribunal would likely proceed regardless of whatever happened in the uh, foreign court, wherever the foreign court was. Or... And Lionel, from an English perspective. Uh, again, broadly speaking, the same. I think you'd be hard pressed, even an advocate uh, with, with, with Glenn's exceptional advocacy skills would be hard pressed to persuade an English tribunal uh, to give um, initial estoppel effect to a judgment which was attained in breach of an arbitration agreement. Um, in, in England, there is um, section 32 of the Civil Jurisdiction and Judgments Act, uh, which isn't directly on point, but is potentially relevant. Um, that provides that a foreign judgment um, shall not be recognized by an English court if it's obtained in breach of an arbitration agreement. I suspect a tribunal would say that should apply equally to arbitral proceedings as well. Yep, I, I agree. Again, any questions from the audience? Well, you know, I think uh, uh, linking what we discussed now to uh, the questions from Ilya, as I understand, 
uh, in order for an English tribunal, for, for a London based tribunal, say tribunal, to apply issue estoppel, uh, it, it is not necessary, it's not a prerequisite that the Russian court judgment is previously uh, uh, recognized in a separate set of proceedings, right? So that, that, that is an important uh, point. It, it, it's not like you simply take what the Russian court has attained as an issue of Stopol and apply it full stop. And in the Russian context, it would be slightly different. You would have to first enforce the arbitral award or the foreign court judgment for it to become binding in our jurisdiction in order to rely on it potentially as a kind of uh, judgment uh, which uh, ascertains certain facts which you can, cannot rebut in the other set of proceedings in Russia. Okay. You know, um, I just w wanted to, um, sorry, slightly tw tweak the situation, just ask, uh, I, I had recently a case where, uh, and, and sorry about that, we didn't discuss this during our previous meetings. Um, uh, I had a situation when I was asked by a, uh, by, by a client uh, for the purpose of Southern District Court of New York uh, litigation to try to obtain a provision in the court ruling of a Kazakh court uh, uh, and estab establishing some facts, for example, some findings. Uh, would it change your analysis, for example, uh, if, if it's not a final judgment, but if it's a pr procedural ruling, like interim relief order or something, which is not fin uh, final, would, would the uh, dynamics change? Well, it would change the station in the sense that uh, you can only enforce in Russia final judgments of the merits. You cannot enforce uh, interim procedural rulings. They have no effect. And I, I, I believe the approach would be the same in England and in the US. Generally speaking, that's right. It's usually a final judgment. Um, there may be, it might have some evidentiary value. You might be given some weight, but it would not be binding in any way. Okay. Um, I think we have one last question, which just got time to deal with, I think. Let, let's assume that the court judgment in, in Moscow or Almaty was, was not obtained in breach of any um, dispute resolution agreement, but it's under appeal. Does that make a difference in the arbitration to its status as, as an issue, a stopple? Um, Lionel, do you wanna give this a go? Yeah, so I think that that potentially does change the position because um, running through the, the checklist of issues, we, we, there needed to be finality. Um, and of course, there's always a prospect that if it goes to appeal, that the, the decision gets reversed. So arguably, there's no finality. So arguably, no issue or stopple or res judicata. Lawrence, Swiss perspective? Yes, that would pretty much be the same uh, position before the Swiss courts, an, an issue with the finality, the final nature of the decision. Glenn, US, same. And I mean, but perhaps, Carol, you just want to um, educate us about the, first of all, the status of uh, a Russian court decision when first made, and when it then has uh, effect and legal force? Well, it's, it's quite straightforward. Uh, the Russian court becomes final and, and binding uh, after the appeal stage, uh, or if the appeal is not filed with respect to uh, judgments like when 30 days uh, period elapses, so it's final and binding. It is subject to ordinarily further appeals as of right, but uh, unlike in, in the English court system, for example, but it does not in itself affect the first conclusion that it's final and binding. And in Kazakhstan? Well, the approach is broadly similar, but I think one should take, an in, uh, take into account the difference um, in terms of the threshold you need to pass in England to make an appeal, as opposed to the appeal which you can file in the CIS. I mean, you can simply file it and the, the court will take it. So, um, but you might be in a situation where, for example, the appeal period, for example, for cassation is six months in our country. So, but what if then the cassation court cancels whatever the finding you've made, and then, then what the situation would be? I mean, there's no reconsideration procedure for the purpose of arbitration. That's another tweak. Yeah, and, and let's assume that, that um, one of the parties to the arbitral proceedings is really, um, have, has their heart set on relying on the conclusion of the 
the court, whether it's Moscow or Almaty, but it's it's not yet, um, it, it, it's the subject of an appeal. Strategically, what about asking the tribunal to adjourn if the process is quick, the appeal process is quick? What, what do you think about that as, a, as an argument? You think the tribunal might buy that? Yeah, I think an English tribunal might be open to that suggestion. Um, otherwise, there's a real risk of inconsistent judgments and uh, potentially challenge of the award as well. So I think the safe option for the tribunal would be a stay of proceedings pending the result in the um, appeal, assuming that it's not going to take years and years, of course. Glenn, would you fancy your chances with that argument? Yeah. Lawrence? Yes, that would be exactly the same position. Uh, there would be no obligation for the tribunal to uh, suspend uh, the proceedings, uh, but if there are insurances that the, the decision will be rendered uh, quickly, then I, I think an arbitral tribunal seated in Switzerland will definitely consider this. Okay, thank you. I think we, we've almost exhausted our, our time, but um, I'm going to give the audience again one last chance to, to raise any questions. Yes, sir. Thank you. If uh, a criminal procedure during this period uh, was opened against that uh, state's survivor who was uh, taking bribes for issuing favorable for one party reports, criminal procedure opened by local police, so civil court judgment is absolutely okay, but very new and challenging fact fact which might, which might affect findings of the local court and, and possible uh, existing or future arbitral proceedings. But, so cr criminal investigators found that that guy who was preparing this report was doing wrong because of receiving bribes. And right now he's a subject of criminal investigation. Civil court judgment is um, probably okay. Nobody tried to reverse it, but real fact. But, but there is no verdict yet, right? In the criminal case. Pending criminal procedure. Okay, who wants to take that on? Well, I, th I think it's a question of Lex Foray. Um, I mean, it's, it's not a Kazakh law issue, isn't it? whether that evidence would be admissible. For the, from the Kazakh law perspective, for example, um, until there is, there is a binding verdict, then you cannot make reference to it. And then th there's a second question of uh, how parties became aware of that evidence, because it's, um, uh, as we call it, um, basically, uh, I, mean, I mean, it shouldn't be disclosed. So I don't really see a reason why uh, the Kazakh court judgment would, would, be, would be reversed on this basis. Well, uh, I had two cases, one in, LCIA and one in, at uh, ICAC, or Russian CANS, when Russian parties sought a stay of arbitration proceedings pending investigation of a criminal case. And uh, it is my understanding when I investigated this, this issue thoroughly is that uh, arbitral tribunals are reluctant and almost never stay their proceedings pending some criminal investigations in Russia because they may take one year, they may take 10 years, they may result in nothing. It's something not, it's not something which you can, you know, really rely on. And uh, I don't know how like an English tribunal would approach this, but if you have a final court judgment, Russian judgment, which basically stays, stays for uh, issue estoppel, and you had some, you know, one page, document which says some criminal proceedings are being investigated. It does not probably, this paper, it does not trump the issue is uh from the court judgment, or does it? That's basically the question for, for yeah. Lionel. It's a great question, thank you for raising. I think it actually goes back to the very point we made at the start, which is the, the difference between res judicata on the one hand and issue or stopple on the other. So assuming uh, for Beckett's purposes that the evidence is admissible, um, then the question is, is what being argued here an issue or stopple or a res judicata? If it's a res judicata, then the rule is that it will be an absolute bar on any subsequent proceedings, including in the tribunal. 
unless there is some fraud which justifies the unraveling of the original judgment. Um, if it's an issue of stoppel, on the other hand, there's a little bit more wiggle room, at least under English law, uh, because not only can a party prove fraud to unravel the um, local court judgment, um, but it could also show that there has been fresh evidence that has come to light that could not have reasonably been discovered earlier, or perhaps there's been a change in law. And if either of those two things can happen, the issue of stoppel does not arise and it can be argued again. But that can't happen if it's a res judicata. Yeah, I, I think just to add to that line, I suspect that if it's a raised judicata situation and there is new evidence that has emerged which, bring, which calls into question the uh, uh, correctness of that decision, I suspect and it, it's, it's a complicated issue that what the tribunal should do is to say, well, if you want us to go behind the raised judicata, then you, you, you've is you've got to appeal it locally. Yes. You've got to be able to persuade the local court that the emergence of the new evidence is sufficient under local law to justify setting it that aside. And if the local court is not willing to do that because it doesn't satisfy the test, I'm not sure that the tribunal can do much more. Yeah. Um, and it goes back, I mean, we haven't discussed what's the policy reason behind res judicata, and it's, it's of course, you know, to, to have finality in proceedings, so the, the same defendant isn't facing the same issues over and over again, so this goes back to precisely why res judicata exists as a concept. Good. Uh, uh, perhaps, uh, Rupert, from a Swiss perspective, um, you would have to... to you know, prove uh, that the the new evidence is or, or new facts are true, new evidence and facts what we called uh, uh, in in Swiss law true nova, true novas, right? So um, this, of course, uh, pertains to the question of the identity of facts. So to demonstrate that there is actually no uh, real identity of facts, you will have to prove. Uh, those true novas. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Right, I think we, we definitely have exhausted our time and it's now time for, for, for a coffee break. But before we adjourn for a coffee break, can I ask you just to give uh, our panelists a round of applause for their contribution. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining our session today. Uh, Today we have a session devoted to anti-suit injunctions and we have uh, disti distinguished panelists. Uh, Kendall Coffey, I'll start with, with him, partner at Coffey Burlington. Uh, Mr. Coffey served as the U.S. attorney for South uh, Florida. Now his practice in uh, uh, areas are uh, international litigation and arbitration, business disputes, fraud cases, enforcement of contracts and loan agreements. Uh, uh, etc. He is a frequent teacher and uh, guest lecturer, and uh, uh, he has been guest for uh, local com commentary for international networks. Uh, Ramon Saudzevichus, partner at Motieka and Uh Ramon is a partner and the co head of dispute resolution uh, practice uh, at the Vilnius based firm uh, Motieka and Daudzevichus, and he is a well known arbitration figure with many years uh, of experience. James Hargrove, uh, partner at TORIC, uh, partner at International Arbitration Practice Group, uh, based in London and Geneva. Uh, James has over 20 years of experience and has acted as counsel in over 80 international arbitrations under all the recognized arbitration rules. And myself, uh, Sergei Petrachkov, I'm a partner at uh, uh, Dispute Resolution Group and Bankruptcy Group at Alarut Law Firm, Russian, Russian law firm based, based here, here in Moscow. Uh, I am pleased and honored to moderate uh, this session uh, today. Hope, uh, ho hope it will be interesting. Uh, <clears throat> what is anti-suit injunction? Uh, anti-suit injunction is an order issued by a court or arbitral tribunal that prevents an opposing party from commencing or continuing uh, a proceeding in another jurisdiction or forum. Uh, Anti-suit injunction used to be uh, a tool, uh, nuclear weapon uh, used by the US and the uh, UK uh, courts. 
uh, but recently uh, this instrument uh, ha has been implemented into uh, national law and uh, has been used by continental continental courts and if we have uh, uh, some time at the end of our session i'll give you some examples of the german and french uh, french courts uh, anti anti suit injunctions against the U us courts and some some experts even say nowadays that uh, because of this development of this institute in continental law uh, 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 in continental law jurisdictions we have now a new era of anti suit injunctions which used to be an instrument of uh, common law jurisdictions but nowadays uh, they they use more and more in continental law uh, jurisdictions and those of you who are practicing uh, law here in russia and uh, not only then they you you know that last year the amendments into national uh, law were introduced. It was uh, 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 widely widely debated by the legal community. Uh, I mean, anti suit injunction with regard to uh, sanction disputes. Uh, so it could be issued with regard to the uh, uh, sanction uh, dispute, or uh, if the party to this uh, dispute is a, is a, uh, the company under under sanctions. Um, so. The, 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 there was a concern of the legal community that it will be a universal uh, tool in order to circ circumvent the uh, proceedings abroad. Uh, but uh, what what we what we have now, at least uh, uh, I, I know, yeah, two two cases, uh, Ural Wagon Zavod case and uh, 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 the the other one, the Astros case. So uh, so far, no, not not so many cases when this. Uh, when the parties they they were trying to uh, to obtain this anti suit injunction, and yesterday there was an interesting development in, that, in that one of these cases. If you are monitoring the Ural Wagon Zavod case, uh, uh, you will see that the deputy head of the Supreme Court transferred the case to the panel of three judges. So in this case, if you if you remember, uh, uh, the, the the law courts they denied the application on anti suit injunction. But as far as I understand, uh, the uh, the opinion of the deputy head of the Supreme Court is is is, is opposite, and uh, now the, the case is transferred to the panel of free free free, free judges. Um, that's that's the introductory words, and uh, here I want uh, I want to give floor to to Kendall Kendall and uh, gen general question uh, to you. We we know that in in the U.S. you could uh, you could obtain injunctive relief. And uh, what are the conditions for, 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 for the injunctive relief to be granted? And whether it's common practice or uh, rather an exception in, in the US? Over to you. Well, well, thanks very much, Sergey, for moderating. And, and I really appreciate being allowed to participate by Zoom so that I can get to my granddaughter's birthday party, which is very, very important, among other things. The U.S. has a couple of different perspectives, and, and the U.S. Supreme Court hasn't specifically spoken to the question of international anti-suit injunctions. So in our federal system, we have different districts, a district that includes New York and some other states, and a district that includes California and some other states. And they have really split up with some uh, different opinions. What what they call the conservative. Они называют консервативное, например, решение или консервативный подход. The conservative, the conservative perspective, perspective means означает, uh, что reluctance to grant these они injunctions. Они не хотят использовать вот эти меры. They based on a maximum of respect for the principles. And I, I think we know what comedy is. Думаю, I, что... I'm hearing the translations, which. К сожалению, uh, мне мешает good. перевод. It's Это очень неприятно, мне мешает перевод. Russian, but um, is there a way to uh, disconnect that? It's a little hard to speak through the translation. Uh, but anyway, let me let me keep keep going. So if you know, in a, in a sense, we're all at this conference out of respect for different countries and their perspectives, and and that's of course the principle of comedy. So. Most of the federal appeals courts that have spoken to it, again, our Supreme Court hasn't, take this conservative approach and they say that 
it's okay to have parallel actions, two different lawsuits in different countries addressing the same issues uh, prior to judgment. If there's a judgment, then some different principles come into play. The two main instances where these courts, and it includes the federal courts uh, in New York, uh, in, in the Boston, Massachusetts area, uh, Mid Midwest United States, most of the federal appeals courts that have spoken to it. But there are two situations where we're not gonna allow it. One of it is if we think a foreign court proceeding is utterly at odds with an important US principle of law. And the second is if there is an invasion, an intrusion, an affront to the court's jurisdiction. So to give you an example of when that would apply, there was a case that grew out of a uh, sec alleged securities fraud. The, the uh, federal court Eddie. in Massachusetts Например, ordered documents to be turned over by the Pete Marwick affiliate accounting firm in Belgium. Uh, those court orders were entered in Massachusetts. Pete Marwick in Belgium went to get orders to block the enforcement of the US order. That was held to be a violation of the court's jurisdiction and that was rejected. So in the conservative philosophy that is reluctance, a maximum of respect for, uh, for other countries and their judicial processes, there are limited exceptions. And so most of the time you should not be able to get an anti-suit injunction. There's a liberal philosophy and that's actually what the courts call it, conservative and liberal. Normally judges don't like those labels, but here the liberal philosophy, which occurs in the courts in, in California says, you know, we're going to entertain these anti-suit injunctions because we don't want duplicative vexatious litigation and especially so if there is a forum selection cause. So several of the cases that have come out of the federal court system in California involve a situation where the, the parties agree that California law and California as a location would control. And even though these cases involve operations in Ecuador or in Belgium or in Holland or in Luxembourg, the court said, well, you know, you agreed to California. We think it is an, a violation of your agreement to litigate in California to go to some other country. So we are going to issue an injunction against it. Again, that is the so-called liberal view. It, it does prevail in a number of circuits. At some point, we think the US Supreme Court will decide what is the, the better view. All the courts recognize that it's a global that globally business is coming together, that the world is shrinking, but of course, where they go with the principle of supporting international transaction can be in different uh, paths. And those are the two main philosophies in the US right now. Not, not able to hear. Uh, I think the interpretation change may mean that we can't hear the room now because we can't hear either Kendall nor I can hear, can hear um, Sergey. We can't hear you, we can only hear Russian interpretation.
It might be the case, knowing Zoom, that we need to go onto a Russian channel while you're talking to us, and then we need to go onto the English channel while we're talking. But we've been sort of force put on the English channel, perhaps. you everyone knows that and so there are let's say i won't, I won't say two orders but two systems uh, national system and eu system so uh, i would like to make a distinction between uh, anti suit injunction uh, issued by the court of any state including the member state of the eu and anti suit injunction issued by arbitral tribunal so there's a different approach in the european union in relation to these two anti-suit injunctions. And it's, it's, of course, for James to speak, but however, coming back to, to the common law system, uh, knowing the differences, liberal and conservative view in the common law system explained by Kendall, however, House of Lords in the UK, referring the case to the European Court of Justice, said that anti-suit injunction is a very good thing. A very good thing that is uh, good for the seat of arbitration and for the court, the valuable tool for the court to exercise supervisory jurisdiction and uh, promote legal certainty and cause absence of conflict in decisions. So that was the message from the House of Lords to Court of Justice of European Union, which is the highest court in uh, European Union of interpretation of EU law. So that was very positive in terms of anti-suit injunctions issued by the court. Uh, EU courts, continental part of Europe, had no similar view. And there was a case where two parallel litigations were going on. That was anti-suit injunction in Westankers case in the UK and the Italian proceedings uh, related with Westankers in the Italian court. What uh, what uh, uh, common lawyers done? They applied to uh, uh, the United Kingdom court, English court, to get anti-suit injection, which is common there, and got it. And uh, uh, of course, uh, the, the the defendants appealed, and the procedure in Italian uh, litigation went went on. And the House of Lords uh, decided to check what's going on at the level of EU law when, comes, when it comes to uh, anti-suit injunction. And the European Court of Justice had a very different opinion from uh, English court in relation to anti-suit injunction. Uh, for those who, who doesn't know, there's a Brussels 1, uh, Brussels Convention converted into Brussels 1 regulation, which is directly applicable in all member states of uh, European Union. And uh, this is a very unique tool for uh, the courts of the member states to make, decide on jurisdiction. And of course, the uh, Court of Justice of European Union went to, uh, to explain uh, the courts of uh, European Union. Is it compatible for the member state court to issue anti-suit injunction against the party where a parallel litigation is going on and jurisdictional question is being resolved in other court of a member state. And uh, for at the level of uh, court of EU, European level uh, of the court of uh, justice of European Union, uh, the court explained that no, it is not compatible with the system of European Union law to have one court to provide its opinion on jurisdiction of the other court of member state. It's incompatible. There is no other court which knows its own jurisdiction better than the court which makes a decision on jurisdiction. 
So at the level of core decisions, I say European system, it's against it, including my country, Lithuania. So it shouldn't come to a different uh, opinion. When we go to uh, anti-suit injunction issued as the final arbitral award, which is recognizable under New York Convention, the issue is completely different. So uh, yes, and there was an opinion of Lithuanian court that this kind of anti-suit injunction has no place in Lithuania. It's contrary to public policy and even infringes so so sovereignty of Lithuania. However, the Supreme Court of Lithuania went to the referral to uh, European Court of Justice, of course, knowing the best tankers case and seeing some arguments at the level of the Court of uh, Appeals uh, of Lithuania from best tankers case uh, with the question as to whether Brussels 1 regulation could be the ground of public policy to deny recognition and enforcement under New York Convention. And the European Court of Justice came to a very different opinion by saying, look, you have a right to check as to whether by recognizing your uh, award in your own jurisdiction, your courts are limited to decide upon your own, its own jurisdiction. And there was a control on the New York Convention and uh, uh, this moment of the control allowed the European Court of Justice grand panel to say that uh, Brussels 1 doesn't work as the tool to prevent recognition and enforcement of anti-suit injunction issued as a final judgment, as a final award by arbitral tribunal. So there are two different systems as we see, and these systems work differently. So I would say that in Lafayette and in European Union, I've heard that the German and, and French courts already are moving towards the direction of anti-suit injunctions. However, the system of EU law, especially based on Brussels 1, does not recognize it as, as, as valid, uh, valid tool. However, when it comes to arbitration anti-suit injunctions, that's okay in the system of EU law. Thank you, Ramon. And what about the uh, interim ASI would be enforceable in, in Lithuania? And have you seen after this case, ASI issued, uh, ASI is issued by arbitral tri tribunals? Uh, when it comes to interim measures, uh, the same it goes, if we, if we speak about the court interim measures, and it comes usually as interim measures, uh, it, it, it would be very uh, hard to recognize it and get enforcement of a court judgment. Notwithstanding the court judgment could be of, uh, of English court, which is no longer uh, a member, uh, a court of a member state. However, the mindset behind the tankers does not allow me, does, doesn't allow me to be very optimistic in relation of enforcement. Yeah, so it means that uh, anti-suit injunction leaves in the territory of the court which issue it. It has no extraterritorial uh, effect. When it comes to arbitral uh, interim measures, yeah, the question is open. Uh, the question is very open. And, and uh, when it comes to recognition and enforcement of interim measures in uh, the, the certain part of the world, that would be a new issue, which it's now quite uh, hardly to, uh, hard to comment. Thank you, Ramon. Uh, James, do, do you hear us now? I do. Yeah, uh, so my question to, to you, what, what about the UK and what happened after, after Brexit, especially? Thank you. Over to you. Well, uh, yes, what about the UK? Well, um, apparently we're very liberal um, by way of comparison, international comparison with the United States, or at least some parts of it, although about as liberal as California, it would appear. Uh, other people might think that the English court are the bad boys of the uh, uh, injunction world, anti-suit world. Um, so there's a number of questions which lie within the question, including what happened after Brexit. Um, <clears throat> although uh, post-Brexit in short means that uh, the English court will do what it always used to do before West Tankers. Um, uh, so the, the right arises under, for, for an anti-suit injunction, arises under two parts of English English law, section 27 of the Senior Courts Act and section 44 of the Arbitration Act, uh, there is some very complicated interplay and judicial commentary as to which one might apply, apply when, uh, but we practitioners always apply under both in order to get around uh, that nuance. Um, 
uh, as you all know, Russian uh, parties have been kind and ge generous in their contribution to the development of English case law on anti suit injunctions. Uh, the list of cases is long. Uh, BNP, Paribas, Russian Machines, Ingo Strack Investments, Norrie Holdings, and Acquitty. Uh, all of the IBSP, St. Petersburg cases, River Rock, Quadra, most recently Louis Dreyfus, uh, and Enko and Chubb, which uh, was a Supreme Court case, uh, which didn't have any Russian parties, but related to a Russian power station, uh, and actually was seminal in relation to the law of the arbitration agreement, but actually concerned an anti suit injunction when Chubb started proceedings in, uh, in the Russian uh, arbitrage courts. Uh, in short, it is uh, the norm in England to issue uh, an anti-suit injunction uh, where uh, there are strong grounds to believe there is an arbitration or court clause um, uh, stipulating English arbitration or English courts. Um, uh, the parties were, uh, the courts will demand that the parties keep their bargain, uh, in short. Uh, now, why is that not in breach of comity, uh, according to the English judiciary? Well, uh, because... Uh, we need to remind ourselves that the injunction takes effect uh, ad personam. Uh, it is not an instruction to a foreign court to cease the proceedings. It's an instruction to a party in breach of an arbitration agreement or a court clause uh, to stop what they're doing or to take no further steps. Um, so that gets around the problems of comity. Uh, comity. Uh, it's also worth remembering that uh, there are teeth to an anti-suit injunction. Um, uh, not only does the respondent need to obey it, according to the English courts, uh, but if it doesn't, uh, it, or respectively, those who which it acts through, i.e., sorry, who control it, directors <clears throat> or liquidators, uh, will, if they breach it and they step foot in England, be liable to imprisonment, uh, fines and or sequestration of their assets. Um, uh, the anti-suit injunction itself can be enforced internationally, but uh, whether it will be successfully enforced internationally uh, is patchy. Uh, <clears throat> would take longer than we have in this uh, chat to talk about which countries such injunctions can and can't be enforced in. Uh, the types of the injunctions, as I've said, are um, either um, uh, prohibitory, and that's the norm, uh, so to take no further steps in breach of an arbitration or court clause, agreement or court clause. Uh, they can also be mandatory, uh, directing a party to um, uh, withdraw from foreign proceedings. Uh, that is normally the case when foreign proceedings are at a pivotal state uh, and there will be prejudice to the innocent uh, party uh, by having to participate in them in some way or take key decisions or be involved in some measure of complexity. There's a direction from the English court that the wrongdoing party uh, the foreign, <coughs> in the foreign proceedings must actively withdraw them. Some other important nuances uh, include, uh, and somewhat surprising, uh, you don't need to have an English arbitration or court proceedings in uh, contemplation, have any intention of starting some in order to stop a foreign wrongdoer proceeding with uh, foreign proceedings in breach of the arbitration agreement on court clause. Uh, that was made clear in the case of UST and Kam Kamenogorsk, um, <clears throat> because this is about protecting a right um, uh, to be sued in a certain place, uh, rather than actually going and suing somebody in that place. Um, and lastly, and we come back to this in the last question, uh, in relation to the types of injunction, uh, injunctions against third parties can be obtained. Uh, another uh, important and interesting uh, couple of cases uh, coming out of Russia involving BNP Paribas and Russian machines uh, and Ingo Strack Investments uh, stood for the principle that if a, an affiliate in this case uh, of a party to a contract that contains an English arbitration clause starts proceedings, and in this case in Russia, uh, with the intention of um, uh, interfering uh, with the proceedings that properly in, uh, rest in, in England, uh, the English court will issue an anti-suit injunction against the non-party. Um, in terms of the test that needs to be passed, uh, there needs to be jurisdiction. Uh, and Enka and Chubb uh, and Riverrock both stood for the concept that the English courts have jurisdiction if there is an English arbitration clause or an English court clause. And indeed, uh, uh, a suggestion to the contrary uh, by the respondents in Riverrock was classed as being hopeless. Um, there needs to be simply strong evidence that the arbitration agreement or court clause exists 
and the dispute must fall within the uh, arbitration agreement, which was interesting in relation to the Bank of St. Petersburg cases, as you probably know, because that addressed the key question as to whether um, actions relating to the assertion of rights under Russian insolvency law could be determined in an English arbitration. And the answer of the English court to that question was, yes, it can. Um, uh, the other tests for injunctions in England, which appear under the well-known case of American cyanamid, would involve damages not being an adequate remedy in relation to the injunction, if it's not granted, uh, and the balance of convenience. But frankly, those don't really apply in, in anti-suit injunctions because um, it's clear that damages are not a, a, an adequate remedy and uh, the balance of convenience favours an injunction. Uh, delay is a nuanced question. Uh, delay can be fatal to anti-suit, uh, to, to injunction applications per se, uh, although there are a number of, in short, there are a number of cases in England where in certain circumstances there can be some period of delay uh, which may not be fatal to the application. Um, so it is common practice uh, ever since the angelic grace uh, a very long time ago, which is the first uh, case standing for these principles, the English courts have been issuing anti-suit injunctions on the basis of the test I've explained. Um, and uh, post-Brexit, um, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, business as usual. Um, there was a, a, a blemish in the English court ability to issue uh, intra-EU injunctions. Um, uh, that has now, with the end of the transition period, disappeared. Uh, and so intra-EU injunctions can be issued. Uh, uh, they won't be enforced if they're issued by the court uh, around Europe, that's for sure. Um, but to follow up on... Mamunis' last point, uh, uh, the way around that in Europe, uh, should one wish to have an enforceable situation would be to ask your arbitral tribunal uh, for a final partial award, uh, emphasis final, uh, in relation uh, issuing an anti-suit, an arbitrator anti-suit injunction and get that enforced instead. Um, uh, you didn't ask me, Sergey, uh, in relation to Switzerland, but uh, I'll, I'll preempt you on that. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, in Switzerland, uh, you can't do it. Uh, you can't uh, do it uh, under uh, Chapter 12 of the Public International Law Act, the Lugano Convention, uh, or the New York Convention in the sense of going through the Swiss courts. Uh, the Swiss courts are, in this case, quote unquote, conservative. Uh, and moreover, the Swiss courts have determined that uh, even though under Article 183 of the Private International Law Act, an arbitral tribunal can issue an anti-suit injunction, uh, the Swiss uh, Supreme Court has determined that foreign anti-suit injunctions from arbitrators will not be enforced uh, in Switzerland. And that's all I have, Sergey. Yeah, thank you, James. Uh, and what do, what do, what do you like the, the, the UK court's approach? I, I mean, unlimited discretion when imposing anti-suit injunction or the approach of, uh, of continental law, law, law courts? Well, uh, ba basically, uh, what the English courts look at is whether there uh, is a good argument that there is an arbitration agreement or a court clause. Uh, and whether the dispute that has been brought in the foreign court falls within the scope of the arbitration agreement or the court clause. Uh, when you bring into that um, the uh, fact that arbitral agreements are uh, construed widely uh, in England, including, by the way, even if there is an allegation of bribery or fraud in relation to entering into a contract containing an arbitration agreement under uh, the case of Prima Office, probably everybody knows. Um, uh, English courts have absolutely no problem. Uh, there's no concerns about comedy at all, a comedy at all uh, uh, and indirect impact on foreign proceedings. So that was dealt with and dispo um, disposed of a long time ago. Uh, so it's essentially the norm, as long as you can pass those two tests. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and James, you, you mentioned the Russian machines case where... Uh, there was an attempt to obtain anti suit injunction by uh, against against the the affiliate, and uh, as far as I as I remember in this case, this, uh, the High Court said that uh, Russian machines and uh, uh, Ingostrach Investments they are under common uh, uh, ownership and control, 
that is why ASI uh, uh, is bound uh, uh, on the on the affiliate as well. Uh, but we have the other situation uh, when you know that uh, mostly ASI with regard to Russian cases is in the bankruptcy context. And in many cases, uh, DIA, Deposit Insurance Agency, as a bankruptcy receiver, is, is the claimant uh, here, uh, here in the bankruptcy proceedings. For example, they have clawback action, so challenge and transaction uh, of, the, of the debtor. Uh, but we, we could have the other situation. Uh, it, it is provided by Russian law that the creditors of the debtor, if they have 10 or more percent in the register, they could file a claim on challenging transaction. And if, uh, in, in, the River, in the River Rock case, uh, the High Court left this question, uh, answer to this question open. I mean, whether or not ASI uh, uh, could be issued against the creditors. Because formally, they are not a party to the, to the, to the agreement. Uh, I mean, the arbitration clause, the choice of uh, court agreement is not bound on, on, on the creators. Uh, and uh, in this specific case, in the River Rock case, the High Court said that I was not provided with any evidence of aff affiliation or, or some co connection between the creditors and uh, uh, DIA and the debtor. So what, what's, what's your opinion in respect of the creditors of, uh, of the Russian debtor, which quite often happens in, in Russian bankruptcies when they are trying to challenge transactions. And uh, so sometimes it is, it is orchestrated by, by DA in order to avoid, uh, uh, in order to avoid uh, uh, statute, or statute of, of limitation expiry and some other, some, some, for some other issues. What do you think whether, whether or not ASI could be issued against, uh, against the creditors by, by the High Court? Well, it's a very interesting question. Um, there, were, there, were there were two issues in River Rock, uh, which effectively related to third parties. Uh, the first one's a bit easier, but I won't only answer one that you haven't asked me. I'll also answer the one that you have asked me. Uh, the, the, the first question was whether, um, uh, in actual fact, the, the, the uh, the IBSP was not really the right respondent. Uh, and in fact, it was the DIA uh, because the right of action vested in the DIA uh, in Russia as opposed to in IBSP. Um, and that question was determined uh, in the sense that the English court, uh, and this was reflected in the subsequent Quadro and, and Louis Dreyfus um, applications, really. Uh, the English court determined in actual fact there was no separate right of action that was specifically vested in the DIA. Uh, and there, in fact, the DIA was a liquidator, <clears throat> which is therefore an agent, operator, or director, if you like, of the uh, of the insolvent company, and therefore the injunction should be against the insolvent company. But, but of course, uh, the penal notice and the obligations under the injunction are such that uh, nobody can interfere with the purpose of the injunction who's involved in um, guiding IBSP, if you like. So therefore... Uh, if the uh, DIA uh, personnel uh, procured that the um, Russian proceedings continued, the DIA personnel would be in contempt of the English court and in breach of the order uh, indirectly and subject to fine imprisonment or sequestration of assets if they set foot in England. Um, so that was one third party question that was resolved. Uh, the question in relation to creditors is very interesting and comes back to the Russian machines case. Uh, probably everybody knows which group Russian Machines and Ingo Strack relates to. Uh, and that made that decision easier uh, in relation to that case, because if you like, it was clear to the English courts, at least, that there was a concerted effort by two uh, companies under joint control uh, to uh, disrupt and invalidate um, uh, an, arbitration, an arbitration agreement by way of an application uh, in the Russian courts by Ingo Strack uh, to uh, invalidate a guarantee uh, under which, um, uh, on the basis that it was a major transaction under Russian law and didn't have the proper director approval um, or shareholder approval, I don't remember which. Um, 
It's certainly, I'm going to slightly fudge the answer, it's slightly, certainly more difficult uh, to, on a merits basis, convince a court that um, uh, an anti-suit injunction should be um, issued against a third party if they're not related uh, to the actual party, to the arbitration agreement or court clause. Um, however, the first part of your question said, well, sometimes the DIA actually act with the creditors potentially in order to consider doing this sort of thing. If that were to occur and the creditors were working with the DIA, then that would put you in the Russian machines, Ingo Strack and BNP Paribas territory. So it seemed to me that there would even be an application of those principles that could be used to stop the creditors doing this if they were in league in some manner with the DIA. If they're not in league with the DIA, I think it's still possible uh, to present an argument uh, that a third party is by its actions interfering uh, with uh, the proper protection of an arbitration agreement or a court clause, which demands that um, uh, disputes are um, determined in uh, England. Uh, because uh, it remains the case that English courts protect uh, the sanctity of an arbitration agreement or, or a court clause uh, if it is binding and, the, and a dispute falls within it to be determined in England. And I'm not sure that per se the, deter the defining factor is that uh, the two parties uh, who are involved in the disruption of the court need to be related. It doesn't necessarily follow. So I think there is possibility for, uh, for an anti-suit injunction, but as you say, it hasn't been determined yet. I would like to jump in a bit. Um, uh, James has mentioned two very interesting criteria, sanctions, one of, one of, one of, one of the things uh, James has mentioned I, I, I didn't. And uh, I would like to come back to my uh, my topic and um, the synchronized of what James just said, that the European Court puts a lot of attention on sanctions, uh, which are very much real, including imprisonment, when court issues a suit injunction in England. Uh, according to uh, European Court of Justice, sanctions was one of the criteria for European court to come to the conclusion that that in the Steinker's case, uh, that uh, anti-suit injunction is not compatible with the European law system. And in Gazprom case, there was question of sanctions was also interpreted, but in a different way. Uh, that European Court of Justice said that, look, there are no sanctions at all until the member state court recognizes that arbitral anti-suit injunction. So sanctions is a big, huge criteria for European continental, pure European continental system to work on. The other moment uh, James has mentioned is uh, anti-suit injunction is issued against the parties, not against the courts. However, at the level of European, of European Court of Justice, there was a different opinion. Uh, European Court of Justice took a systematic approach and said, look, Notwithstanding that anti-suit injunction issued by English court is against the party, systematically it damages ability and, and the power of uh, the court of a member state to decide upon its own jurisdiction just because anti-suit injunction is already in force. So systematic approach was absolutely different and it said it, it interferes uh, powers of uh, the court of a member state notwithstanding it is issued, uh, it is issued uh, against the party. Thank you, Ramons. Thank you, James. Uh, Kendall, I, I, I think question to you about sanctions. Uh, I mean, sanctions for for um, uh, uh, if, the, if the party uh, does not follow this anti-suit injunction uh, order issued by the court or by uh, by the arbitral tribunal. Uh, just uh, how, how it happens I, 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 before Russian courts. Uh, in many cases, the, D, the DIA, uh, yes, uh, I apologize, the anti suit injunction is against DIA, Deposit Insurance, uh, Insurance Agency, which is acting as a receiver of the bank. Uh, and if uh, ASI is issued against DIA, they usually discontinue proceedings uh, here in Russia. Uh, how it happened, for example, in uh, River Rock case, which uh, James mentioned, in LDC case uh, this, this year. But didn't happen, for example, in Nori Holding uh, case. They, they, they discontinued proceedings in Russia, but uh, the Russian courts 
uh, in Nori Holding uh, versus Открытие Кейс, just did not accept this uh, withdrawal of claim of the uh, DIA and continued proceedings in Russia, saying that it will violate uh, public interest, that uh, this Russian bank uh, has a lot of creditors, and uh, such discontinuation of the proceedings here in Russia just will violate the, their rights. So uh, how, how, it, how it works uh, in the US? What, what, what's the sanction for, for, for the violation of the a, uh, ASI? Well, as Ronis was describing, uh, it's against the parties, not against the court, but it's still considered by all the federal courts an offense to the sovereignty of another country. So whether, even if it's just against the individuals, it's seen as potentially interfering with, with a, a foreign court, which is a very significant matter, especially as we described with the, the conservative courts that take a very uh, positive and strong view of that comedy. The consequences, of course, are contempt uh, for any parties that violate it, uh, su substantial fines, and, and as was being described uh, by James, those who act in concert you know, people who are members, even lawyers of a company uh, can have considerable issues with the U.S. court. Of course, if walking into the United States is, is not a concern to somebody overseas, uh, it might be reduced, but assuming that uh, there is U.S. jurisdiction and that the parties who are affected by this injunction are in some way already uh, in the United States or subject to the United States, then those kind of orders are very, very powerful. And in fact, in the case I mentioned with Pete, Pete Marwick, uh, the, they, uh, they, threaten, they can threaten uh, very substantial fines. Obviously, the ultimate power of contempt is the threat of incarceration, which is, of course, the, uh, the nuclear weapon in, uh, in, in injunction law and in anti-suit injunctions. Thank you, Kendall. Uh, a little comment from my side. Uh, Kendall has mentioned the, the, the conservative view and the possible attack on over sovereignty of, of, uh, of a state. And this issue was, was discussed in Lithuania while recognizing anti suit injunction issued by arbitral tribunal. And uh, uh, as I've already mentioned, uh, Court of Appeals in Lithuania uh, went this exact way. However, the Supreme Court didn't see any issues because anti-suit injection in the Gazprom case was issued against the sovereign itself. The sovereign was the party to arbitration agreement. And, uh, the, the Supreme Court of Lithuania overturning the decision of uh, the Court of Appeals was very pro-arbitral in, in, in my country. Yeah, I think well, I'd just add one thing as well, just in the nature of the, the sanction in England. Uh, it's, it's known as quasi-criminal. It's basically a civil wrong. Uh, with a criminal remedy, um, so a criminal sanction, uh, and just for everybody to know if they're strategically advising their clients, there's essentially no chance of exporting that uh, criminal uh, judgment to another jurisdiction in order to uh, pin your wrongdoer in some manner. And also it won't, it won't form the basis of any form of Interpol red notice or something like that. So it really is a strictly English um, uh, sanction. Yeah, thank you, thank you, James. Uh, I, I think, well, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, you, yeah, you could, you could ask uh, now. Yes, John. Uh, John, mic, mic doesn't work. Okay, uh, John Hines from the Morgan Lewis Law Firm. I wanted to ask James a question, but it touches on something that Kendall just mentioned as well about it's, it's aimed at the person, an anti-suit injunction, but it can be seen as interfering with the court's uh, obligation and right to go forward with a, with a case. And uh, James, you've been addressing the context, which is most understandable and relevant here, where there's an arbitration agreement and the anti-suit injunction makes sense and the, the position that it doesn't violate 
comedy makes sense as you explained it. But what about in other contexts? I'm, uh, I'm giving away my age to say that at the beginning of my career uh, in New York, I was involved for one of the defendants in the famous Freddie Laker um, litigation that gave rise to the mother of all, um, mother of all, um, let's say, situations involving anti-suit injunctions going back and forth across the Atlantic. And of course, that was, the, at the core there was an antitrust action. It wasn't a contractual setting uh, brought by Laker Airlines or its liquidator in federal court in New York under the, uh, in Washington under the um, US antitrust law. So there wasn't a contract, there wasn't an arbitration clause. And some of the defendants who were most of the airlines that flew across the North Atlantic went to the English court seeking an anti-suit injunction barring Freddie Laker and also sought um, a counter anti-suit injunction barring Laker from seeking an anti-suit injunction against those who had proceeded in England. And you may imagine, although it was based, uh, it was aimed at Laker, the US District Court judge in Washington did not take kindly um, to that application and issued a fiery um, decision accordingly. So James, bottom line, I wonder what, if, you're, if you take it out of the contractual setting with an arbitration clause, what is the position? Uh, are the English courts still there, the bad guys, the cowboys? Um, happy to issue anti-suit injunctions or no? In other words, what, how has the Laker situation and precedents uh, uh, in, on the English side evolved today? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I, I too recall Freddie Laker. There's only, as far as I know, <laughs> one, one cricketer who set up an airline uh, that then, in fact, went bust. But anyway, um, the situation now uh, I've not refreshed my memory of those particular decisions, but the situation now is that uh, the, the rationale for an anti-suit injunction uh, is to keep parties to their bargain. Uh, that bargain is contractual, uh, so it's a, an arbitration agreement or a court clause. Uh, a question as to whether there is some other basis for English courts to have jurisdiction, uh, albeit uh, whether it's um, subject matter jurisdiction, um, uh, um, personal jurisdiction, et cetera, uh, is not the same. Uh, and the same basis for an anti injunction does not exist in the sense that uh, arguments that uh, England is the forum convenience, because now we're into common law principles in post-Brexit world, uh, as opposed to um, uh, Brussels regulation um, uh, jurisdiction, uh, means that anti suit injunctions on the basis that a case should properly be brought in England because of common law jurisdictional principles uh, is not the foundation or an anti-suit injunction, uh, which is most of what we're dealing with now. Uh, however, there are exceptions to this, and I'd have to pass on the question in relation to antitrust. It could be different, but there are exceptions, as I've said. So, for example, in relation to English insolvency proceedings, um, there is jurisdiction in the English courts to issue injunctions against creditors uh, who start proceedings in foreign jurisdictions uh, in breach of personal jurisdiction of the English court uh, over such creditor claims, whether it's personal jurisdiction through um, uh, domicile or by submission to the jurisdiction or having proved in the English lit liquid liquidation already. So by extension, I can imagine there are some circumstances where the English court will, uh, will determine that it has exclusive jurisdiction over a certain uh, class of defendant and therefore anti-suits them to participate in those proceedings, but they will be on a case-to-case -case basis and then the antitrust scenario would have to pass. Um, <clears throat> um, so I think that's probably my answer to that. Yes, potentially, but not for general, for example, tort or common law based or jurisdiction claims. Thank you, James. Any other questions uh, from the audience? Rupert, please. Yeah, um, another sort of comment, picking up on what Kendall has said, and, and also James, and it's the impact of the anti-suit injunction on uh, not just the immediate parties to the litigation, but also those that may be helping them or involved um, in a satellite litigation or, or, or a proceedings brought in breach of an agreement. And um, James, I, th I mean, my, my understanding is that 
the issue under English law is, is not very clear. There's a court of appeal judgment which says that, of course, it will be, and it's just an over to comment, um, of course, it would be absurd to argue that an English anti-suit injunction would bind, for example, the lawyers of one of the parties involved in bringing foreign proceedings in breach of a jurisdiction agreement, but it's only a passing comment. And I think there's still some uncertainty as to the impact of that sort of injunction on foreign lawyers who are instructed by parties to an English litigation to bring uh, an offending foreign proceedings. I just wanted to know what your view on that was. Uh, my, my view on it is that I'd be very surprised uh, if one found oneself before the commercial court uh, starting contempt proceedings uh, against foreign lawyers uh, who were involved in providing legal services, uh, assisting in a party uh, prosecuting the um, uh, the proceedings. Uh, one wonders where the buck would stop uh, in that case as to whether it would be the partners, the associates, uh, paralegals, uh, whether all of the employees uh, involved in the defendant company would also be in some manner seen as being aiding and abetting the application. Uh, so I would have thought um, that uh, a strict test as to who is actually uh, empowered to direct uh, the wrongdoing company uh, would be the limit as to who would be actually, therefore, if you like, aiding and abetting the breach and therefore subject to contempt of court proceedings, potentially. Yeah, I think, I think if I may just add a follow-up comment, I think all of those are very valid points. Uh, and the other issue I think that should impact on a very cautious approach by the court is that it may well be the case that a foreign lawyer instructed by a client to appear in foreign proceedings is under some sort of obligation, ethical, professional obligation to carry out those instructions. And it would be a very strange thing if any injunction, an English injunction, prevented uh, a foreign lawyer from carrying out those duties and subjecting them to local uh, penalty as a result. Yep, fully agreed. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So we kindly invite you to, to, to thank our panelists in the usual way. Thank you very much. round table two, which is called Investment Treaties and Disputes, was the focus for CS-related disputes. As someone commented, not really a sexy name, but we hope to make our discussion more sexy. Uh, we are not going to discuss sanctions, so if you are here by mistake, you can still leave. We hope you will not. Uh, what we are going to discuss is a current framework called the Investor State Dispute Settlement which is set to go through credibility crisis for the last years, and perhaps to reflect on a possible roadmap to its better future, at least in the Russian context. Uh, our panel has been very carefully uh, composed to represent first-hand experience of different diverse stakeholders. We have Ms. Anna zuban a secretary of Anstral, which is leading uh, global ISDS reform. We have, uh, uh, we used to have uh, Gonzalo Flores, a secretary general of, uh, deputy secretary general of ICSID, which is a well known, of course, main uh, international forum for investment arbitration. Uh, we have Alexander Poltrakevich, uh, who is a, let me read it. <laughs> a head of legal department division responsible for representing Russia in international trade law organizations, including Antitral, at the Russian Ministry of Economic Development, uh, which is a, a leading ministry on the Antitral reform uh, and forming a Russian position on the reform. We have, uh, sorry, I'm just uh, 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 choose a name occasionally, <laughs> not in any order. We have Anna Kozmianka, who is a partner at Schoenberg Whitmer in Zurich, and who has acted and 
continue acting for Russia and other share states in many investment districts. And we have Sergei Marozov, who is the senior counsel at the International Center for Legal Protection, or ACLP, or MCPZ, as many of you know it by this name. Uh, essentially, it is an agent of Russian state bodies managing uh, investment disputes, both in arbitration and state courts. So we are very grateful to all our panelists uh, for Anna, who made it in person to Moscow at this occasion. Really, thank you very much to Gonzalo, who used to be with us and who had to connect at 3.45 a.m. his time. He we are lucky that he realized it's too late to cancel. Uh, yes. Uh, and of course, to Alexander, especially because it's not always that you have state uh, bodies representatives at legal community conferences. So thank you very much for your transparency. Uh, we will start discussion with the ANSI trial, and I will address Anna question. So the reform led by ANSI trial is progressing and essentially shaping the future, the whole future of the system as it's supposed to. Uh, it was officially launched in 2017 and under recently adopted very ambitious work plan, it should extend into 2026, which would bring us almost to a 10 year anniversary. Uh, so could you please tell us, Anna, what are current main directions of the Secretariat's work, how you see the reform? My sentiment is that it's very difficult and I saw it uh, in practice to accommodate all diverse and sometimes opposite uh, opinions of delegations. So how do you see in that environment uh, the prospect of reaching any consensus and the satisfactory result of the reform? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say how happy I am to be here in person. Uh, it's my first uh, travel outside of uh, Vienna for since uh, February of 2020. So yeah, I'm very glad, very glad, very glad to share this panel also with my uh, colleagues, uh, particularly our bosses from the Ministry of Economic Development who sit in Ancitral as the delegates uh, representing the Russian Federation and who tell us what to do and also those who behind the scene um, handle disputes uh, either for the state or for investors and uh, feed into the debate that is taking place in Ancitral and also the concrete work. And I'm very grateful for this opportunity to present uh, the, the work where we are currently, what we are seeking to achieve. And indeed, I think the timeline is an important point because we're talking about a system that is now 60 years old. Uh, I wouldn't say that 60 is old because I'm very soon turning 60. Um, so it's still very young, but it's uh, also time maybe to reflect on how things have been uh, designed uh, to accommodate or to cater for a special uh, economic situation and to see whether it is still um, adapted and whether it still delivers on the purpose it was built for 60 years ago. So that's what we're doing in Ancetral. Can I ask you for the... Yes, Thank you. I hope it works. Um, yes, it does. So um, I'm going to go very quickly over the mandate, which was given to us in uh, 2017, and which requires that we look at possible reform of investor state dispute settlement in a with a very broad mandate. So the commission didn't say you have to do this, 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 and that, but rather you have to, to um, go through three steps. A first step of the mandate was to um, gather all the concerns, identify what are the problems. Um, then the second step was among all these problems, which are the ones that, uh, that warrant reform, that require reform and a reform that Ancitral can deliver because there are many other issues with investor state dispute settlement. For example, with the treaties themselves that Ancitral is not, uh, doesn't have the mandate to look into. And uh, now we are in the third phase, which is the phase of delivery 
of the reform options, of the reform elements. And I'm going to try to show you how uh, this still fits together and is not going into different atomized places. Uh, and this is really where the whole challenge is uh, to keep a, uh, a clear direction while at the same time, as Olga said, catering for very different uh, approaches and views in the room. Um, so very quickly, the principles which are a bit different from other working groups of Ancetral, for example, those of you who are uh, taking part in our working group two on dispute resolution know that it's really expert led. Uh, so it's practitioners, it's, uh, it's uh, end users who take part and who work with us on, on delivering uh, on the legal text. Here we have a government led um, uh, process. And this, of course, makes it also very different because when you're talking to the governments, uh, you have official positions and you don't have expert views. And so you have to deal with them in a different manner. Uh, it's also fully transparent. And I really uh, insist on that, that everything we do is available on our website and everything that is being said in the Ancetral meetings is available also from recorded um, uh, archives that are available on our website. So anything you want to know about what's taking place in Ancetral, you can know about and nothing is uh, done in a you know, secret room or with uh, uh, whatever kind of haggling or, or uh, uh, you know, other forms of consensus building that you might find in other organizations. So what are the reform options we have on the table that have been identified as um, deliverable? First of all, we have um, a strengthening, and I'm not putting them in any order of importance, because that's also what the working group has decided, is that all the reform options have to be developed in parallel. And why is that the case? Because you can imagine that some countries are more eager to see one reform option being finalized and others don't want this reform option to be finalized at all. And they would rather that the group concentrates on others. So also one of the difficulties and one which has required a lot of work and a lot of consensus building uh, among the working group was to define a way to move all these reform options in parallel and to deliver at the end something which is all encompassing. And we have, uh, as I said, as a first reform option, strengthening uh, the access to alternative dispute resolution. And when, when I'm saying alternative dispute resolution, in the context of ISDS, of course, this alternative is alternative to arbitration, because the mainstream is uh, arbitration in the current system. And so here, one of the, uh, um, deliv the, the deliverables, one of the reform options is to strengthen access to mediation uh, as one of the uh, reform option and also strengthening both the institutional and the treaty aspects of dispute prevention. And this is uh, an area where a lot of good and best practice exists around the world and where the, um, the various um, uh, agencies like, for example, uh, Sagay's agency or other agencies or ministries in various countries have developed some uh, good practices in addressing issues at the very early uh, stage before they become an actual investment dispute that ends inevitably in an arbitration. So all of this is being strengthened and you will find the relevant uh, supporting papers on Antetra's website. There is one on mediation that has just come out and which is ready for everybody's comments. Um, and then we have another one on dispute prevention that is also in the pipeline and it has already been discussed by the working group. Then the second um, part is the, uh, an, another option is the establishment of a multilateral advisory center. And I would like to stop here a little bit by saying that what we have in the WTO is an advisory center for developing countries in order to assist them in better navigating, using, and uh, litigating in the WTO uh, under the uh, WTO treaties. 
And what we are looking into here, and that was a call from developing countries, particularly African and Asian countries, was that they think that they would need a similar construct for uh, investment arbitration, especially when they are not equipped, as some countries are, with a very strong internal team, or for example, an agency, like is the case in Russia, uh, but they have a case every six or seven years, so it doesn't require to keep um, a, a strong team in place. And so what they would like is to be able to be represented by that center. And other countries that have already such a strong internal team could contribute with their competence, with their expertise, could exchange. And that is one of the requests, for example, by uh, the uh, more experienced countries is to have in this uh, multilateral advisory center a platform for the, um, the dispute uh, settlement teams, the domestic, uh, not the domestic, the international dispute settlement teams of the different countries to exchange and to uh, be trained and to, uh, to have the opportunity to exchange with their colleagues who are, and I'm always saying this, all the states are in the same boat when they're facing a claim. So it's not like, you know, when you're in the US, you have a special treatment. And when you are Burundi, you have another treatment. No, you all have to do the same things in order to defend the state in an investment dispute that is brought against you. And you have to go through exactly the same phases, exactly the same, um, uh, bring up the same defenses. And, and all of this can be, uh, I wouldn't say mutualized, but at least there is a, this pooling of experience, expertise, and possibly also defense services, as is requested by some, uh, will be a really, really a value added and will contribute to uh, giving the sense that there is more balance in the system uh, and that the states, is, the states are not always at the losing end, which in practice, when you look at the data, is not the case. But if there is this perception that, you know, there are these big companies that are suing these poor countries, which is, you know, something that even if it's a perception only, you have to address it if you want to ensure that there is legitimacy in the system. Uh, another uh, aspect is the development of a code of conduct. And that is, I hope, something that uh, my colleague and friend Gonzalo, even if it's early in the morning in Washington, D.C., will be speaking about because we are developing it jointly with the ICSID um, Secretariat. It's a code of conduct for arbitrators. And here, I really would like to say that uh, in spite of some uh, reactions, uh, epidemic reactions that we had at the beginning from some arbitrators who said, you know, don't you have better things to do than to deal with our way of uh, conducting ourselves and our cases? Uh, I think it was a long overdue um, set of rules that will apply to arbitrators like they apply to any one of us when we're in a bar uh, association or in, a, uh, in, in, in private practice. We all have rules of ethics and uh, we, they apply to us. So, uh, you know, this, this is going now to apply also to arbitrators and ensure that one aspect which, you know, has brought a lot of suspicion, which is this sort of um, small group um, uh, delivering on, on uh, arbitration in investor state uh, disputes uh, has a little bit more transparency and particularly also a bit more uh, disclosure rules, uh, a bit more, um, there is, for example, discussion about banning double hatting, which for some countries is really a no-go. The European Union doesn't want to hear about double hatting anymore because they have been uh, criticized heavily for that. So this is something that will be addressed in the Code of Conduct. Um, another uh, aspect, of course, uh, is the um, establishment of uh, three different um, um, more institutional uh, aspects of reform. And I will be looking at that in my next slide. But before that, I wanted to also insist on the reform of procedural rules. And here, if you look at the investment chapters of current investment treaties, and you compare them with the dispute settlement uh, provisions of early treaties, which were general, generally two paragraphs, you had a paragraph that says, 
the state hereby consent to uh, bring uh, any dispute uh, um, before either ICSID or um, ad hoc under ancestral rules, and uh, the award shall be final and binding. Now you have uh, dispute settlement chapters, which are 20 pages or more, because you have a very detailed set of procedural rules. And this is precisely what these procedural rules reform intends to bring, including into the old treaties that don't have all this detail, which is necessary for both parties, for investors and for states to know what the rules are and not be simply left at the decision of three people who are going to decide that this is how we are going to deal with third party funding in a case or with uh, treaty interpretation and or with uh, means to address frivolous claims, multiple proceedings, reflective loss, counterclaims, security for, for costs. All of these procedural elements will be looked at uh, through this procedural rules reform. So now let me talk very briefly uh, because it's time is flying. Um, uh, let me talk very briefly at uh, how it's going to look like from a uh, coherence and structural point of view. And this is what I call, we call our little house in the prairie. Uh, and it's really uh, to show you that the dispute settlement system is not going to be completely put on its head or simply, you know, uh, erased and something new will be set up. No, you will continue to have those states. But so uh, the, the, the system will continue to be a multi-door system with just one more doors. Uh, state to state will continue. Some countries like Brazil never agreed to invest a state dispute settlement. And the only way of bringing a case against Brazil is through the state to state mechanism. They will continue to do that. Investor state arbitration is going to continue. And we are working with our colleagues in ICSID very closely to make sure that you know all the improvements in the ICSID rules are reflected in what we're doing and uh, making sure that you know the improvement of investment arbitration continues. There is a proposal on the table by the European Union to have a first instance court and a second instance court. It's going to happen because the uh, European Union is 27 countries strong. So even if they want to set it up unilaterally, they can set it up unilaterally. But the thing is that every time they negotiate with a country, they will have new countries joining this. So what they are proposing basically is to multilateralize this uh, uh, investment court and joins who wants to join. And then you will, of course, still have domestic courts as a first door of entry because some countries like India, for example, say no way. Uh, we only allow investor state arbitration in very limited uh, windows, for example, in the case of a denial of justice. What is going to change, and that is quite radical, is that we will have a second floor. And this second floor is going to be an appeals level. And this appeal level, we're talking about uh, having it not only as an appeal for the first instance court that the EU wants to set up, but also an appeal and a standing appellate mechanism that applies across the board. And this is where we have to work very carefully and closely with our friends in ICSID, because obviously this is going to rock the ICSID boat because the ICSID convention says an award is final and binding. And what we are looking into is putting now an appellate system on top of all of this. And they're very strong proponents for this appellate mechanism. For example, China wants it very strongly. Usually when China wants something, it sort of happens. Um, and there are other, I know that there is interest in Russia on this appellate mechanism as well. And there is generally, an, um, I think there's a general consensus that a bit of consistency in jurisprudence, a bit of a, uh, um, uh, you know, overlooking over the shoulders of the arbitrators, which, you know, is never a bad thing. When you know that somebody's looking over your shoulder, you're 10 times more careful than when you have no control and you can say basically what you want. So all of this is going to be set up and is going to be delivered through the overall institutional part of the, of the, um, uh, the reform. And uh, what I put in the top, uh, in the roof, is something which will remain overarching. 
is that what we have understood uh, very clearly from the beginning is what states want from this reform is to regain control over their treaties. The states are the ones that negotiate their treaties. They are the masters of their treaties, and they want to make sure that their interpretation remains consistent with what they have negotiated at the outset. And so you will find this at the top as an overarching uh, um, uh, roof or umbrella for all this um, reform. On both sides uh, of the little house, you have the uh, strengthening ADR, uh, strengthening mediation, dispute prevention, and advisory center. And all of this, and this is where we are currently, will be delivered through a, um, a uh, um, comprehensive multilateral treaty, which will include all these different elements of reform. These ones are the procedural ones. And what will they do? They will do two things. They will address the existing treaties. So all these 3,000 something existing treaties will be reformed through this multilateral instrument, which is very, you know, something that in public international law works very well. We've already done it with the uh, uh, Mauritius Convention on Transparency. Uh, the OECD has done it recently with the revision of their 2,500 and something um, bilateral tax, um, double tax treaties. So from a mechanical point of view, it works very well. What we have to see is how structurally we ensure that all the countries that want something, get something, so agree to something, and that we have a sufficiently meaningful common um, set of, uh, of reform options and that all the others that will come uh, will arrive, will be there linked under the, the same uh, overarching multilateral treaty will come in the form of protocols. So you will have a protocol on, um, on for example, the, multiple, the, the multilateral court, you will have a protocol on a pellet, you will have a protocol on an advisory center. Not everybody will have to be a member of the advisory center. Not everybody will have to become a member of the multilateral court. This will take time, but at least the structure will be there and the structure will apply not only to the existing treaties, but also to the uh, forthcoming treaties, which will become you know, much more detailed uh, and, and transparent and, and, use, and user friendly. So uh, basically I have other slides that I could go through, but I know that I've already uh, uh, overstepped, but it's difficult to, to, to summarize the work of four years in 10 minutes, uh, especially to give you the idea that we know where we're going and that we're not going, you know, jumping from one idea to the other and simply under the pressure of different pressure groups. Yes, there are different views, but there are ways of accommodating them. And that's what we're trying to do in the delivery mechanism, which will be this multilateral framework. Olga, over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anna. So your example show us that consensus is not something, it's not always about you know, the whole pie, but you can get a piece that you want, mm -hmm. hopefully. Exactly. <laughs> uh, okay, the time is flying, so we need to move to the next speaker, Alexander. I'll now switch to Russian, because uh, Alexander will speak to Russian. Because Russian is, Russian is going, uh, Alexander is going to speak. Yeah. He's going to speak Russian, okay. Okay. Alexander. Poto Rakevich, he is very active. He has a very active position in this reform. About two years ago, we published the general standpoint and the vision of Russia on this reform. But during these two years, you see, we have moved ahead a lot. There were a lot of articles published, uh, the draft of the code, conduct of behavior. Then there was active discussion about the appellation mechanism and courts. And we're very interested to know about the standpoint of Russia. 
does the standpoint change during these two years and how it can be incorporated into the current agenda? Yes, Olga, thank you very much. I also want, first of all, to express my gratitude to all organizers, my colleague speakers, those who are today with me and who are taking floor with me and making presentations. And of course, I want to thank Anna, uh, because she has presented the general standpoint of on the trial. Of course, I would like to speak about what's really happening in the Russian Federation and what the Russian Federation and the member of UNICETRAL sees and thinks what as a participant for many years already, maybe from the very, very first years from the moment of foundation, of course, we're now talking about the specific topic about the reforms of the system and settlement of this uh, disputes among states and investors. And of course, I want to make a focus on the things that we have to understand. First of all, what is the role of the reform? What kind of role the reform will play in in terms of this system is defines a lot in terms of protection of the direct and foreign investments. And this is the consequence of the development of the economy of the member countries, member states. And we may speak about the efficient functioning of the system. We can see not only the successful settlement of different districts, but also we can judge about the economical prosperity of all the participants and stakeholders of this system. Here, I would like to focus on some positive sides of the current system, like inclusive participation of the state. This is, of course, very important. And we want to draw attention that this inclusivity is also very important in issues of court formation. And of course, this is also an opportunity to all members to follow their procedures, including languages and disclosure regime and all other, and also they can select the location, the seat and of the settlement of the dispute. These are not the only benefits, but first of all, I would like to underline this particular things. At the same time, with these, you know, benefits, there are some challenges that we see now that we face. First of all, this is the continuous and increasing number of disputes that we see. We also can see the systemic problems that exist today in the system, like unpredictability of the arbitration award. There's a different interpretation of the double-sided investment treaties and there is lack of mechanism that allow to provide the correctness of the arbitration award plus there is increase of the timelines and costs of the dispute settlements of course we have to seek for the solutions to the, together and we have to reform the system because it is a requirement of today. Another thing I want to say, to reform, we must do it in a reasonable, very rational way, without any you know, lips or any sharp actions that would threaten the foundation, the basics that we already have. So my colleague gave a very good example about the house. Yes, it's very interesting comparison with this building, with this house, but you know, foundation, the foundation is very important for any building. We are now working on this reform. There are, of course, some different opinions, but what are our considerations? What we are afraid of? We don't want to build a Babylon Tower when everyone has its own language and they don't understand where are we moving together. And as a result, we know that Babylon Tower it was not a successful project. We know how it was constructed, it failed. And now what we want, we want to participate in this, to take part in this process. We understand the importance of this reform, but I would like to describe here some of the existing approaches to the reformation of the system. It can be either somehow rejections of the control and regulation of any kind of distance, or sometimes it's a kind of 
of targeted solutions. And this is the position which is supported by the Russian Federation. And there is a third approach. It's a systematic reform with the establishment of the certain institutions that can potentially be able to solve all these problems. But many of these problems, these are not problems of the process. These are problems of the substantive law. And there's no universal solution. We can, but we want to offer or to propose some of our visions that maybe can be implemented. But first of all, we would like to make a kind of focus on the same type of interpretation of the international treaties of different third parties and the you know settlement of the disputes case by case basis. And here we may work on the mechanism how we can interpret these provisions about the protection of the investments. I think it will allow us to exclude the situation when the arbiters will introduce some new notion in interpreting the text. Or maybe they'll orient on the things which are beyond the interpretation of the legal norms. Uh, secondly, about what my colleague Anna said, it is necessary to, net, to set unified requirements to arbitrators. And of course, we appreciate the work of the Commission, the work over the Code of Ethics of Arbitration. Traders. We are supportive of this work, and we believe that the code will allow to improve the quality of uh, dispute resolution and minimize the risks of a conflict of interest. So, consequently, this is in conformity. This will meet the needs and requirements of any participants. And thirdly, for the benefit to decrease the cost of proceedings, it, it, it may be necessary to elaborate recommendations to broaden involvement of state authorities for the pre-action resolution of disputes within national domestic jurisdictions. So summarizing, I would like to remind that when using different approaches, we should not forget that there are particular principles by which we should be guided. So the decisions should not be political based. We need, on top of that, we need to ensure interests of all participants of the reforms. And third, the reforms should be consensus based. Due to that, we are inclined to do it in an accelerated speed because doing it too quickly, we will not be able to listen to each other carefully to discuss everything in many details. If we start considering all these issues in parallel, there may be the risk that we would omit some important issues. In any way, I would repeat, we are supportive and we recognize the importance of reform in the system. With one reservation, efficient elements of the system should not be damaged, should not be deteriorated, because they are the foundation. And if this foundation is uh, destructed, it may result in disproportion, disbalance of interest of participants of the system and fragmentation of the system. So we request everybody to keep the dialogue. Thank you very much, Alexander. Based on what you have said, I believe that everybody heard that it's necessary to keep the foundation and maybe it will not be enough to discuss all the issues uh, until 2026. Gonzalo, Gonzalo, do you hear us? It's your time. Uh, so when I'm saying that people are surprised, uh, I don't know whether you know, but ICSID is mentioned as a dispute resolution forum in half of all Russian BATs. 27 out of 65 Russian BATs refer to ICSID.
In practice, it's of course exit additional facility rules because Russia is not a party to the convention, but it makes exit quite relevant to Russia, which is not always realized, I think, at our market. So, Gonzalo, I know that exit is a has an active stand on the reform, that it is a co-author with the young ancestral of the code of conduct of, uh, of adjudicators of the draft of it. Uh, and the question to you would be, how do you see the role of exit in that reform? Uh, perhaps especially on the verge of the discussions about establishment of permanent investment court and how do you see the future of the system? Uh, thank you, Olga. Thanks for everyone uh, for coming to see us today. Can, can, I'm going to ask the standard question of the COVID times. Can you hear me and can you see me? Yes, very good. Thank you very much. Again, well, as, uh, as usual, let me start by thanking the ABA and the Russian Arbitration Association for inviting ICSIP to participate in this event, in particular to my friend Olga for coordinating all these efforts and inviting me. It's a, always a pleasure to be surrounded by old friends and new friends. And believe me, it's a delight to have the opportunity to wear a suit, which in COVID times is such a rare gem in my life. So uh, much appreciated. Now, we've been speaking uh, about reform, and it's uh, hard to beat Anna's infectious enthusiasm. Uh, we have, we have uh, been together in many, many panels. But let me let me start with something, and I know that time is uh, time is quite uh, restricted, and I don't want to take the time of uh, my fellow panelists. So let me share with you as for for a few minutes some slides because to understand why we are doing a reform, to understand the changes proposed to the system, I think it's good to understand who we are, where we are in in the system. So if if you uh, uh, bear with me for a second, let me let me quickly uh, show you a few slides. I promise it's not going to be too many because we don't have the time, and usually we have a lot of slides in exit. So let me open this one second. And. My apologies. Uh, please let me know if you can. If can you see the the can you see the slides, uh, Olga? No. No. That, that's sort of your notes. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. One second. Uh, I'll show you right away the. No. There you go. <laughs> A very nice picture, but but not slide. No. I guess. No, it's okay. Here. No, it's Yes, now you see it? Oh, sorry, there's some delay between the video and my screen. Can you see it now? Yes, perfectly well. Thank you. Excellent. And those were my two beautiful kids, by the way. So, <laughs> so uh, very quickly, I'm going to go through some ideas on, on where we where, what it is and where we are and what has led us to this uh, to the the idea of change. So. Uh, and and some some of these slides are very basic, and I'm, I'm going to leave them with the organizers later if you're interested. Of course, ICSID is part of the World Bank Group, uh, was established in 1966 through an international treaty uh, with the idea of promoting international uh, private, uh, to promote private private investment. Uh, it's uh, the only non-financial institution of the of the World, world Bank Group. Um, it's uh, it's essential purpose again is to promote the flows of capital uh, private capitals to countries uh, within, wishing to attract them um current membership and this is something that's very very close to my heart the current membership of fixing is 156 member states you can see on the on the screen some uh, blue countries those are the countries that have signed and ratified this convention some yellow countries like the Russian Federation who having signed the exit convention, the, the constituency the basic treaty have not ratified it. And some few countries in gray, uh, which have not signed or ratified the exit convention like the Brazil, for example. 
which was mentioned by Anna before. Uh, and I said this is close to our heart because uh, number 156 is because Ecuador recently, a couple of weeks ago, became the 156 member state, having signed and ratified the exit convention for the second time. Some of you may know Ecuador left exit uh, back in 2009. This is a sovereign right which we, for which we have uh, utmost respect. But um, uh, this year they took the decision to come back, which we consider a big uh, sign of trust on the system. Uh, ICSID is structured on a dual uh, structure with an administrative council, which comprises one representative of each member state and a secretariat, which takes care of the day-to-day -day business, the administration of cases mostly, led by Secretary General McKinnair and a staff of approximately 70 people. Uh, you, you will see in a, in a slide in a couple of minutes the growth of the system that led from a, a very small international organization when I joined 20, 24 years ago of six or seven people to an organization that comprises over 70, 70 staff members. And I would like to uh, um, uh, underline in the left column of the Administrative Council that in ICSID, unlike other organizations of the World Bank Group, each country has one vote. Each representative has a, uh, the same the same weight. This is not uh, there's no cost to be a member of ICSID, and this is not uh, calculated on the basis of participation in the in the capital. Uh, the Administrative Council plays a very important role in the con context of the discussion that we're having because it's it's the administrative council who will decide if they approve or they do not approve the uh, amended rules that ICSID is, is proposing. Uh, therefore, the importance of membership of the countries in the ICSID governance. Uh, I will skip this one. This, this is an important uh, image that's been uh, provided here some time ago by, uh, these are numbers by UNTA. And you can see on the screen in blue the uh, immense increase in the last 20 years of foreign private, uh, foreign uh, direct investment, uh, growing in parallel with the, the line that you see on top of the growth of international investment agreements, which uh, for the promotion and protection of foreign investment. Most of them, including dispute settlements through uh, exit arbitration, there's approximately uh, Calculations that are approximately 3,300 uh, international in, uh, investment agreements, most of which provide for the dispute of any settlement, uh, any for the settlement of any disputes between investors and states through exit arbitration. Now, this graph is quite interesting because it it mimics the following graph, which is the number of exit cases raised by, by calendar year, as you have seen. As you can see on the screen, there's a huge increase on the number of cases that starts roughly in 1997, 1998, which is uh, by coincidence the, the year when I joined ICSID, and I hope I, I have nothing to do with the increase on, on the disputes. Um, the increase in disputes, of course, has to do with the increase on, uh, on flows of private, uh, direct, private direct investment, has to do with the increase on the number of uh, treaties that provide for arbitration of the dispute uh, settlement mechanism of, of, of choice. And it also has to do, I, want, I would like to submit, to the transparency of the system. Uh, when I started working in arbitration, this was not a well-known system. Now it is very well known, the parties feel more comfortable using it. And we continue to have uh, year after year record numbers of cases. This uh, doesn't need, has, does not reflect a more litigious society, but a, a more comfortable uh, or uses that are more comfortable with a well-established system, which is, as Anna mentioned before, uh, very close to turning 60 in, in a couple of years. Now, in, in, in the region, in particular, or in, uh, in the CIS region, you can see uh, that the patterns are very similar to the general, uh, general patterns of development of the system with a couple of caveats. As you, can, as you can see on the screen, Eastern Europe and Central Asia are the main areas uh, when it comes to respondent states, uh, closely followed by South America with a 22% of the cases, in the case of uh, South America, it has uh, uh, 
a very important factor is the Argentina crisis of 2001. So the numbers in that we are, are a little bit skewed. Uh, as you can see, uh, you can see on the screen in, in green, the number of cases, the, the same graph that we saw before, but in green, you can see the number of cases uh, uh, that comprise states from, the, from Eastern Europe and Central Asia, which as I said before, is one of the main regions where we uh, where the respondents, ex respondents come. And this is basic, but I just to mention, as you know, the basis for consent uh, for arbitration and conciliation uh, in ICSI, it, it, the basis for consent can be contracts, can be foreign investment laws, can be treaties. But the, the vast majority of our cases in the last 20 years, and this is the one, as I said, one of the reasons of the increase in the number of cases is the impact of uh, uh, international investment treaties, whether they're bilateral or uh, multilateral, with a party's consent, a state's consent to arbitration as a dispute settlement mechanism of choice. And you can see that in general, um, bilateral investment treaties stand for 60% of the uh, basis of consent in general, all exit cases. And in the case of Eastern European and Central Asian countries, it increases a little bit to a 74% plus the energy charter treaty leading to an 87% of all, 88% um, of all cases brought against the states from the Eastern Europe and Central Asia, Asia based on, on this consent. In terms of economic sectors, there, there are not much differences. It's not surprising to see that the main areas of disputes that are solved through international exit uh, arbitration, exit conciliation, are the oil, gas, and mining sector and the electric uh, power and other energy sectors. It is not surprising as uh, these are areas, economic sectors, where great investment is needed it, uh, in uh, know-how is international, transfer of know-how is needed. Therefore, these are the areas where you see more generally private in, uh, investment taking place. Now, in terms of case, uh, case outcomes, the center started about six to 10 years ago to publish uh, detailed uh, statistics of the outcomes because you generally see this idea of uh, in, in exit arbitrary, um, the states always win or in exit the investors always win. And we started to uh, want to make this criticism accountable and we started publishing careful raw data on, on cases. And as you can see uh, on the screen, and an important point that Anna mentioned before the idea of, of settlement, uh, through our analysis, we re have realized that approximately 34% of our cases never reach the adjudication phase. They are either settled or discontinuous, which has led to our uh, conclusion that there's an appetite for other softer means of uh, dispute settlement. And that's why we have been working very hard on a new set of mediation rules, uh, which is a concept that was mentioned by Anna in her presentation before. Now, in terms of the result, the outcomes for parties, approximately 35% of all exit cases are decided in favor of states and a 31% is decided in partially or totally in favor of uh, the investors. So th these are raw numbers that are very important to take into consideration. Now, in this graph, as you can see, uh, the, this graph shows those cases where the uh, tribunals actually reach a conclusion, a, a, dis a decision, which were not discontinued. And in general, you can see that uh, roughly 47% of uh, cases are decided in favor of investors. But uh, in the case of Eastern European and Central Asian states, this has been more successful than the general numbers with uh, um, only 40% of claimants being uh, awarded uh, compensation. Now, we are we were speaking about, and I'm going to take uh, only two minutes, I promise, on, on what uh, of the time. Uh, ICSID has been working since uh, 2016 uh, on, a, on the amendment project. This would be the first time ICSID amends its rules. Um, uh, and this is the most comprehensive and intensive process of reform that we have ever embarked on. It's also, as Anna mentioned before, uh, in, when speaking about UNCITRAL, the most transparent process. 
we had so far published uh, five working papers uh, we propose uh, for reform. Each working paper has collected the views of commentators, whether the private is the private sector, is states, academia, uh, NGOs, etc. We have had a complete open process. We have heard everyone. We have had before the pandemic started. We held three large uh, consultation meeting with states. Every document that we have published is available on our website. And every time we have published a document, we have invited the public at large to, um, to express their views on these proposed amendments. Now, these proposed amendments are procedural in nature, which is what ICSID does. And we, we were hoping right before the pandemic started to bring the proposals to a voting by the ICSID Administrative Council. The pandemic, of course, changed uh, uh, the plans of all of us in many, many ways. And at this point, we are. We think we're reaching the end of the process. We have reached consensus in a large number of, of uh, areas. There are two or three uh, missing points where we're still discussing with member states and hearing from, from the users. But we are confident that uh, we're going to be able to reach the, the point of conclusion of this uh, process uh, and bring the, the amendments to a reform to the administrative council fix it in the next hopefully uh, six to nine months so that that's the approach um, the idea here is to establish clear rules um, simplify and and uh, it was mentioned before alexander mentioned the idea of cost and time uh, being something that needs to be targeted this is a key component of our reform trying to make proceedings uh, more efficient and uh, less costly and and with that, I stop here. I'm sorry I have taken a lot of time, but uh, uh, this is uh, the overview of the context. Why we get to the reform? Why are we proposing reforms? To understand the reform, you need to understand the past and the evolution. And, and I would say the story of success that uh, ICSID is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gonzalo. I was going to ask you a lot of questions, but I will not. We don't have I'm, time. I'm very sorry. <laughs> we should have a separate you know, event uh, for exit. Uh, we will jump now to uh, practical issues because the reform in the end of the day is about end users. And it's really uh, uh, demanding to see what uh, people who represent the state now in current investment disputes think about the current stand of the system and it's possible improvements. So we'll start with uh, Sergei. He will not have slides, uh, no slides anymore. Uh, I'll just ask uh, him because he has a very beneficial perspective of uh, in-house counsel and external counsel uh, because of the position of the uh, ICLP as an agency between state bodies and uh, law firms, basically. So Sergei, what is your, in your opinion, uh, the main what are the main reasons of the ISDS system loss of credibility in the eyes of its users? And is it real or you just don't feel it in practice? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Olga. And thank you very much for inviting me to this amazing panel. I think it's the best uh, in this conference, to be honest. Very, very modest, yes. Uh, yes, I have some kind of uh, mixed experience because some of you know I was a practitioner as an international firm before. Now I'm at ICLP, it's a task force created to defend the Russian Federation interests in foreign proceedings and international arbitrations. And uh, of course, standard disclaimer that nothing that I will say can be attributed either to ICLP or to the Russian Federation in any proceedings. So to, to answer your question, of course, we are watching closely the ISDS system and the ISDS reform, but uh, our role is more like we're like a SWAT team or like first responders, because when we have some fire, we have, you know, to deal with it and to defend the state's interests in these proceedings. And uh, unfortunately, we are not very actively involved in, this, in the process of uh, reform, in the process of providing some uh, relevant input. And would you like to? That would be awesome. I think, yeah, we, we already discussed with Alexander that uh, we have many connections, we have many common issues which could be discussed and contributed uh, to, to, to this issue. And uh, I think we all agree that uh, there is current state of affairs that the system lost some kind of 
credibility in the eyes of uh, the end users, the main stakeholders. And there are certain problems which contributed to, to this issue. The first one is that uh, sometimes really the system works not for the purposes which it was designed for. And sometimes uh, claims are submitted not because of real investments some real problems with the state, but just for some political reasons, when they have some kind of underlying political background, when some investors were specifically picked up for this purpose to fight with a certain state. And I think you all know, or you can guess uh, which case I'm talking about. And uh, some cases uh, could be considered as like personal vendetta of some so-called investors against a certain state. And of course, the problem is that it costs a lot uh, money of this, this state's taxpayers. And uh, it's another like social aspect of this problem. Another thing is the system, I think, uh, in certain respect is unbalanced and it allows an opportunity to abuse the system also in terms of submitting uh, frivolous claims and uh, some other issues. So basically the main idea, which I think Anna was talking today and actually I think yesterday, uh, why uh, the system was created as this is basically for promotion and protection of investment. Uh, I think it's sometimes forgotten in the middle of the fight when the main purpose is just to get some money from some certain state. Speaking about frivolous claims, I think there are also not, not enough safeguards to protect against uh, this problem because, of course, we're speaking cases when we have no genuine investments, no genuine investors. Uh, we have problems with treaty shoppings and treaty shopping and uh, deliberate change of domicile of some claimants who just want to uh, have some benefits under certain treaties under certain uh, BITs, but they did not uh, provide anything in return. So the main issue here is reciprocity because the state doesn't get anything, but the state has to fight these unsubstantiated claims. Uh, and of course, there is a problem with shell companies because, as you may know, lots of investments, they are structured in a certain way uh, for maybe some tax reasons or from some other legal or illegal reasons. But in any case, uh, many claimants are also uh, represented by shell companies. And this leads to another problem, the recoverability of costs which state incurred, for example, defending its interest. And in case the state prevails, it, to be honest, it's very difficult sometimes to recover actual monies from these unsuccessful claimants because, again, they're shell companies, they have nothing, uh, they're letterbox companies, but sometimes they even don't have a letterbox. And uh, that, that's, that's the problem here. And finally, I think uh, the main issue now, especially nowadays, is the huge claim inflation and exaggeration of claims in the quantum stage, because we have two main, uh, you know, options. Uh, once, like in a virtual world, how this business could normally operate, and completely different, another story in a quantum expert report. What's with this investment? What what could be, what could happen with this company in the future? And basically, that that doesn't correspond to reality at all. And for example, in reality, company could be entitled like maybe to like several millions or even some more, but what the tribunal decide and what the quantum experts provide in the expert reports is much more bigger and th that's the problem here. So I think we're going in the right direction. And uh, as I said, we're watching closely the reform. It, uh, I think it's good that now it's getting more and more attention from all relevant stakeholders. And hopefully together we will make this system and this world better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergey. That was very specific, especially for that part. Are, well, so we should find a way to for the users' concerns to be heard and to deal with, and how to oblige claimants to have lead boxes. Yes, so that's we got. And <laughs> finally, we have Anna. Anna is a one of the most experienced, and I'm not telling that because she's my friend, uh, one of the most experienced uh, Russian practitioners uh, in investment disputes. 
she has been practicing worldwide and is heavily involved in defending Russia and investment disputes. So from your perspective, Anna, just tell us, um, because current disputes, uh, they require so many uh, solutions on complex issues and guidance is not always uh, in place, either in case law or in doctrine or whatever. So what do you think about the reform and uh, does the system, in your opinion, need uh, like radical, complete, uh, I would say change? Uh, and what are, in your opinion, because we heard Sergei, but you have a bit different perspective, what are, in your opinion, areas to be developed? Thank you very much, Olga, first of all, for the kind introduction. I'm really happy to be here today, happy to be part of this wonderful panel. And indeed, this discussion is so interesting and it's so practical uh, that I join uh, Sergei in saying that's, that's probably the best, the most informative session of this conference today. Um, and I'm happy to contribute within the very limited time, I understand I have. Um, of course, I think the discussion we're having today has many angles. Uh, first of all, with regard to the reform of the system, I think we have to distinguish two elements here, like material aspect about the BITs themselves, maybe whether the BITs themselves have to be changed, what has to be done to make them more balanced, maybe more obligations of investors have to be included in the uh, BITs, uh, respect of certain uh, laws, respect of human rights, environmental restrictions, maybe more provisions about counterclaims that states have to also bring. So I think this is one aspect, the BIT. Here today, we are more focusing, I think, on the procedural aspects, uh, how to make the procedure uh, more perfect. And there is no limit to perfection, of course. Uh, we can always try to improve things. And the discussion has been going on, I think, for at least uh, 10 years since I started practicing investment arbitration, I don't know, 12 years ago. I think there was already discussion about uh, the system, the problems that it has. Uh, some even would say, oh, the system is broken. Uh, it needs to be fixed. And it's really good to see that now the discussion was brought to a higher organized level where concrete examples and concrete solutions are being worked on. And this is the second aspect. And the third aspect, I would even say that what Sergei mentioned is an abuse of system uh, by certain investors that act in uh, bad faith. Now, I will comment maybe on some practical things, some practical issues that I see from the second element about the process, the procedure itself. Now, Olga asked me whether I think it has to be completely changed or maybe it has to be just improved. Well, I think the system has been working so far. And as I said, there is no limit to perfection. And if practitioners, if stakeholders see certain problems, of course, they need to be discussed, they need to be fixed, the solutions need to be found. Um, now, we've discussed today the issue, for example, of diversity uh, of arbitrators, people who resolve the disputes. And I can say that I see improvement in this regard. We certainly see now more female practitioners being investment arbitrators. We now certainly see more younger practitioners who are being appointed. What we still, I think, don't see enough, the di geographical diversity, especially practitioners coming from the CIS region, Russian arbitrators, I don't know, maybe Gonzalo will comment how many of the CIS or Russian practitioners are being appointed maybe by exit, if there is any comment on that. We don't see that maybe many, um, and there is room maybe to diversify in terms of the geographical representation. Of course, there could be some reason for that, because this area of law investment arbitration is not something that has been developing here in Russia or in the CIS countries for as many years as it has been done in other countries, in other jurisdictions, but definitely new generation is coming. Uh, those who have experience already in this type of disputes, those who have knowledge in this type of disputes, and hopefully we will see the change soon in this regard in terms of the diversity. 
Um, in terms of the independence, of course, the code of conduct covers all important, very good and helpful issues. And I think this initiative should be fostered and should be developed. Of course, it contains some really, one would say, fundamental basic principles, which you would understand everyone in arbitration should follow. But I think it's important to spell it out. Because when you spell it out, when you have it in certain code, certain document, then it's easy to enforce it. Uh, it's easy also to put the seat in arbitrator's mind that these are the rules they have to follow. So from my experience and from my point of view, this is very, very helpful. Another issue uh, would be about consistency of decisions, predictability of decisions, which I understand is also discussed quite intensively. Uh, and here it's quite a difficult question because the cases are being decided by people who have their own ideas, who have their own logic. Uh, and we see cases, for example, where exactly the same issues resolved by different tribunals can be really decided in a very, very different way. I saw really a few times exactly when the same issue was at stake, but different panels would take completely different approaches. And that's because really the factor, the human factor plays role, the synergy within the tribunal plays role, how the case is presented by certain counsel, by certain parties plays a role, what experts, what witnesses are being heard in certain cases, that that all plays into that picture that ultimately can lead to a completely opposing decisions that happens. What also happens we see when basically the same issues, maybe the outcome would be the same, but the reasoning, how this outcome is arrived to, that also happened in a very, very different way. So that's really difficult to tackle and to solve unless you would say, okay, this is the case law and you have to follow the case law. But I don't think this is something really that can work in arbitration. That's a different topic to what extent the case law should be binding, of course. But as long as think as human beings, as arbitrators with their different backgrounds, with their different experience, with their different thinking involved, it could be difficult to reach this consistency unless again, some maybe interpretation, standard interpretation rules apply. And this is probably the way to look at, to tackle it, how certain standard provisions of treaties should apply. Well, we have the Vienna Convention, but of course it can be interpreted again in a different ways and different factors can be taken into account. So from my perspective and I know that some practitioners also show it. I think that's a good, wonderful initiative. It has to be uh, continued. Uh, and definitely, um, as I said at the beginning, uh, there is no limit to perfection. And we should aim at really making the system as perfect as possible to make our uh, world better, as Sergei said before. So here I finish with my comments and I would be happy to answer any questions uh, anyone might have. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Anna. You re reflected on very important topics. Uh, so uh, you've heard a lot of diverse views from diverse stakeholders. Uh, hopefully it was useful to you. Uh, we would love to take some questions from audience. If you want to, we still ha can have one. Otherwise, we invite everyone uh, to the coffee break. Uh, okay, Isabel. Yes, we we we, we can't. So sorry. Okay. Very sorry. Um, yeah, uh, Isabella Kruskaya, Kerry Olson. So, very quick question to Anna. Um, as an accredited medi mediator, I was really happy to hear that actually mediation would probably be. Um, the future uh, way of uh, investor state dispute resolution. But I'm just curious to know, what do you envisage? Would it be an obligatory step you know, in this multi-tier dispute resolution or would it just be an option? Because if it would be an option, it probably wouldn't be that popular. So like, what's your opinion on that? Well, thank you very much for, uh, for this question. Uh, Isabella, I'm, I'm very uh, glad because I'm also a mediation fan. Um, so two, two, two things. The, the current state of play is that there are very few investment treaties that actually mention mediation as a way of settling disputes, which means that they are not conducive for any government official to engage into mediation. 
if tomorrow Sergei were to say, oh, we should mediate this case and would go to his minister and say, we have to, to mediate because, you know, we're probably going to lose. So we'd better off if we have a nice, good settlement early on. His minister is going to say, but what allows you to do that? Does the treaty say you can mediate? No. So the only way you have to, the only avenue you have in the treaty is to go to arbitration unless you have an amicable settlement. The amicable settlement is something that, you know, sometimes can be considered as fishy, taking place in a non-transparent manner. So if the treaty is not conducive to mediation, it's, it's, um, it's a hurdle. The second thing is we've also heard from uh, Gonzalo is, uh, is that you have about 30% of the cases that settle before they go to actual arbitrate to the uh, final award. So that tells you also something about the preparedness for settlement. Now, what mediation as a, an alternative means with much stronger support in the treaties and in the procedure will provide is to cater for these 30% in a way which will be acceptable, transparent, and enforceable, because that's also a big issue is, uh, you know, thanks, for example, to the uh, Singapore Convention, now you can enforce mediated settlements. So what, what we, we intend to, to work on is we don't want to duplicate existing uh, rules. For example, ICSID is putting forward a set of rules for investor state mediation. There are already rules at the IBA on, on investor state mediation. So the idea is not that we come up with the ancestral rules on investor state mediation. That would be not very efficient. But what we are going to provide for are mechanisms that will allow for mediation in treaties, even if the treaty doesn't provide for mediation, so that government officials and investors will, find, will be comfortable <laughs> that the mediation process is not a mere waste of time or waste of, uh, you know, show of bad face, but rather that it is an efficient means of settling not all disputes, but at least those that really warrant an early settlement, uh, rather than having to go until five years to at the end of the day having to pay or not pay or whatever. So it's really about providing an efficient means that has more credibility and more efficiency than it has today in the investment uh, stage. So yes, brace yourself. We will soon have investor state mediation cases handled in the BVI. <laughs> Ramonas, can we have an individual session with you? <laughs> or, okay. Yes, if the audience let me. Yes. yes. Very small, but uh, quite, uh, quite attractive. Uh, Gonzalo. Actually, it's a question for you, and I would like to both honest to, to comment on. Uh, Ahmia, Comstory cases, PIT, Energy Charter Treaty. What's next? Next is the clash between exit and EU law. And my question: How exit is prepared for that? Uh, is prepared for that clash? And uh, what's your forecast? It's coming. Thank you. Uh, let me start by saying I don't know if I have to say thank you for that question, but. Thank you for that question. Uh, it, is a, it is a difficult question, but it's a substantive question. Um, if you look at the history of Ixit, the, the genius, everybody says that the genius of Aaron Brockes, who was the founder of Ixit, was establishing a procedural mechanism. And that's, that's what Ixit is. Ixit was able to establish a consensus procedural mechanism that could be accepted by all users, uh, by private investors and states. Um, and I always try like to remark as a source, as a tool for a peaceful settlement of international disputes. Your question goes straight to the to the substance of the disputes, and in that regard, that's a matter that has been decided consistently by, by tribunals. It's a very complex uh, question. It's it's not an easy question. Uh, that I it's not something that we should shy away from, but it's a sub substance question that need to be addressed directly by the decision makers, by the, by, the, by the arbitrators appointed to decide these cases. And in this regard, there was a point, that, and I'm gonna combine your question with something that Anna said uh, before about the lack of uh, Russian arbitrators in exit systems. 
I think a key component of everything, of all the development of the answers to your question on Ahmea and on the question of diversity has to do with transparency in two aspects. The more decisions that go out there, the more we know about the system, the better decisions that come, more consistent, we will see more consistency on decisions and we will be able to find solutions by difficult legal questions like the, the question of the, uh, the intra-EU problem. And in terms of uh, Anna Reese, in the, she, her last intervention, she mentioned that there were not uh, Russian arbitrators, so there was little diversity. I think it also has to do with, uh, with transparency and a better understanding and knowledge of the system. Uh, I, the advantage of doing this from my house and not being there is that I can look at the internet and I check, and in fact, there have been no uh, Russian arbitrators uh, ever appointed on, on exit cases to my, my surprise. But at the same time, I have seen the development of international investment arbitration in other regions, particularly in, in Latin America. When I started 25 years ago, there were no, there were one or two experts. Now you see very thriving communities in different parts of the world. And this has to do again, in great, great part with the transparency of the system and the access to knowledge, which is part of one of the, one of the objectives of the center. The, of exit to spread knowledge and to foster the development of international investment law. And I stop there. I hope I have been able to dodge the question with some level of elegance. <laughs> Thank you, Gonzalo. Ramon, we prohibited Anas to comment here. <laughs> we are going to have a coffee break. Uh, we should say good morning to Gonzalo because it's already 5.30 a.m. in Washington. <laughs> and we finally, you are free for a coffee break. Thank you very much for staying with us so long. Thank you very much. Let's get started. I would like to begin by welcoming everyone uh, to this panel. Uh, the panel is on the call for civility in international arbitration. Uh, as this is set out in the new ICA guidelines on standards of practice in international arbitration. And uh, obviously these guidelines are a, re a reaction uh, to what many of us perceive as increasing incivility uh, in arbitration, the use of guerrilla tactics and things like that and aggressive uh, uh, attacks and ad hominem attacks and all the kinds of things that unfortunately we see from time to time. Uh, and our panel, I must say, is particularly timely since these ICA guidelines were launched uh, on June 3rd, 2021, which was only about three and a half months ago. So this may be one of the first panels uh, discussing uh, these uh, uh, guidelines. And uh, I, I think uh, it, it's very commendable for ICA to produce a document uh, which deals with the issue of civility, which is something that counsel and arbitrators can point to uh, when civility issues arise. Well, the ICA guidelines are only three and a half uh, months old, uh, but if I may take us back a bit, uh, much longer ago, indeed, I would say more than 2,300 years ago, uh, Aristotle argued that goodness and good behavior is not a means to an end, but is rather an end in itself that should be followed without the need for any other justification. Good behavior is its own end. And he might have thought that good behavior and civility are an inherent part of any system of justice and do not need to be justified by any practical reasons. Now, this may well be true from an idealistic standpoint, but we as lawyers, of course, also have a clear and established duty uh, to act in the best interest of our clients. So what happens if civility in a particular situation is not in the interest of our clients? And particularly in a situation where the incivility in question wouldn't violate any mandatory rules or any uh, mandatory principles of legal ethics. Well, at that point, do we as lawyers have a duty to abandon civility? Well, I would like to submit to you for the purpose of today's discussion, and maybe with the panelists, uh, we can uh, debate this a bit, uh, but I would submit to you 
that we don't really need to answer that question uh, because incivility, I would submit to you, is almost never in our client's best interests. Now, why do I say that? We must never forget that our essential goal in the interest of our clients is always to win the arbitration. That's our goal. And we win the arbitration by convincing the arbitrators and not anybody else, not the other side, uh, they're being paid to disagree with us. And so we need to convince the arbitrators that our client's position is correct. Now, I don't know if any of you receive in your inboxes uh, the word rate columns of Gary Kinder. Uh, he uh, advises law firms on effective legal writing. And one of his word rate columns has the following title, and this is a quote, so uh, um, these are not my words. Uh, and the title of his article is, quote, Your Honor, you are stupid, you suck, and please decide for me, unquote. And Mr. Kinder advises that this is hardly a good way to win your case. Now, I submit to you also that arbitrators tend to be impressed and may give the benefit of the doubt to counsel who demonstrate professional integrity and present their case in a clear and logical manner without vituperation or nastiness. And I think it should be pointed out that this in no way limits a lawyer's ability to make strong arguments on behalf of the client. I would say to the contrary. So put simply, I submit to you that a counsel who engages in guerrilla tactics or is nasty and uncivil to the tribunal or to opposing counsel or to anyone else connected with the arbitration loses credibility to the arbitrators. Would you be more likely to believe someone who raises their voice, is aggressive and makes disparaging and unsupported ad hominem attacks rather than someone who firmly but politely proves their case. And if a counsel is found to have submitted a forged document, which happens, or to have misrepresented the contents of a judicial decision, which also happens, credibility I submit to the arbitral tribunal is utterly lost. Now, sometimes clients need to have all of this explained to them so they don't think that this aggressiveness is really helping their case and makes them feel good. But if it's really hurting their case, then it's the duty of counsel, I think, to uh, explain that. So in short, uh, good behavior in an international arbitration, I submit to you for discussion, is truly a means to the end of improving your chances of winning the case. And in addition, Aristotle may also be right to the extent that he suggests that good behavior is also an end in itself and contributes to justice and also to the credibility of the arbitration process itself. So turning now to the ICA civility guidelines, now it is true that they do not purport to set out mandatory rules of civility, but rather they lay out what they call guiding principles of civility in international arbitration. Now, to the extent that they do lay out useful and reasonable principles, and this is a point that will be uh, treated in detail and discussed by our panelists, uh, to the extent that they do so, uh, I would suggest that they should be followed uh, for the reasons that I've just sketched out. However, in addition, uh, they can be incorporated by the parties in their arbitration agreement, or they can be included by arbitral tribunals in a procedural order or in terms of reference. Uh, under those circumstances, they can be bindingly adopted by agreement of the parties. Now, in any case, and I think this may be a, a very significant aspect of the guidelines, is that now there's something that arbitrators and parties can point to when they're faced with a situation of incivility during an arbitration. Now we have something to point to. We could say, well, members of the tribunal, you know, the new ICA guidelines, they say this, this, this. And I consider that my distinguished colleague on the other side is not really complying with this. And 
I would ask you to take this into account or, or please do something about it. Or an arbitrator uh, can point to the ICA guidelines and say, well, in our view, this and this council is just not, uh, uh, we would ask you that you try to calm down and do something different. Now, the civility guidelines are divided into four sections. Uh, the first is general guidelines for all arbitration participants. Next, guidelines for party representatives, then guidelines for arbitrators, and finally, guidelines for other participants, which include expert and fact witnesses, tribunal secretaries, and uh, personnel of arbitral institutions. Uh, now, uh, each of our four speakers today uh, has agreed to address one of the four sections. So each will lay out first uh, and explain the specific civility guidelines in the section they have agreed to address. This will enable you all uh, to have a, a, a good and clear overview of what these guidelines actually say. But afterwards, uh, we have agreed with the panelists that they uh, will be free afterwards to share with us their own notions of civility, because of course, civility in one place may not be the same as civility in another, and also share with us any other comments they may wish to make. Now, we are most fortunate to have with us today four very distinguished panelists, and let me briefly uh, introduce each of them uh, to you in the order in which they will be presenting the four sections. So, first of all, we have Uliana Cook. Uh, we're grateful to her for being in Moscow and uh, being the only live presenter here uh, for those of you who are also in, in Moscow and sitting in the library. Uh, so thank you for that, uh, Uliana. Uh, and um, Uliana is a partner specializing in international arbitration at PCB Burn LLP in London. She acts as counsel to states, corporations, individuals, uh, and, and also involving uh, treaty investor cases in the CIS region, also Africa, Asia, the Middle East, uh, with issues under both common and civil law. She's duly qualified, dual qualified uh, in uh, England and in Russia as a lawyer and teaches international commercial arbitration in the LLM program at Queen Mary University in London. Next is Olga Botenko, uh, who will address the second section of the guidelines. Olga is a partner in the dispute resolution group at Bang of Partners in Hong Kong. She has over a decade of experience advising states and investors on investment arbitration disputes under various institutional rules. Uh, she previously served as a legal counsel at the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague and teaches arbitration law at the University of Hong Kong and international investment law at the Royal University of Law and Economics in Phnom Penh. She's admitted both in Hong Kong and in the Russian Federation. Uh, next, we have Drew Holliner, who will present the third section on uh, the guidelines for arbitrators. And he is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and is admitted to practice in Russia, England, BVI, California, and Ireland. And uh, he regularly acts as counsel or arbitrator in disputes involving the application of the laws of Russia and other CIS associated member states. Uh, he also sits on the panels of arbitrators of several arbitral institutions. Finally, uh, last but certainly not least, is Laura Harden, who will address the fourth and final section of the guidelines. Uh, she is the co-chair of the Alvarez and Marsal International Arbitration Group and heads the firm's international arbitration practice in the United States, where I take it she is now uh, meaning that she's gotten up quite early in the morning to be with us, and I thank her for that. Uh, that's true of Drew, too, by the way, I guess even more so because he's in Los Angeles. Uh, she has over 25 years of experience providing business valuation, damages quantification, and forensic accounting services for both claimants and respondents involving a variety of industries. And, and, uh, she's fluent in Russian and has been involved in numerous engagements involving Russia and countries of the former Soviet Union. 
so uh, that sort of gives you an overview of, of our uh, panel and what we hope to accomplish uh, with you today. And so without any more ado, I turn the floor over to Juliana Cook, uh, who will discuss with us uh, the first section of the guidelines and then her own views. Juliana, please. Much for this uh, very kind introduction, and thank you to the ABA and the Russian Arbitration Association for this kind invitation. I, I personally would like to add that I'm delighted to be back uh, in my hometown, and it's great to see um, everyone here in the audience in person. Um, so, we'll, we'll uh, in my section, I'll address the general guidelines, which are contained in part one of the ECO guidelines, followed by a few remarks um, on my own. So there are six uh, principles uh, in the general guidelines uh, set out in sections IA to IF. Uh, important to note that um, they apply to all participants in international arbitration, including counsel, arbitrators, tribunal secretaries, witnesses, experts, translators, interpreters, court reporters, staff of arbitral institutions. And that's basically a starting sto sort of a, a starting point of the ECO guidelines, if you'd like, followed by more specific guidelines that my colleagues would address. Um, guideline one, uh, y, uh, 1A um, sets out a requirement that all participant, uh, participants shall act with integrity respect and civility vis-a-vis -vis other participants in the arbitral process. Um, the ECA task force um, was chaired by the American lawyer, um, Abby Cohn Smutney and Argentine arbitrator, uh, Guido Tabel. And um, the, the, the task force um, worked, um, I, I, I think, and they've done tremendous um, job. And, uh, collecting uh, the surveying ethical standards um, in various legal traditions and uh, understanding what uh, other practitioners uh, mean mean by civility. Uh, you'll see that there is no um, definition of civility in the ECA guidelines. However, it is commonly understood um, that um, civility is, uh, in the practice of law, is an essential attribute um, of maintaining the rule of law. And of course, international arbitration, as we know, is part of the justice system. And this guideline really serves uh, the function um, of maintaining the rule of law and maintaining public confidence in international arbitration. Um, and, and we know that the arbitral process really cannot work effectively unless each participant in the arbitral proceedings treats one another with courtesy, respect, and civility, and adheres to basic standards of integrity, honesty, and condor. So these guidelines uh, is further followed by five specific guidelines. And just to mention that each guideline um, has a substantive expl explanation that can be found in the ECO guideline. Um, so guideline 1B continues to say that all participants shall respect all forms of diversity and cultural backgrounds represented in the, in the international arbitration community and refrain from any form of discriminatory conduct. So this guideline reflects the paramount importance of respect for various uh, cultures, um, languages, um, ethnic, religious, geographic, gender, disability, sexual and orientation and other forms of diversity considerations and reflects the cross-cultural um, environment that characterizes international arbitration. Um, and it just serves a reminder to all participants that they should be aware and respect for all forms of diversity that exist and also be aware really of the risk of unconscious bias and be mindful of that. Guideline 1C um, provides that all participants shall act in order to ensure that international arbitration remains a timely and cost-effective means of dispute resolution subject to the particular circumstances of each case. Important to note that, of course, you know, each case uh, has its own complexity and um, timeliness and cost-effectiveness de de depends on, the, on specific 
circumstances of, of a particular arbitration. Uh, but really, this is just a reminder for uh, a, a reaffirmation uh, of the duty of all participants in international arbitration to work towards the effective and effective and fair administration of justice. Um, and of course, professionalism entails both the requisite skill and the ability and availability to dedicate the time and resources necessary to perform the required duties of every single participant, participant in international arbitration. Guideline uh, 1D uh, sets out a requirement uh, that all participants shall respect the rights of parties and non-parties to privacy and confidentiality where applicable. Uh, we all know that um, arbitrations involve a significant amount of information concerning the case um, that may include personal and sensitive information about individuals. And we're not talking about witnesses and experts involved. Uh, we also um, need to think about persons um, who may have been involved in the underlying facts of the disputes and have to be mindful of the sensitivity uh, surrounding that personal data of, of those individuals. Um, interestingly, uh, it, the, the, the explanation uh, provides clearly that this guideline does not uh, seek to regulate the data protection and privacy obligation, obligations that um, are governed by the relevant applicable law. Um, and they, they are not meant to provide um, a separate distinct obligations of confidentiality. Um, but by contrast, the, the principle that's embodied here, it's, it's, it is really uh, may require, uh, you know, implementing certain uh, considerations of privacy and confidentiality, say in hearings, so that may require limiting those who are present in the hearing room during testimony on, on a sensitive matter, or excluding from um, the record um, an exhibit which contains private data um, of an individual um, where the use of such data is aimed solely at um, harassing or putting undue pressure on that individual. Guideline uh, 1E uh, requires that all participants shall ensure that those individuals under their supervision follow the standards of practice expressed in these guidelines. And that's an interesting guideline that it's clearly sets, expands the reach of the guidelines to make sure that those who are under supervision of the practitioners who bear the principal responsibilities in arbitration follow those standards of practice. Um, and it just serves again as a reminder that um, the guidelines apply to all participants in international arbitration, regardless of whether they have legal training or have been admitted um, as a member of a bar or a particular association or other professional body. Guideline 1F um, finally sets out that all participants shall disclose conflicts of interest and or facts or circumstances that may call into question the integrity of the arbitration process. Uh, that's, that's again, so that's a, a really a reflection of a basic standard of practice expected from all, all participants to disclose any material information, which if not disclosed at the appropriate juncture may jeopardize the integrity of the arbitral process or the finality of the award. And important to remember that that's an ongoing um, duty um, really throughout the, the arbitration. And it doesn't, it's not just applicable to the arbitrators, uh, it, it is applicable to everyone. Um, this guideline, however, does not purport to regulate the types of information that are subject to disclosure and um, the questions, um, you know, to the extent of the data that um, needs to be disclosed. Uh, basically, that, that, that is uh, subject to the applicable statutory, institutional or other legal instruments outside of these guidelines. Um, but really the, the general guidelines, they set out a, a, a framework um, of the conduct um, of uh, the participants in international arbitration. And I think um, it's, I quite like um, the quote of the late Joni Vida who said that 
lawyers are not musicians or ballet dancers. Um, a lawyer's training skills and ethics are still essentially rooted in a national legal system. And it's far from clear how and to what extent national professional rules apply abroad to the transnational law and the international arbitration process. And from our panel, we can just see uh, the diversity um, and um, you know, the variety of cultural backgrounds involved. And um, I'm, 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 I'm pleased to, to, to see and uh, fully agree with Peter that um, the general guidelines um, just reflect the maturity of the international arbitration process. And, um, you know, it's, it, it, it is, I would say, uh, it, it, it cre creates a, a voluntary sort of benchmark of the standards of practice in international arbitration. And it's helpful, as Peter mentioned, to help this common framework for conduct during international arbitration um, that basically uh, can be referenced, um, agreed to reference in the arbitration agreement um, or implemented uh, in the procedural order um, number one, I'd suggest. Um, and um, of course, civility, the notion of civility differ, differs, uh, and I guess there are various standards in different jurisdictions that govern the concept of civility. Um, and in, in England, uh, we have uh, the SRA, uh, the Solicitor's Regulator, uh, Regulatory Authority, and the Bar Standards Board for barristers that are responsible for monitoring uh, the, the conduct of solicitors and barristers. Uh, but I think for uh, the international arbitration community, it, it is really um, undeniably helpful to have um, a, a, an international framework that that uh, that, uh, that that is basically go, that, that um, is um, you know the parties can 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 see and uh, council can refer to. Um, I would say that for me, since we are here to address also what civility means to every one of each of us here, I I I, I agree with. Um, I quite like the expression of uh, James Spiegelman, a, a former Australian judge, that who said, civility is not simply a matter of etiquette and manners. The core element of civility is the manifestation of respect for other persons. And I would add to that, uh, perhaps, uh, really uh, being aware of um, various cultures and legal traditions uh, that you, know, you might encounter um, in international arbitration and the ways to achieve that potentially for everyone involved to maybe have a universal sort of understanding of civility in international arbitration could be by starting and promoting those core elements um, in law firms, make thinking uh, potentially of broader issues of, um, you know, unconscious bias that may exist and potentially even mental health considerations that I think have recently also been covered uh, quite extensively in the international arbitration community. So that's really, I would submit, um, it's, it's up to us, the, the practitioners, to develop the notion and what it means to, um, to the international arbitration community as a whole. And with that, Peter, I'll, I'll conclude my part. Thank you very much, Juliana. Uh, very, very interesting to walk us through these general guidelines. And uh, as you pointed out, they are very general, uh, which is both a virtue and a vice, perhaps. Uh, it's a virtue in that they can be generally applied across the world. Uh, but maybe we have to hope that arbitral tribunals in particular and counsel in particular cases will adapt them to the realities of the particular case and the particular cultures of the parties. And maybe that's why the ICA people decided not to define civility. Uh, so having said that, uh, I'm happy to turn the floor over to Olga Botenko, who will now address the second uh, section of the guidelines on uh, party representatives. Olga. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And uh, good afternoon to everybody in uh, Moscow from uh, late afternoon here in Hong Kong. Uh, before I set out the guidelines for party representatives, um, just one question. Do you all see the uh, screen share of my slides? You, yeah. you do. I hope that's not my inbox, but uh, rather the slides uh, that I've prepared for, 
for the presentation. In fact, uh, when uh, Peter convened uh, a meeting of the panelists to discuss uh, the presentation, I felt very lucky that I would have to, in fact, cover this particular topic, and that's guidelines for party representatives. And I thought to myself, everyone who's ever acted as counsel in international arbitration would have a plethora of stories to share about counsel being uncivil, counsel being, being nasty, uncooperative, aggressive, and so on and so forth. So I thought, well, that would be an easy and entertaining session because I could then just share all these war stories and then seek everybody's views on uh, what they think about counsel being uncivil. But um, as I uh, thought deeper about the issue and now being reminded by Peter and Uliana about this, um, ideal world that I hope one day I, I'll live in, where counsel are courteous and polite to one another, to the tribunal, to witnesses and to experts. I thought that the issue, in fact, the issue of counsel misconduct, or rather the issue of counsel being uncivil, goes deeper than, uh, than just sharing uh, stories of examples of uh, counsel being nasty. And in fact, uh, that issue pertains to a number of questions. What if, for example, uh, being uncivil or rather unnecessarily aggressive or uncooperative is part of uh, strategy? And what if that strategy is, in fact, uh, effective, despite what uh, Peter was telling us about how the tribunals might find it um, unconvincing if counsel uh, for either uh, party act in an aggressive and unacceptable manner? And, and if, it's, uh, if it's an effective strategy, if it destabilizes, for example, a witness or an expert on cross-examination such that the expert doesn't come uh, across as a, a convincing expert who knows what he or she is talking about, then is that really necessarily unethical to deploy a, a, a strategy or conduct that's not necessarily civil? So with that in mind, I thought, and that brought me back to the uh, issue here in the guidelines, uh, which Juliana and Peter also highlighted, is that, that there is no definition of uh, civility. And if there is no definition of civility, then how can we enforce the guidelines in calling something civil or uncivil? Now, with respect respect to uh, party representatives and their conduct, there, I, I put up here on the on the slide the uh, the exact wording of the guidelines. But uh, and and you see it's very concise. But essentially, what the guidelines uh, when it comes to party representatives appear to call uncivil behavior would be behavior uh, on the council where the council is not acting cooperatively. So a uh, lack of cooperation. Um, a second would be where a council is not acting with respect and courtesy or is acting offensively or with disrespect towards the other participants. And then the two other elements, uh, which uh, I, especially the third one, which is false submissions of facts. It's the, uh, an issue of, uh, uh, for the regulators to take into account, particularly here in Hong Kong, where a Hong Kong admitted lawyers um, uh, shall not mislead the court or, or the, uh, the, uh, the tribunal in this particular case. So um, in, in the interest of time, I would focus on the first two items simply because uh, false submissions um, are quite uh, deeply regulated already in a number of jurisdictions. And of course, the finality of an award is a separate issue on, on, on its own. And I'll start with uh, the issue of a party representative not acting cooperatively. And I think a lot of us, uh, and the council here in the audience, you, you had arbitrations where council on the other side would uh, uh, act so uncooperatively to the point that, for example, they wouldn't accept the correct corrections of their own typos in e-bundles index just for the sake of it. Or uh, they would file applications on Christmas Eve or on Friday night but then they refused to get on a call uh, over the weekend saying that no claims should be placed on council time over the weekend, yet they, they would request uh, that uh, you on the other, um, on the other side to uh, do just that. So there are a number of examples of council being uncooperative. And how in the absence of these guidelines would, uh, uh, would council or tribunal uh, be expected to deal with those? Now, um, Peter mentioned that uh, an experienced tribunal will 
advocacy through these issues and would likely uh, take uh, that sort of conduct into account, at least uh, when, when it comes to cost of the arbitration. But uh, there is a dilemma there, at least for me, because if you're counsel on the other side and you are acting in a polite and civilized manner and you're facing behavior of that nature, like, do you bring that out? Do you highlight that? Do you address the tribunal and ask the tribunal, for example, now with reference to these guidelines, to uh, issue a reprimand uh, to the party? And, and it's uh, an option that's open, but uh, in, in my experience, whenever that attempt is made, it's, it's the council who is bringing forward that sort of behavior that appears uncooperative or, or appears to be stalling the uh, proceedings. So it's really a judgment call and, and uh, it all really depends on the tribunal and whether the tribunal is amenable to reprimand a party who is uh, acting in a way that's not uh, cooperative. Um, and the second issue um, I, I would like to address is the issue of uh, respect and courtesy. And now uh, Uliana uh, set out a number of definitions of what is civility. And there's probably a number of definitions as well of what is respect and how it manifests in, in, uh, in party submissions. So I, uh, I thought I would uh, simply set out examples anonymized quotes from uh, the latest submissions that uh, that I've seen and seek your views. Do you think uh, these uh, sorts of submissions, written submissions, are they respectful, are they courteous when it comes to the other, um, to, to a conduct, conduct and are they in compliance with the ECA guidelines? For example, opening a reply submission by saying the claimant's memorial is yet again long, confusing and unhelpful. Now, why would that statement be made? It doesn't address the issue of fact. It doesn't address any legal argument. But rather, if you're looking at the underpinning for that statement as an opening to, to reply submission, that's discourteous. That is uh, targeting the uh, counsel on the other side and whether that counsel is being professional. And that's not necessarily helpful for the tribunal, but that creates this uh, uh, or of, of uh, hostility in, in, in the proceedings, that's not necessarily helpful. Then the second quote, and that's a quote uh, describing an expert, uh, of course, a quote coming from the other side, um, it is a poor piece of counsel work with the more than obvious aim to create an artificial, absurd and ridiculous counterclaim and so on and so forth. And I see, and, and in fact, I should uh, at, uh, at some stage publish a book of these sorts of quotes where counsel uh, in writing act as if uh, they find glory in humiliating counsel on the other side, witnesses on the other side, experts, and, and Laura uh, would probably attest to that, the experts get attacked uh, quite often and routinely, uh, in fact, on, uh, on, on cross-examination and, and uh, whether that's uh, necessary and how to prevent that from happening. That sort of emotive uh, uh, language that's not necessarily dealing with matters of uh, facts or law. And, and with that, uh, that brings me to uh, my conclusive remark. And that's the point of, um, um, in fact, two points. The first point is if uh, we see a conduct uh, on the other side that's uncivil, that's uh, discourteous, and that's uh, uh, ruining the integrity of the proceedings, well, of course, it's very easy to criticize that and share war stories and say, well, the counsel on the other side was absolutely nasty. Uh, but I think uh, that's a secondary issue because the council would not necessarily be nasty unless that behavior would be learned somewhere. So I think if we are to implement these guidelines in, in, uh, in, in an effective manner, we need to also look at the, our own environment within our own practices, where you see, for example, how often do you see where um, an associate dealing with another associate and you believe that, um, for example, there could be more civility there, you would intervene and, and uh, uh, resolve a dispute. Or how often do you uh, um, step in and, and uh, um, um, assist the associates with not working over the weekend or um, uh, describe your views over uncivil conduct on the other side? That, I believe, needs uh, to be addressed as well, starting not only from the council on the other side, but also looking uh, within ourselves. And finally, uh, on the point of the tribunal, that's a quote that um, some of you would be familiar with because it's quite famous. It's, uh, it's a quote from uh, an actual uh, order 
by uh, uh, Oklahoma District Judge, um, uh, Judge Wayne Alley, who was dealing with the parties council on both sides and were bickering over document production. And that's what he, uh, what he said in the order. I have a little this notion of hell there, but he clearly described that context as uncivil where, uh, and, and unnecessary. And, and he was upset by that. So whether in addition to having guidelines of that nature, whether it would also be helpful for the tribunals to, um, to feel that if there is a, a conduct that's particularly uncivil, then that needs to be mentioned in procedural orders or in, uh, in, in the final award and whether that needs to be reflected on costs. And one uh, last point I see that I uh, overran by two minutes. One last point I, I would mention is that uh, I do find in terms of uh, council conduct, I do find glory in after a hard for, uh, fought case even if uh, you lose, where you feel the need to come up to the council on the other side and shake his or her hand and say, well argued, rather than you know finish the arbitration and, and uh, never want to hear from the council on the other side again. I'll finish with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Olga. Uh, you know, one thought occurs to me listening to you. Uh, what is the correct response of, of opposing counsel when the other side gets very aggressive and, and, and makes ad hominem attacks? Well, I had that happen to me in one hearing. And uh, I turned to the tribunal, I said, members of the tribunal, I, I, I don't really feel any desire to get involved in this kind of a colloquy. But if you have any question you'd like me to answer about what this gentleman has said, I would be happy to respond to it. And the tribunal said, no, 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 we don't need any information from you, it's fine. So that gives you an example of uh, how you can handle a situation like that very calmly. And then of course, the other side looks the way they should look, namely that they've just been uh, gratuitously aggressive. So now I, I turn the floor over to uh, Drew Holliner uh, for the third section on uh, guidelines for arbitrators, Drew. Uh, thank you, Peter. So we uh, look in this guidelines on um, civility for arbitrators, They're usually not uh, participants in the process that are usually observed or thought to be uncivil or rude. Um, it's usually not a problem, although we've perhaps all come across uh, exceptions to that rule. Um, but I would uh, submit to you that um, uh, as far as these guidelines are concerned, arbitrators are perhaps the best place to promote stability and facilitate use of the guidelines by virtue of their role in the process. And um, <clears throat> uh, that can happen in uh, a couple of ways. Uh, one, encouraging civility by one's own example, uh, by following the guidelines, not just the saying I'm following the guidelines, but following the spirit of the guidelines and the explanations that are given, and we will go through some of those, which um, are perhaps helpful um, because uh, as one dives deeper into the explanations given, it's we can see it's more than just uh, sort of limits on uncivil behavior, but it's uh, fostering and encouraging a culture of respect uh, for one another in the arbitral process. Um, a second way the arbitrators can um, uh, promote civility uh, and facilitate use of the guidelines is as suggested in the beginning of it is by actually um, referring to it perhaps in the procedural order in terms of reference. Um, this may not always be necessary, but it may be useful uh, in circumstances where um, there are people from uh, participants from different cultural backgrounds. Uh, so you can sort of set down a baseline of, of behavior that is expected of parties. If one goes through these uh, various guidelines, both for the arbitrators and others, we do we can identify certain themes that sort of come out uh, uh, that, that the uh, guidelines are designed to encourage in arbitration, as I mentioned, respect for others. Um, at the beginning, uh, and this is useful to arbitrators as well, to introductory comments, uh, there's some pretty clear statements about what the guidelines are are intended to be and what they are not intended to be. 
In particular, they're not intended to be a basis for sanctions when uh, no other such basis exists. There are some uh, rules, uh, institutional rules that do have sanctions, but that's not the purpose of the guidelines. It's not the purpose of the guidelines for uh, uh, arbitrators to use it to sort of as a cudgel to bludgeon counsel that's, well, you aren't following this um, uh, in, in that sort of uh, vein. Uh, nor are they intended to increase litigiousness or exacerbate disputes between the parties. We wouldn't expect reams of submissions on why one or the other party isn't following the guidelines and the explanations there to do and so forth. Nor is it intended to uh, discourage fair and rigorous advocacy. That means it's not uh, intended to um, impinge on particular advocacy file, uh, when, uh, it, which may vary quite a bit but to keep it in bounds that uh, demonstrate respect uh, for other participants in the process. If we look at um, the rules, I'll just start with uh, uh, the guidelines, not the rules, guidelines. Um, we can see for arbitrators here, the very first and hopefully this is visible. Um, the first one, A, 3A, says the arbitrators shall address all participants in an international arbitration in a courteous and impartial manner. Arbitrators shall not employ hostile, demeaning, or humiliating terms in written or oral communications with participants in an international arbitration. Again, you know, one would hope that um, that is something that we don't commonly see uh, in arbitration, uh, berating counsel and, and, and the like. Um, but when we get into the uh, explanations given by ICA to these guidelines, we can see a, 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 a sort of wider principle being embodied here. Um, one point is raised is to avoid a patronizing or authoritarian attitude uh, when conducting an arbitration. Now, that can often be difficult for a person because, after all, as an arbitrator, you are in a position of authority. And... A position of authority can cause people to behave in an authoritative manner or an authoritarian manner. It's sort of human nature. Um, uh, arbitrators might have in mind uh, uh, judges that they've encountered in their practice and, and seek to em emulate their behavior. But really what the guidelines here are trying to uh, foster sort of culture arbitration that um, uh, 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 respects the parties to this view. And when we think about it, uh, arbitrator's authority, unlike a judge, doesn't come from appointment by, by some state, but their authority comes from the party's agreement. They're rendering service to the parties as a neutral. Um, and so there are a very number of aspects of arbitration that we wouldn't find encountered in, uh, in litigation, um, uh, where, the, where the arbitrator is going to be much more sensitive to parties' agreements on issues, seeking their input on procedural matters. Um, so that is one thing that um, parties can avoid under these guidelines. Also, uh, there's reference to empathy and sensitivity to participants' unique backgrounds. Now, that's particularly true um, in international arbitration as opposed to litigation, where it's common that the participants in the process all come from very different backgrounds. Um, in a state court, you might be expected, if you show up in, a, in, a, in, a, in an English or a Russian court, you might be expected to know uh, how to conduct yourself there and what is expected of you there. It's quite different in an arbitration where parties can change from dispute to dispute and the types of backgrounds that they have. A couple of things that are mentioned is particularly the um, um, questioning by arbitrators. Now, in some cultures, in, in, in common law systems, it's quite uh, common for a judge to uh, interrupt counsel, to engage in questioning in sort of devil's advocate type style, to try and tease out and understand the position better. It's not you know, necessarily in a, uh, a, in a hostile way, but, but in other cultures, it can be perceived that way. In many civil law jurisdictions, um, it would be quite rude to interrupt the counsel when they're speaking, or it might be expected that uh, any sort of interventions or questions would be reserved to the end of the presentation or even uh, 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 given and, and the party given a, a, a break of time to respond to those questions. Well, how can an arbitrator uh, deal with that? Well, one, um, maybe not necessarily uh, varying their style, but it's certainly 
uh, making clear up front what the parties are to expect and what that means. Um, something that might be get, uh, taken for granted, say, in an arbitration involving American English parties uh, would create surprise or, or, or discomfort in a civil law jurist uh, when you're dealing with practitioners from a civil law jurist. So it's good to have those um, uh, sort of rules of the game explained and agreed up front so people know what to expect when you do have a cultural uh, difference in the arbitration. So looking at this guideline, the arbitrator might ask himself, do I, um, how do I treat the parties in this dispute? If we've got parties from different jurisdictions, do I treat them differently just because they lack formal legal training in my jurisdiction or in the jurisdiction of the seat? Um, am I making unwarranted assumptions that certain procedures or conduct expected or accepted in my jurisdiction that the seat will apply? Now, I've often seen, you know, we often see in, um, uh, in arbitrations where counsel will come up and say, well, we should do this in the usual way. I've often, you often see that comment, well, we will expect to do this in the usual way. Um, uh, but having no basis in the rules of the arbitration is simply expected because the, perhaps the counsel and the arbitrator have a common background, these sorts of procedures will be followed. So it's important that um, uh, in order to solve these types of issues, an arbitrator proactively manage the party's expectations of what will happen in the procedure because all parties are on the same page. Arbitrators should also make an effort to ensure all parties are being heard and taken seriously without accepting of bias or discrimination. Um, this can also require special care when Say, for example, the counsel and arbitrator from one jurisdiction or for one background and, and counsel for another party from another. Um, I recall a um, arbitration was involved where we had a panel of uh, three English barristers and arbitrators. One party was represented by English counsel and the other by Ukrainian in-house counsel. The arbitration was under English law and um, the the Arbitration was conducted normally in the way, uh, 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 say, an English practitioner would expect. But we end up having a uh, a challenge alleging bias in that uh, arbitration because the uh, Ukrainian counsel ended up getting the perception they weren't taken seriously. Uh, they weren't taken seriously as as uh, English counsel simply because they weren't trained in that uh, jurisdiction. Um, <clears throat> if we move on to uh, Guideline B, I think I can pull it up there. Arbitrator shall ensure that all participants in international arbitration conduct themselves in a courteous and respectful manner throughout the proceedings. Well, that's... Um, uh, here, the explanations talk about maintaining control over the proceedings, ensuring respectful conduct. Well, the rules don't have sanctions. One might wonder how that's really possible to do so. Some institutions have uh, 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 sanctions, such as the LCIA rules, have uh, possibility of written reprimands and uh, warnings. SAIC rules, uh, 27.L, um, allows pretty wide discretion on the part of the tribunal to. Um, uh, 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 to impose sanctions. Um, but <clears throat> certainly what the arbitrator can do is make clear what sort of standards are expected. And if they do so, then there's a, um, uh, there can be a, a limited scope for uh, a challenge when we have uncivil behavior. So oftentimes what we'll see is counsel will try to uh, behave in a provocative manner to try and uh, create a situation to uh, rise to a challenge later. Um, I recall one uh, counsel, I won't mention the background, <laughs> uh, a colleague of mine said, well, I always try to make sure I, I try to generate or provoke a ground of challenge within the arbitration um, by perhaps uh, making unreasonable requests and so forth to try and provoke a reaction from the parties. So. Arbitrators, by seeking to maintain control in that way, um, and also foster stability. The final uh, bit here is um, C. It says arbitrators shall act efficiently. Interesting here is this goes back to the same theme that we've seen about 
arbitrators fostering respect. And here, uh, when we look at the explanations, it talks about things that arbitrators need to do to show their respect for the parties. Um, very common uh, for institutions to make sure that arbitrators and uh, um, make, uh, make a statement that they are able to devote sufficient time and attention to the arbitration. Um, this is mentioned here, so it's interesting. The guidelines are looking at not only what is happening in the arbitration if the guidelines are stated to apply, but really as a general good practice. Um, also mentions <clears throat> the parties or the arbitrators uh, acquainting themselves with facts and arguments as soon as possible to be able to understand the dispute and provide suitable at the appropriate time. Um, so the arbitrator is not waiting say until the eve of the hearing to familiarize himself with the materials, he needs to be ready to, to react to interim applications and so forth with full knowledge of the dispute. Um, and finally, uh, in, the, in the explanation, it refers to um, acting with respect and consideration for the schedules of all uh, parties when uh, conducting the uh, timetable. Again, this is something where we contrast with the state court where all are essentially expected to accommodate the court timetable. Um, but if the arbitrator doesn't have any flexibility to, um, uh, uh, to accommodate the party schedules, um, that perhaps brings back the first question, are they really able to vote sufficient time and attention? I mean, a recent example where in a case I was involved in the tribunal imposed unrealistic hearing dates in a, a complex arbitration over the respondent's objection, saying that they simply would have to do better to, to, to fit their uh, um, uh, pleadings within to, the, within to the timetable, and then refused to adjust when this produced obvious impracticalities, such as um, uh, final pleadings received only two weeks before the hearing and and joint expert reports received only on the eve of the hearing uh, of, a, of a, a, a week and a half arbitration with multiple witnesses and experts. So while it's important for arbitrators to act efficiently to, to help run the trains on time, so to speak, um, if acting with efficiency also means uh, uh, showing respect and consideration for all participants in the process. I think I've I've run a little bit over on my time, but those are some of the considerations we can take in uh, for, for arbitrators. Thank you very much, Drew. Most helpful. And so now yes. I'd like to turn uh, the panel over to Laura Hardin for the final and fourth section of the guidelines. Thank you very much, Peter. Now, um, I have some slides and I'm hoping that um, Moscow is going to put those up on the screen so that I can see them. So I can uh, appropriately move them ahead or tell you to move them ahead. Are they, does every, does, do people in Moscow see them in any event? <laughs> Something is showing up there, Laura. Okay. All right, I'm not seeing it, but I will go ahead. Um, so the first slide, if you could just push it to the, the slide that says contrary to popular opinion, it's there. Okay. Uh, this go to the second slide, please. Um, so, contrary to popular opinion, um, there among lawyers, there are other people in the room um, other than the lawyers, of course. And uh, you know, I think as experts, uh, we are are basically have a target on our back as Olga referred to. Um, we're often the victims of incivility in international arbitration. And uh, so I've been badgered by some of the best of them. And I, and I can talk uh, specifically to you QCs in the audience uh, for, for doing that. And also uh, been the brunt of uh, incivility from other experts. So I feel uh, that I'm pretty qualified to talk about this. Um, so can you hit the, the forward button three times please here? Also, as an American, um, we are, of course, known for uh, generally being very civil and having lots of decorum. And so I also feel uniquely qualified as an American to talk about this topic. Can we go on to the next slide? <laughs> so 
the ICA guidelines uh, on standards of practice in international arbitration has section four, which deals with the guidelines for other participants. And I'm going to speak mostly about uh, the, the experts, uh, because frankly, I've never seen a tribunal secretary be uh, ugly um, in, in that kind of context. What I think is interesting about these guidelines is that they address an issue that is not really well covered for experts, which is that it's the duty is being to the tribunal, they shall assist the tribunal um, and follow its directions, and then the need for them to be truthful and correct any mistakes uh, or that they, they notice. I personally wish they'd taken this a bit further and specified that expert witnesses should not be advocates of their clients and should present their findings in, uh, and opinions in an objective and independent manner. Um, here I can point out a tip for all the counsel in the room. Um, most experts are members of some professional organization such as the AICPA, um, you know, the Chartered Financial Analysts, you name it, Society of Petroleum Engineers, and we have codes of conduct. In fact, recently I was in an arbitration where I made a direct presentation where I talked um, a lot about the mistakes and issues that I had with the other uh, experts report in a very civil manner, I, I mentioned. And um, after that, the first questions I got from the other side were uh, pointing me to the rules of conduct for the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, of which the other side's expert was a member, and said, now you know that you're not supposed to make disparaging comments about the other side's expert. And I said, well, I don't believe that they're disparaging. I'm just merely pointing out areas where I feel his analysis is not adequate. But in any event, it happens. Um, you know, people, people bring this up. We can go to the next slide. And this brings me to an issue that I think we need to talk about, uh, again, probably from my American perspective, which is that just because there are guidelines for civility, this does not mean uh, that we don't need to seek the truth and point out uh, inadequacies in the uh, analysis of the opposing experts. Um, Olga and I were discussing previously when we talked about this subject, uh, this term garbage in, garbage out, that someone had said that about her expert report, and she was very offended uh, by that, her expert's report, not about her, her work, of course. But um, I'm not really offended by that. It's a term of art for experts, garbage in, garbage out. Um, it's a little slangy. What usually I'll say is if you use inappropriate, and that's my code word for garbage, um, assumptions, you'll get incorrect results, which should not be relied upon by the tribunal. So if you ever read my report, that means garbage in, garbage out. Um, but it's, you know, our duty as, your duty as counsel is to point out these aggressive assumptions, to point out the omitted steps and departures from standard uh, methodologies. And you have to hold experts accountable for these things. Um, what I personally object to, and this is, you know, not something that I think should be done, is when I take a lot of uh, abuse uh, and get brutalized for my character, for uh, being a hired gun, for example, um, for belittling my qualifications and, and trying to pick me apart in that manner. Honestly, you know, I've been doing this kind of work for over 25 years, uh, not that I look at, of course, but, uh, you know, as my young adult children would say, bring it. Um, I, I, I frankly think that if you do this, this kind of cross-examination where you're overly aggressive and attacking the expert, and even I've seen cases where the arbitrator will step in and say, now, hold on a second, you know, let's, let's kind of calm down. But if you do that, I think that the tribunal gets the signal that there's not much substance to your, uh, you know, your cross-examination and you really have nothing. I think it's much more effective to go methodically through the, the, the issues with the other side's calculation. And your expert can help you do that and very effectively, honestly. So um, my last slide uh, on, on this topic is civility do's and don'ts for expert witnesses in the council that uses them. Um, don't let counsel insert aggressive language into your report. Now, this is an insidious process. It often happens over time. They'll say, well, can you say this? 
can you say this? And you know, it keeps going along a continuum. And finally, you have this, this uh, statement that you've made that is completely not something that you want to say that's not what you had originally. So you need to be careful not to allow that to happen. Don't get personal. Uh, I, have, <laughs> I have had so many personal remarks made in, in expert reports criticizing my skills and credentials criticize them if they're there, if there's a problem, but let the lawyers do that in cross-examination and be civil when you're doing it. Um, this is an example from a report. Um, the, like they said, Laura Hyden doesn't understand the fundamental rules of finance. I thought this was actually hilarious because the person who said it, the opposing expert, was actually someone who I'd worked with for quite a long time. And I thought that was interesting that they would say something like that. Don't insert inflammatory language yourself. I, re I really resist the urge, even though it would be so satisfying for me to put in words like ridiculous, laughable, outrageous, you know, those kinds of words. I use a lot of un uh, uh, unreasonable, um, inappropriate, those kind of words, um, you know, because I think it's just better to do that. Um, let's see, you should just need to be factual and methodical in your, your uh, cross-examination also as a uh, cross-examiner, because frankly, the best cross-examinations that I've ever seen are when the witness answers your questions, you're very polite, you're deferential, and all of a sudden, their intestines are hanging out in front of them, and they haven't even felt a thing. So it all Uh, Laura, you've just frozen, uh, so we can see you, but we can't hear you anymore. I don't know if there's anything you can do about that, and I don't know if you hear me. Well, you have to have at least one glitch every once in a while. Um, Well, I, I think Laura was almost finished, although not completely. So uh, let, let's move on. And, and, and if she comes back on, you know, we, we, we'll, we'll hear the, the rest of what she has to say. Um, now, uh, Uliana, you were there in, 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 in Moscow in, in our actual <laughs> uh, uh, room. Uh, I, 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 everything seems to have been delayed. I don't know how much is there anyone there to give us some guidance on how much time we might have for questions and answers, if any? I, Peter, I think we, we might have run out of time, but um, maybe the better way would be to address any questions. Um, maybe two questions we could potentially hear from the audience. I I, 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 if I've opened up the Q&A, the official yes. Q&A, and there's nothing in there. So I think if there are maybe one or two questions from people in the room, we can take those and, 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 and close the session at that point. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Veronica. Uh, I'm a lawyer at Igor Uginsk Afanasyev and Partners. And first of all, I wanted to thank um, uh, the panelists for this insightful discussion that we had today. And um, my question would be, well, personally, I think that these guidelines um, is, is a great achievement and a step uh, forward, um, a step toward a uniform, a creating uniform approach uh, to the issue of um, behavior and ethics in international arbitration, something that I think we really need. At the same time, the guidelines um, are not mandatory and um, I mean, at least unless the parties agree so or the tribunal orders so. So my question would be, do you think the soft law nature of the guidelines is um, more an advantage because it gives the parties flexibility or a disadvantage? And um, another follow-up question, what do you think will be, should be the next step in future? Um, shall there be any um, you know, universal mandatory set of rules regulating um, behavior uh, in international arbitration. Thank you. Does anyone want to address that on our panel? I could start uh, very briefly. Thank you, Veronica, for, for the question. 
I, I, I do believe that the uh, soft law uh, nature of these guidelines is an advantage because it uh, upholds the uh, party autonomy um, to decide their own procedure. And if the parties are willing to include these guidelines, even as a reference, uh, for example, in procedural order or in uh, terms of reference or insist that the tribunal uh, does so, um, that then uh, I believe that uh, that would be a, a, an effective way to deal with uh, uncivil conduct. And, and uh, on, uh, on whether there's more guidelines, whether there's a requirement or there's a need for more guidelines and more legislation. I, uh, I recall Toby Landau a couple of years ago in Hong Kong during the Hong Kong Arbitration Week, he referred to this urge to uh, create more guidelines and more regulations and more rules. Uh, he referred to that as this, uh, contagious disease called legislitis. He, he, at the time, he didn't believe that uh, more guidelines are necessary uh, for, for international arbitration, given that already the uh, plethora of uh, existing guidelines. And I agree with him. I think uh, it's an important step on the way to civility and recognition that uh, counsel and arbitrators and experts and witnesses are to uh, behave. Uh, when they're conducting an arbitration. And these guidelines, uh, in my view, would be enough. And, and uh, there is no need for anything uh, further than that, uh, more regulation. Thank you, Olga. I, I would tend to agree with that myself. I think it's very hard to for international arbitration, as opposed to a particular state court system, uh, to sort of set out very specific notions of what mandatory civility really is. I, I think we may just have to leave it to the arbitral tribunals to apply the general principles in more of a civil law way than a common law way. Um, Uliana, is there anyone else who has a question in the room? Take maybe one last question. Oh, yes, yes. One more question. Right. Uh, good afternoon and good morning for for someone, it's still morning. My name is Daria Kuznetsova. I'm from CMS London. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding the regulation of the conduct of the arbitrators. So uh, we have the guidelines for the arbitrators, but sometimes we know that the arbitrators also could you know, not always act in a civil manner or from sometimes from the point of view of the council. Do you think that, and of course we have a mechanism to challenge the arbitrators, which is, which, which is not always effective, and if you challenge the arbitrator during the proceedings and he's not challenged or she's not challenged, then you stay with this arbitrator till the end and you already have some you know, bad relationships with this tribunal. So do you think this, the uh, arbitral institutions should play some role in regulating the conduct of, of the arbitrators or could be, some, could be an instance where the parties could go, not, not like a formal challenge, but where the anonymously probably on confidential basis, the parties could go to point out some conduct which is not appropriate. Thank you. Would you like to address that? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Well, I mean, first of all, um, many institutions do actually have codes of conduct for arbitrators um, that, they, that they publish and uh, they expect arbitrators to follow. Um, and, you know, if one looks at the guidelines, it's sort of like a a, if, if not, not a code of ethics, but sort of a standards of best practice. Um, if an arbitrator is consistently falling short of those, um, you know, that might be used in, in, in argument and reasoning in a challenge to an arbitrator on grounds of perhaps bias or, or um, uh, uh, you know, failure to follow proper procedures, depending on uh, the nature of the, um, uh, 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 of the problem. Um, and, and I would just echo my colleagues on that is I, I think it is helpful to have it as sort of a, a uh, soft law establishing a sort of, of, of I, I hate to say lowest common denominator, minimum standard that uh, we would expect um, arbitrators and other participants in the process to follow. Um, and that can be you know, used in assessing conduct in various contexts. Well, thank you, Drew. And uh, I guess it remains for me now to thank our, our panelists and also particularly to thank our audience, uh, both the live audience and the, and the virtual audience. Uh, I think this has been quite a, uh, uh, an enlightening panel. 
and uh, an opportunity for everyone to uh, get some uh, knowledge of these new guidelines and, and how they can be used and, uh, and their various uh, issues and virtues. So thank you, everyone. And I, I'd like to applaud the panelists and uh, applaud the audience. So thank you all and uh, have a good rest of this uh, wonderful session of the ABA RRA conference. Thank you. Um, my name is Peter Ferrer. I'm a partner in the Harney's BVI office. Um, I know exactly which room you're in. I'm sorry that I'm not there this year. And I, I know how these things overrun with lunch. So um, hopefully people will continue to come in as, um, uh, as, uh, as we continue. I see there's somebody else from Kerry Olson who's just arrived in the room. So at least we've got at least three people who've at least got um, but we've got various people online as well. We've got various people online as well. Uh, we have a very um, distinguished and experienced panel. I think the combined age is something like 120 years of experience all put together. <coughs> and we have um, practitioners, George uh, George Yu, um, a lawyer from Cyprus, uh, Darren Reeds, an insolvency practitioner also based in Cyprus. Um, Alex Hall-Taylor, who, as you can tell from the sun, is, is in, uh, in the BVI. Uh, and his colleague, Jan uh, Goloszewski, who I think is in Cayman, or he may be in London. Um, and today we're going to have a really a fireside chat about some of the experiences that we've had, some of the difficulties, uh, what tools are available. Uh, and I thought we'd kick off by letting the panel introduce themselves and what their practice is. Um, so, George, I don't know if you want to go first. Uh, happy to. Thank you very much for the introduction, Peter. Uh, hello to everybody. Um, well, uh, just a, a few short words. Um, um, I'm, a, I'm a Cypriot lawyer. I've, uh, I, I studied in the UK. I was called to the bar in the UK. I'm an associate tenant at Littleton Chambers in London. And I'm also qualified to practice in Cyprus since 2001. Uh, uh, generally, the, the office here consists of uh, 40, 40 lawyers. We are a general practice firm, and I especially deal with complex multi jurisdictional uh, commercial litigation and arbitration. Um, I'm a member of the LCIA and the uh, Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, and uh, my general experience lies mostly in advising in arbitrations, although I have sat as an arbitrator on a few occasions. Um, the as, as an introduction, I think I think that's that's it, uh, Peter. And, Thank you, George. And I think we'll get more into it later on. Darren, Darren, would you like to uh, introduce yourself? Thank you, Peter. Yes, um, good to see everyone. And again, I'm ashamed that we can't be in Moscow in person, but uh, certainly on the next one, hopefully. Um, I'm an insolvency practitioner compared with the the other guys who are on the panel here, who are all barristers and solicitors. Um, I'm a UK and Cypriot licensed insolvency practitioner, um, head up the office for Begbie's trainer here. Uh, prior to being in Cyprus, I spent around five or six years in the BVI where I was also a licensed insolvency practitioner. Um, my practice focus is on cross-border offshore international insolvency um, engagement. So I'm typically appointed a receiver or liquidator frequently by the court. Um, in pursuit of assets, realizing assets, um, tracing them across different jurisdictions. Um, inevitably, my work goes closely with legal advisors who, who we work with to um, affect those, those asset tracing and most quasi-forensic uh, exercises. Thank you, Peter. Thank, thank you, Darren. Uh, Alex, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, as you say, I'm sitting in the uh, early morning Caribbean sun here, so I apologize for squinting into the camera a bit. Um, um, I'm uh, head of uh, Kerry Olson's BBI uh, litigation insolvency practice, um, which is a team of about uh, 20 lawyers around the world based uh, in the BVI came in London, Singapore and Hong Kong. And we cover the full range of commercial litigation, arbitration disputes, insolvency and restructuring, as you'd expect in the BVI. That's uh, largely company, financial, uh, crypto and funds, trusts and general commercial disputes. Uh, personally, I practiced um, for over 20 years as a commercial barrister in Lincoln's Inn in London. Uh, I moved to the BBI um, just after Hurricane Irma in 2018 as a partner at, at Maples, and then a year ago moved to head up our, our team at Kerry Olson. 
Um, I now live and practice permanently in the BVI, at least most of the time, apart from occasional trips back to the UK. Uh, our team is, uh, is now large and growing, and that's part of what I'm, I was brought in to oversee. We have six partners um, dotted around the globe, council and associates with many linguistic abilities, including particularly Isabella Praskaya, who's amongst your audience, who I think speaks more languages than all of us put together. Um, and uh, that means we can cover off um, pretty much 24 hours a day any disputes that are going on around the globe. Uh, I hope that's a, a quick introduction. It's fairly similar, I suspect, to Peter's own introduction, which uh, he now heads up the, the Harney's equivalent. Uh, yeah, we'd like to introduce yourself. Are you based in Cayman? Hello. I, I've just moved to London after 13 years in Cayman. Uh, I was working for Maples and Kerry Olson in the Cayman Islands, and I headed up the litigation and insolvency department in in the in the Kerry Olson Cayman Islands office. I've moved to London in July, <clears throat> and from here I'll be working on Cayman Islands and BVI litigation and insolvency matters, along with Richard Brown, who does um, uh, BVI matters. Uh, so um, uh, much closer now to to Moscow. Um, so hopefully more more trips over there. My background is that I worked at Freshfields in London and Hong Kong before moving to the Cayman Islands. Okay, thank you guys. Um, now, the, the subject, subject we have today is sun, sand and spora, which I think means disputes. Um, and as it's an arbitration conference, I thought it'd be quite useful for each of the jurisdictions really to sort of set out what their attitude, are they pro-arbitration, are they anti-arbitration? Um, what, what, what is the, the current position? Uh, George, do you want to kick off with, with Cyprus in terms of, of how, particularly the, the, the courts, when you have a when you have a, uh, an arbitration clause, how they how they deal with it. Thank you, thank you, Peter. Uh, Cyprus is a very pro-arbitration jurisdiction. Um, we have been signatories of the New York Convention. Been signatories of the New York Convention, and uh, we also have uh, the International and, Commercial uh, Arbitration Law. We have uh, the International. I get a lot of feedback, uh, Peter. Can you hear me clearly? Yeah, I think I can now. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I'll 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 start again if I may. Uh, I was getting a lot of feedback from the microphone. Um, I was saying Cyprus is very pro arbitration. Um, we are full signatories of the New York Convention. There's been a ratifying law in 1979, and there's the International Commercial Arbitration Law 101 of 1987, which essentially adopts the, with very minimal amendments, the ancestral model law of 1985. So for any, anyone dealing in international arbitration, um, the, the Cypriot legal from, uh, framework should be very easy to follow. Um, is, it, is it also the case, George, that there is an advantage in Cyprus in terms of arbitration? Because if you, if you have a, um, uh, a, a, a foreign arbitration or, or, a, or a domestic arbitration, then you're entitled to get um, injunctive relief in support of it. Whereas that, that if, you, is, if you don't have substantive proceedings in Cyprus, you, you can't get an injunction. Is that right? That is perfectly correct, uh, Peter. And that's exactly due to the existence of the law. The law 101 of 87 provides the legal framework and essentially the foundation on which an injunction or any sort of uh, be it the discovery order, the disclosure order, freezing order, uh, bankers' trusts uh, order, tagging order, uh, the framework for obtaining it without having substantive proceedings in Cyprus is the law. Whereas in commercial proceedings, there is no corresponding provisions. And if you are not acting in aid of, uh, of proceedings in the EU, where you can make use of the Brussels one recast, uh, you are a bit stuck uh, in arbitration, as you correctly said. Uh, that is uh, that is not a problem. We can issue uh, any sort of injunction in aid of arbitration, uh, even arbitration that has yet uh, to start. So we can we can issue a, pre a preemptive injunction in anticipation of initiation of arbitration. So, and this is uh, really quite common and it's a big part of the work we do uh, here. Okay, uh, Alex, do you want to briefly discuss um, 
the BVI's position. Yes, and uh, obviously, since it's your own jurisdiction, do chip in as well to, uh, to add anything you feel I'm missing. But um, I'm BVI not correct is, you, Alex. <laughs> or correct me, whatever you wish. Um, the BVI, uh, as you know, is is very pro arbitration as well, uh, probably in in two different ways, um, both from the point of view of, of now holding arbitrations within the BVI, uh, but also from the enforcement perspective. Um, we have a very uh, new and efficient BVI arbitration centre, which uh, the government and, and itself are very keen to promote. Uh, you can choose to, to have your uh, arbitrations here, no matter what the original uh, seat might be. Uh, Peter will know also we have the benefit of a very good arbitration act. Um, and uh, indeed, we have statutory bases here uh, for enforcement purposes, both um, for the benefit of foreign arbitration awards uh, and foreign litigation now, uh, a much more recent amendment to our law uh, allows that statutory basis. Uh, and in fact, Peter knows uh, probably more about that than anyone, I think, um, in the BVI. I don't know if you want to chip in on that. Uh, but, but generally, our court is very pro-arbitration. We're a very creditor-friendly uh, jurisdiction, and the courts are very quick, efficient, and private in terms of what they will do. The thing that I that struck me about the BVI Arbitration Act is um, the the authors of it um, essentially looked at uh, different jurisdictions and said, well, uh, in France, Sweden, there's very minimal uh, interference by the court, so perhaps we ought to go that route. They looked at England and they saw that there was a section 67, 68, 69 challenge, which is uh, irregularity, serious um, uh, 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 serious uh, jurisdiction, serious, uh, serious irregularity and, and point of law. Um, and they essentially tried to amalgamate all of those different types of institutional rules and, 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 and attitude into one act. So, so they, you, you have a, a Schedule 2 in the BVI Act, which you have to opt into if you want to have some sort of court interference. Otherwise, you're, you're very much sort of a French Swedish style arbitration where you you simply uh, have very limited grounds to go to court and the other the other aspect I think about the BVI Arbitration Act is is its position in relation to foreign arbitrations and how you can get injunctions in relation to it in in England it's quite unusual to um, to get an injunction in support of a foreign arbitration because the court will usually say well why can't you go to the supervisory court so if you have a if you have a um, uh, a Russian arbitration, for example, um, one of the questions that the English court will ask is, well, why can't you go to the Russian courts to get it? Um, now, it's not impossible, obviously, under the Act, uh, the English Act, but it is, it is more unusual to, to, to have that position, whereas in the BVI, there is no um, restrictions. You simply say, we have this, we want to get an injunction in support of an arbitration, whether it be foreign or domestic. Um, and that's, that's quite an unusual, unusual feature. Uh, yeah, yeah. And do you want to talk about um, uh, Cayman? Yes, Cayman is very similar to the, to the BVI position. And again, we have our, an Arbitration Act which came in in 2012 and has been used a number of times since. So, um, and again, like the BVI, we often act and are involved in uh, in, injunction applications in relation to arbitrations. That can be in one of two ways. There's the in, an injunction to in, enforce in support of an arbitration proceeding, um, but also you can have anti-suit injunctions, which we've had in the Cayman Islands, in order to enforce uh, arbitral uh, clauses and agreements to arbitrate. Of course, that normally depends on the uh, parties being in, in the Cayman Islands, but there has been a couple of cases with uh, joint official liquidators based in the Cayman Islands with anti-suit injunctions. We also have the uh, usual uh, enforcement procedures in terms of uh, um, receivers in particular, which I think that Darren will give us some practical examples of that. Uh, the other thing to say is that we have had some recent case, uh, recent case in 2019, where although we are arbitration friendly in the Cayman Islands and we do seek to enforce arbitral awards. That's only if the arbitral award 
uh, meets the, the relevant test in order to be enforceable. And there was a matter involving a, a Brazilian uh, airline and, and an arbitration in Brazil where it was found that uh, that award shouldn't be enforced. So it shouldn't be seen that it's a slam dunk just as long as you've got an arbitration award, you can enforce it in Cayman. The court will look at the arbitration award to see in what circumstances it was granted. But as long as it has followed the proper procedure, then we have a number of tools available in order to enforce that award and indeed to, in order to, in, to support those arbitral proceedings while they're ongoing. Yeah. Now, you've touched on, on enforcement, um, and obviously in all of the offshore jurisdictions, um, um, particularly the connection with Russia and Cyprus, Russia BVI, um, there, there uh, inevitably will be an asset tracing exercise or an enforcement exercise. Um, this morning, one of the cases was mentioned by, by one of the panel of um, uh, Timis, Gerald Metals and Timis, um, which was one of my cases. And, and in that case, there was a, a, an entire um, panoply of, of applications made in relation to uh, Timis, um, who, who had a, a 50 million arbitration award against him and, and um, uh, everything from charging orders to freezing injunctions to, to orders for sale until finally there was, there was a settlement. But um, it's often the case that these holding company jurisdictions like the BVI, Cyprus, will be the places where people want to go and enforce. So there's no point in having your award if you can't get something, something out of it. Um, so we we're going to discuss some of the enforcement methods that we have. Um, you touched on on receivers, uh, Darren. You, you you've had experiences acting as a receiver, haven't you? Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, we certainly in the BVI, and obviously um, as George will will agree, uh, receivership is available in uh, in the Cypriot jurisdiction as well. But in the BVI, um, I think over the recent years we've seen an increasing usage of um, of receiverships as a tool for equitable enforcement of judgments. Um, it's, um, you know, it's, it's quite an aggressive, rapid tool. Um, frequently, if there's a risk of dissipation of assets or there's been alleged wrongdoing, these will even be heard on an ex parte basis. Um, the, really, the, the, the crux and purpose of them are, are obviously to get control of the assets that have been moved or get control of the assets that, um, that the company holds that we're trying to enforce over to, um, to repay money back to the creditor that we're effectively acting on, so on behalf of. So a receivership as compared with a liquidation is much more focused on uh, the interests of one specific creditor or claimant that we're appointed for. Um, it's an imperative on the, on the uh, receiverships that the drafting is correctly carried out because we're in the court appointed receivership. We can really only do as receiver what the order allows us to do. So close collaboration between the IP and the, and the solicitors beforehand in the drafting process is really is key. Uh, but a well-drafted order should hopefully get us access to things such as the books and records, uh, financial records, uh, just so that we can we can really get under the skin of the company um, and try and identify where there may potentially be uh, the assets that have been moved to, or something that we can get back for the interests of the of the creditors. Um, a receivership is also quite a you know, it's quite a draconian process. It's um, a fairly high threshold to be able to obtain that. Um, and so there are consequences if people breach those receivership orders, the potential um, consequences of being held in contempt of court. Um, one, one example I had, however, though, um, we were appointed receivers in the BVI and uh, it was on the back of an English High Court judgment. And there were two or three different key decision dates on that judgment. Um, and what we found when we eventually got hold of the books and records after our appointment was that the shares over which we'd been appointed at had actually been transferred to a different company in a completely different jurisdiction. So we had to go to that jurisdiction, go to court there and um, seek a Norwich Pharmacal order, which I'm sure some of the lawyers amongst the panel will be talking about in due course. Uh, but we had to get a Norwich Pharmacal order against the registered agent of the new purported shareholder of our shares. Um, and then we could investigate, go through the books and records and we could then evidence that it was effectively just a, it was just a, a sham. It was still ultimately the debtor that we were enforcing against had moved these shares to another offshore jurisdiction. So we could then evidence that and go back to the court in the jurisdiction and obtain a freezing order um, so that the shares didn't move any further. I often think that with the receivership, the important point is to have the power to vote the shares in the subsidiaries. 
um, because it's often the case that it's 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 via the corporate structure that you have better results rather than rather than necessarily go into a foreign jurisdiction trying to get recognized as a receiver per se uh, George what's what's your experience in, in Cyprus I fully agree I fully agree Peter I mean uh, uh, Taren and I have known each other for a long time I think we met through uh, a receivership some years ago and uh, the, the procedure as such, and I think the main benefit of the receiver is that uh, it's a drastic remedy, but if you do manage to get it, uh, you might as well get the full scope of it. And uh, the, the most important one is really controlling the assets, um, especially in jurisdictions such as ours, where we are the holding companies and the operating companies are beneath, are below the ones generating the income. If you don't manage to get a good a good control of the subsidiaries, uh, you are not really in control of the of the company itself. So, so that that is certainly key. But the ability, the ability also to put a receiver in who can have access to records and bank records, also enables you to do a follow the money trade and see the bank accounts where the company was banking or where the company sent money upstream, as well as the money it received from downstream, and that's usually very helpful in then trying to, to find out where the money has ultimately gone. Uh, Alex, do you want to uh, uh, chip in on the, on the BVI experience of receivers? Yes, I mean, as everyone will know, uh, and, and much like Cyprus, BVI is, is uh, a largely a holding company uh, jurisdiction. There, there are so many companies in the BVI, as we all know, well over 370,000 uh, now. And I was just looking at the statistics this morning from RFSC and, and we've seen a year of growth in our in our corporate registrations again we're up another 50% on on the, this time last year in terms of the numbers of new incorporations everyone will know I, I'm sure that the BVI company is is usually at the top of a quite complicated structure and when you are looking at receiverships as Darren says uh, one of the key questions is well, well what is it holding and what can we get control of uh, and of course there are probably three main types of receiverships in the BVI, um, ones that you can impose through, say, securitized lending under the terms of, a, of an agreement, uh, and then the, the court-appointed types, either for the purposes of enforcement uh, or for preserve and protect reasons. Uh, and, uh, and Peter will know, because he and I were against each other on one of these, it, it can result in quite a battle uh, over the conduct of the receiver and the control of the underlying company, which may, for example, uh, be a listed company in another jurisdiction, uh, where the those who are in control of that company, uh, it being a subsidiary of the BVI Co, are not at all used to being told uh, what to do or how to cooperate with a third party appointed receiver. Um, the BVI, of course, again, is, is a very sophisticated legal and financial services jurisdiction with many people like uh, Darren who have great experience of those kind of things. But nevertheless, the court will uh, will get involved if it feels that um, people are overstretching the mark or overstretching the terms of the order. Uh, and as Darren says, one of the key features of, of receiverships here now is quite how wide the powers might be from the very outset. Uh, and those applying will seek very wide powers, and obviously those who are subject to it will seek to restrict them. Uh, so we can end up in court battling over that uh, and how that 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 should carry on. And, and uh, as I say, Peter and I Know that very well, although that's a case I've now departed from on my move from my old firm. <laughs> yeah, I suppose that's a perfect introduction for me to sort of mention about the case. So, J, J Trust is a case that's been going on for the last uh, four years or so. Um, the defendant, who, who Alex didn't didn't act for, um, uh, was a uh, fraudster. And I'm allowed to say that because there's a judgment against him. Um, and um, prior to judgment, um, we had obtained a freezing injunction. He breached the freezing injunction. And one of the tests to appoint a receiver is if the freezing injunction isn't strong enough. Darren mentioned it's a very draconian method um, of, of trying to preserve assets for, for when there is a subsequent judgment. So we applied for a receiver and we, 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 we had a receiver appointed uh, before judgment. Um, and the only asset which the BVI company had was a majority shareholding in a Japanese listed company. And Alex, um, when he was at Maples, acted for, for that Japanese listed company. And as Alex said, it, it, it causes uh, huge problems 
um, for the board of that listed company because suddenly their majority shareholder is subject to um, uh, the direction of the receivers. Um, and um, uh, we went all the way to the, to the, to the Court of Appeal on it. It's, it's not currently pending in the Privy Council. So far, it's gone um, my client's way, fortunately. Um, but it just shows the strength of a receivership order because essentially um, the receivers are now appointed to the board of the Japanese listed company because that's the only asset which the BVI company has. Um, and there were concerns that uh, that listed company wasn't being managed in, a, in an appropriate manner. Um, so it's an extremely, extremely powerful, powerful weapon. And indeed, actually, the order in that case um, goes much further. It provides for the ability to, to replace the boards of the subsidiaries below the listed company as well. So it shows you quite how significant the powers may be. Yeah, so it's very, very important when you're drafting when you're drafting the receivership order or your lawyers are drafting it, you, you, you have to sort of try and get as much control as you can downstream um, because that's that's the whole purpose of having BVI entities. Um, uh, Jan, do you, do you want to um, comment on the on the, the, the Cayman experience? Yes, it's very similar, uh, again, to, to what you've described in the BVI, and I agree with, with the points made in terms of uh, making sure that um, you, you can control um, or, or seek to control through perhaps additional receivership appointments in other countries that the companies through through the chain. Um, <clears throat> and again, uh, as Alex said, and I think as you said, Peter, the important thing is to work out what powers you want those receivers to have from the outset. It's not a sort of a, a statute that you can look to which shows or, or an act that look that you can look to to show what powers the receivers have. It's really what powers they have set out in the court order. So it's quite important to do your research beforehand and work out exactly what you want your receiver to be able to do in order to help you enforce your um, arbitral award uh, um, uh, and therefore set out exactly those powers mm -hmm in the court order. And as Alex said, sometimes that can involve some back and forth with the court, particularly if it's being defended. But what you want is as much um, leeway as you can for those receivers to go in and, and have um, the powers to, to enforce the arbitral award as set out in the court order. Actually, yeah, um, if I just cut in there, actually, we had a, an interesting scenario where a prior BVI judge, very well respected, um, wasn't a particular fan of receiverships. Um, so we went to went to court um, with a well drafted drafted by Harnix actually so it was very well drafted um, order, and um, it didn't like all the powers we were seeking to have included, such as getting books and records, um, you know, getting cooperation, and it, it was just struck through. And our powers were basically to sell the shares for maximum value, but we had no yeah we had no teeth really to do this, so we actually had to go back to court to have that order widened because otherwise yeah, we were effectively incapacitated by that. We had no, no abilities whatsoever. I think Bannister uh, clearly had a different view as to the appropriateness of, of receiverships. And I, I think that has been a change over the last four, five, six years where the courts have, have um, I think appreciated that, that there, are, there are wider powers needed. There, there is a slight oddity in the BVI legislation because um, every receiver, whether it's under a, a debenture or, or, or security documents, um, uh, uh, so an out-of-court receiver or, or a court-appointed receiver uh, is covered by the Insolvency Act. Um, and the Insolvency Act does have a schedule of what receiver powers could be. And sometimes you see people trying to sort of sneak sneak those, those Schedule II insolvency powers into a receivership order which shouldn't really have those powers. Um, and, um, you know, broad powers basically to take control almost as if they were a liquidator um, of, uh, of the companies. Um, I was going to say, Peter, just very quickly on, uh, I'm sure Darren and you and, and probably in other jurisdictions too that have noticed, that, as you say, there's been a trend towards that kind of like preserve and protect type receiverships away from a sort of straight enforcement type. But it, we shouldn't remember the simple types, which are often just appoint a receiver to do a specific task, like Darren says, you know, maybe just a, it, there's a very simple way of selling some assets realizing some money paying people back and all of a sudden you're out again because uh, the company can carry on after those assets have been gone and the, and the judgment or in or arbitration award is cleared um now ju just as the the appointment of a receiver whether pre-judgment or post-judgment is is there to try and uh, obtain information about assets and and realize value um 
uh, the, the jurisdictions, I think all of our jurisdictions offshore, uh, have followed, um, at least initially, the English approach of Norwich Pharmacals, which is an assets disclosure order. Um, George, George, do you want to, to, um, to deal with the Cypriots position? Definitely. Um, uh, Peter, it's exactly as you've said. I mean, we've adopted uh, lock, stock and barrel, if you like, the, the UK position in Norwich Pharmacals. Um, Cypriot courts are quite adept knowledgeable regarding uh, Norwich Pharmacal orders and uh, they are they can be obtained as a matter of course in most disputes uh, uh, given the sufficiency of the evidence of course so we can either obtain standalone Norwich Pharmacal orders uh, in order to initiate proceedings against a third party uh, or they can be part of uh, an interim uh, an interim remedy in existing proceedings uh, to obtain information that can then be passed on uh, in aid of the main proceedings. So as well in, as uh, for the arbitral proceedings per se. So uh, the, test, the test for obtaining the knowledge pharmacal is the same as in the UK. You need a good arguable case, probability of success, irreparable harm, but also the, the mix up in the wrongdoing or the potential mix up in the wrongdoing of the, of the party against which you are applying. And, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's generally, it's, it's a well, I would say, uh, uh, it's a well progressed area of the law. It's something that the Cypriot courts are familiar, are familiar with. Uh, and same, same roughly goes for with London pillar orders, although those are much harder to obtain. And those, those, are, those are search and seize orders um, um, so you can you can send the police around and uh, with a supervising solicitor and not do that yes and generally generally speaking the the knowledge pharmacal we usually get them together with the bankers bankers trust order or coupled with a guiding order so uh, a common um, a recent case we had was a fraud in the uk against the pension fund where the the wrongdoers had set up two separate companies that they used to to send the money to and then they went on from here. So we need the information from the banks in Cyprus regarding the Cypriot companies. And then we got the knowledge pharmacal orders against the bank together with the guiding order enabled us to get all the information to the receiver who was appointed in the UK uh, and, and to govern who was investigating and tracing the funds. And they were able to then uh, secure the funds, uh, I think in Switzerland, they flowed out of in Cyprus and they managed to recover. So that's that's really a very practical uh, and real real life example where we used the knowledge pharmaca lot there very effectively. Alex, the, the BVI has um, has to some extent sort of deviated or developed from the English position, hasn't it? Do, do you want to deal with that issue? Yes, I mean, it, there are a couple of points really, I suppose. Uh, firstly, we had a a sort of moment where we weren't certain what standalone relief would really be available for, for foreign proceedings, but that's been cleared up by statutory change, and so there's now no question about that. There, there's been a, a trend of late, I suppose, as a, I think this is what you're alluding to, for at least one of our judges, and sometimes both, um, to uh, resist Norwich Pharmacal uh, relief if there is another route to the information. Um, and in particular, we've had a, a couple of judgments of rejecting Norwich Pharmacals uh, where there are foreign proceedings in which the, the parties are present and, and it could simply be dealt with by way of a, a, a disclosure order in those proceedings, or also uh, where it might better be dealt with by a letter of request from a foreign court and, and there's been some encouragement to use that route uh, rather than a Norwich Pharmacal. If you do go down the Norwich Pharmacal route, uh, and it is appropriate, then you will get one here um, with the usual uh, seal and gag orders preventing uh, tipping off, as it were, of the of the relevant uh, UBO or uh, client of record. But it's also to be borne in mind that sometimes when you get an orange pharmacal against a registered agent, uh, they actually have quite limited information. Uh, you may you may not find out as much as you might expect in, in certain circumstances. Is that what you meant? It's Yes, yes. So, so there's the Ramalos point, which is you know use 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 a different method in order to get it. Um, but I think that I think also the jurisdiction has certainly uh, Warbank, who's one of the um, uh, full-time judges in the BVI, has 
has really lowered the threshold in certain circumstances um, to say you simply have to have a reasonable suspicion um, uh, of, of, of some uh, wrongdoing, um, which is not necessarily uh, prima facie, um, not necessarily more than 50%, there's simply some reasonable suspicion that you, you, you think this person has been involved. And, um, and I think there is a, I think that that development is because of the, the context in which they operate. So unlike um, uh, in England, where the principle was first developed, you, we don't have open registers, we don't have companies house, you can't do a computer search and try and find out who the UBOs are. Um, you know, there is there is limited public uh, access and I think as, as a result the courts have then tried to sort of step in in order to um, to to deal with 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 that issue um Jan, do you want do you want to deal with um Cayman yes can you can you hear me I can hear you yes yeah yes. So, sorry you can't see me for some reason I can't put my my video on um, I can still see you don't worry okay good yeah. um the, yes, so the positioning came in relation to Norwich Pharmacals. There has been the development that Alex mentioned in terms of if there is another route, which is often a letter of request, then the court sometimes encourages that. However, um, if we're talking about arbitrations, um, they're very used to Norwich Pharmacals to support arbitrations. And indeed, if you if you think about it, um, the you know Cayman and the BVI there isn't a lot of public information you can find about companies however if you do serve a Norwich Pharmacal on a um, registered office provider or a bank then they do readily comply with the terms of that order and you can find the information that you want the only time um, there is any dispute is often as to how much the service provider claims it's cost them to provide that information and um, so so, so when we have acted for off for service providers served with Norwich Pharmacals, we obviously comply with the conditions because it's a court order and there, there often isn't a fight in terms of the order there. It's just a fight in terms of how much it costs to provide the documents because, of course, if you're asking for the Norwich Pharmacal, you have to pay for the service provider or the bank's uh, costs of, of complying with it. it. I think in Cayman, it's quite interesting to sort of compare um, the development of the jurisdictions, because obviously, you know, they're, they're still all fairly adolescent jurisdictions. They haven't been going for hundreds of years like, 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 like England. Um, and, and if you look at, say, cases in, in Cayman, I think there's one called um, SR Steel, which um, Caverly at first instance r refers back to the World Bank judgments in, in UVW, where he lowers this standard and he he says i i don't agree necessarily with his reasoning but i agree with his outcome um that then goes to the court of appeal i think in the grand court in um in cayman and they they then sort of firmly put the lid on that and say no we reject that sort of looser looser threshold so i think that i think probably in cayman they're they're still trying to maintain sort of um a very uh, strict english approach in terms of in terms of the asset disclosure whereas um, certainly, my my impression from the cases I've seen over the last few years is that that BVI is 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 more open. At least the two judges we've currently got, or at least one of the judges we've currently got, is more open to 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 give in disclosure. Um, now, now, so suppose so. In terms of the disputes, I mean, your your tactic is obviously to try and get information. So you you can either you can either go for your your, your receivership order. You, you can which we probably didn't dealt in the wrong order, but you, you get your asset disclosure order. One of the other weapons, obviously, is the freezing injunction. Um, how, how, how does that work in, in, um, in BVI, Alex? Well, much the same way as it does um, in England and Wales uh, in terms of uh, really demonstrating that you've got a, uh, a serious case, effectively, uh, and a risk of dissipation of assets. Um, and uh, the BVI is probably one of the jurisdictions most accustomed to being asked to impose freezing injunctions, um, both uh, within the territory in terms of assets within it and extraterritorially. Uh, worldwide freezing orders are not at all uncommon. Um, and they are often made quite quickly in the BVI. That's one of the things I think people uh, need to appreciate that our court can move extremely fast if it wants to and sometimes on a uh, very very short notice basis <laughs> if any notice at all is given um, and it, it is often only when one comes to the return dates that the, that the proper battles begin um, over over things like that um, so um, urgent basis 
can get a freezing order quite quickly. Uh, the usual tests apply, uh, and our courts are generally pretty open to to making orders if they see a a, a, a serious case. There, there was an English case actually recently, um, uh, Le Ambassadeur, which is a casino in in Mayfair, and um, the reason the reason it sort of came across my radar is that the defendant was Mr. Yu, who is a very wealthy Chinese billionaire. I think he's something like top 100 in China. Um, and he had gone gambling to London and had lost several million. Um, and then he'd written a check to pay back and the check had bounced. Um, and so the casino decided to get a freezing injunction against Mr. Yu because they're saying he's deliberately not paying his bills. He's got the, he's got the wherewithal to pay, he's, he's not. And he has a whole series of offshore networks, which means that he can just, just dissipate his assets easily. Um, and at first instance, the judge says, no, that's not good enough. And the Court of Appeal also said, that's not good enough. Um, so, so the current position in England is, um, it, it's still, you know, solid evidence of real risk, um, whatever that might mean. Um, there, there's, there's been a certain tendency amongst practitioners to say, well, you can you can usually get your order on ex parte, easy to get, difficult to maintain. Um, and certainly some judges have also taken the view in the BVI where it's up to them to oppose it. If they want to oppose it, they can come, come and oppose it. Um, uh, whereas the, the English Court of Appeal, certainly in, in the ambassador's case, really is sort of saying this is a nuclear weapon. This is the most draconian, one of the most draconian orders that the court can make. Um, and simply because somebody chooses not to pay their bills isn't sufficient to 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 give rise to risk of dissipation. Um, it, it, do you think that's going to cause any difficulty in the in, in the future? Are you asking me? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll ask you, Alex. <laughs> um, I, I don't think so too much. Um, I mean, the, the I mean, we all know the test is a, a risk of dissipation effectively in order to evade uh, enforcement in due course. And it's always actually been quite a high test. Uh, it's sometimes rather loosely applied, particularly on the ex parte basis. Um, but most often, I think for us in the BVI, at least, um, the, the evidence of what is going on or is likely to go on is relatively clear cut sometimes on, on that side of things. Um, you know, you, you often start with a massive fraud or a massive evasion of, of enforcement or uh, and things like that. So it isn't, I don't think, um, I, I think it's unlikely, I hope it's unlikely anyway, that most of the, the larger cases we see are, are about someone sort of, as it were, fumbling around for their checkbook in the corner. Uh, it's normally a little bit more clear cut than that, but who knows? Um, I mean, it, we'll see how our judges respond to, to the influence of the English uh, English courts. They sometimes do and they sometimes don't, as you well know. Um, I think we've got about um, 10, 15 minutes left. Uh, should we move on to the next topic about liquidations? Um, now, obviously, one, one of the other uh, areas for enforcement is, is, a, is a liquidation. Uh, George, in, in Cyprus, if you have an arbitration award, uh, whether it be domestic or foreign, can you, can you go straight to a liquidation application in, in Cyprus? Well, uh, once you register it, Peter, uh, of course, because once you register it, it, it uh, it's essentially uh, takes on the force of a local judgment. And uh, when you have the local judgment, you serve it on the, if it's a company on the other side, you serve it on the company statutory notice, the same as in the UK under the Companies Act. They have 21 days to comply. Failure to pay the, the, the judgment within the 21 days, it gives rise to a liquidation event and you can initiate the liquidation process. Uh, you have to register it first. It has to be converted to a local judgment first. Yes, so that has the, uh, there is a Supreme Court judgment exactly on this point, uh, which essentially says that the registration, it's what uh, essentially uh, entrenches the arbitral award into the local legal uh, framework. So once you once you register it, it uh, it gains the the force of law. Uh, it's a legal judgment. It's recognized in Cyprus, and as such, it can be acted upon. And um, 
the other key takeaway uh, I would say in Cyprus is that you can run several execution mergers and liquidation in parallel. Mm -hmm. So you could issue a read of movables, you can uh, seek uh, to, to find um, assets in, in other, with other means of execution, and at the same time start the clock ticking with the statutory notice and move on with liquidation. So in BVI, it's slightly different because you don't have to have you don't have to register it first. Mm. You can register it. You have an option of of localizing it, but if you have an arbitration award, um, you can go straight to to, uh, to to a winding up of the company uh, mm -hmm. on the basis you you say that um, uh, it's it's cash flow insolvent because it's not paying its debts as they fall due. Um, there then obviously there then is is a debate. Sometimes there's a debate as to um, you know, should this be, you, you, you sometimes have the same argument that you would have at a registration stage. So is there, you know, some New York Convention defense, which is very unlikely um, to, to read the reasons why the, the, the award shouldn't be enforced. Um, but in, in the BVI, you, you don't have to, don't have to necessarily um, uh, register it. You can just, just go straight. Well, theoretically, theoretically, you could do that in Cyprus because what the law says is if you have a clear debt, a crystallized debt, a, a demand, due and payable, and an arbitral award could arguably be that. But in, in the same sense that, as you say, they will raise the defense, I think it's much safer to first register the award. You then have it entrenched. It's um, almost impossible to shift. And then you can run with the liquidation without any, without any hitch. Uh, Darren, do you want to um, uh, discuss the advantages of, of a liquidation? Yeah, sure. Thank what you. are the liquidator powers that you, 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 you can have? Yeah, I mean, by comparison of a receivership, a liquidation is much more um, hev heavily um, driven by the insolvency legislation, um, have a lot more powers. Again, whereas a receivership is typically you're acting in, in the interest of one particular claimant or creditor, um, liquidation tends to be more in the interest of the body of creditors as a whole. So any assets you realize would be distributed amongst the creditors. Um, in terms of the powers you have as a liquidator, um, you've got much more, you, know, you effectively have powers and you have real teeth, you can interrogate uh, service providers, you can demand books and records from service providers, um, you're looking for cooperation from directors and really anyone who's been involved with the promotion of a company or servicing it, anyone who may have some useful documentation or information, what you're looking at um, is potentially antecedent transactions where there may be potentially fraudulent trading or trading whilst an asset is insolvent or some kind of preference where a director may maybe has paid um, paid one creditor in preference to another one. Perhaps it may, it may um, improve their position if they've given personal guarantees. Um, so it, you've got a lot more a lot more powers and rights as a liquidator than, than you would as a receiver to effectively deal with wrongdoing. Um, you, you obviously you'll frequently interview a director as well. Um, it's whilst it's it's typically more difficult in an offshore jurisdiction because the directors will often be somewhere else. They'll be onshore. You do have the rights and powers to to request an interview with the directors. Um, one again, a bit of a war story of one I did previously in the BVI. Um, we had a director and, and the company had completely ceased operation. Um, it actually was a trading business in that jurisdiction and we were appointed liquidators by the court. Um, so in our, in our usual duties, we're, we're looking through the books and records, looking through the balance sheet to see what assets this company has. And we saw nothing particularly exciting, but we saw a vehicle there. Um, so we interviewed the managing director and said, oh, where's this vehicle? It looks, it, it, the description is very similar to the one you're driving. He said, oh yeah, I've, that's my vehicle now. Um, I purchased it from the company. Um, so he said, okay, well, how much did you pay? And it, it was way below value. And they said, well, I was owed so much money by the company that the beneficial owner said I could buy it at a discount. I said, okay, so have you got the proof of, um, of the payment? I, I paid the, um, the funds went across by Western Union. You know, and it's these sort of situations where you're having to interrogate, um, interrogate directors and, and other service providers, but a lease of liquidation does give you statutory basis in which to do so. And it's not not uncommon um, for there to be an arbitration award, and then for the company to be liquidated and to find out there are no assets. You know, they've they've been stripped. The assets are long gone. Um, and in those in those circumstances, um, uh, 
the advantage of, of a liquidator is that they can bring proceedings against the directors or those others who've assisted yeah. in order to try and compensate and contribute to the company's assets again. Absolutely. Um, so we, we can unwind transactions. So if there's been a transaction, for example, the motor vehicle, if it was cost effective, if it was uh, proven to be a transaction and an undervalue, we could unwind that transaction or require contribution towards it. As you said, Peter, um, directors can be liable for making contributions to the losses of the company uh, to, to compensate creditors. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do, do you want to um, discuss the, the Cayman aspect? Yes, so Cayman's the same as you described in the BVI. You don't have to enforce the arbitral award in the Cayman courts first before you can present a winding up. You can present a winding up petition on the basis of the arbitral award um, uh, without any further action in Cayman. It's often a useful tool because um, obviously uh, it's quite a nuclear weapon to uh, to wind up a company and can therefore lead to payment. However, if, if the... Um, uh, debtor under the arbitral award is is trying to hide assets. Then it might be the first step in terms of putting a liquidator in, and then and then looking through and trying to get those assets. I suppose one thing to to warn um, clients is that if you are putting a liquidator in and there are no assets in that company, then the the liquidator will seek uh, payment uh, or often often assurance of payment from the party that puts it in. Although, of course, there is a lot, lot more now um, um, accessibility to litigation funding. So if you put a liquidator in, there is a valid claim against a director. You can get that funded through, through litigation funding. Uh, but certainly putting liquidators in, I think, is a very effective threat and, and then a very effective way of, of um, seeking ultimate payment of the award. Yeah. I think we've probably just about... Um, run out of time. Do, do we have any questions from, from either online or, um, or, or, or live? No questions from the Q&A, Peter. No questions from the Q&A. Okay, well, thank, thank you very much, um, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you thank you, everybody. Thank you, Peter, for, for moderating. That's all right. Good to see you again, George. All the best. Good to see you. Take care. Thank Take you. Care. See you. Bye. 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 Enjoy the conference. Bye. Uh, shall we begin? It's uh, that time. Uh, first of all, this is the bewitching hour. It's the time when everybody feels the jet lag and it's getting late in the day. But what we're going to do is have a good time and involve all of you in uh, the discussions. Um, Kathleen uh, Paisley is the chair. She's re re remote. And Kathleen, do you want to uh, start us off? Sure, that would be great. Can you hear me OK without too much echo? Yeah, it's yeah. fine. Super. So hi, I'm Kathleen Paisley. I'm an arbitrator based between Europe and the United States. Um, and I fear that I may have the least connection to Russia of anyone on this panel. I've, I've spent a lot of time doing Russian cases, but other than that, um, but I do have a very distinguished panel with me that have very um, strong ties to Russia. So I'm very happy to be here together with them. Um, I'm honored that the ABA International Section asked me to, uh, to chair this panel and to the Russian Arbitration Association for having us as well. Thank you very much. Um, so the impetus for this panel was the discussions that have been are being had as we speak around the globe about you know what is the role of the dispute resolution professional in trying to promote settlement. Um, today we're going to look at it from the perspective of an arbitrator, but the same issues arise in other contexts. Are we really when I sit as an arbitrator, which is most of what I do uh, these days, together with with many of my panelists, but you know, am I, is my job to simply decide the case or do I have any role in promoting settlement? And if I do have a role in promoting settlement, what is that role? So at the moment, there are two major international task forces looking at this issue. One um, of the International Mediation Institute together with the College of Commercial Arbitrators in the United States and another one headed by the ICC in Paris, looking at this specific question of what is the role of an arbitrator in facilitating settlement. So um, to set the stage a little bit, 
Um, what we won't talk about today is switching hats. By switching hats, I mean when an arbitrator um, becomes a mediator, a mediator becomes an arbitrator and then back. We're not gonna talk about that. What we're gonna talk about is, you know, what, what could the role of, of an arbitrator be to facilitate settlement, keeping his, his or her own hat on? So um, some of those, just to give you sort of a, a laundry list of what that might include, um, it might include uh, having a very active and engaged first procedural conference. Um, in my experience, the first procedural conference or case management conference can range from three minutes where the goal of the arbitrators is to get off the phone as quickly as possible to three hours where the goal of the arbitrators is to really set the stage for the case, to really delve into the detail of this case, to try and create a bespoke procedure. And the same case, the same, you know, can have the two approaches depending on who the arbitrators are. And so, you know, that that one decision at the very beginning can have a have a major impact on the promotion of settlement. When you're in that conference, that procedural conference, whether it be long or be short, do you talk about the possible inclusion of mediation windows or settlement windows? And by that I mean breaks in the procedure where the parties will go off and try and mediate or negotiate. That does not mean the, the arbitration has to stop. It, and they may already be an a mediator in place from a step clause. So what is the relationship between the arbitration and a mediator who may be present already or who may be added in the procedure? And if you haven't added a mediator at that point or suggested it, is there any role for the arbitrator later in saying, you know, you guys might want to think about mediating this case. Is that appropriate use of, of the arbitrator's function. And then the other thing is, you know, what, what procedural mechanisms might promote settlement? And to what extent should you consider whether a procedural mechanism will promote settlement in deciding whether um, to do it or not? To give one example, um, a request to bifurcate, or not necessarily bifurcate, but to decide a dispositive issue, let's say. Um, to what extent when you're deciding whether to grant that as an arbitrator, could you or should you consider the impact that may have on settlement? Or should it only be about whether or not the standard is met um, for deciding that issue in a dispositive way, putting aside whether or not facilitate settlement? And there are others. And my distinguished colleagues, I'm not going to steal their thunder because we have experts here and many other mechanisms and they'll talk about those. Um, and with that background, let me just introduce my panelists. Um, let me start with Patricia, who's my other panelist on Zoom. Patricia, Patricia um, Shaughnessy is a professor um, in uh, uh, Stockholm, Sweden, as well as being a very distinguished arbitrator, mediator, expert, um, and she's written a lot on the subjects we're going to talk about today, so we're very glad to have her. Um, Peter? Now, Peter, pronounce your last name for me. I don't want to get it wrong. It's Pettenbaum. Pettenbaum. Yeah. Everybody knows Peter. He was a longtime managing partner of uh, Hogan's in uh, Moscow and has managed other law firms in Moscow. And now he spends his time primarily as an international arbitrator and mediator and often gets involved in disputes involving uh, Russia and um, other countries in the region. And in addition to that, he too has published and is involved in uh, uh, working groups considering these issues. And Felix, who's also in the room with you, is a German uh, partner in a law firm where he uh, uh, also specializes in international dispute resolution. And he is a member of the bar in, Mo in both Moscow and Germany. So he's really um, very well qualified to speak to uh, the subjects today. And Anna, um, who is also in the room today, um, she and I share a, a, a home, but not in Russia, in Miami. I'm also from Miami, although now I spend a lot of time in Europe. Um, and uh, she is a uh, international disputes resolution professional, but also has a strong insolvency practice and as well as data protection. And she is president of the Florida chapter of the Russian Bar Association as it were. So I'm sure I got that wrong a little bit, but um, 
See, I did. They, they took me off screen because I said something wrong. Anyway, so what I would like to do now is we would like to have a very interactive session. Um, we, we really don't want to talk at you. We want to discuss with you um, questions that we think are worthy of discussion on this subject. And we're going to start out from those of us who are on the phone. So I'd like to ask Patricia a question to start out with. Um, so taking a step back and not delving into the details too much, Patricia, what do you consider the role of the arbitrator to be in facilitating settlement? You arbitrate as much as anyone. What do you think our role should be in facilitating settlement? Sort of when, where, and how should we do that? Thank you, Kathleen. Um, I don't think there is one answer. And I think that it, this is a question which very much reflects different cultural and legal traditions. And it also may reflect a certain generational differences. So the idea of an arbitrator acting to facilitate settlement as compared to adjudicating, deciding, um, is something which particularly common law jurisdictions um, were not particularly acquainted with earlier, but it definitely is the new normal. And the traditions in which that has been existing for a long time have now been, we could say, exporting what I think is a very positive development into other cultures, into other contexts. And we see that it's definitely come into fashion um, as an effective tool, as the arbitration community has been working towards trying to really increase its efficiency, its service to the users to efficiently, with reduced costs, arrive to a enforceable and fair outcome. And there's really no settlement of a dispute, no resolution of a dispute that's more efficient than one in which the parties have reached a settlement provided that their settlement terms will be timely complied with or enforceable. We'll come back to that later. So in the, the more specific uh, answer to your question, let me just know that the, the, in your question, you said facilitating settlement. And so what is facilitating settlement may be subject to many different approaches and different opinions and something I think we should discuss. We know that if one looks at the ICC guidance and the times and costs that um, arbitrators facilitating, encouraging the parties to consider settlement is advisable. If we go to, for example, Felix's home country, we'll talk about that perhaps a bit in the German Arbitration Institute, the DIS, in its rules from 2018, at all times, the arbitrators have a duty to facilitate settlement. Um, we see it in the Prague rules, which reflect the um, alternative to the IBA, but have more procedural aspects, giving a distinct role of arbitrators to facilitate or encourage um, settlement. But again, that depends on, on what it means. And in any case, I think the days of where you would simply say to the parties, would you like me to facilitate settlement? Um, if you don't, then we'll just continue. And nobody nods their head, so you just continue. Those days are over. And I think that we all need to seriously have a conversation at the first case management conference. Have it on the agenda that you send out in advance of the CMC and discuss what role the parties might want and to remind them that that is a continuing role. The bigger challenge before I'll turn over is um, uh, a question that I will pose. And that is, are arbitrators inherently naturally born with the skills to facilitate settlement? I think one of the, the things that many lawyers and arbitrators underestimate is the important development of professional skills for parties, um, experts, or facilitators of settlement, and mediators. There is a real developed professional toolbox in skills training to be able to engage in the type of mechanisms and procedures, whether they be facilitative or evaluative or dialoguing, whatever, that are at play. And I think actually um, many arbitrators are really, frankly, unfamiliar with that. And that may cause them to try to uh, jump over that particular role. So with that, I invite uh, my colleagues and the audience to engage in a discussion with us. 
That would be that would be great. I am, um, and and I and also our other members of the panel. I mean, what are your thoughts on on Patricia's remarks? I have some, but I think it would be good to to hear from those in the room. Well, I personally think that um, many of us do mediation as well as arbitration, and I think that skill um, can be brought to bear if one is trying to settle a particular facilitate the settlement of a case in arbitration. And if uh, the, the, in the middle of the arbitration, there's a mediation window uh, and um, a separate person comes in as mediator, there are a lot of due process issues if the arbitrator tries to mediate a solution uh, because if the arbitrator as mediator fails or the, the parties do not reach a settlement and the arbitrator comes back in, significant due process considerations. But, but if you have a, a, a person who might be an arbitrator but has mediation skills, that's terrific. Got a question over here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I believe that uh, basically um, the purpose to facilitate uh, the dispute uh, lies in the very uh, root of uh, the arbitrator's uh, mandate and uh, his purpose of uh, existence in the case, uh, if I may to say so. Uh, so I believe that it's more than relevant for the arbitrator uh, to act as a mediator if the parties ask him to do so and if they don't uh, you know, argue over this uh, factor. So if this uh, results in effective settlement of the dispute, why not? Because it's the main purpose of all the procedure. Other comments? I actually agree. I, I seek out arbitrators that are experienced, especially in a single arbitrator um, proceedings, because often than not, um, a single arbitrator who's experienced will at least direct the parties in the in the right sort of way and do it so um, eloquently that it doesn't seem like an arbitrator is biased towards one side or another. And I think that's important. That's important for arbitrators to keep in mind that at all times there has to be, uh, you know, arbitrators have to act independently and there, there cannot be even a hint of bias, especially when um, and sometimes it happens that you don't always have a very experienced uh, counsel on the other side when it comes to arbitration. So it's, it's I, I feel like it's such an intricate job for an arbitrator to facilitate potentially settlement, or talk about the most important issues. But if you can find an arbitrator who can do that, that often can help the case um, to get resolved way before the final hearing. Yeah. So I am very much uh, supportive of uh, an active role of an arbitrator in the arbitration. Um, so as I know, I represent here Germany and uh, German style arbitrations. Uh, so we learn uh, how um, it can be done in the German litigation. So uh, German judges and Austrian judges, I, I see Austrian colleagues in the audience, uh, they developed a wide variety of skills, uh, how to facilitate an arbitration. Of course, not all skills are suitable for international arbitration, especially with the participation uh, of parties uh, from common law countries, but a lot are. And uh, I hope today I can present you a couple of uh, secret tools of German arbitrators how to, uh, to make the parties settle. Well, one thing that uh, just uh, one thing that uh, Felix has mentioned is very important, which are the cultural differences. The uh, Germanic Austrian uh, approach is much more uh, along the lines of facilitating settlement long before there's a hearing and a final award. And I think, however, the common law approach is much more uh, the lawyer, uh, the lawyers, the, the counsel for the case carry the role and the arbitrator sits more as a judge waiting for submission of testimony and arguments and, and is not uh, acting as a facilitator. The gentleman back here asked the first question. I think you put your finger right on it. Is it the duty of the arbitrator to facilitate or is it the duty of the arbitrator to be more like a judge? Nicholas, you had a question or a comment. We should use a mic so it gets on the recording. Yes, um, Nicolas Pitkowitz speaking. I um, think uh, for Austrian uh, arbitrators, uh, they are like judges in a way bound to attempt uh, to seek a settlement. But the question is how far they can go. And my view, I'm a, 
um, coincidentally, I'm also a trained mediator. I don't think that the arbitrator um, can go very far. I think they can investigate how far if the parties want to settle. Very often they do, uh, but there are many cases where they just simply don't and the arbitrators mustn't push it. And if they do, I think the arbitrator will have uh, a number of techniques and one technique uh, often applied um, that also um, provides or presupposes that the parties agree to that and um, also waive any potential challenge uh, rights, etc., cetera, um, is uh, what, what is very often applied in, in, in Vienna um, and, and, and also in Germany is that the arbitrators give a preliminary evaluation uh, of some aspects of the case or at least of the key issues of the case, um, which gives the parties some guidance in which direction a decision uh, could be forthcoming, but they would then um, clearly, I would never go so far as to make any settlement proposals um, or to act active as a facilitator in a settlement, but rather recommend that the parties then seek assistance of a professional um, mediator or settlement facilitator. From a cultural point of view, though, that would not be the position of most common law lawyers, common law arbitrators. They, they would never go even uh, to the limited extent that you have mentioned. It's a fact of life. It was interesting. I was in Paris for the very beginning of Paris Arbitration Week, and I was speaking with a um, very distinguished Israeli um, arbitration practitioner, and he was describing um, probably the, one of the most um, famous uh, international arbitrators giving a settlement proposal in a very large um, arbitration um, involving both a common law and an Israeli party. And that with a lot of, I mean, the whole point is you got to get all the consents and you want to make sure that, you know, and you still, you still have risks. Um, but that they were all extremely pleased, settled the case, um, they thought it. They thought it really worked well, um, but of course, that's when the settlement proposal is accepted. So I think we've sort of jumped ahead to your topic, Felix. Do you want to talk a bit about more about the German approach and how that might work? And I think we should, Peter, um, whenever or or Anna or whomever. I think to the ex or the room. I think we should be, you know, to the extent that you know, what is the cultural approach in in Russia? How would Russian parties feel about these issues? How would they feel about these issues? You know, I always make a very careful line between what I consider to be my role in facilitating, whatever that means, settlement as an arbitrator, and then what I consider to sort of go over that line and where what I wouldn't do, but I know that with my common law training, my line is probably closer I mean, although I think I'm quite active, I think that my line is quite more limited than than others. So I think if if you wanted to talk about that, Felix, that would fit good in, and Peter could could talk about cultural issues, maybe. Sorry. Well, I think that one of the I'd like to turn to Felix on that because uh, you are dual qualified in Germany and uh, in in uh, Russia. So what do you think the differences are culturally? What I see the difference is uh, more between the German legal tradition and the uh, common law legal tradition than between the German and the Russian one, uh, because uh, both in Germany and in Russia, uh, the litigation, the process uh, in the courts are more, the people call it inquisitorial, but uh, I uh, like more uh, the expression managerial. Uh, so that, uh, of course, uh, uh, the, proceeding, uh, the procedures are up to the parties, but what is emphasized is uh, a slightly more active role of the, of the judge. Uh, so I don't see big cultural differences between Germany and Russia, and I do see cultural differences between the, uh, the civil law and common law system. Uh, are there Russian attorneys in the audience that might want to comment on that? Well, I had no experience uh, with arbitration cases, but uh, in my litigation cases or my practice, uh, I 
as I somehow noticed, that uh, Russian courts are more likely to uh, evade the active role of courts, uh, and they are evading any uh, grounds to settle up the mediation procedures and to turn parties from uh, settling the disputes uh, without the court, uh, and they mostly uh, take uh, non-active grounds, as I as, as I saw it. Are you referring to Russian judges or Russian arbitrators? Uh, Russian judges, as, as I mentioned, it, it can, my common concerns the Russian litigation, not arbitration. Anna, do you have a comment on that? Um, well, I. I have a comment, although um, I can't say that I have a vast experience with a Russian judicial system. I do represent a lot of Russian clients in Miami, represent them in the US courts in Florida, as well as in arbitration proceedings. And um, um, the reason why I'm even on this panel, I think it's very important for arbitrators to uh, be wise enough to facilitate settlement. Um, I hands down, uh, hands up, hands down, um, all, all uh, for sell, uh, settling the dispute. I think it's efficient. I think it's cost effective for the parties. And the most important thing of the parties reaching a settlement agreement is it provides for a result that both parties can live with. Uh, and uh, parties know what's going to happen. Whereas in litigation or in arbitration, we know we don't always know till the very end. Um, and I think this is very important. However, um, I'd like to cover this one important thing when settling a case with Russian parties. And this is what I've learned the hard way. It's my war story. <laughs> um, I was representing uh, a party that was going through a divorce proceeding here in uh, Moscow. And um, they had um, assets here in Moscow. They had uh, several corporations here, and then they had assets in the United States, particularly in the state of Florida. And not even the southern part of Florida, but central Florida. And that is um, a big difference, um, practically uh, just two different countries, actually. Uh, people who know, they know. Um, nonetheless, uh, what happened was one of the spouses um, decided to um, get rid of assets in the United States and started selling them off without telling uh, the other spouse. Um, she accidentally found out, um, nobody ever notified her that her houses were being sold at that time. So we had to start uh, proceedings in Florida quite urgently, putting um, notices on all the real estate that it cannot be sold. Um, and quite quickly, we got a settlement proposal from the other side. Um, interestingly, though, the parties were going through divorce in Russia, and Russian court said, we are not going to determine how the assets will be split in the United States because it's not within the purview of our jurisdiction. So here we were, stuck with parallel proceedings, not cost efficient by any means. Nonetheless, an American lawyer from the other side basically um, propo proposed a settlement, which uh, my client liked because it allowed her to keep her assets in Russia. And she was willing to um, allow the other side to, you know, keep the assets in the United States. Now, in order for her to keep the assets in Russia, which were um, a corporation and a real estate, uh, we had to have a settlement agreement that also involved specific performance. However, my client was represented by an attorney in uh, proceedings in Russia who probably have not had a huge experience dealing with settlements. Why? Because when we were signing parallel settlement agreements, that lawyer fully advised me that everything is fine with the settlement agreement and that the settlement process was concluded. Well, he was wrong, very, very wrong. And we learned that within three days because in Russia, under Article 39 of the Civil Code of the Russian Federation, the process is not as simple as it would be in the United States. You see, in the United States, once a settlement agreement is signed by the parties, it has a full binding and legal effect. It's not the case in Russia. As a matter raising, of Anna, you raise a very good point because talking about arbitration and mediation, uh, 
mediation settlements are generally considered to be contracts. Um, and the enforceability of a, of a mediation is just enforcing a contract right. Whereas if you have an arbitral award, that can be enforced uh, under the New York Convention. And one of the things that uh, has happened very recently is there is the Mediation Convention, the Singapore Convention. It's been ratified by only five or six states that is supposed to make mediation settlements enforceable uh, in foreign jurisdictions. But that um, hasn't gained popularity as yet. So one of the techniques is if an arbitration starts and then there it moves into the mediation phase and the mediation results in a settlement, you then go back into arbitration and take that mediation uh, settlement and convert it into an arbitral award, which then is enforceable under the New York Convention. One of the problems is that the people don't really quite understand that and they uh, feel that once they have the mediation agreement that it's an enforceable contract and it is not, uh, it's only enforceable as a contract. You've got to go into court and um, enforce it as such. Anna, you, you did mention that. Um, one of the questions that we have is really for you. Uh, and it says, if the goal is to settle the case, what should we know about the enforceability of settlement agreements in Russia as opposed to the US? Maybe you want to take that Peter, one. Peter, thank you for, for your comment. I think it's uh, very important. So just to finish up my uh, prior story, uh, we ended up, um, the other side did not want to settle it through the Russian court proceedings. And we ended up uh, going through two years of litigation in the United States, eventually coming to another settlement agreement. We ended up having a uniform settlement agreement that also had an arbitral provision. And um, of course, because the settlement agreement had issues of real estate involved and issues of corporate dispute involved, we had to adhere to the Russian standards of arbitrability uh, and have a Russian uh, or a Russia Russian registered arbitral institution, because uh, only those institutions can look at those disputes. The reason why I'm mentioning uh, right now because it's not as easy to transfer real estate in Russia. A party has to go to uh, uh, the state um, registry and register their right and change their right of property. They have to, at times, notify the court. They have to appear in court proceedings and confirm the settlement agreement. I believe this is one of uh, the demands of making the settlement agreement um, enforceable. Actually, the court has to make the decision to make sure that there are no other non-parties to this action that could be somehow um, affected by the settlement agreement uh, and could be harmed by it. There are other reasons why the court, the law is as such in Russia is because uh, I believe that um, the legislator probably took um, in mind that some of the parties could be um, influenced or could be uh, uh, somehow uh, victimized, especially if it's elderly people or um, you know uh, people that has uh, limited capacity to decide on certain issues. But uh, Peter, um, to, to your note, what should we consider if we have um, an arbitration or a consent really award in Russia? I think it is important uh, to look at several things here is whether or not the arbitral institution has the right to, um, first of all, has the right to decide whether or not, for example, the property in Russia has been transferred, whether or not um, you know, the, the shares were transferred to a shareholder. Um, this is important. And another thing is, is to make sure that you have a proper juridical seat for that. Good. Uh, I'm going to turn a question over to Patricia. Um, and the question is the following. Uh, what about when the settlement agreement is converted to an arbitral award? What are the most important issues to take into account? So what do you say about that, Patricia? <laughs> Well, there are a number of important issues, and, and one of the issues that I'm hoping that the Felix will, when I finish a few introductory comments, will jump in on, is the timing of the settlement. And there, um, many assume that, in fact, the, um, as you were mentioning, that a consent award can be enforced under the New York Convention. And uh, as a matter of principle, that's true but it may not be a matter of practice in a particular case. 
and the and the reason for that is that that a although the regulatory framework the model of arbitration the most arbitration rules provide that upon the request of a party the arbitrators may render an award on agreed terms also known as a consent award and it shall be as any other award and we know the New York Convention does not define awards. So the problem that we have with the timing, if we one were to look at um, the ICC rules, it provides in the ICC rules that if a settlement has been reached after the constitution of the tribunal, which under Article 16, then the arbitrators may convert a settlement agreement into an award. If you look at other rules, it may say, um, for example, SEAC or UNSATRO rules, it may say, if a settlement is reached during an arbitration. So you find different rules uh, characterizing this differently. And the problem stems from um, whether or not the arbitration was started with a settlement already agreed that is going to create a potential problem for enforcement. And so that's something the arbitrator should consider. Or if the settlement was reached before the constitution of the tribunal. And that stems to um, a wealth of academic writings from German writers and some decisions. And you'll find even in the digest of the UNSATRA model law and such some discussions about that, art that article two of the New York Convention requires that there is a difference between the parties for a referral to arbitration. And that has been deemed to be considered by many as a dispute. And we have recent case law in the United States um, from the federal courts dealing with specifically this issue. Um, I won't go into it, I wanna unpack that. Uh, I've written extensively about this in some publications, so I won't give you a, a, a law lecture, but the bottom line is, is that if the settlement is reached during the arbitration, then the arbitrators may be able to render a consent award that may be enforced under the New York Convention. But if there was no dispute at the time of the commencement of arbitrators, or if there was no dispute when arbitrators uh, were being appointed to adjudicate a dispute, there may be issues that are going to come up on enforcement and can create problems. Now, others will argue, and a good argument can be made, that that should not be the case, that, um, that one is not asking, as one federal court said, asking um, uh, uh, someone to wave a magic wand under the mantle of being an arbitrator and converting a already agreed settlement arrived outside of the arbitral process into a consent award. Um, so there are some different approaches, and a lot of this stems from a number of writings and I believe some cases that are coming out of Germany. And so this is a very um, much discussed issue and one that should be considered. And then others I'll just uh, throw out is that we have a couple of uh, recent cases where the Paris Court of Appeal has um, set aside consent awards, um, dealing with issues that had somewhat unique factors, but dealing with issues where obviously the, um, the uh, agreed settlement was uh, tainted by uh, by fraud or by corruption or bribery or perhaps it was not a properly authorized party representing and you know the french courts had taken a strong position regarding the red flags of corruption and that um, case law seems to have come into the areas of consent awards and then also because of the um, case law from saint petersburg we might discuss on um, ensuring that the settlement that's put into a consent award falls within the arbitration agreement and the mandate. And that, um, that we have an interesting case we might discuss from St. Petersburg where there were uh, settlement matters that were outside the arbitration agreement. And so the arbitrator did not include those in the consent award. And when it was brought for enforcement, the party that had not complied objected saying that, um, that that party was not was deprived of the right to be heard because the arbitrators had not discussed with the parties um, that they were not going to put all of the terms of settlement into the consent award because of that problem with the arbitration agreement. I invite Russian lawyers who've actually read the case to be more specific on that. So yeah, Felix, yeah. did, did yeah. you start this? Did you start the problem, Felix, you Germans? 
Patricia, thank you very much. Uh, I think you outlined the problem uh, very well. So it's exactly this, uh, this stage of the discussion. Um, uh, one of the specific problems is uh, whether the parties um, agreed to a settlement and the, the settlement is converted uh, to the arbitral award. And we are on the stage of uh, recognition um, of this, um, of making enforceable of this award in court. And suddenly one of the parties says, you know, actually, there was no dispute because we agreed the settlement a minute before uh, I filed for the arbitration. And uh, so there is a, a, a scholars discussing on this issue whether it should be considered or not. And uh, there are very good scholars, very, very, very good arguments for each direction. My personal view is that we shouldn't be um, we shouldn't allow it because because it would be unfair if both parties uh, did it um, and uh, the both both parties decided to go um, uh, those way we should we should honor it because there are enough uh, requirements uh, to this award it should be done it has to be done during the arbitration so it should be done after the filing of the arbitral award it, um, it cannot be done after the rendering the, the final award. It cannot be done before uh, the constitution of the arbitral tribunal. So there are so many requirements. So f to my personal opinion, it is enough. Uh, we shouldn't introduce a in, 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 in new requirement and shouldn't uh, allow a party late in the arbitration process come out with this argument to say, actually, I was in agreement before the arbitration. You know, if the Singapore Convention is ratified by more states and comes into effect uh, and is more recognized than it is today, all these things may disappear because the Singapore Convention allows for the recognition and enforcement of mediation agreements without having to go through the arbitration process. As I say, Peter, can I, just, can I just jump in and say the Singapore Convention now ratified by in four and seven out of the 55 right. signatories, um, but doesn't it have to be a mediated and not a negotiated or facilitated settlement? Yeah, mediated. Yeah. But at least it's uh, going in the direction of getting us away from some of the problems that you have mentioned. Um, Anna, we could turn to you now. Um, uh, do you have comments about where the, the direction is going with the Singapore Convention or with the arbitration, these problems that we just raised? Well, I think it would be wonderful if uh, mediation could gain more popularity um, in Russia. It's quite popular in the United States right now. I'll say this, that from my experience, I have been lucky enough to have good mediators in some of the disputes that we could not resolve in both arbitration and court that lasted for over five years were all decided in mediation, all disputes at once for one particular corporate client, and that worked quite well. Uh, however, I don't think that mediation just is popular here in Russia right now, but I hope that there is going to be a future. Like we have a comment from a Russian lawyer, maybe maybe uh, you'll tell us otherwise. Uh, yeah, I believe that the main obstacle uh, which mediation is facing in Russia uh, is called the costs of litigation in Russia, because litigation is uh, extremely cheap in Russia. Uh, the access to the judicial courts of, and the arbitral courts uh, is, uh, you know, they're very, um, um, what's the word? Uh, you, you can access them with the minimum financial resources, uh, and that's why they're overcrowded with the cases, and that's why they're overcrowded with the parties, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And at the same time, uh, they're working pretty fast, uh, even in this overloaded regime, uh, so you can, uh, whatever, in six months from uh, filing the case to the court, uh, you can, in six months, already enforce uh, uh, the final uh, judgment. Uh, so, yeah, I believe that at the certain moment, the main uh, obstacle that mediation is facing is that the arbitration procedures are still quite expensive, and not always very fast, uh, while judicial, uh, this basic judicial procedures are too, uh, basically cost nothing uh, in terms of, uh, especially the capitals of a huge economical subject, and they're quite fast. Well, on that point, and I'd like to just uh, just say that I, I, I can see that. However, with mediation, in my experience, it was it, it's not cheap, certainly because you have to pay for the facility and you have to pay a mediator's fee, hourly fee, and the lawyer's fee, whatnot. However, I think the most important result that you gain out of mediation is a certain result. 
You know, it's the result that both parties, as I've said, can live with. It might not be uh, something that uh, either party can bolster about and say, oh, we won this case. You know, we were right from the get go. But I think for a lot of corporations, and I think we, we are getting to this point where a certainty of a result is more important than a litigation bravado, if that makes sense. And I don't know if um, you have any other comments. Yeah, yeah. I just want to say one little thing that uh, at the end of the day, uh, resolving your case by a motivation uh, in the uh, you know, public policy of a company uh, is a non-toxic decision while pursuing with litigation procedures or even with arbitration procedures could be quite toxic because you will be considered by your contra agents in the future as a toxic party in case of any problem. Uh, so uh, this social capital uh, aspect of this problem is still very valuable, and that's why uh, mediation is actually a preferable way to uh, resolve your dispute. Do we have comments? I maybe break in from abroad and 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 ask Peter a question because I I think what one thing that's very interesting is you know this question of combining dispute resolution mechanisms. I take the point of the speaker, which is an excellent one. If um, in any jurisdiction where you can get a good result, um, a reliable good result in six months for a marginal cost, that's going to be a relatively high hurdle to, to beat in terms of any dispute resolution mechanism. Whereas in my mother country, um, it will take longer and it will cost a fortune. And in my adopted country, it will take longer, it will be cheap, and the result will be not necessarily a quality result in my experience, but if you could have a quality result in six months, that's hard. But one thing I was very interested in is the first UNCITRAL Academy was held recently and they asked the participants, what do you think is the most important thing, development that will impact international dispute resolution next five years? And overwhelmingly, the answer was mixed mode dispute resolution. So in other words, some combination of litigation or arbitration with mediation or DR dispute resolution boards, or I mean, define it as you will, but I thought that was very interesting. Um, and one of the most um, common, as, you know, or one of the common ways of doing that is ARB med ARB. So arbitration followed by mediation, followed by arbitration. And you've written about that. So I'm wondering if you would tell us a few words about, you know, what, why do we do ARB med ARB? You know, what are the important characteristics? Because it does feed into this consent award question as well. Well, I've written an article, there are copies on your, your chair, uh, looking at the protocols and practices of institutions, civil institutions on this subject. It's a process. Um, it is designed to um, facilitate uh, settlements much more quickly than would be the case if uh, arbitration went full course to the hearing, uh, to post-hearing briefs, to the writing of the award, uh, et cetera. And there have been quite a few studies that, uh, of users that have concluded that um, uh, arbitration is in danger because it, uh, the large-scale arbitrations, and maybe even some small-scale arbitrations are too costly, they take too long, and this is a process where uh, the arbitration begins, and after a, a period uh, where uh, briefs have been exchanged, maybe there's been a limited amount of discovery, a mediation window is inserted in the process, and uh, a mediator, generally speaking, not one of the arbitrators, uh, mediates for a very distinct period of time. And if the mediation is successful, there's a settlement, it then reverts back to arbitration, that becomes a consent award, and it is enforceable, recognizable, and enforceable under the New York Convention. If after that limited period, um, the mediation does not result in a settlement, the arbitration continues on uh, to the whole process of a hearing and the, then a final award. There are many issues that are raised by this. How does it get uh, implemented? How do the windows get created? Who is really driving the force? Because unfortunately, um, uh, many participants in this have a sort of a vested interest in seeing the arbitration go to full completion. The hearing date has been put into everyone's schedule. Uh, council feel that they're very much in control of the process. They know what to do. Um, bringing in um, a new person, the mediator, uh, is disruptive. On the other hand, if it's successful, it does produce a considerable saving in time and costs. 
And that in a nutshell is our meat arm. And I mean, so what I think, what I thought was very interesting, because I've always in my, so in addition to doing a lot of arbitration, I've always had a technology and life sciences practice where I've done also uh, transactions. And I've always put in step clauses invariably um, because I've, I've never mediated a case that didn't settle. Um, and in my mind, you know, the enforceability of the settlement was not that essential to a formal mechanism because I'd put in an arbitration clause in the settlement, quick and dirty, and then you'd have a, an enforceable award under the New York Convention. But um, given the import, uh, but now what we're learning actually is that enforceability is much more important to the parties than we thought it was in terms of being willing to do different mechanisms. So, well, Kathleen, uh, on, on the meet arb, that's the step clause. You see that in yeah. many contracts is that it may be very early in the process and the parties really don't understand what the issues are. There may be documents that have yet to be produced that are critical. And I think uh, many times the step clause is viewed as a waste of time. The parties want to get on. They want to get on to a, a more recognizable form of dispute resolution. So uh, in many cases, um, the parties really don't give much uh, credence to that. They, they don't really put their effort into it. They, they feel it's just a waste of time. But Not as I said, I've never mediated a case under a set step clause that didn't settle as a result of the mediation, but maybe not in the room. That's the thing. That's what I wanted to say is that, you know, the mediator isn't, you know, the, the arbitration may then begin, but you have a kind of mediator in waiting, right? And so if there comes a moment at which you believe a settlement becomes a better moment, then you either have a mediation window that you can go back to your mediator or you just decide on your own between the parties, God forbid, we might wanna go back to the table. We're tired of spending $100,000 a month on this case. So I hear that all the time from my clients. Oh, it's gonna to be too early. Oh, you know, but you know, I, I did have the honor of moderating this whole in-house counsel group of a hundred folks thinking about these issues for the ICC. And I do think, uh, especially in these COVID times and all that, parties are much more willing to consider early mediation before they've blown their wad on legal fees, et cetera. So I think we should, I, I agree with you that there's a moment for mediation in every case, but I'm not sure that having the mediation clause in as a first step to kind of open the batting is so bad in most cases. But again, it, it all depends, like yeah, love and work. One of the things is that most contracts, even large commercial contracts, have a very standard arbitration clause. It may be three or four sentences, the ICC example, the ICDR example, and all that. Uh, none of them really um, contemplate these mixed modes. It's, it's the new era. Yeah. I want to ask, though, the, the, the audience whether there are comments, um, A, about uh, mediation in Russia, and B, about this new concept of arb meet arb. Are there any thoughts that you have? I actually would like to comment on that, if I may. Um, I just had a conversa conversation with Dmitry Davidenko, who was an expert uh, on settlement agreements, at least in one of my cases, for sure, uh, regarding Russian law. Um, and I asked him about, you know, there is a difference about having a regular settlement agreement and maybe potentially a mediated um, agreement. How do Russian courts view mediated agreements? And he mentioned that it's actually getting much better and the courts are now adapting a simplified process. Um, his words, uh, hopefully they're true, not mine, <laughs> but I'm just, uh, you know, I thought it was important. Uh, he unfortunately couldn't be here right now, but he definitely mentioned that. And in light of that, I am wondering now, us having this discussion, I had quite a few arbitrations where with international parties, we reached an agreement and the award was written as such, and it began, the parties have agreed. Now I wonder, right, how enforceable these awards are now. Now everything's luckily concluded, but now that makes me think of whether or not I should be seeking an arbitrator signing an award that says the parties have agreed that yada, 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 or should we just have an arbitrator saying the tribunal has found something to that extent? 
What do you think? Nicholas, what do you say? Uh, a quick comment to, to this last question. And I think the issue which uh, Patricia raised and then Felix followed on is, is really whether there is a difference on the basis. It's not the form of the award. So I think that if there is no difference, uh, as Article 2 of the New York Convention says, among the parties in the first place, the question arises if uh, the result of if an award pick is ever uh, enforceable. And I think, I mean, that that is, I think, um, to, in my view, to a large extent, also a theoretical issue because most um, parties tend to comply with um, mediated settlements because they're both getting what they want and then they comply with. And it's to a second extent, I think it's something for council to be aware of and you can protect your client by getting a separate, as you mentioned, it, um, um, uh, enforceable um, instrument in Russia or getting a second enforceable instrument in the country where you need to seek enforcement, but you just need to be aware of it. Now, and coming back to the um, MET, sorry, ARP, MET, ARP, I don't see an enforcement problem here because you start with a genuine difference. Um, I think from, um, even though, as I mentioned, I'm a trained mediator, I think mediation is not yet so um, good um, recognized in Central Europe. Uh, it's very well known in the US and in the UK, but um, there is, I think, a need to educate uh, the people, the parties, and that's a very difficult task as an arbitrator to <laughs> do so. So the question is really, and that's what I'm putting back to you, how, how to best get the, um, the parties uh, to benefit from that, because that's something which I see in, in practice. If, an arbi if I, as an arbitrator, start talking about this, they say, the parties say, well, that's not your job. Um, your job is to decide the dispute. You may ask us if we want to do that or not. So I think that the real issue which I see is how to get the parties into this process, which um, you described, Peter, and which I find very useful and 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 good process, and I would be interested to hear, hear your uh, recommendations or uh, practical uh, experience. Well, one comment is, I think it has to start with the institutions. I think if the institutions push this concept, uh, educate the panels of arbitrators, uh, that's a first step. And then I think talking to council at or before the first case management conference that um, consider a mediation, consider mediation windows. Uh, we, the institution, will propose this at certain points of time when we feel it is likely to be successful. But I think it ultimately is a cultural change because clearly the Anglo-American approach is not to favor this. Could I um, maybe bring Felix in again? Because I, I think Felix, it does comments. relate in part to, well, it's a different way of getting to the same thing, right? But I mean, the notion of arbitrator um, uh, preliminary views and potentially with consent and all that arbitrator settlement proposals is a way is a sort of way of, of moving towards settlement but in a different way could you maybe say a bit more about that how that works and how it doesn't work and whether consents are required and 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 what your perspective is on those issues because I find that very intriguing Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Nicholas uh, Pritkowitz from the audience already mentioned it, and uh, sorry, it is. Uh, we are uh, speaking now about a, a, a tool in the arbitration and, uh, and litigation, um, uh, such an early assessment of the case by the arbitrators to, together with the parties. So how it works, uh, basically the arbitral tribunal discusses the case extensively with the parties early in the proceedings, uh, after the first or second round of the submissions, um, if there is a production of documents, so after the production of documents, but uh, fairly early and uh, well before the oral hearing and uh, uh, fairly early be before the really uh, money spent um, on, on, on preparation and hearing the witnesses. Um, so um, I had a discussion today 
uh, in the in, in in the break um, with somebody from the audience, and uh, we we talked about this tool, and uh, I saw that the perception was uh, that this early assessment is like of a settlement proposal or like a certain prediction of the outcome of the case by the court, but it is not the it is not the tool. The tool is to to analyze the case, uh, to go into the specific legal issues of the case and uh, uh, of the fact issues with a right, a, a right lot of, um, um, of, of legal issues. So we all know sometimes there are different lines of argumentation of the case and there are forks in the, in the road, so, uh, so, to, uh, so to say, and the parties have to, uh, have to elaborate on each of these alternative ways until the very end of the arbitration. And uh, sometimes it's re re required a lot of uh, alternative argumentation. What the court does, the court expresses its opinion early in the proceedings about of how, how likely um, uh, one, uh, one outcome and one decision of, of the legal case is um, as, as different to, uh, to other. Um, I think uh, what is the uh, what is the uh, the process of these um, of these proceedings? Um, it is obvious. So the court it it helps the parties to predict the outcome um, of the case. It uh, helps the, the parties to find a, a solution, an amicable solution, very close uh, to the likely outcome of the case. And um, also a part of promoting evidence. I think it has a worth, a part of the promoting evidence. It narrows down the case and it's, um, it helps the parties to concentrate on really important issues, so not spend energy and money on commenting on issues which very likely are not going to become important. And also very important, uh, the court, by, by expressing its opinion on legal questions, give the parties the opportunity to comment on it and to try to uh, to persuade the arbitral tribunal to influence it, maybe to change the opinion. It is also very important for the arbitral tribunal to be open, to handle it very open, um, uh, uh, very open to, 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 to both parties, to avoid um, challenges on, on, on possible bias of impartiality. And of course, the arbitral tribunal should have the greatness uh, to accept uh, the arguments of the parties and should have the greatness to change its preliminary opinion if it is required uh, in the case. So I think if, um, if those requirements are, are followed by, it's just a very useful tool in promoting settlement. Sounds like the prog rules. <laughs> I, I can certainly say from the Anglo-American or the common law approach, that's a long way away. Um, but we may get there. Uh, I think the, uh, all these studies, these mixed mode studies and the like are beginning to like seeds. They're, they, they will begin to blossom in a while but not at this point in time. Uh, Kathleen, we are now well over our allotted time. Oh, I thought it was going to the top of the hour. I apologize. Um, no, no, no. Um, uh, we are the penultimate session. There's one more session. In oh, I'm sorry. So that's my bad. I did not look carefully enough at the program. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you all. I'm so jealous of you being in Moscow. I cannot tell you how sad that both Patricia and I are that we are not there. Um, that's why we we stayed over our welcome because we didn't want to leave you. So anyway, well, thank you. There'll be the 14th annual next year. I'll be there for sure with bells on. Patricia, Patricia and I are coming. Save us a chair. Anyway, thank you very much for your time. I apologize for going over time. I never do that when I'm arbitrating, just to be clear. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Have a good, Patricia. Thank, thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you, apologies. start uh, and, and kick it off. Well, welcome everyone um, remote and also in person um, in Moscow uh, to this mock pre-hearing conference. Uh, my name is Alice Fremont wolf I'm the presiding arbitrator of this mock pre-hearing um, and uh, my co-arbitrators are um, Maxim Kulikov, who you have already seen, who is there in, in, in presence, um, based in Moscow, and Grant Tanesian, um, based in New York. Um, it is really a pity that we can't be there uh, in person all together today, but uh, we take advantage of the technological advantages and we'll have a truly hybrid hearing. Um, I will quickly set the scene. Um, what uh, we are going, what you are going to hear today, um, we tried to be uh, very entertaining in in setting up this case, and uh, I hope you will have 
a lot of fun watching and also chipping in. Well, um, the dispute is between um, Energia Gas, um, an operator of oil and gas storage facilities in the Republic of Kalia, which, which is, is a former, former, former Soviet, Soviet Republic uh, with a legal system um, identical to that of the Russian Federation. Um, Energia is uh, the claimant in these proceedings and is um, represented by a council team based in London, have it by Gavin Chesney from Deverworth. Um, the respondent in this case is a service holding uh, Germany GmbH and Co, um, a German affiliate of Service Inc, which is a US energy service company based in Houston, Texas. And uh, Service GmbH is represented by a council team based in Geneva, headed uh, by Noradel Raj, from La Leaf. So the dispute um, arose uh, out of a um, contract between Service GmbH under which uh, Service GmbH sold certain valves um, to EG pursuant to an agreement um, providing for arbitration of disputes with the place in Moscow, me being uh, that the Lex Arbitry in this case is Russian law, under the Vienna International Arbitral Center rules, the VIAC rules of 2018. The applicable law is um, uh, the law of the Republic of Kalia, which is uh, basically the same um, as, as Russian law. And um, yes, the place of arbitration is, as I said, in Moscow. So EG commenced the arbitration against Services GmbH in October 2020, alleging that the wolves that Services GmbH had sold to EG were defective and that these defects had caused massive oil and gas leaks, which again resulted in a substantial environmental damage. And of course, Service GmbH denied all the liability. Um, in November 2020, the tribunal established a procedural uh, calendar providing for a two-week evidentiary hearing beginning um, on 11th of October. In June 2021, however, uh, the tribunal ruled that the hearing would take place as scheduled in October and that the tribunal would, would determine at the later stage, meaning now, um, whether those hearings can be held in person or in a hybrid manner with counsel, witnesses and members of the tribunal being able to choose whether to participate remotely or, um, on, um, or in person in light of the ongoing health and safety developments and governmental uh, restrictions um, regarding travel and so on. Um, now, and that is the first issue, um, e.g. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the claimant is actually um, arguing or is, has brought forward an application that the evidentiary hearing to be scheduled uh, for October should again be postponed uh, and that uh, they should take place um, only in person. So I give the floor to this issue one um, to claimant, which is the applicant. And just as a housekeeping issue, we, will ha we have allocated around 15 minutes for the arguments by councils with us as arbitrators chipping in with questions. The audience will have the possibility either, either to um, ask questions in the chat box or ask questions after each individual issue. And at the very end, we'll, we will have the deliberations um, within the tribunal also live for you to watch, which is usually something that um, you can't um, be part of, but, and we will then render a decision on all these three issues. So Gavin, um, the floor is yours for the, um, um, issue one on evidentiary hearing, postponement, and taking place in person. Uh, thank you, Madam President, um, and thank you to the other members of the Arbitral Tribunal. Um, I would note briefly, but unfortunately I can't see Mr. Hanessian. I don't know whether his video link is, is not working. Um, I yes. think in the interest of the connection, um, he, he put it off. Is that correct, Grant? Uh, no, I'm just having issues. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. We can hear you, and at least we can see your picture. Yes, I, I apologize for that. <laughs> I will. I I um I just wanted to make sure we didn't have any issues, so I'm pleased to continue in that case. <laughs> Members of the tribunal, there are two points that I want to develop in relation to this issue, which uh, Madam President has just identified. 
One relates to the question of postponement of the hearing, which is currently scheduled for the 11th of October, so a little two weeks time. And the other one then relates to the question of the format that that hearing should take, whether it should be in person or whether it should be a hybrid or a virtual form of hearing. If we look at the first point, the question of postponements, now as uh, Madam President briefly summarised there, a decision was made by this tribunal in November of last year that the hearing should take place on the 11th of October. And that decision was reaffirmed the last time that council and members of the tribunal came together in June of this year. Um, we are, of course, now seeking to reopen that decision, which no doubt my, uh, my friends opposite representing services, Gay and Behar, will say is uh, already a settled point. But it is important in our submission to recognise that there have been important changes in circumstance since the tribunal last considered this issue in June. Um, there are two important changes in circumstance. The first one is an issue which we will come back to address later in this hearing concerning a question around document production and in particular an application that my client, Energy Gaz, which I'll refer to as EG for the rest of these um, proceedings, is making to have access to documents which we say should already have been provided by services as part of its document production in this arbitration, but which it has withheld, and which we are concerned, as I'll come back to develop later, it has withheld for wrongful reasons. Um, those documents are, we say, fundamental to the evidence that is to be considered by the tribunal in this case, um, as each of the members of the tribunal is already well aware what is at issue in this dispute is the defectiveness or appropriateness of a set of valves which were provided by services for the use of my client, e.g. in its pipelines, in its oil and gas pipelines. And we say that those valves were defective both in design and manufacture, and they resulted in very significant losses being suffered, oil spills and gas leaks, which resulted not only in a loss of product, but also significant damage to the environment, which our client has found itself liable to to uh, make good. And the documents that we're seeking relate to uh, development and design of those valves and questions around any complaints that may have been made by other third parties, better parties not involved in this arbitration, which, which may concern the same defects which we have suffered. And we say, as I'll come back to develop in a little bit more time, that those documents are crucial to the tribunal's proper determination of the issues, the disputed issues, uh, live in these proceedings and therefore should be brought within the fold of the evidence that is available here. We asked for those documents some time ago. Um, we have now made an application slightly more than a month ago for an order that those documents be produced. If they are now to be produced, if the tribunal accepts the application that we have made and grants the order that we have sought, it will take some time for that order to be executed. The uh, documents that we are seeking, we would hope, should be readily available to services, to the respondents, and therefore it will not take them a significant period of time to collect and disclose them to my clients. However, we appreciate that it will take some time. Um, it, it, we would expect a, a matter of weeks. After we have received those documents, we would then equally need some time to consider and digest the material that they contain, and then as appropriate to make a submission to the tribunal as to which of those documents should be admitted in evidence and to, to make submissions on those points. That would all involve a period of a number of weeks, somewhere between four and eight weeks. I don't want to commit to a figure now until we've actually seen what documents may be produced. But in any event, that is not um, an amount of time that we have left between now and the 11th of October when we are due to start. And so on that basis, I would say that it is, if the tribunal is with us and grants the application that we are seeking, but we'll come on to later, then it is necessary for you to grant a postponement of the, um, the current timetable. There's also a second issue which we'll come on to, that's an application being made by um, services to try and prevent us from seeking information that we are trying to obtain in US courts, which we'll come on to. That again is an issue where if the tribunal is with us on that point, and we'll get into that in more detail later, then that will also necessitate a postponement. Council, you have two minutes left, less than two minutes. And so that was all I wanted to say about the postponement. Obviously, you've had our written submissions. I believe you may have had more of our written submissions than we, the parties, have had, actually. Um, but 
the only other point I then wanted to touch on briefly is that if we are to have a postponement, as we suggest, is necessary in this case, then we should also revisit the question of whether that should be an in-person um, hearing. Previously, the tribunal left it open as to whether it would be in-person or not. The major factor in that was how the world would develop and what we would see in terms of COVID restrictions, preventing people from moving around from country to country. If we put off this hearing, then it is inevitably going to lead to a delay of a few months. And we suspect that given the general trend worldwide towards developing um, cures or vaccines rather for this terrible disease and uh, withdrawing restrictions, then it is likely that an in-person hearing will be easier when we get there. Obviously, there are no guarantees. But in any event, you have seen our submissions previously that this is a case in which we feel it is important for physical evidence to be presented. We are talking about a set of valves which are very complicated, very intricate, and where you have received technical summaries from the expert reports on both sides. But I, I hope the tribunal would agree with me that those are quite complicated documents, and we really do feel that it is important for the tribunal to understand the physical evidence, to see a model that our expert wishes to present, and therefore for him to be present in the room with at least the members of the tribunal, the experts, and the council, and that uh, therefore we should be having a, an in-person hearing. With that, conscious of time and conscious that I will have um, a few minutes for rebuttal afterwards, I cede the floor. Thank you very much, um, council. Um, I give the floor to Nora Dell, um, who will provide us with a few of respondents in that case, please. Thank you, Madame. The respondent requests the tribunal to order that the evidentiary hearing proceed as planned in October in a hybrid fashion. The hearing shouldn't be postponed and it need not be held in person. EG's initial request to postpone the hearing was made before the document request to which it now refers. The initial request was made on the ground that the hearing should be held in person. For reasons I'll explain in a moment, that's not a justifiable ground for the postponement. EG apparently also thinks the same because today they seek instead to link their request for postponement to their pending document requests and 1782 applications. Confirming that the true motive for these unmeritorious applications is to force the tribunal's hand to give EG what it wanted all along, a postponement of the hearing. This is simply another attempt to revisit an issue which the tribunal has already decided and that request should be rejected. The central premise of this latest request as formulated today is that the evidence EG now seeks is so crucial to the case that it would be unfair to hold the hearing before this evidence can be presented. But as the tribunal will hear later today, the evidence sought is not crucial. In fact, it's not even relevant or material. If the tribunal agrees with me on that, then the basis of the postponement request also falls away and the hearing should go ahead as planned. Even if the requested evidence were important, and we're not to prejudge that until the tribunal has heard both parties, the tribunal must weigh that against the efficiency of the proceedings and the delay with which these applications have been made. Under Article 25 of the Russian Arbitration Law, a party's failure to provide evidence is no bar to proceeding and rendering a decision based on the available evidence. As to the 1782 application specifically, the claimant should have sought this evidence earlier. It has known about these proceedings since at least October 2020, when it filed for arbitration. So in summary, the claimant's new um, excuses for the postponement, namely its various document requests, provide no better basis for the requested extension. As for the original justification for the postponement, the virtual versus in-person debates. Under the can I, 
Can I quickly chip in? And sorry, Noradel, to interrupt you. I mean, just on a general basis to make uh, the tribunal understand, usually it's always respondent who is trying to postpone hearings and is usually happy if the claimant does. So why is it so important for you to, to keep the dates? So I'm, I'm going to address the question of delay. And actually the question of delay, uh, contrary to Mr. Chesney's attempt to separate the postponement from the format, the two are of course linked because as, as the claimant recognizes, if we are to have an in-person hearing, clearly that cannot be in three weeks time. So in fact, the postponement and the format uh, issue are quite linked and I will come back to the question of delay and why the respondent is quite concerned. And so should the tribunal be as well. So under Russian arbitration law, um, parties only need to be given a full opportunity to present their case. But that right doesn't extend to having a physical hearing. A tribunal in a Russian seated arbitration governed by the Vienna rules, namely like this distinguished tribunal, can order a virtual hearing against a party's will. This is the case both as a matter of Russian law and under the Vienna rules. If you were to have regard to the IBA rules, which of course are not directly applicable, they also permit the tribunal to order against one party's will that the evidentiary hearing be conducted as a remote hearing. Since this tribunal can order a fully remote hearing, then of course it can also order a hybrid hearing, which is what we have planned, um, and which a party can choose to attend if it so wishes. In terms of the claimant's expectations, we should also remember that the claimant started these proceedings just a year ago, namely after the breakout of the COVID pandemic. And they must have expected that the hearing wouldn't be in person, but chose to bring the proceedings now anyway. There are, of course, also practical considerations um, in favor of a hybrid or virtual hearing, which this distinguished tribunal will be well familiar with. I won't go into the detail, but even this case management conference shows how well a hybrid hearing can work in practice. Um, I have one um a uh, small question to, to the hybrid format. Would it be okay um, for, for you uh, that in the hybrid fashion um, uh, that claimant presents its experts to the tribunal being fully present and just, you know, respondent being in a, in a sort of virtual setting? Would you, would you be okay with that? I mean, it's up to the tribunal how it dictates the hybrid, but of course, the hy if hybrid is ordered, it needs to still have regard to the equal treatment of both of both parties. So I think if if one council attends, then both council would, would have to probably attend. I will address the expert issue, of course, uh, as well in a moment. Um, the, the delay now and Madame Chair's earlier question, beyond the question of virtual versus in person, in the present circumstances, an in-person hearing would inevitably mean an indefinite postponement of the hearing. Um, Mr. Chesney was careful to avoid when that might be. Um, and indeed, we are all hopeful for a general trend in ease of restrictions worldwide, but this has, alas, not been the experience to date. What we have seen is ebbs and flows, and currently cases are on the rise, not on the decrease. Um, so a postponement until a physical hearing can be held may leave us all waiting for a rather long and indefinite amount of time. Such an adjournment, um, in our view, contravenes the tribunal's duty under both Russian law and the Vienna rules to conduct the arbitration efficiently and with reasonable expedition. As to the respondent's prejudice, Postponing the hearing puts an undue burden on the respondent in defending unmeritorious claims for any day longer than it needs to. This is true both in, time of, in terms of time, cost, and resources. It's no secret that the longer an arbitration goes, the more costly it becomes. Moreover, as the saying goes, justice delayed is justice denied. An indefinite postponement is also not helpful from the tribunal's perspective. Witness memories start failing and therefore become a less useful exercise for the tribunal in terms of the hearing. And also, we're now three weeks away from the scheduled hearing. We have no doubt that this well-prepared tribunal is ready to hit the ground running. And if we were all to put pens down now, only to dust it all off and have to familiarize yourselves with it in a year or more, 
um, this will certainly be inefficient. Last. Your time is almost up. Can you wrap up quickly? Yes. My mm -hmm. final point relates to the parties and arbitration generally. Arbitration in Moscow is building up a reputation as an efficient and transparent arbitration venue. The Vienna rules have a long-standing reputation in the same vein. This is what the party signed up for, and this is what they should be able to expect. In view of the evergreen debate about time and cost in arbitration, each of us have a role to play. And in this case, I submit, our role is best played out by proceeding with the hearing as planned and bringing this dispute to its final resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Um, Gavin, I give the floor to you for your rebuttal. Uh, thank you. I will just take a, a moment to respond to a couple of those points. You have my submissions on some of the points, um, as I made earlier. I would note just one additional thing. Uh, it was suggested by Ms. Rajai that uh, there is no right to uh, an in-person hearing. That is something that we would accept. There is no express right to be found either in the Russian International Commercial Arbitration Law or in the VIAC rules, giving uh, an ability a, a right and entitlement to an in-person hearing. There is, however, a requirement in Article 28 of the VIAC rules to the effect that parties must be granted the right to be heard at every stage of the proceedings. Uh, now, that goes without saying, it's trite, some might say, but we would make the comment that for that right to exist, for that right to be recognised, it must be approached in an effective way. We must be given a right to be heard effectively. Uh, it's no good for you simply to say that our submissions can be made through a format and that is good enough. Instead, we must be able to make our submissions through an effective format. And in this case, we would say that that does require an in-person hearing because we have evidence to present which can only be presented in person. Um, and the other point I would make just briefly on um, the merits of postponement uh, suggested by various general um, assertions made by uh, my friend opposite as to the impact of delay um, I believe the tribunal has the point that, of course, services as the respondent in this case, uh, the only potential thing that they will suffer from delay is the additional cost of dealing with the points which we have raised as part of our applications. But obviously, if you are to grant our applications, then those are costs that they should be bearing, frankly. Uh, so I, I would say that we do not accept that there is any delay that would be suffered by the respondent. On the contrary, my clients would be gravely uh, prejudiced were they not to be able to obtain and present this crucial evidence as part of these proceedings. But of course, we will examine the crucial nature of that evidence as part of the rest of these applications. Thank you very much. Uh, Nora Dell, would you like to have a sir rebuttal? Uh, just that allusion to evidence, I assume that uh, Mr. Chesney is not talking there about these document requests, which I've addressed and which we'll talk about more, but about the expert evidence that they want to show in person. Um, this distinguished tribunal will be well aware that extremely complex and technical arbitrations with high numbers at stake have been heard in a fully virtual setting for almost two years now. That this case should prove to be the exception that needs to be done in person seems extremely unlikely. Indeed, the claimant brought these proceedings after the breakout of the pandemic with the expertise that it intended to bring and as I said, must have expected that the hearing would not be held in person. Their expert reports have been on record for months. The claimant's expert must have been instructed well before that date. If this type of inspection were so crucial or important, this could have been done by way of a site visit with select participants only in a timely and efficient manner. It need not jeopardize the hearing date or the format at this stage. As with all the claimants' applications, this is simply too much disruption and too late. Thank you very much. Um, my uh, learned co-arbitrators, do you have any additional questions at this time? Or is there a question from, from the floor? Yeah, I, I've got a question, uh, if I may. Uh, and by the way, uh, do you have a, a short description of the case in front of you? I just don't see it in front of you. Yeah, so if you just don't understand anything, so you can check uh, uh, this uh, short description. Uh, 
Uh, and also, uh, you uh, have the right to ask uh, questions as you are uh, the uh, arbitrators in this panel. So we have a big panel today. Uh, all of you are the arbitrators, uh, in fact. Uh, so my question is to the claimants' council. So as I understand, uh, so that uh, you require uh, hearing in person because your experts uh, will demonstrate uh, function models uh, of the wolves, uh, correct? Yes, that's correct. They are uh, scale models, approximately this big. Okay, uh, but why it's not possible just to, you know, to watch it on video or online? I don't know. Do, do, do we need to test it, like, I don't know, touch it or smell it? So why it's impossible mm -hmm. to watch uh, the whole process uh, uh, on the screen. I'm. I'm. Uh, thank you for your question, Mr. Kolkov. I'm not sure what the models are made of, and therefore I cannot recommend tasting them. However, um, they are remarkably intricate models. They have been designed in a fashion which allows you to cut away and remove certain parts. But also, very importantly, they have been designed so to be perfectly to scale with the specifications of the valves that were supplied in this case. And so they demonstrate the way in which surfaces within the valves rub against each other in operation. That's something which is not apparent from photographs, it's not apparent from video evidence. This is why the experts who spent quite a lot of time on these models, I also hasten to add, uh, really wants you to have the physical items in front of you so he can, he can demonstrate the actuation and can um, talk you through exactly how it is that these defects have arisen and what results they have had. Okay, thank you. Maxim, um, do you want, if there are no further questions also from the audience, would you like to proceed uh, with introducing the second issue that is up for discussion and decision today, please? Certainly, uh, but just again, do you have any questions to, to the parties councils? Yeah, I think they understood everything. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so the second issue, uh, is uh, uh, about uh, 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 documents production requests. Uh, so under uh, the procedural timetable, uh, documents exchange was to be completed by 20th of August this year. And the claimant uh, had requested documents from uh, the respondent uh, and any uh, affiliated company uh, Related to the respondent uh, concerning the development and uh, testing of the wolves and any customer uh, complaints regarding the wolves. And uh, the respondent uh, responded that uh, it possessed no such document and objected to any request for documents uh, possessed by its uh, affiliates uh, outside of Germany. Uh, so the respondent stated that it didn't have access to documents of its affiliates uh, uh, and that affiliated companies, uh, uh, they have different computer systems, so uh, no uh, access to their computer systems. And uh, on 20th of August this year, the claimant requested that the tribunal ordered the respondent to provide uh, it's American Parent Company Services Inc. Um, uh, documents concerning uh, development and testing of the walls and customer complaints about them. And in support of its application, the claimant submitted a witness statement from uh, an IT consultant uh, formerly employed by uh, the uh, respondent, stating that some uh, services, uh, oh, sorry, some. Uh, uh, respondents' employees uh, have access uh, to um, uh, its American uh, parent company uh, computer system. So therefore, uh, it's in fact possible uh, to, uh, to have access to their system and uh, so to review the documents of the parent company. So that's uh, basically issue number two. Uh, so uh, the um, uh, request of the claimant uh, that the tribunal ordered uh, the respondent to 
uh, ask its parent company to provide uh, certain documents uh, on uh, the wolf's testing and the customer complaints about the quality. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Um, and I would like to ask um, uh, Gavin on behalf of Clement to um, argue in favor of its application, please. Thank you, Madam President. And thank you, Mr. Kulkov, for that summary of the position. Um, I, I almost feel rather that having heard that summary of the facts and how we have got to this position, that I could say that those are my submissions and leave it at that. I, I do feel the matter rather speaks for itself. What we did was we applied um, according to the schedule that the tribunal previously set for services to produce documents relating to, um, as Mr. Kolkov just said, the development and testing of the valves that are in dispute in this case, and also any customer complaints that have been made with respect to those valves. The relevance and materiality of those documents is self-evident. And this is a dispute which concerns, we say, defects in both the design and the manufacture and potentially the installation of these valves. Um, documents which relate to the design and manufacture of those valves will be material evidence in demonstrating whether or not these valves had a tendency to be defective in the way that has uh, eventuated in this case, I'm going to say. Similarly, documents relating to other customer complaints, complaints made by third parties, uh, may well reveal that the issues that we have suffered are commonplace and will help to confirm, therefore, that as we say is the case, the defects arise out of defects in design and manufacture, rather than, as um, I understand, services to be alleging defects in the way in which the valves have subsequently been used by my clients. Um, Gavin, sorry to, to, to chip in with the questions. I mean, okay. concerning these customer complaints, I mean, we all know that people sometimes are bored sitting in front of their computers and they feel bad and then they type in some sort of complaints just to make someone feel bad and that gets a sort of uh, revolving effect and all of a sudden you have all this, is that really, are you really arguing that that is evidence that is material for the outcome of these proceedings that someone typed in? In the middle I, of the night? I, uh, <laughs> I can certainly uh, acknowledge the point that you're making, Madam President. However, I, I don't believe that services sells these valves on Amazon. And so we're not looking at a, a comment section or some form of social media. What we are talking about here are the kind of complaints that are made by purchasers of these valves, big oil companies, big gas companies, the kind of serious players in the market who don't make frivolous complaints uh, like the ones that you are uh, averting to. And they uh, don't sit in front of the computer in the middle of the night and are bored. I'm not going to make that submission to you. Um, so I, I, would, I would suggest that these documents are going to be ones where they will be looking at the kind of complaints that we have had. They are going to be documents, not only are we asking for the complaints themselves, but we're also asking for documents relating to the complaints. So the complaint itself, but also whatever action was taken internally by services to address that complaint. Uh, and we say, we anticipate that such related documents will contain, for example, comments made by services on employees about whether the complaint was legitimate, about whether an issue existed that they would have to resolve in future. All of which is relevant, we say, to the issues that are to be determined in this arbitration. Um, two other very quick points, which I just want to take briefly. Um, one is regarding the timing of this application, obviously, we do appreciate that this application was made on the 20th of August of this year. Um, that was uh, towards the end of, in fact, it was the last day of the period on which document production was due to take place. However, we do say that this is an application which has been driven by the fact that originally services itself said it did not have these documents and it did not have access to any documents that belonged to its parent company, Services Incorporated. We now know that that is not true. You have before you the witness statement that we have provided from a, a former IT consultant of services, where he has stated he is somebody who, as an IT consultant, knows the computer systems well, knows that services employees, in fact, do have access to, uh, to documents and to electronic resources available to the parent company. And we say that those were exactly the kind of records, therefore, that should have been searched and which, from which production should have been given already. And so we are now making this application at the earliest point that we could, that we reasonably could. Um, and so the timing 
although unfortunate, is not driven by us, it's driven by services. Um, and I think um, I have one eye on the time and I don't want us to run over. I think I will therefore leave it at that. The point I would make is that this is an important application. This evidence that we are seeking is obviously crucial in determining the matters that are at issue before the tribunal in this case. And if we are not granted access to these documents, which should have been provided previously, we say, then that will cause a, a severe prejudice to us. It will seriously call into question the extent to which we have been granted a full opportunity to present the evidence that is relevant to our case in these proceedings. Thank you. I have just one follow up question um, on the power of the tribunal sitting here um, to, to really order that kind of document production. What is your position on that? Uh, if you are referring to the fact that these documents primarily are in the possession of a parent company, as we understand it, there are two points on that. The first is that actually the primary focus of our application is for access to the documents to which services GmbH, GmbH itself, has access. Uh, as is stated in the witness evidence we have filed, there are employees within services GmbH who have access to the documents of the parent company that we are seeking. And so we say we haven't heard any claims of confidentiality or similar from, from services GmbH. We say that those documents being accessible to GmbH's employees are therefore within its possession, custody and control and so should be part of this document production. The second point we make in the alternative is that even if those documents are not properly within the possession of GmbH, it has the power to ask its parent company it can write to them and it can say, we are required to provide these kind of documents for the purposes of arbitration. Will you please give them to us? Um, and of course that is, as the tribunal will know that we are aware, that is a, a, an approach which is foreseen in article 3.9 of the um, IBA rules on the taking of evidence as a possibility for gaining access to documents which are not within its possession, not within a party's possession, but which are within the possession of a party over whom it may have influence. Thank you. Um, over to you, uh, Nora Dell. Please let us know the position of uh, respondent. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the overall position of the respondent is that the document request of EG should be denied. The scope of document exchange and document requests in Russian seated arbitrations is very narrow. Generally, in line with other civil law traditions, each party is required to prove the facts on which it relies in support of its claim or its defense. The documents requested are also irrelevant and immaterial. Under both Russian arbitration law and the Vienna rules, arbitrators should have regard to the relevance and materiality of the, of the documents being requested. Services is confident that the testing and development of the valves was carried out correctly and in line with the relevant standards. Services is also confident that any customer complaints were few and unrelated to the issues now raised by EG in this arbitration. But all of that is irrelevant. EG must demonstrate that the specific valves which services applied to it are defective and faulty. Either the valves were defective in the manner that the claimant alleges, or they weren't. And the tribunal has both parties' expert evidence to guide it on that issue. This evidence regarding the testing of the valves or what other customers received or think they received is entirely irrelevant to the question which this tribunal must determine, namely whether the valves that services provided to EG were defective in the manner that they allege. It is telling that the experts, including those on the claimant side, have submitted two rounds of reports on this issue to the tribunal about whether the valves were defective without referring to the testing or the customer complaints or even uh, referring to the need for such evidence. In other words, this wild goose chase for these documents will simply take up the tribunal's time on some other issues without bringing it any closer to the decision that it must render. Nor has the claimant demonstrated 
indeed it cannot, that it has any reason to believe that these documents it seeks will support its case. In summary, these requests fall squarely into the bucket of what we call a fishing expedition for documents that are irrelevant and immaterial. They should be dismissed for that reason alone, regardless of the question of custody and control. Now on custody and control, even if the documents were relevant, the respondent doesn't have them. They are alleged to be with Services Inc., which is undisputedly a third party to this arbitration. It's also undisputed, as Mr. Chesney just told Madam Chair in response to her question, that this tribunal doesn't have the power to order documents from a third party. As to the respondent itself, the tribunal cannot order a party to produce documents that it does not have. Under the IBA rules, which Mr. Chesney seeks to rely on, parties are only required to produce documents that are within their possession, custody, or control. The respondent maintains that the alleged documents, even if they exist, are not within its possession, custody, and control. To counter this, the claimant purports to rely on a witness statement alleging that some of the respondent's employees do have access to its affiliates documents. This evidence, uh, distinguished members of the tribunal, cannot be relied on. This hearing is submission only. The respondent doesn't have a chance to test the evidence of the said witness. And under the Vienna rules, the right to be heard requires that a party be provided with an opportunity to question a witness orally before that evidence is relied on. In the absence of that opportunity, um, for which this is no criticism, um, the witness statement cannot be relied on. The witness's evidence, and this will not have escaped the tribunal, is also inadmissible, being in breach of that witness's confidentiality obligations to its former employer. Finally, even taking the witness statement at its face value, the witness himself alleges that it's only some employees that have access to the requested documents. Even if this were true, it would be unduly burdensome to require the respondent to search out those employees that may have access to its affiliate documents in order to sift out those documents, which as I said, are ultimately of minimal relevance and materiality. This also goes to Mr. Chesney's other point about um, the, the respondent seeking these documents directly from, from its affiliate. Um, again, it's unduly burdensome to require it to do that in circumstances where even the witness that they have provided, which as I said, cannot be relied on in any event, alleges that it's only some documents and only some uh, employees that have access. I have uh, some... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, um... So Services Inc. Uh, is your parent company, right? It's an affiliate. Okay, affiliate, yeah. And uh, usually, so if uh, you ask them to provide uh, you with such an information about uh, such a business within the group, so they do provide you with such information, correct? As usually within the group, uh, so you quite free circulation of information if requested? Um, unfortunately, that's not always the case. Within the group, there are these are different entities. Um, we're all at arm's length, um, and there isn't a free access of information from one entity to the, to the other for all sorts of reasons, from tax obligations, uh, confidentiality, client sensitivity, and data protection. Sorry, so your answer is, if you ask your affiliate to provide you with some information uh, so they say no because it's covered by confidentiality right or not it, it's possible the, the, the point of our submission is these documents are not within our custody possession or control now if the tribunal were to go and ask us to try and obtain them from a third oh, no, party, sorry i i interrupt you well everything is possible yeah so some something that you even cannot imagine is possible but I'm asking about just uh, uh, business usage. On average, if you ask your affiliate to provide you with some business information, uh, usually they uh, provide you with such information. Yes or no? No. 
No. Okay. Yeah, that's why they said. Oh, they say it's confidential. Go away, right? I mean, obviously, it depends on the information, and there are information sharing agreements between. Oh, I mean, I mean, not just any information. Of course, we are talking about information about uh, wolves and any defects and then testing. Uh, so, information which is relevant for our case. There is, in my understanding, sir, no automatic transfer or access to such information. No, I'm not asking you about automatic transfer. I'm asking about business usage. Usually, do they provide you with such information? Yes or no? No, because respondent uh, JMBH has a different business usage than Services Inc. So the answer is no. Thank you. Yeah, I understood. Okay, Council, um, it's, uh, are you, are you um, finished with your argument or do you want to quickly wrap up? Because uh, in the interest of time, I would uh, give them the floor for the rebuttal to. Um, perhaps I'll just wrap up. Thank you for the mm -hmm. question. Um, just one point, which I'll make in summary. Um, we've talked about the merits of the request on the substance. There is also the question that it should be denied because of the tactical uh, manner in which the request has been made. Document production was supposed to be completed on 20 August. This request only came on 20 August. And as we've heard today, the clear motive for this document request, as well as the 1782 application, is clearly the postponement of the hearing. And for the tactical underlying reasons for the request, it should also be dismissed. Thank you very much. Um, Gavin, um, would you like to uh, present your rebuttal on behalf of Clement on that issue, please? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam President. And I will be very quick and very brief in light of the time. I want to make just three points. The first is relating to uh, the point that the witness statement we have submitted stands alone and there has been no opportunity for the other side to contradict it, to examine it. Um, that simply isn't true. We submitted that witness statement on the 20th of August. It is now over a month later. The other side hasn't asked to cross-examine that witness or hasn't asked to put in any evidence in rebuttal. Uh, on the second point, on the question of whether this evidence should be excluded because it has been obtained illegally, because it's in breach of some confidentiality obligation, well, obviously that's a question that it is difficult for us to go into without a significant degree of briefing on what exactly it is are the obligations that are alleged to have been owed by that employee. But in any event, uh, I think it is more or less a universal principle, and certainly it's a principle of all the laws of the um, jurisdictions which apply to this arbitration that confidentiality can be set aside in circumstances where it is necessary to do so to prevent an injustice or to prevent fraud, as would be the case uh, in these circumstances. And then finally, um, just on the last part, uh, the question about having access to the parent company, rather the affiliate, the US affiliate company's documents. Um, I am sure it is correct that were a letter to be sent now by Services GmbH to Services Inc asking, will you give us documents? Services Inc will now say no because that is the obvious tactic to adopt in response to any such request. Uh, however, we would suggest that there, that should not prevent the tribunal from ordering that such a letter be sent, and the, letter can, uh, the tribunal can then consider, when it has seen the response to that letter, what it should draw from that. We would reserve the right to invite the tribunal to draw appropriate adverse inferences where that to be the case. Thank you very much. Um, Noradel, you have uh, the possibility for a sir rebuttal. You're on mute, Norada. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chesney referred to fraud in his last submission. Um, in my understanding, there has been no allegation of fraud in this case, but simply defective services. So I assume that was just uh, a mistake. Um, with regard to the letter being sent, um, the, the point remains that first the tribunal needs to determine the relevance and materiality of those documents. The burden of relevance and materiality is greater the steps that need to be taken. The steps that need to be taken here involve a third party which is not a party to these proceedings. And therefore that higher burden requires an even higher threshold of relevance and materiality to be met. Here, we haven't even met the prima facie test of relevance or materiality in terms of the document sold. As to the witness evidence, this is the first opportunity we have had to discuss this matter with the tribunal. And we are saying, that if this evidence is to be relied on, then in accordance with the standard practice and procedure, including under the Vienna rules, we would need to be able to test that evidence, which brings me to my third and final point. 
all of this is ultimately going to lead to a postponement of the hearing. And again, the tribunal has to bear the, the, the balance of the importance of these documents on the one hand, compared with the result, the draconian consequences of having to shift the hearing date to an uh, indetermined time in the future as a result of these, on our submission, irrelevant documents. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Council. Are there any questions from the extended arbitral tribunal, uh, meaning the audience? Maxim, do you see any raised hands or Grant or Do Maxime? you have any questions? So I understood that you understood them. Okay. You have already formed your opinion. There are no questions. Yeah. So far. Very good. So Grant, um, over to you for the uh, issue number three. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, apologies about my video. Um, so those of you that have the problem uh, available, um, I'm, I'm, we're, I'm going to talk about beginning at paragraph nine. So on 20 August, uh, with the cutoff date for the exchange of documents, uh, without uh, informing services or the tribunal, um, EG filed an ex parte application in uh, US court federal court in South Carolina, seeking documents and testimony from the manufacturer of the valves, a company called Valve Master, under 28 USC section 1782, which, um, as you know, will uh, permits um, uh, discovery uh, from companies, entities in the United States in aid of arbitrations outside the US. Um, uh, parenthetically, <laughs> we can say that when we drafted the problem, this very problem was in front of the U.S. Supreme Court for argument uh, in two weeks as to whether 1782 extended to commercial arbitrations, um, and uh, that is no longer on the Supreme Court docket. Um, South Carolina is in uh, the part of the U.S., one of the parts of the U.S. that permits a discovery in aid of commercial arbitrations outside the U.S. Um, and as is customary here, the, the, the petition is brought ex parte. Um, it is granted ex parte, permitting um, e.g. to serve the subpoena. Um, and the target of the subpoena, Valve Master, has until October 3 to file a motion to quash um, and it is understood, um, or at least uh, services has said to the tribunal that this will take about six months in the first instant court uh, to determine whether or not um, the subpoena can be enforced. Um, and so uh, services has asked uh, the tribunal to order EG to withdraw the 1782 action or alternatively to order that any evidence produced not be used in the arbitration. Um, so that's our, our setup to our problem. Thank you, uh, Grant. And now I uh, would like inv uh, to invite um, Nora Dell on behalf of res respondent to actually file the application um, uh, to go first on arguing on this issue. Thank you, Madam Chair. As Mr. Hannes summarized, the order we seek is that EG withdraw its 1782 action or that the tribunal order that any evidence it obtains through that action cannot be used in this arbitration. Let me start with the alternative order. As a preliminary matter, the tribunal has the right to make that order to bar documents or evidence coming into the arbitration. Article 28 of the Vienna rules, which I believe the claimants council referred to earlier, expressly provide that the tribunal may admit the submission of evidence and request for the taking of evidence only up to a certain point in time in the proceedings. There are several reasons for the tribunal to exercise its discretion to do that here. First, it's undisputed that it can take the US court several months to resolve the respondent's objections to the action of which we assure this tribunal there will be many. Awaiting such documentation, if any is obtained at all, 
will therefore lead to an extensive delay in this arbitration. I've already addressed in my earlier submission on postponement why such delay should be avoided. Second, the documentation sought is again, not material or relevant to the case before this tribunal. The evidence sought by EG in its 1782 action concerns again, the testing of the valves and customer complaints about the valves. The only point I would add here to my previous submission on relevance and materiality is that is this, EG now strongly alleges that this evidence, which it sought for the first time on 20 August, is crucial to its case. That allegation is belied by the fact that EG makes this application only now, almost one year after it initiated this arbitration. Third, the documents should be barred as a punitive measure. The claimant didn't seek the tribunal's consent or even inform the tribunal that it was making the 1782 application. Instead, choosing to go behind the tribunal's back. Under the IBA rules, a party is supposed to either ask the tribunal to take steps available to it to obtain the document, or seek the leave of the tribunal to take such steps on its own. In this case, the claimant did neither of these two things. Worse than that, the timing of its application is in flagrant disregard of the tribunal's procedure. EG was aware that document exchange had to be completed by 20 August in order to meet the October hearing deadline. Just by filing this 1782 action after that date, the claimant was already in a sensible breach of the tribunal's timetable by seeking documents for introduction into this procedure after the cutoff date for such documents according to the tribunal's timetable. The claimant should certainly not be rewarded by having any fruits of its fait accompli accepted into this procedure. So in any event, the documents from its 1782 action, if any, should not be used in this arbitration. I would submit further than that though. The tribunal should actively order EG to withdraw its application. Again, first, the tribunal has the power to make this order. This tribunal's power extends to the parties before it and to asking them to take action or refrain from such action as it deems fit. Indeed, this is the claimant's own submission with regard to the Services Inc. document request. The exercise of that power in the manner we request, namely to order EG to withdraw its 1782 action is more than justified in the circumstances. First, as a practical matter of time and costs, if the documents obtained from the 1782 action will anyway not be used in this arbitration, then it's easier to simply have the application withdrawn and save both parties time and costs fighting it in the US courts. Even if the tribunal doesn't bar the documents if further to our alternative order, but goes ahead with the hearing as planned in a few weeks time, by the time a decision on the 1782 action is rendered, the hearing and likely knowing how efficient this tribunal is, the award will be well behind us. Again, it's more efficient to simply save the wasted time and cost and withdraw the application. Third, there is every chance that the 1782 action will fail. Why is this relevant? The point is not that this tribunal should put itself in the place of the US court and determine that action. Of course, that's for the US court. The point is, that this tribunal shouldn't postpone a hearing that has been scheduled since long in order to await the outcome of an application without first considering whether that application has prima facie chances to succeed. This is simply part of the tribunal's duty in managing uh, efficiently the proceedings under the Vienna rules. This 1782 application is not likely to succeed. A majority of US courts, including the District Court for South Carolina, which is the court in question, have held that 1782 does not extend to a private international commercial arbitration like this one. 
A further factor a US court would take into account is whether the application is an attempt to circumvent foreign proof gathering restrictions. Here, that factor would clearly weigh against EG's application. In this Russian seated Vienna rules arbitration, the tribunal would undisputedly not have the power to request Valve Master to produce the requested documents. So the claimant 1782 application applying that rule is clearly an attempt to circumvent the available resources, uh, the resources available to it in this arbitration. Finally, the delayed nature of the request is also something the US courts would take into account. And in this case would again be an obstacle to the 1782 application. So in summary, the 1782 application was made in flagrant disregard of this tribunal and of your procedure. It is in any event unlikely to succeed. So more than simply barring the documents obtained under it, which it should do in any event, we submit that the tribunal should order EG to withdraw that application altogether. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. If I may? Yes, of course. Go ahead. Thank you. So as I understood, Council, so one of your arguments was that the documents requested from uh, a U.S. company, uh, so they're uh, unhelpful and uh, irrelevant. Uh, and I just don't understand this argument, period. So let's assume that uh, there are some documents in possession of uh, a U.S. company uh, confirming that... Uh, uh, the wolves, so they have certain defects. Uh, uh, why do you think uh, such documents are unhelpful and irrelevant? Thank you for the opportunity, because of course this question goes to both the relevance and materiality of the document request in this arbitration and the 1782 action. Um, our, our submission is the following. The claimant's allegation in this arbitration is that the valves that were submitted after testing and everything were defective. And that is the question that this tribunal must determine. And that's what the experts are examining. They are examining the valves as they were submitted, delivered, and to see if they were fit for purpose. What was done by way of testing before that is an entirely different issue and would actually require different expertise, because then we'd be talking about you know, was the testing done in a coherent and, and, and way, an integrous way? And then you require testing experts. And then the allegation becomes one against Valve Master or Services Inc. or I don't know who else the claimant seeks to target with these applications. But the point is, it would no longer be a claim against the claimant, uh, sorry, against the respondent, but now about how, how well or not well the valves were tested. Of course, the tribunal has the power to expand its terms of reference uh, if it thinks it's useful and uh, appropriate to do so at this late stage of the proceedings. But that is not the application that is being made. The application that is being made is that the documents requested are relevant to the case before the tribunal as it stands. And that is simply not the case. But what, what, thank you. But what I mean, so in my life, I've seen hundreds of expert reports. And uh, so it, it's quite usually when uh, uh, one party provides uh, an expert report, it's black, and the opposite party expert reports that this one is white. And, you know, to understand, uh, really to understand uh, who is right, who is wrong, uh, it's extremely difficult usually, especially if it's narrow technical questions. And why do you think that such uh, testing reports from your U.S. company could not help uh, to understand the expert reports uh, in conjunction uh, with other documents. So the experts themselves, as I said before, have submitted two rounds of reports are ready for a hearing without this evidence. So clearly they believe they are able to assist the tribunal with this question without that evidence. Um, as to, again, why that testing is not going to be relevant um, and uh, you know, perhaps to put it differently, this tribunal must decide Whatever history or path these valves took before they got to the claimant, the point is when they arrived to the claimant, were they defective in the manner alleged or were they fit for purpose? Whether the testing, the testing could have been done perfectly well and the, and the valves still be defective. 
Conversely, the testing could have been atrocious, but actually the valves were fit for purpose. So my point is simply that that investigation, which the tribunal would have to embark on, would ultimately not assist in the resolution of the dispute, which is the valves that were delivered, were they defective or not? Did they cause the damage alleged? And actually, this is a damage claim. The, the claim by the claimant is a claim for damages caused by the consequences of the defect. So that's even further removed from the history of the, of the valves until they got to the claimant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's, let's give the floor to, to Gavin now in the interest of time um, to uh, convince or try to convince the tribunal why it should, should not order the withdrawal uh, of the application and still take into account any information obtained. Uh, thank you, Madam Arbitrator. If I may, just before I start on that point, could I just address the question that Mr. Kolkov asked a moment ago? Um, I would have two, two points to make on the relevance of these documents generally. Um, it was suggested by Mr. Kolkov and, and in the conversation between Mr. Kolkov and Ms. Rajai that um, the experts here have been submitting expert reports on the valves as they were delivered to the site. That, of course, is not correct. What we have are valves that have failed and the experts have only been able to examine those valves as they were installed and as they have failed. And so in their broken condition, the dispute between us is what was the reason behind that breakage? Was it always going to happen because of a defective design or defective installation? Or was it something that happened subsequently, uh, an event for which the respondents are not liable? Um, that is why it is important to see the documents which relate to these valves as they were going through development, as they were going through manufacture, because that will inform what did the valves look like when they actually started operation, which is the, the relevant question for the tribunal's determination here. Um, and then the second point about obtaining documents from third parties and potentially pursuing claims against manufacturers or other third parties. Um, I, I don't want to commit my client to saying that it will never bring such claims. I don't know under what law they might be brought. Uh, but what I can say is that we have a contract with services. They provided and installed the valves for us. It is our claim against them that matters in this arbitration. And if services wants to pursue an argument that says that actually it's somebody else's fault, that's for them to do. And they can seek their own indemnity from that third party as they see fit. Um, coming back then to the 1782 application, this is one where, um, as, as was appropriately summarized by Mr. Hennessian, um, we have brought this application in the District Court of South Carolina, uh, state of the US, which is the home uh, base of a company called Valve Master. Valve Master is a company which performs manufacturing of valves for services. Um, I'm not sure of what exactly the contractual arrangements are, but Valve Master uh, has some involvement in manufacture, in assembly, and therefore has documents relevant to the testing and um, uh, and any issues which might have arisen with these valves. That is information which we understand is shared between services and valve master. We only became aware of this over the course of the summer. Uh, it was roughly in line with the time that we obtained information from the IT technician, the IT consultant rather, whose evidence has been submitted to the tribunal. And therefore we made our application as promptly as we believe we could have done on the 20th of August to seek information from valve master. Uh, this came about in part because of a realization on the part of my clients that this information might well exist. Um, we've already discussed the fact that we believe that information of this sort does exist within Services Incorporated, mm -hmm. the affiliate company of Services GAMBH, GAMBH. Um, and it was all part of the same parcel. So we appreciate that it was reasonably late on that this application was made. However, by the same token, it was made, we say, as promptly as we could in the circumstances. The other uh, point that I wanted to make is that this application um, under section 1782 the, the has been reference made by Ms. Rajai to the appropriateness of this application before the US courts. Um, for the tribunal's benefits, I'm sure you are aware of the nature of section 1782, but it is fundamentally a remedy which is available under US federal law um, under Title 28 to the United States Code, which permits the US courts to grant various forms of discovery in support of overseas legal proceedings, um, tribunals in foreign countries. And there has been some debate, we're not going to deny that there has been some debate as to the extent of that provision. Uh, 
certainly it applies to supporting foreign, as in non-US, court proceedings. There are also a number of authorities, including particularly from the District Court of South Carolina, where we have applied, where it has been held that that power also applies to international arbitration proceedings, international commercial arbitration proceedings. And in those, uh, in those proceedings before the District Court of South Carolina, my clients will be relying upon cases including the Abdul Latif judgment in the Sixth Circuit of uh, the United States. Ma Ma Madam Chairman, may I, may I ask? Of course, question? of course, go ahead. So, Mr. Chesney, could you could you address um, the reason, uh, such, such as it might be, as to as to why uh, your client did not uh, seek permission uh, from the tribunal or inform? Uh, service of this application. We, we have said that we'll be guided by the, the IBA rules, as you know, uh, Article 3.9 um, does require uh, that parties make such applications to the tribunal. Well, addressing your question, Mr. Hanessian, and thank you for the question. We would dispute the interpretation of Article 3.9 of the IBA rules that it requires in all circumstances that a party uh, seek permission from the tribunal. Uh, our reading, obviously, the most important point is that the IBA rules are rule of guidance. Um, they are not necessarily to be applied as a fixed code. But in any event, we say that Article 3.9 uh, exists to cover those circumstances in which it is necessary for a party to obtain permission from the tribunal as a matter of the law, either of the seat or of the court in which they are applying for uh, relief outside of the arbitral tribunal. Um, it's, a, it's a mechanism that enables that process to, to take place and recognises that in some jurisdictions that process is necessary. That applies, for example, in, in my home jurisdiction in the United Kingdom, in England and Wales, it is necessary to seek permission from a tribunal to seek relief from the, tri uh, from the court once uh, an arbitration has commenced. However, in these circumstances, for Section 1782 relief in the United States, that is not a requirement. There is no requirement under the US Federal Code for uh, a party making its application for 1782 relief to have sought the permission of anyone else. Uh, indeed, in the op opening summary to this part of the argument, it was noted that these kind of applications are usually made ex parte. Similarly- uh, May I have a question? Certainly, uh, Mr. Colgo. Uh, well, and, and what about Article 27 of Russian of the Russian international commercial arbitration law? I remind you that uh, uh, so the article contains uh, the requirement that uh, a party has permission from the tribunal before seeking relief from a competent court. Uh, so, uh, so there is a quite a clear requirement uh, to uh, obtain the permission from the tribunal. Uh, that is correct. Article 27 of the, of the International Commercial Arbitration Law does indeed require that um, a party with the approval of the arbitral tribunal may request assistance from a competent court in taking evidence. Our understanding of the effect of that provision, however, is that it applies to circumstances where the party is seeking assistance from the Russian courts. Uh, and we believe that that is informed by the sentence, the final sentence of Article 27, which states that the competent court may execute the request in accordance with the rules provided by the procedural legislation of the Russian Federation. Well, so your argument, your argument is that if a party applies to a Russian court, uh, so uh, permission is required, and if a party applies to a foreign court, permission is not required, correct? That is essentially our argument, yes. That is our interpretation. But what do you think is the ratio behind such rule? What is the ratio uh, behind the rule to uh, apply for a permission uh, before uh, seeking any relief uh, from a competent court? Well, I think that varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, it very much is a, a question on which different jurisdictions take different approaches. Some jurisdictions do require applications for permission. Okay, okay. To sorry to interrupt you. What, okay, I. I um, <coughs> um, so, what is the ratio between such uh, segregation? I would call it. Uh, so, if you apply to a Russian court, you have 
uh, to obtain the permission of the tribunal. But if you apply to any foreign court, I don't know, African courts, American, uh, European courts, uh, you don't have to apply for any permission. So what is the ratio for such a different approach? Well, within the context of the Russian law, I'm afraid I would have to consult with my Russian colleagues on, on what might have been the legislative background to this particular provision. Um, typically, these provisions, when they exist, requiring permission to be sought from a tribunal, they are intended to ensure that the tribunal is the primary source of control over the arbitration. However, as I say, that is an approach which varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And there are some courts where, like the US courts in this case, uh, where it is willing or may be willing, uh, I shouldn't jump the gun on that, may be willing to provide its support despite the fact that the tribunal has not been consulted. And as was adverted to previously, applications under Section 1782 of the US Federal Code are generally made ex parte without notice to anyone. They are primarily actions between the parties seeking the disclosure and the entity from whom the disclosure is sought. In this case, it's between my client, e.g. and Valve Master, the third party. Um, without necessarily requiring the involvement of any other parties. Council, uh, in the interest of time, do you want to wrap up uh, your argument so we can come to the, the rebuttals and the rebuttals? Certainly. Just very briefly, then, I will. You have my written submissions like yeah. soon. Uh, and so I will only say very briefly that here there was no requirement for us to seek permission. Um, it is uh, also in the interest of time, given the late stage at which we recognize the existence of these documents, the potential existence of these documents. We made that application as quickly as we could, and that also meant that we couldn't really tell the tribunal beforehand. Uh, and furthermore, we would also note that um, all of these questions around the appropriateness of the Section 1782 relief are, with respect, interesting matters, but not matters for this tribunal to determine. They are matters for the uh, District Court of South Carolina to determine whether this relief is appropriate. We obviously consider this it is. We don't yet know whether Valve Master will object. I understand from Ms. Rajai's comments previously that it is likely that services will seek to intervene and that will lead to court proceedings there. Um, but what we would say is that this is appropriate relief for us to be seeking in circumstances where we are seeking the kind of documents from Valve Master, which, as I said with respect to the previous issue, services has sought to hide from us, has said that they're not in its possession, when in fact that turns out not to be true, uh, and which, as we've explained before, are crucial to the determination of the issues in this dispute. Thank you very and much. I think we have one more active arbitrator, so uh, the question from the audience. Is that a question? Do you hear me well? Or... Well, I'll yes. hear you well, I don't know. Yes, um, maybe that. speak up a little bit then. I think I think you need to use a microphone. Okay, is it better now? Yes, yes, okay. much better. Okay, yeah. in in seventeen eighty two application, you need to demonstrate that um, the application will not circumvent foreign gathering evidence gathering procedures. So, um, don't you think? That, for example, in uh, I, I assume that our law is similar to Russian uh, procedural law. So, uh, when you file an application to uh, produce some evidence, you need to prove four things: that there is some specific evidence which is relevant to the case, that the party is, is in possession of it, uh, that uh, the part uh, you cannot obtain that evidence yourself. And there's also a uh, fourth criteria, I don't re recall. The idea is that, don't you think that by filing the 1782 application, you are basically bypassing the procedural requirements for the pr protection uh, for the production of evidence available under Russian procedural law? Even if we assume that you are in position to uh, produce this evidence from, from this specific party. In terms of the threshold for the production of evidence, I don't know uh, if, if I'm clear enough. No, I, I, thank you for the question. Um, I'm afraid I didn't catch your name, but um, thank you for the question. EG's response to that is that in these, in these circumstances, we are not seeking to circumvent any restriction that exists under Russian procedural law or any other law that would prevent us from obtaining information from Valve Master. But there's nothing that tells us from Russian law that we cannot seek to subpoena third parties under US civil law for the purposes of gathering information. Um, there is a provision that Mr. Kolkov referred to within Russian 
uh, arbitration law, which would require us to obtain permission <laughs> before going to the Russian courts, but no equivalent applies, we say, on our interpretation to going to any other courts. And again, I would refer to the fact that um, the argument that has just been made that uh, 1782 relief should not be granted in circumstances where it appears to be in circumvention of a foreign restriction is an argument which will have to be debated before the District Courts of South Carolina and on any appeal which then subsequently is taken. Um, as Mr. Hennessian referred to briefly in his introduction, there was supposed to be a case going to the US Supreme Court in the very near future, which might have considered this point amongst others. Uh, unfortunately, the terrible beast that is settlement has got in the way of that. And so we now won't have an answer to that question. But what I would say is that the decisions of the Sixth Circuit and the Fourth Circuit in the US in the Abdul Latif case and in the Servotronics case in, in the appeal court, have both considered that point and, and have looked at um, international arbitration in that case seated in the UK and have decided that they would be willing to grant 1782 relief to support that arbitration. So it clearly is a possibility. Thank you. Um, my question is now to the to the organizers. How much time do we have left since we started late? Uh, so we can, you know, either start with the internal deliberations or still have some some rebuttal and so rebuttal on that issue. Deliberations. <laughs> deliberations. Okay. Um, well, then I think the audience now has uh, the possibility also to, to chip in here with their opinions as we are all this arbitral tribunal uh, now deliberating on the three issues. And probably we have to take uh, the reverse order and starting with issue three and two and then um, at the end decide whether that has an effect on, on the actual hearings. And I would be curious um, to hear the opinion of my co-arbitrators on, on the arguments very briefly. Grant, do you want to start, um, please? Uh, sure, thank you, Alice. Um, well, I, I think the, if I can speak within the cloak of deliberations here, um, I, I think this, if I can call it last minute appeal to an American court for evidence uh, when the hearing date had been long known uh, and the uh, claimant wished not to go forward on a virtual basis, but to delay matters. Um, has a technical element, which I think we should resist, um, putting aside the very good uh, legal points that, that Maxime made about, about uh, Article 27. Um, so my, my own view is that we should, uh, we, should, we should ask them to withdraw it, uh, frankly. Maxime? Well, I think with Article 27 of Russian uh, International Commercial Arbitration Law, uh, yes, well, first it said that uh, not the Russian court, but the competent court. Well, it could be argued that uh, maybe uh, under competent court, uh, uh, they mean uh, Russian court, because uh, the last sentence of this article uh, said that uh, uh, the court may execute uh, the request in accordance with uh, rules provided by procedural legislation of uh, the Russian Federation, yeah, so, uh, yes, perhaps it means uh, Russian courts because it would be uh, uh, difficult to imagine, a, for example, English courts, uh, uh, you know, uh, decide the case uh, uh, based on the Russian procedural rules. Uh, uh, but um, I think anyway, this rule, so they meant any court uh, under competent court, just because I see no reason why uh, uh, we apply different treatment uh, uh, to applications to Russian courts and applications to foreign courts. Uh, because in my opinion, the ratio behind this rule is not to interfere, not to interrupt the proper arbitration proceedings by uh, different applications to different courts. Uh, so therefore, um, uh, the uh, <clears throat> claimant, I think they go in breach of uh, Article 27. 
So you, you would also say, uh, or go that far to say, we should order them to withdraw the application or simply disregard the information. I think it's enough just simply disregard, yeah, because, uh, you know, they can do what they want in America, or, uh, you know, it's up <laughs> to them. We just uh, don't, uh, they'll not notice it. That's it. Um, um, I, I, uh, I'm a bit torn between the two, um, I have to say, because if we say we, we, we will disregard it, why should we then, you know, have the parties go all that way and, you know, have them cause costs and so on and so on. Um, and it will also probably affect, um, you know, the hearing and all, all that. So I'm, what do you say, Grant? Would you also be fine with simply just disregarding or are you very strong about that we should really order them to withdraw? Well, uh, I, 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 I would need to hear a much better reason than we heard why they waited until the 11th hour, mm. or 11th hour and 59th minute to bring this. Um, and I also think there's a bit of a tactical decision not to tell the tribunal about it because this is one of the so-called intel factors, the views of the tribunal. Yeah. Um, and you know, given the, the, the timing uh, issues and what I think seem to be tactical considerations. I, I would, I think the better course is to ask them withdrawal. Um, again, um, over to you, Maxim. I, I would rather go with um, um, Grant on that point. Would you have a very strong ob objection or are you also fine if we say, okay, we order them to withdraw? I mean, in any case, if we don't regard it, and I think that that is what, what our common ground is, we can as well ask them to withdraw, whether they will do it or not. I mean, again. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I have no okay. strong objections. I think okay. the withdrawal would be fine as well. OK. Can you see from the, our audience um, arbitral tribe uh, members by raising their hands, would they, would they uh, agree with the conclusion of the tribunal on that point or the withdrawal? Could you let us know, Maxim? Do you see? Well, I think it was always Glenn. And uh... <laughs> <laughs> so are we are we overruled? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, 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 yeah, I didn't count uh, so how many, but I think it's about 50 50. Yes. Something. Okay. A couple well, of chants you... uh, uh, for one side and a couple of chants for another. Okay. So if it's 50-50, then uh, we take um, we take the decision on us and order the withdrawal um, of this application. On the issue two, um, Maxime, would you like to go first? Um, the document production, should we um, deny that request or should we grant that request? Um, yeah, really difficult question. Um, um, I think, um, I think, uh, we should grant it uh, because, uh, um, well, about the delay, I think the delay was uh, justifiable because uh, the claimant uh, had uh, a good reason to expect that uh, the respondent uh, would uh, disclose such information. And uh, so we learned that uh, the respondent uh, uh, reply was uh, that uh, we know any documents on the quality of the products. And well, for me, it sounds a bit strange, actually. <coughs> uh, and I think, uh, uh, so therefore, uh, when uh, in the end of August, uh, so they learned that the respondent uh, didn't have, didn't want to disclose uh, any information uh, because uh, allegedly they, they don't have such information. Uh, so therefore they made it the next step uh, application for uh, document production. So uh, there is okay. a, a justification for such delay, I believe. Grant? Uh, yes, I agree. I agree. I, I thought Gavin made a good point um, that um, uh, services hadn't challenged the um, this witness statement of this IT person, and they'd had a month or so to do that. Um, but I, I think on balance, I would, I would permit this. I would, though, hold the hearing dates. I, this can be mm -hmm. done very yes. quickly. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I was at first 
Uh, I have to say more convinced by Nora Dell's argument, uh, or put it reversely, not convinced by Gavin on the materiality um, you know, of, of the requested sort of documents. You know, why are these sort of customer complaints and all that, why is that really material? Because either the welfare defective or not, and why do we care about all these, you know, issues? But if the two of you feel very strong that we should grant it, but still maintain the hearing dates, and I think here I'm quite strong um, uh, that I would really like to maintain it because also in the interest of time and I think also respondent has an interest of you know swift proceedings and not um, being subject to to unnecessary delays um, so if you are with me on the issue one that we should maintain the hearing dates and also have it in a hybrid fashion um, in that sense that we re really have to make sure that the right of right to be heard is being uh, maintained for both sides. So we can't just have one council being present and the other not. Um, uh, then, then I'm also okay with, with you know, uh, granting the document production request. Grant, what would you say on, on issue one? It's issue one. The hearing dates, ah, maintaining well, the please. hearing dates and the uh, in-person or hybrid. Yeah, no, I agree with both of your comments um, that it, it we have decided, it seems to me, uh, about these hearing dates and about the, mm -hmm. uh, the hybrid nature of things. I, I, thought, I thought Gavin's um, remarks about the model, although they were clever, <laughs> were uh, you know, uh, somewhat uh, uh, challengeable given the timing here. I mean, the tribunal mm -hmm. decided some months ago that we were gonna go forward on this basis. So if they put their money, they put, they put their time into all this model Prior to that, then they're already reconciled to the decision. If they put their time into it after we made the decision, then that was probably not the best use of our time. And in terms of the hybrid fashion, you would also agree that um, uh, it's not an in-person, it, it's not necess necessary to have that in-person hearing. As Nora Dell said, we have had huge hearings, you know, on technical issues without. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, yeah. This is my second virtual hearing of the mm -hmm. day. Um, I, yeah. And then in between, <laughs> I. I had a Teams uh, consult with uh, with the chair, which I think has screwed up my camera. But uh, it. Uh, oh. <laughs> but no, we're all on Zoom or Teams <laughs> all the time, so I don't think that's okay. an issue. Uh, Maxime, what is your if, was, what is your opinion? Would you would you be with us or have your strong uh, position? Yeah, well, I, about postponement, I think we we, we we have to postpone it, but not till next spring uh, because. Uh, uh, I think document production could take maybe up to three months, uh, so it's not half a year, yeah, or nine but, months. So. But finding uh, hearing dates again, you know how complicated these councils and how busy their schedules and so on are, and also ours. Uh, honestly, uh, phew, this is going to be so difficult. And honest, I, for me, I'm quite strict on keeping the hearing dates. But well, if we well the the, 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 net, the, the previous issue, so we decided yes. to grant a request for document yes. production. But if uh, next hearing, so now the hearing is scheduled in in about uh, two weeks from now, and yeah. you know it's impossible to uh, uh, discover the documents uh, and uh, to review them. It's a very short period of time, so I think at least a couple of months. What do you think, Grant? Uh, I would hold the hearing date. I think that if there's a showing that for some reason this cannot be done quickly, we don't know anything about the volume of the documents, how many complaints, what kind of testing documents yeah. are available to the, the affiliate. Um, I, I would require a much stronger showing than we've heard uh, to put off the dates. Yeah, I'm, I'm completely with you. I'm, I'm tired of these postponements. Um, I also think that uh, we can still hold the hearing. And if after the document production, something material comes up, which will have to be seen, then we just have a post hearing brief or something. I think it's not something that we have to review uh, and we can deal with that um, at the later stage. Because postpone, yeah, Maxim? Yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah, I think I could agree with you. And about uh, uh, in-person hearing or uh, 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 remote hearing, I think remote is uh, 
uh, or hybrid is uh, well enough. Uh, I was not convinced uh, uh, by the argument that uh, we have to test, smell, and touch uh, yeah. the equipment <laughs> in person. Yeah. Could you could you ask um, our um, other arbitrators in the audience whether they would uh, agree with sort of issue to granting the document production request? So, uh, dear arbitrators, so what do you think about document production request? Would you grant such a request or not? If you grant it, raise your hand, please, and you report. Okay, yeah. So, who, yeah, who would grant it? Yeah, please raise it. Okay, about 10 or 11 people. Wait, is that uh, like. Is that half, or can you can you say it in in, in numbers so that we? Uh, okay, so Raman corrected me. Uh, uh, Fourteen, yes. <laughs> so, so how many? Is that the percentage? Okay, one free thirteen uh, to grant, and uh, uh, not to grant, to reject. No, uh, one. Okay. Okay, yeah, just one. So granted, basically. Good. And in terms of um, um, postponement of the hearing, um, could you also ask our arbitrators in the audience whether they would go with us to uh, maintain the hearing dates? So who would uh, uh, stick to initial date uh, just uh, two couple of two weeks from now? Uh, please raise your, uh, raise your hands. And Four. four. Okay. Yes, four person. And uh, who uh, who would postpone it uh, uh, up to two months uh, to wait until uh, the documents uh, 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 <coughs> discovered? One, two, three, four, five, five people. Okay, so it's almost 50 50. So we overrule <laughs> the audience. <laughs> and on uh, concerning the hybrid uh, manner, is hybrid uh, acceptable? Uh, and that's okay, the last so question. Who, who is, uh, so who, who supports a uh, hybrid hearing? Uh, please raise your hands. Okay, a lot. Yeah, so I think the majority. Hybrid. Okay. So I sum up and I thank uh, my, my co-arbitrators and the arbitrators in the audience and also the council for their entertaining and superb arguments. I sum up on the um, application to postpone uh, the evidentiary hearing. That application is dismissed. Um, the hearing will take place as scheduled and it will take in a hybrid fashion and I request the council to liaise with each other on what platform to use and uh, provide the tribunal with um, an outline of how to proceed on that. On the second issue, uh, the application uh, to produce documents, that application is granted. Um, but again, a claimant as applicant is requested to specify in detail what kind of document it seeks um, and uh, what is the materiality in, in that um, if it hasn't done so in detail, almost like a, a red fund schedule. And on the issue three, um, um, a respondent uh, is ordered to withdraw uh, its application according to 1782 in the US courts. And with that, I close the hearing and I thank everyone um, for the um, participation and for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you.